3. 1. Harry returned to Morningside Heights later that day and watched the house for seventy-two hours, in the hope of catching Kassoon. He had no particular plan as to how he would deal with him if he did, but took some comfort in the fact that he had the cards and the map. Both, he suspected, were of some value to Kassoon, enough to have him stay his hand if killing Harry meant he'd never be able to find out where they were hidden. At least that was the calculation. As it turned out, both weight and calculation were wasted. After three days of almost constant surveillance without so much as a glimpse of Kassoon, Harry went back into the house. The licks at the bottom of the stairs was little more than a crusty stain on the boards. As for Kassoon's bedroom, it had been ransacked, presumably by its sometime occupant searching for the cards. He would not come back, Harry guessed. He'd done his work here. He was off on the road somewhere. The next day Harry left for North Dakota, and the pursuit that would occupy the next seven weeks of his life began. The only person he informed was Norma, and despite her questions, he refused to furnish her with details for fear Kassoon had an agent among the dead listening in. The only other person he was tempted to tell was Grillo, but he decided against it. He'd never been certain of Grillo's agenda, or, in truth, of his allegiances. If Harry shared any part of what he knew in the hope of tracking Kassoon through the reef, he risked the information finding its way back through the system to the enemy. Better to disappear silently, presumed incapacitated or dead. Harry spent eleven days in North Dakota, first in Jamestown, then in Napoleon and Wishick, where by chance he picked up a trail that led him west into the Badlands. There, during a spell of brutally hot weather at the end of July, he came within a day, perhaps two, of Kisun, who had moved on, leaving another massacre behind. This time there was no fire to conceal the bizarre nature of the corpses, and after a short time all reports of the incident were suppressed. But Harry had garnered enough information to be certain Kassoon had done here what he'd done in New York, located and destroyed a group of exiles from Quiddity. Whether they too had been in the process of opening a door back into the metacosm, he could not discover, but he assumed so. Why else would Kassoon go to the trouble of slaughtering them? The assumption begged a question that had been itching at the base of his skull since he'd left New York. Why, after being exiled in the Cosm for so many years, were these people now gaining access to quiddity? Had they discovered some conjuration previously unknown to them, which opened doors where there had only been solid walls? Or were those walls becoming thinner for some reason, the divide between this world and the metacosm growing frail? The heat did nothing for his equilibrium. Lingering in Wishick, hoping to discover where Kassoon had headed next, his fears grew gross in the swelter and bred hallucinations. Twice in two days he thought he saw Kassoon out walking and pursued him around corners, only to find the streets empty. And at dusk, watching the solid world succumb to doubt, he seemed to see the shadows shift, as though darkness was the weakest place in the cosm's wall, and there the cracks were beginning to show. He looked for some comfort in the people around him, the tough, uncomplicated men and women who had chosen this joyless corner of the planet to call home. Surely there was some reserve of hard-won truth in them that would help him keep the delirium at arm's distance. He couldn't ask for evidence of it outright, of course. They'd already viewed his presence with suspicion enough, but he made a point of listening to their exchanges, hoping to find some plain wisdom there that could be used against the insanities he felt creeping upon him. But there was no solace in his study. They were as sad and cruel and lost as any people he'd encountered. By day they made their dull rounds with sullen faces, their feelings locked out of sight. By night the men got drunk, and sometimes violent, while the women stayed home, watching the same chat shows and cop shows that softened wits from coast to coast. He was glad to go finally into Minnesota, where he'd read of an incident of cult murder outside Duluth, and hoped to discover Kassoon's hand at work. He was disappointed. The day after his arrival, the cultists, two brothers and their shared mistress, all three in severely psychotic states, were arrested and admitted to the slaughter. With the trail growing colder by the hour, he contemplated traveling down into Nebraska and hooking up with Grillo in Omaha. 
It was not his preference. The man's contempt still rankled, but he increasingly suspected he had no choice. He put off calling Grillo for a day. Then, finally, dulling his irritation with half a bottle of scotch, he made the call, only to discover that Grillo wasn't home. He declined to leave a message, fearful as ever that the wrong ears would be attending to it. Instead, he finished off the other half-bottle and went to bed drunker than he'd been in many a year. And he dreamed. Dreamed he was back in Wickoff Street, up in that foul room with a demon that had slaughtered Father Hess, its flesh like embers in a gusty wind, dimming and brightening in the murky air. It had called itself by many names during the long hours of their confrontation. The Hammermite, Peter the Nomad, Lazy Susan. But towards the end, either out of fatigue or boredom, it gave up all its personas but one. I am the Moor, that it said over and over. I am you, and you are love, and that's what makes the world go round. It must have repeated this nonsense two hundred, three hundred times, always finding some fresh way to deliver it, as wisdom from the pulpit, as an invitation to intercourse, as a skipping song, until it had imprinted the words on Harry's mind so forcibly he knew they'd be circling his skull forever. He woke strangely calmed by the dream. It was as though his subconscious was making a connection his conscious mind could not, pointing him back to that terrible time as a source of wisdom. His head thumping, he drove in search of a twenty-four-hour coffee shop, and, finding one out on the highway, sat there until dawn, puzzling over the words. It was not the first time he'd done so, of course. Far sweeter memories had died in his cortex, gone forever into whatever oblivion happiness is consigned, but the demon's words had never left his head. "'I am you,' it had proclaimed. "'Well, that was plain enough.' What infernal seducer had not tried confounding its victim with the thought that this was all a game with mirrors? And you are love, it had murmured. That didn't seem to demand much exegesis either. His name was Demur, after all. And that's what makes the world go round, it had gasped. A cliché, of course, rendered virtually meaningless by repetition. It offered nothing by way of insight. And yet... There was meaning here, he was certain of it. The words had been designed as a trap, baited with a sliver of significance. He had simply never understood what that significance was, nor did pondering it over half a dozen cups of coffee, and, as dawn came up, Canadian bacon and three eggs over easy, give him the answer. He would just have to move on, and trust that fate would bring him to Kassoon. Fortified, he returned to his motel, and again consulted the map he had taken from the hovel in Morningside Heights. There were several other sites his quarry had deemed worthy of marking, though none of them had been as significant to him as New York or Jamestown. One was in Florida, one in Oregon, two in Arizona, plus another six or seven. Where was he to begin? He decided on Arizona, for no better reason than he'd loved a woman once who'd been born and bred in Phoenix. Two. The trip took him five days, and brought him at last to Mammoth, Arizona, and a street corner where a woman with a voice like water over rock called him by his name. She was tiny, a skin like brown paper that had been used and screwed up a dozen times. I so deeply said he was never quite certain if they were on him at all. I'm Maria Lord Nazareno, she told him. I've been waiting for you sixteen days. I didn't realize I was expected, Harriet replied. Always? The woman said, How is Tesla, by the way? You know Tesla? I met her on the same corner three years ago. Popular place, Harry remarked. Is there something special about it? Yes, the woman replied with a little laugh. Me? How is she? As crazy as ever last time we spoke, Harry said. And you? Are you crazy too? Very possibly. The response seemed to please the woman. She lifted her head, and for the first time Harry saw her eyes. Her irises were flecked with gold. "'I gave Tesla a gun,' the woman went on. "'Does she still have it?' Harry didn't reply. "'Demur? "'Are you what I think you are?' Harry murmured. "'What do you mean?' "'You know damn well.' Again a smile. "'It was the eyes that gave it away, yes?' Tesla didn't notice. 
but then I think she was high that day. Are there many of you? A very few, Maria replied. And the greater part of all of us is Sapa Sumana. But there's a tiny piece, she put a thumb and forefinger a quarter of an inch apart to demonstrate how little, a tiny piece of me which quiddity calls to. It makes me wise. How? It lets me see you and Tesla coming. Is that all you see? Why? Do you have something in mind? Yes, I do. What? Kisun. The woman visibly shuddered. So he's your business. Is he here? No. Has he been here? No. Why? Do you expect him? I'm afraid so. The woman looked distressed. We thought we were safe here, she said. We haven't tried to open an Erika. We don't have the power, so we thought he wouldn't notice us. I'm afraid he knows you're here. I must go. I must warn everyone. She took hold of Harry's hand, her palms clammy. Thank you for this. I will find some way to repay you. There's no need. Oh, but there is, she said, and before Harry could protest further, she'd gone, off across the street and out of sight. He stayed in Mammoth overnight, though he was pretty certain that the Nazareno woman was telling the truth, and Kassoon was not in the vicinity. Weary after so many weeks of travel, he retired to bed early, only to be woken a little after one by a rapping on his door. "'Oh, is it?' he mumbled as he searched for the light. The answer was not a name, but an address. "'One to one, Spiro Street,' said a low, sibilant voice. Maria, he said, picking up his gun and crossing to the door. But by the time he had it open, the speaker had disappeared from the hallway. He dressed and went down to the lobby, got the whereabouts of Spiro Street from the night manager, and headed out. The street he sought was on the very edge of town. Many of its houses, in such an advanced state of disrepair, he was amazed to see signs of occupancy. Rusty vehicles in the driveways, bags of trash heaped on the hard dirt where they'd once had lawns, one to one was in a better state than some, but was still a dispiriting sight. Comforted by the weight of his gun, Harry stepped up to the front door. It stood a couple of inches ajar. Maria, he said. The silence was so deep he had no need to raise his voice. There was no reply. Calling again, he pushed the door open, and it swung wide. There was a fat white candle set on a dinner plate surrounded by beads on a threadbare rug. Squatting in front of it, with her eyes downcast, was Maria. "'It's me,' he said to her. "'It's Harry. What do you want?' "'Nothing now,' said a voice behind him. He went for his gun, but before his fist had closed on it, there was a cold palm gripping the back of his skull. "'No,' the voice said simply. He showed his weaponless hands. "'I got a message,' Harry said. "'Another voice now. This the message carrier.' She wanted to see you, he said. Fine, I'm here. Except you're too damn late, the first man said. He found her already. Harry's stomach turned. He looked hard at Maria. There was no sign of life. Oh, Jesus! Such easy profanity, said the message carrier. Maria said you were a holy man, but I don't think you are. The palm tightened against the back of Harry's head, and for one sickening moment he thought he heard his skull creak. Then his tormentor spoke very softly. I am you, and you are love. Stop that, Harry growled. I'm just reading your thoughts, Damour, the man replied, trying to find out whether you are our enemy or our friend. I'm neither. You're a death-bringer, you know that? First New York. I'm looking for Kassoon. We know came the reply. She told us. That's why she sent her spirit out to find him. So you could be a hero and bring him down. That's what you dream of, isn't it? Sometimes pitiful. After all the harm he's done your people, I'd have thought you'd be happy to help me. Maria died to help you, came the reply. Her life is our contribution to the cause. She was our mother, Damour. Oh, I'm sorry. Believe me, I didn't want this. She knew what you wanted better than you did, the message carrier replied. So she went out and found him for you. He came after her and sucked out her soul, but she found him. Did she have time to tell you where he is? 
Yes. Are you going to tell me? So eager, the skull holder said, leaning close to Harry's ear. He killed your mother, for Christ's sake, Harry said. Don't you want him dead? What we want is irrelevant, the other son replied. We learned that a long time ago. Then let me want it for you, Harry said. Let me find some way to kill the son of a bitch. Such a murder is hard, the man at his ear murmured. Where are your metaphysics now? What metaphysics? I am you, and you are love. That's not me, Harry said. Who is it, then? If I knew that. If you knew that? Maybe I wouldn't be here ready to do your dirty work. There was a lengthy silence. Then the message carrier said, Whatever happens after this, Yes? Whether you kill him, or he kills you, let me guess. Don't come back. Right. You've got a deal. Another silence. The candle in front of Maria flickered. Kassoon's in Oregon, the message carrier said. A town called Everville. You're sure? There was no reply. I guess you are. The hand didn't move from the back of Harry's head, though there was no further response from either of the sons. Have we got some further business? Harry asked. Again, silence. If we're done, I'd like to get going, get an early start in the morning. And still silence. Finally, Harry reached around and tentatively touched the back of his head. The hand had gone, leaving only the sensation of contact behind. He glanced round. Both of Maria's children had disappeared. He blew out the candle in front of the dead woman and said a quiet goodbye. Then he went back to his hotel and plotted his route to Everville. Part 5. Parade 1. 1. Not for the first time in the dark years since the loop, Tesla dreamed of fleas. A veritable tsunami of fleas that rose over Harmon's Heights with the wreckage of America on its busy crest and teetered there, ready to drop at a moment's notice. In its itching shadow, Everville had become a lagoon city. Main Street was a solid river of fleas, upon which makeshift rafts were paddled from house to house, rescuing people from the leaping surf. A few folks seemed to know her, though she didn't recognize any of them. You, you, they said, stabbing their fingers in her direction as she towed her own creaky little boat down the street. You did this. You with the monkey. She had a monkey on her shoulder, complete with vest and red felt hat. Admit it, you did this. She protested her innocence. Yes, she'd known the wave was coming, and yes, maybe she'd wasted time with her wandering when she should have been warning the world, but it wasn't her fault. She was just a victim of circumstance, like all of them. It wasn't... Tesla? Wake up! Tesla? Listen to me! Wake up, will you? She unglued her eyes to find Phoebe, staring down at her, grinning from ear to ear. I know where he is, and I know how he got there. Tesla sat up, shaking the last of the fleas from her head. Joe? Of course, Joe. Phoebe sat down on the edge of the sofa. She was trembling. I was with him last night, Tesla. What are you talking about? I thought it was a dream at first, but it wasn't. I know it wasn't. It's just as clear in my head now as it was when I was there. Where? With Joe. Yes, but where, Phoebe? Oh, in Quiddity. Tesla was ready to dismiss the whole thing as wishful thinking at first, but the more Phoebe told, the more she began to think there was truth here. Raoul concurred. Didn't I tell you? he murmured in Tesla's ear when Phoebe came to the part about the door on Harmon's Heights. Didn't I say there was something about the mountain? If there is a door up there, she thought. It explains why this damn town's gone crazy. I have to go up there, Phoebe was saying. Get through the door so I can go find Joe. She grabbed hold of Tesla's hands. You will help me, won't you? Say you will. Yes, but... I knew. I said the moment I woke, this is why Tesla came into my life, because she's going to help me find Joe. Where was he when you left him? Phoebe's face fell. He was in the sea. What about his boat? It went on without him, I think. I think they must have thought he was dead, but he isn't dead. I know he isn't. If he was dead, I wouldn't be feeling what I'm feeling now. My heart would be empty, you know. 
Tesla looked at the woman's elation, and heard her faith, and felt a pang of envy, that never in her life had love taken hold of her this way. Perhaps it was a lost cause, going in search of a man lost overboard in the dream sea, when it seemed the world was about to end. But she'd always had a taste for lost causes, and if she spent the last few hours of life trying to reunite these lovers, was that so petty an ambition? Did Joe tell you where the door was on the mountain? Just somewhere near the top. But we'll find it. I know we'll find it. Two. It was less than half an hour later when Tesla and Phoebe stepped out into the sun, but Everville was already in high gear. Main Street was fairly swarming with people, bleacher builders, banner hangers, balloon inflators, barricade raisers. And where there was labor, of course, there were people around to watch and remark upon it coffee drinkers and doughnut dippers, advice givers and troubleshooters. We shouldn't have come this way, Phoebe said as they waited in a line of a dozen vehicles for a truckload of chairs to be unloaded. Calm down, Tesla said. We've got a long day ahead of us. Let's just take things as they come. If only they knew what we know, Phoebe said, watching the people on the sidewalk. Oh, they know, Tesla said. About quiddity? Phoebe replied incredulously. I don't think they've got the slightest idea. Maybe it's buried deep, Tesla said, studying the blithe faces as they passed. But everybody gets to go to Quiddity three times, remember. I got the steal a visit, Phoebe said proudly. You had help on the other side. Everybody else gets their glimpses, then forgets them. They just get on about their lives, thinking they're real. Did you do a lot of drugs? Phoebe said. I've had my moments, Tesla said. Why? Because some of the stuff you come out with, it doesn't make any sense to me. She looked across at Tesla. Like what you just said about people thinking they're real. They are. I'm real. You're real. Joe's real. How do you know? That's a stupid question, Phoebe said. So give me a stupid answer. We do stuff. We make things happen. I'm not like... Like... She faltered, searching for some frame of reference, then pointed at one of the coffee sippers who was sitting on the curb scanning the cartoon strips in the morning's Oregonian. I'm not in the funny pages. Nobody invented me. I invented myself. Just remember that when we get to quiddity. Why? Because I think a lot of things got invented there. Go on. And where things are made, they can be unmade. So if something comes after you, I'll tell it to go fuck itself. Phoebe said. You're learning, Tesla said. Once they were off Main Street, the traffic lightened up considerably and disappeared completely once they reached the road that wove up the flank of Harmon's Heights. It didn't take them all that far. About a third of the way up the mountainside it came to an unceremonious halt, without so much as a sign or a barrier to mark the place. Damn, Phoebe said. I thought it went further than this. Like all the way to the top? Yeah. Looks like we've got quite a hike ahead of us. Tesla said, getting out of the car and staring up the forested slope. Are you up for it? No. But we're here. We might as well give it a try. And with that, they began their ascent. 3. In his long life, Budenbaum had met many individuals who had tired of the human parade, people who had gone to their death with a shrug content that they no longer had to witness the same old traumas played out over and over again. He had never understood the response. Though the general shapes of human exchange were unchanging, the particulars of this personality or that made each new example fascinating in and of itself. In his experience, no two mothers ever educated their children with quite the same mingling of kisses and slaps. No two pairs of lovers ever trod quite the same path to the altar or to the grave. In truth, he pitied the naysayers, the souls too stunted or too narcissistic to revel in the magnificent minutiae that the human drama had to offer. They were turning their backs on a show that divinities were not too proud to patronize and applaud. He'd heard them with these ears many times. Despite the fact that his body knitted together with extraordinary speed, in a week his defenestration would be an embarrassing memory, he was still in very considerable discomfort. Later, perhaps, when the avatars had arrived and he was certain everything was in hand, 
he take a little laudanum. In the meanwhile his chest hurt like the devil, and he had a distinct limp, which gained him some unwarranted attention as he made his way out in search of a decent breakfast. It would be inappropriate, he decided, to go to the diner, so he found a little coffee shop two blocks from his hotel, and sat by the window to eat and watch. He ordered not one but two breakfasts, and consumed the better part of both in preparation for the exertions and last-minute panics ahead. His eyes scarcely strayed to his plates as he emptied them. He was too busy watching the faces and hands of the passers-by, looking for some sign of his employers. It was by no means certain they would come in human garb, of course. Sometimes, he never knew when, they would descend out of the clouds wreathed in light, the wheels of Ezekiel rolling into view. Twice they had come in the form of animals, amused, he supposed, by the conceit of watching the drama from the perspective of wild beasts or lapdogs. The one way they had never come was as themselves, and after years of doing them service he'd given up hope of ever seeing their true faces. Perhaps they had none. Perhaps the plethora of faces they put on, and their appetite for vicarious experience, were evidence that they had neither lives nor flesh of their own. Was everything okay? He looked round to see his waitress standing at his side. He had not taken too much notice of her until now, but she was a wonderful sight. Hair raised in a vivid orange hive, breasts rampant, face daubed and drawn and dusted. You are looking forward to something today, I can see that, Budenbaum remarked. Tonight, she said, with a flutter of her mascarade lashes. Why do I think it's not a prayer meeting? Budenbaum replied. We always throw a little party festival weekend, me and some of my girlfriends. Well, that's what festivals are for, isn't it? Budenbaum said. Everybody has to let their hair down, or put it up, once in a while. Do you like it? the woman said, patting the hive affectionately. I think it's extraordinary, Budenbaum said, without a word of a lie. "'Well, thank you,' the woman beamed. She dug in the pocket of her apron and pulled out a little sheet of paper. "'If you feel like dropping in,' she said, proffering the paper. On it was an address and a simple map. "'We have these little invites made just for the chosen few.' "'I'm flattered,' Budenbaum said. "'My name's Owen, by the way.' "'I'm pleased to meet you. I'm June Davenport. Miss.' The addendum could not be ignored politely. I can't believe you haven't had offers, Budenbaum said. None worth accepting, June replied. Who knows, maybe tonight will be your lucky night, Owen said. A lifetime of yearning crossed the woman's face. It better be soon, she said, more lightly than it was felt, and moved off to ply the needy with coffee. Was there anything more beautiful, Owen wondered, as he left the coffee shop, then a sight of yearning on the human face. Not the night sky, nor a boy's buttocks, could compare with the glory of June Davenport, miss, dolled up like a whore and hoping to meet the man of her dreams before time ran out. He'd seen tale enough for a thousand nights of telling there on her painted face, roads taken, roads despised, deeds undone, deeds regretted. And tonight and every moment between now and tonight, more roads to choose, more deeds to do. She might be turning her head even now, or now, or now, and seeing the face she had longed to love, or, just as easily, looking the other way. As he made his way down towards the intersection, where, despite the previous day's encounter, he still intended to keep watch, he chanced to look up towards Harmon's Heights. There was a mist cloud gathering on the summit, he saw, hiding it from view. The sight gave him pause. The sky, but for this mist, was flawless, which made him think it was not of natural origin. Was this the way his employers would come, down out of a clouded mountain top like Olympians? He'd not seen them do so before, but there was a first time for everything. He only hoped they wouldn't be too baroque with their theatrics. If they came into Everville like blazing deities, they'd clear the streets. Then who'd go to June Davenport's party? 
4. The mist had not gone unnoticed in other quarters. Dorothy Bullard had called up Turf Thompson, whose meteorological opinion she'd long trusted, for some reassurance that the cloud wasn't going to dump rain on the day's festivities. He told her not to worry. The phenomenon was odd, to be sure, but he was certain there was no storm in the offing. In fact, he remarked, if I didn't know better, I'd say that was a sea mist up there. Comforted by his observations, Dorothy went on with the business of the morning. The first of the day's special events, a little pageant about how the first settlers came to Oregon, enacted by Mrs. Henderson's fourth graders in the park, got underway ten minutes later than advertised, but drew a crowd of perhaps two hundred, which was very gratifying. And the kids were completely enchanting, with their little bonnets and their cardboard rifles, declaiming their lines as though their lives depended on it. There was a particularly affecting scene, created around one Reverend Whitney. Dorothy had never heard of him, but she was certain Fiona Henderson had done her homework, and the tale was true, who had apparently led a group of pioneers out of the winter snows to the safety of the Willamette Valley. Seeing Jed Gilholly's son Matthew, who was playing the good reverend, forging through a blizzard of paper scraps to plant a cross in the grass and give thanks for the deliverance of his flock, quite misted Dorothy's eyes. When the show was over and the crowd dispersing, she found a proud Jed with his arm around his son, both beaming from ear to ear. "'Things are off to a damn good start,' he said to Dorothy and anyone else on listening range. "'You're not bothered about that other business, then?' Dorothy said. "'Flicker, you mean?' Jed shook his head. "'He's gone, and he's not coming back.' "'Music to my ears,' Dorothy said. "'And what about little Maddie, then?' Jed said. "'He was wonderful.' He's been learning his lines for the past few weeks. I almost forgot them this morning, Matthew said. Didn't I? You just thought you had, Jed said. But I knew you'd remember them. You did? Sure I did, he ruffled his son's hair lovingly. Can we get some ice cream, Dad? Sounds like a plan, Jed said. I'll see you later, Dorothy. She'd seldom had occasion to see Jed this way, and it was a real pleasure. This is what the festival's all about, isn't it? She said to Fiona as they watched the kids deposit their props and hats in cardboard boxes, then peel off with their parents. People enjoying themselves. It was fun, wasn't it? Fiona said. Where did you find that bit about the Reverend, by the way? Well, I cheated a little. Fiona confessed, lowering her voice a tad. He didn't actually have much to do with Everville. Oh? In fact, he had nothing at all to do with Everville. He founded his church in Silverton. But it was such a good story, and frankly I couldn't find anything about our founding fathers that was appropriate for the children. What about the Nordhoff story? That comes much later, Fiona said in her best school marmish tones. Yes, of course. No, when it comes to the early years, I'm afraid we have some very murky waters. I was quite shocked at how licentious Everville was at the start. There was certainly nothing very Christian about some of the goings-on here. "'Are you quite sure?' Dorothy said, frankly surprised by what she was hearing. "'Quite,' said Fiona. Dorothy left the subject there, certain that the woman was misinformed. Everville had probably seen some robust behavior in its time. What city didn't have its share of drunkards and hedonists? But its origins were nothing to be ashamed of. If there was to be a pageant next year, she said to herself, then it wouldn't be some phony story, it would be the truth. And she would tell Fiona Henderson in no uncertain terms that it was her responsibility as a teacher and as a citizen not to be telling lies, however well-intentioned, to her charges. As she left the park, she took a moment to study the mist on Harmon's Heights. Just as Turf had promised, it was showing little sign of spreading. It was denser than it had been three-quarters of an hour before, however. The actual peak, which had earlier been visible through the fog, was now lost to sight. No matter, she thought. There was nothing much to see up there anyhow, just some bare rocks and a lot of trees. She consulted her watch. It was ten after eleven. The pancake contest and all-you-can-eat brunch would soon be underway at the old bakery restaurant and the pet parade lining up in the square. She was due to be one of the judges of the flower arranging at noon, but she had time to drop by and see how things were going at the town hall first, where people would already be assembling for the grand parade, even though it wouldn't start for another two hours. 
So much to see. So much to do. Smiling people spilling off the crowded sidewalks, banners and balloons snapping and glittering against the blue August sky. She wished it could go on forever. A festival that never stopped. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Two. I don't like this, Tesla said. She wasn't speaking of the climb, though it had steadily become steeper, and now left her gasping between every other word, but of the mist that had been little more than shreds when they'd begun their ascent and was now a thick white blanket. I'm not turning back, Phoebe said hurriedly. I didn't say we should, Tesla replied. I was just saying— Yes, what are you saying? Raoul murmured. That there's something weird about it. It's just mist, Phoebe said. I don't think so. And just for the record, neither does Raoul. Phoebe came to a halt, as much to catch her breath as to continue the debate. We've got guns, she said. That didn't do us much good at Toothaker's place, Tesla reminded her. You think there's something hiding in there? Phoebe said, studying the black wall that was now no more than three hundred yards from them. I'd bet my Harley on it. Phoebe let out a shuddering sigh. Maybe you should go back, she said. I don't want anything to happen to you on my account. Don't be ridiculous, Tesla said. Good, said Phoebe. So if we get parted in there, which is very possible, we don't go looking for each other? We just go on. Right. All the way to Quiddity. All the way to Joe. Lord, but it was clammy cold in the mist. Within sixty seconds of entering it, both Tesla and Phoebe were shuddering from head to foot. Watch where you walk, Tesla warned Phoebe. Why? Look there, she said, pointing to a six-inch wide crack in the ground. And there, and there. The fissures were everywhere, and recent. She was not all that surprised. The opening of a door between one reality and another was a violation of the physical by the metaphysical, a cataclysm that was bound to take its toll on matter that lacked mind. It had been the same at Buddy Vance's house as here. The solid world had cracked and melted and fallen apart when the door had opened in its midst. The difference, however, and it was notable, was how quiet and still it was here. Even the mist hung almost motionless. Vance's house, by contrast, had been a maelstrom. She could only assume that whoever had opened this door was both an expert in the procedure and a creature of great self-discipline. Unlike the Jap, who had been a mere novice and utterly incapable of controlling the forces he had claimed as his own. Kisun, Raoul suggested. It was not at first thought an unlikely choice. She did not expect to meet a more powerful entity than Kisun in the living world. But if he can open a door between here and the Cosm, Tesla thought, that means he has the art. That would follow. In which case, why is he still playing in the shit down in Toothaker's house? Good question. He's got something to do with this. I don't doubt that. But I don't think he could open a door on his own. Maybe he had help, Raoul said. You're talking to the monkey, aren't you? Phoebe said. I think we should keep our voices down. You are, though, aren't you? Am I moving my lips? Tesla said. Yep. I never could... She stopped talking, and in her tracks. She grabbed Phoebe's arm. What? Phoebe said, listen. Anyone for carpentry lessons? Raoul remarked. Somebody higher up the mountainside was hammering. The sound was muted by the mist, so it was difficult to know how far off the handyman was, but the din laid to rest what little hope Tesla had entertained of finding the door unguarded. She reached into her jacket and took out Lourd. We're going to go... Very slowly, she whispered to Phoebe, and keep your eyes peeled. She led the way now, up the fissured slope, the hammering of her heart competing with that of the handyman. There were other sounds, she heard, just audible between the blows. Somebody sobbing, somebody else singing, the words incomprehensible. What the hell is going on up there? Tesla murmured. There were lopped branches strewn on the ground, and a litter of twigs stripped from other branches, Presumably those judged useful by the hammerer. 
Was he building a little house up there, or an altar, perhaps? The mist ahead of them shifted, and for a moment Tesla caught a glimpse of somebody moving across her field of vision. It was too brief for her to quite grasp what she was seeing, but it seemed to be a child, its head too unwieldy for its emaciated body. It left a trail of laughter where it ran. At least she thought it was laughter. She couldn't even be certain of that. And the sound seemed to draw patterns in the mist, like ripples left by darting fish. It was a strange phenomenon, but in its way rather beguiling. She looked round at Phoebe, who was wearing a tiny smile. "'There are children up here,' she murmured. "'It looks that way.' She'd no sooner spoken that the child reappeared, capering and laughing as before. It was a girl, Tesla saw. Despite her almost infantile body, she had budding breasts, which were ruddier than the rest of her pale body, and a yard-long ponytail that sprouted from the middle of her otherwise shaved skull. Nimble though she was, her foot caught in one of the cracks as she ran by, and she fell forward, her laughter ceasing. Phoebe let out a little gasp of concern. Despite the hammerings and the sobs, the child heard her. She looked round, and her eyes, which were black and shiny like polished stones, were briefly laid upon the two women. Then the child was on her feet and away, racing off up the slope. So much for secrecy, Tesla remarked. She could hear the child's shrill voice, raising the alarm. Let's get out of their way, she said, catching hold of Phoebe's arm and hauling her off across the slope. The traumatized ground made speed virtually impossible, but they covered fifty stumbling yards before halting and listening again. The hammering had stopped, and so had the singing. Only the sobbing went on. "'That's not grief,' Raoul said. "'No, it's pain. It's somebody in terrible pain.' Tesla shuddered and looked straight at Phoebe. "'Listen to me,' she whispered. "'You want to go back, don't you?' Phoebe's face was pale and wet. "'Yes,' she breathed. "'Part of me does.' She looked over her shoulder, though there was nothing to see but mist. "'But not as much.' She hesitated, full of little tremors, not as much as I want to be with Joe. If you keep saying that, Tesla said, I am going to start believing it. A burst of nervous laughter escaped Phoebe, but turned into tears the next moment. If we get out of this alive, she said, doing her best to stifle her sobs, I'll owe you so much. You'll owe me an invitation to the wedding is all you'll owe me, Tesla said. Phoebe put her arms around Tesla and hugged her. We're not there yet. Tesla said. I know, I know, Phoebe replied. She stood back from Tesla, sniffed hard, and wiped the tears from under her eyes with a heel of her hand. I'm ready. Good. Tesla looked back towards the spot where they'd been seen. There was neither sound nor sign of motion. It was not much comfort, given how hard it was to judge distance under these circumstances, but at least there was no horde of licks or children bearing down upon them. Let's climb, she said, and led the way up the slope again. It was impossible to judge their precise direction, of course, but as long as the ground continued to rise ahead of them, they knew they were still on their way to the summit. After a few paces, they had further evidence that they were headed in the right direction. The moaning sound was becoming louder with every yard they covered, and it was soon joined by the voice of the singer. She faltered at first, as though trying to pick up the threads of whatever piece she'd left off singing. Then she apparently despaired of doing so, and began another song, this more melancholy than the first. A lament, perhaps, or a lullaby for a dying child. Whatever it was, it made Tesla feel positively queasy, and she found herself wishing a nest of licks would appear from the cracked ground, so she'd have something upon which to pen her trepidation. Anything rather than the sobs, and the song, and the image of the skipping child with its lifeless eyes. And then, as the song came round for another dirging verse, the mist unveiled a horror even her most troubled imaginings had not conjured. There, twenty yards up the slope, was the hammerer's handiwork. He hadn't built a house. He hadn't built an altar. He'd felled three trees and stripped them and dragged them up the slope to fashion crosses ten, twelve feet high. Then somebody, perhaps the hammerer, perhaps his master's, had crucified three people upon them. Tesla could not see much of the victims. She and Phoebe were approaching the site from behind the crosses, but she could see the hammerer. He was a small, broad fellow, his head wide and flat, with eyes like the laughing child's eyes, 
and he was gathering up his tools in the shadow of the crosses with a casual manner of someone who had just fixed a table-leg. A little way beyond him, lounging in a chair, was the singer. She had her gaze turned up towards the crucified, her lament still maundering on. Neither individual had seen Tesla and Phoebe. As the women watched, appalled, the hammerer finished collecting up his tools and went on his jaunty way, disappearing into the mist beyond the crosses without so much as a backwards glance. The singer threw back her head almost languorously and halted her song to draw on a thin cigarette. "'Why would anybody do something like this?' Phoebe said, her voice trembling. "'I don't give a shit,' Tesla replied, pulling her gun from her jacket. "'We're going to do something about it.' "'Like what?' said Raoul. "'Like getting those poor fuckers down,' Tesla said aloud. "'Us?' said Phoebe. "'Yes, us.' "'Tesla, listen to me,' Raoul said. "'This is horrible, I know, but it's too late to help them.' "'What's he saying?' Phoebe asked. "'He hasn't finished.' "'It was a damn fool thing to do in the first place coming up here, but we've got this far.' "'So what, turn a blind eye?' "'Yes, absolutely. Christ, I know,' Raoul said. "'This is a terrible thing, and I wish we weren't here to see it, but let's find the door and get Phoebe through it. Then we can both get the fuck out of here.' "'You know what?' Phoebe said, nodding towards the singer. "'She might know where the door is. I think we should ask her.' She pointed to Tesla's gun. "'With that?' "'Good deal.' "'Just don't look at the crosses, okay?' Raoul said as they started up the slope. The singer had finally given up her lament and was simply slumped in her chair, eyes still closed, smoking her dope. The only sound was the sobbing of one of the crucified, and even that had dwindled as they advanced, until it was barely audible. "'Just look at the ground,' Tesla told Phoebe. "'It's no use breaking our hearts.' Eyes downcast, they continued to climb— Tesla was horribly tempted to look up at the victims, but she resisted. Raoul was right. There was nothing they could do. Up ahead, the singer was talking to herself in her blissed-out state. Hey, Laguna, you hear me? I got them, I got right there. Right there. White they are. So white, you wouldn't believe how... Tesla put the gun to the woman's temple. The stream of consciousness stopped abruptly, and the woman's eyes flickered open. She was by no means a beauty. Her skin was leathery, her eyes tiny and surrounded with coarse bristles. Her mouth, which was similarly ringed, was twice the width of any human mouth, her teeth tiny, pointed, perhaps sharpened, and innumerable. Despite her drugged condition, she plainly understood her jeopardy. "'I'll sing some more,' she said. "'Don't bother,' Tesla replied. "'Just point us to the door.' "'You're not one of the Blessed Men's Company?' "'No.' "'Are you Sapa Sumana?' she said. "'No, I'm just the lady with the gun,' Tesla said. "'You are, aren't you?' the singer replied, her gaze going back and forth between the two women. "'You're Sapa Sumana. Oh, this is wonderful!' "'Are you listening to me?' Tesla said. "'Yes, you want the door. It's there.' Without looking round, she pointed off into the mist. "'How far?' "'A little way.' But why would you want to leave? There's nothing on the other side but more of this mist and a filthy sea. Here's where the wonders are, in the Helter and Sendo, among Humana like you. Wonders? said Phoebe. Oh, yes, oh, yes, the woman enthused, ignoring the gun that was still pointed at her head. We've lived a shadow life in the ephemeris, dreaming of being here, where things are pure and real. My God, is she in for a disappointment, Raoul remarked but there was more here than a misinformed tourist. "'Isn't the Iyad coming through this door?' Tesla asked her. She smiled. "'Oh, yes,' she said, almost dreamily. "'So why are you hanging around?' "'We're waiting to greet them.' "'Then you'll never see the wonders of the Helter in Sender, will you?' "'Why not?' "'Because the Iyad's coming to destroy it.' The woman laughed, threw back her head and laughed. "'Who told you that?' she said. Tesla didn't answer, though she had no difficulty remembering. The first person she'd heard that from had been Kassoon, not, perhaps, the most reliable of sources. But then hadn't she had the theory supported on several occasions since? It was to Moore's belief, for certain. According to him, the Eid was the enemy of mankind, the devil by another name. And hadn't Grillo told her of men and women across the continent who listed on the reef the weapons they'd use to defend themselves if— 
or rather when, the Holocaust occurred, still the woman laughed. The Eads coming here for the same reason that I came, she said. They want to live among miracles. There aren't any, Phoebe piped up. Not here. The singer grew serious. Perhaps you've lived with them for so long, she said. You don't see them. Ask her about the crucifixions, Rotwell prompted. Damn right, Tesla thought. What about them, she said, jabbing her thumb over her shoulder. The blessed men wanted that. They're spies, he said, enemies of peace. Why kill them that way, Phoebe said. It's so horrible. The singer looked genuinely confounded. The blessed men said it was best for them. Best for them? Tesla said, appalled. That? Don't you have it in one of your holy books? A god dies that way? Yes, but... And he's reunited with his father or his mother. Father, said Phoebe, forgive my ignorance. I have no memory for stories. Songs, that's a different matter. I hear a song once, and I've got it for life. But a joke, or a piece of a gossip, or even a god tale. She snapped her fingers. Forgotten. Suppose she's telling the truth, Raoul muttered. About crucifixions? About the eared. Maybe we've had the whole thing wrong from the beginning. And they're just coming to see the sights, Tesla replied. I don't think so. Remember the loop? She brought her one and only glimpse of the Eid to mind now, in all its vastness and foulness. Even now, after five years, the memory made her queasy. Perhaps the Eid was not the enemy of mankind, the evil one itself, but nor had it seemed to have love and peace on its collective mind. "'Will you join with me?' the singer was saying. "'Doing what?' Tesla said. "'She asked if she could smoke,' Phoebe said. "'Didn't you hear her?' I was thinking. "'About what?' about how fucking confused I am. The singer was stroking the tip of her reefer with a match flame. Whatever she was smoking, it wasn't hashish. The smoke was almost sickly sweet, like cinnamon and sugar. She inhaled deeply. Again, Tesla said, inhale again. The woman looked mystified, but obeyed. And again, Tesla said, nudging the gun against the woman's head for emphasis. The woman duly inhaled two more lungfuls. That's it. Tesla said, as a soporific smile spread over the woman's face, and her eyelids began to flutter closed. One more for luck. The woman raised the reefer to her lips and inhaled a final time. Halfway through doing so, the drug claimed her consciousness. Her hand dropped to her side, the cigarette falling from her fingers. Tesla picked it up, nipped off the burning weed, and pocketed the rest. You never know, she said to Phoebe. Let's get going. Only now, as they started off the slope again, did Tesla realize that the sound of sobbing had completely ceased. The last of the spies, crucified as an indulgence of their faith, had died. There was no harm now in looking. Don't, Raoul warned her, but it was too late. She was already turning, already seeing. Kate Farrell was hanging on the middle cross, her belly bared and lacerated. On her left hand, a nailed Edward. On her right... Lucian. He was the most battered of the three, and the most nearly naked, his thin white chest splashed with blood from a face thankfully almost hidden from her by his hair. The breath went out of Tesla's body in a rush, and the strength from her limbs. She dropped the gun, put her hands over her mouth to keep the sobs from coming. You know one of them? said Phoebe. All of them, Tesla gasped. All of them. Phoebe had hold of her tight. We can't do anything for them now. He was alive, Tesla said, the thought like a skewer in her heart. He was alive, and I didn't look, and I could have saved him. You didn't know it was him, Phoebe said. She started to coax Tesla away from the spot, turning her as she did so. Tesla resisted, however, unwilling to take her eyes off Lucian. He looked so pitifully exposed up there, unable to defend himself against the world. She needed to put him in the ground, at least. If she left him here, he'd be a spectacle— pecked and buffeted and gnawed at. She couldn't bear it. She couldn't. Somewhere in the turmoil she heard Raoul say, Phoebe's right. Leave me alone. You can't help him. And, Tesla, you're not to blame. He made his way. We made ours. He was alive. Maybe. He saw me. If you want to believe that, believe it, Raoul said. I'm not going to try and tell you he didn't. But if he did, then maybe that's why he let go. What? 
He could have called your name, but he didn't. Maybe he just laid eyes on you and thought it's enough. Tears started to fill her eyes. It's enough? Yes, it doesn't have to be terrible always, even this. She never believed that, not to the end of her days. What did he say we were? Vessels for something? For the infinite. Vessels for the infinite. What did you say? Phoebe murmured. It's what he wanted to be, Tesla replied. No, said Raoul. It's what he was all along. Tesla nodded. You know, she said to Phoebe, I have a very good soul in my head. She sniffed hard. The pity of it is, it isn't mine. Then she let Phoebe turn her around, and together they headed on, up towards the door. 3. 1. The tide took Joe at last, claiming him from the darkness and bearing him away the way it had borne the Fanacapan before him. For a while he was barely aware of his passage. Indeed, he was barely aware of being alive. He drifted in and out of consciousness, his eyes fluttering open long enough for him to glimpse the heavens boiling overhead, as though sky and sea had exchanged places. Once, when he awoke this way, he saw what he thought were burning birds— falling out of the seething air like winged meteors. And once, seeing something glitter from the corner of his eye, he turned his head to catch sight of a shoe darting through the churning waters, its gaze gleaming. Seeing it, he remembered the conversation he'd had with Noah on the shore. Please one shoe, and you please many, and returned to his dreaming state comforted, thinking perhaps the creature knew him and was somehow guiding him through this maelstrom. When he was not quite awake, which was often, he remembered Phoebe in the weeds, saw her body rising and falling in front of him, lush and pale, and tears came, even in his sleeping state, thinking she had gone from him, back into the living world, and all he would ever have of her from now on was memory. Then even the dreams of Phoebe faded, and he floated on through a cloud of dirty smoke, his mind too weak to shape a thought. Ships passed him by, but he didn't see them. If he had— if he'd seen how they rocked and creaked, filled to the gunwales with people escaping the ephemeris, he might have tried to catch hold of a trailing rope and haul himself aboard, rather than let the current they were fighting carry him on towards the archipelago. Or, at very least, seeing the terror on the faces of the passengers, he might have prepared himself for what awaited him on the shore. But seeing nothing, knowing nothing, he was carried on and on through the remains of splintered vessels that had foundered for want of captains, through floating mortuaries of doomed travellers, through places where the sea was thick with yellow ash and cobs of fire glittered around him like burning fleets. Steadily the waters grew shallower and less tempestuous, and at last he was carried up onto the shores of an island that in its glory days had been called the island of Memer Beketer Sabat. There he lay among the flotsam and jetsam, his balls bleeding, his mind confounded, while moment by moment the island he had been carried to was undone, and its undoer, the Iad Ouroboros, came closer to the shore on which he slept. 2. The distance between the shores of Memer Baketer Sabat and the mountainside where Tesla and Phoebe were climbing was not readily measured. Though generations of thinkers in both the cosm and the metacosm had attempted to evolve a theory of distance between the two worlds, there was little consensus on the subject. The only thing the various factions agreed upon was that this distance could not be measured with a rule and an abacus. After all, it was not simply the distance between two points, it was the distance between two states. Some said it was best viewed as an entirely symbolic space, like that between worshipper and deity, and proposed an entirely new system of measurement applicable to such cases. Others argued that a soul moving from the helter in Sendo into quiddity underwent such a radical altering that the best way to describe and analyze the distance, if the word distance were still applicable, which they doubted, was to derive it from the vocabulary of spiritual reformation. The notion proved untenable, however, one man's reformation being another's heresy. Finally, there were those who argued that the relationships between Sapa Sumana and the Dream Sea were all in the mind, and any attempt to measure distance was doomed to failure. Surely, they opined, the space between one thought and another was beyond the wit of any man to measure. 
They were accused of defeatism by some of their enemies, of shoddy metaphysics by others. Men and women only entered the dream sea three times, they were reminded. For the rest of their lives, quiddity was a lot further than a thought away. Not so, the leader of this faction, a mystic from Joom called Karasophia, argued. The wall between the cosm and the metacosm was getting steadily thinner, and would, he predicted, soon disappear altogether, at which point the minds of Sapa Sumana, which seemed so pathetically literal, would be revealed to be purveyors of the miraculous, even in their present primal state. Karasophia had died for his theories, assassinated in a field of sunflowers outside Elephus, but he would have found comforting evidence for his beliefs had he wandered through the minds of the people gathered along the parade route in Everville. People were dreaming today, even though their eyes were wide open. Parents dreaming of being free as their children, children dreaming of having their parents' power. Lovers seeing the coming night in each other's eyes, old folks staring at their hands or at the sky seeing the same. Dreams of sex, dreams of oblivion, dreams of circus and bacchanalia. And further down the parade route, sitting by the window from which he'd so recently fallen, a man dreaming of how it would be when he had the art for himself, and time and distance disappeared forever. Owen? Budenbaum had not expected to see the boy again, at least not this side of midnight, but here he was, looking as invitingly languorous as ever. Well, well. How are you? Seth said. Mending. Good. I brought some cold beers. That was thoughtful. I guess it's a peace offering. Consider it accepted, Budenbaum said. Come here and sit down. He patted the boards beside him. You look weary. I didn't sleep well. Hammerings in heaven? No, I was thinking about you. Oh, dear. Good thoughts, Seth said, settling himself down beside Buddenbaum. Really? Really. I want to come with you, Owen. Come with me where? Wherever you're going after this. I'm not going anywhere, Owen said. You're going to live in Everville? I'm not going to live anywhere. Is that just some way of saying you don't want me around? Seth said. Because if it is... Why don't you just come right out and say it, and I'll go? No, that's not what I'm saying at all, Owen replied. Then I don't understand. Owen peered out of the window, chewing something over. I know so little about you, he said, and yet I feel... What? I've never really trusted anybody, Owen said. That's the truth of it. I've wanted to many times, but I was always afraid of being disappointed. He looked at Seth. I know I've cheated myself of a lot of feelings, he went on, his turmoil plain, maybe even love. But it was what I chose, and it kept me from being hurt. You've never loved anybody? Infatuations, yes. Daily. In Italy, hourly. All ridiculous, all of them. Humiliating and ridiculous. But love? No. I could never trust anyone enough to love them. He sighed heavily. And now it's almost too late. Why? Because sentimental love is a human affliction, and I won't be susceptible for very much longer. There, I've said it. You mean you won't be human? That's what I mean. This is because of the avatars? In a manner of speaking. Explain it, will you? Stand up, Owen said, coaxing Seth to his feet. Now, look out of the window. Seth did so. Owen stood behind him and laid his hands on Seth's shoulders. Look down at the intersection. There was no traffic below. The streets had been turned over to pedestrians until the parade was finished. What am I supposed to be looking at? Seth wanted to know. You'll see, Owen said, his hands moving up to Seth's neck. Am I getting a massage? Hush for a moment, Owen said. Just let the vision come. Seth felt a tingling at the nape of his neck, which quickly spread up into the base of his skull. He let out a little sigh of pleasure. It feels good. Keep your eyes on the road. I wish you'd just... The remark fell away. He gasped and grabbed hold of the windowsill. Oh, my God! The intersection was melting. The streets turning into laval rivers, decorated with flickering bands of scarlet and gold. 
They were moving, all four of them, towards the center of the crossroads, their brilliance increasing and their breath diminishing, so that by the time they met they were narrowed to blazing ribbons, so bright Seth could only bear to look at the place for a heartbeat. What is this? he breathed. It's beautiful, isn't it? Oh, God, yes. Did you make it? A thing like this isn't made, Seth. It doesn't come out of the air like a poem. All I can do is set it in motion. All right. Did you set it in motion? Yes, I did. A very long time ago. You still haven't told me what it is. It's an invitation to a dance, Owen said softly, his mouth close to Seth's ear. What kind of dance? The dance of being and becoming, he said. Look at it and forget your angels hammering in the sky from heaven's side. This is where the miracles come, where things meet, precisely. My journey ends at the crossroads. That's what you said. Remember that later on, Owen said, his voice hardening. Remember, I never lied to you. I never told you I was here forever. No, you didn't. I wish you had, but you didn't. As long as we understand each other, we can have some fun today. Seth turned his gaze from the street now. I don't think I can look at it any longer, he said. It makes me feel sick. Owen ran his hand lightly over Seth's skull. There, he said. It's gone. Seth looked back at the intersection. The vision had indeed disappeared. What's going to happen? he said to Owen. You just stand in the middle of the crossroads and something comes to take you away? Nothing so simple, Owen replied. What then? I'm not even sure myself. But you know what's going to happen to you at the end of all this? I know I'll be free from time. The past, the future, and the dreaming moment between will be one immortal day. His voice grew softer as he quoted the words until by the end it was barely audible. What's the dreaming moment? Seth said. Owen drew the youth closer to him and laid a kiss on his lips. You don't need me to work that one out, he said. But I do, Seth said. I don't want you to go, Owen. I have to, Buddenbaum said. I'm afraid I have no choice in the matter. Yes, you do. You could stay with me for a while, at least. Teach me some of what you know. He slid his hand down over Owen's chest. And when you weren't teaching me... His hand was at Owen's belt now, unbuckling it. We could fuck. You have to understand how long I've waited, Owen said how much planning and plotting and manipulation I've had to do to get here. It hasn't been easy, believe me. I've almost given up countless times. Seth had unbuckled Owen's belt and was now unbuttoning his trousers. Owen kept talking as though indifferent to the boy's manipulations. But I held on to the vision, he said. Seth's fingers had found Owen's sex. Plainly, his indifference had been play-acting. Go on! Seth said, clasping the thing. Are you always in heat like this? Owen said. I don't remember, Seth said. Everything that happened before I met you, he shrugged, is a blur. Don't be silly. I'm not. It's true. I was waiting for you to come. I knew you would. Maybe I didn't know what you'd look like. Listen to me. I'm listening. I'm not the love of your life. How do you know? Because I can't be what you want me to be. I can't stay and watch over you. Seth kept stroking. So, he said, so you'll have to find somebody else to love. Not if you take me with you, Seth said. Into the dance? He looked out of the window, down to the hard gray street. I could bear the heat of it if I was with you. I don't think so. I could just give me a chance. He dropped down onto his haunches in front of Owen and applied his tongue to the man's half-hard prick. Think what it'd be like, he said, between licks and kisses, if we were together down there. You don't know what you're asking. So tell me, teach me. I can be whatever you want. Believe me. Owen stroked the boy's face. I believe you, he said, idly toying with his prick. I've told you before, you're remarkable. Seth smiled up at him. Then he took the tumescent prick into his mouth and sucked. He was no great technician, but he had an appetite for the act that could turn him into one very quickly. Owen ran his hands through the boy's hair and let out a shuddering sigh. 
Usually, in the midst of being pleasured, he lost his grasp of any business but the one at hand, or mouth. Not so now. Perhaps it was the sense of finality that attended his every deed today, his last breakfast, his last noon, his last blowjob. Perhaps it was simply the fact that the boy had a way with him, but the sensations running up his body from his groin made his thoughts almost crystalline. What was the use, he wondered, living an immortal day if it was a solitary condition? Rare and wise and lonely was no way to live out eternity. Perhaps if he'd had his druthers he might have chosen someone closer to his physical ideal with whom to share the experience. But then accommodations could probably be made in the flux of possibilities that would presently appear in the street outside. When the powers of evolution were unleashed, it would be easy to fix the boy's profile and narrow his hips. He looked down at Seth, running his thumb over the wet rendezvous of lip and shaft. "'You do learn fast,' he said. The boy grinned around his lollipop. "'Keep going, keep going,' Owen said, pushing his full length down Seth's throat. Seth gagged a little, but born cocksucker that he was, he didn't retreat from the challenge. "'Good Lord,' Owen said. "'You're very persuasive, you know that,' he stroked Seth's face. The cheekbones were too low the nose to lumpen. As for the hair, it was characterless, a mousy mop that he would need to recreate completely. Perhaps give him black ringlets to his shoulders, like something from Botticelli? Or maybe make him a sun-bleached blonde with a fringe that flopped over his eyes? He didn't have to decide now, later would do, just before the abolition of nows and laters. He felt the familiar tingle in his groin. That's enough, he said gently. I don't want to finish just yet. If the boy heard him, he didn't obey. Eyes closed, he was lost in an oral reverie, his drool so copious, his motion had foamed it up at the root of Owen's cock. My Dick's Venus, Owen thought, rising from the surf. The thought amused him, and while he was giggling at his own wit, the boy's mouth brought him to crisis. No! he yelled, and forcibly pulled himself from between Seth's lips, pinching it behind the head so hard it hurt. For a moment he thought he'd lost the battle. He grunted and convulsed, closing his eyes against the bewitching sight of Seth kneeling in front of him, his chin shiny. He pinched harder still, and by and by the crisis retreated. That was very close, he gasped. I thought you wanted me to finish. Seth opened his eyes again. Sometime during the proceedings Seth had unzipped and slickened his cock. He was still working it. "'I haven't time to kick back and recover,' Owen replied. "'Lord knows I shouldn't have let you start, but—' "'You kissed me first, Seth said, a little petulantly. "'Maya culpa,' Owen said, raising his hands in mock surrender. "'I'll know better next time.' Seth looked despondent. "'There's not going to be a next time, is there?' he said. "'Seth, there's no need to lie to me,' the boy replied, tucking his sex out of sight. "'I'm not stupid.' "'No, you're not,' Owen said. "'Get up, will you?' Seth got to his feet, wiping his lips and chin with a ball of his hand. "'It's because you're not stupid I have told you all I have. "'I'm trusting you with secrets I haven't shared with any living soul.' "'Why?' "'Honestly, I don't know. "'Maybe because I need your company more than I thought I did.' "'But for how long?' "'Don't push me, Seth. "'There are consequences here.' I have to be certain I won't lose everything I fought for if I bring you along. But you might. I said, don't push me. Seth hung his head. And don't do that either. Look me in the eyes. Slowly Seth raised his head again. He was close to tears. I can't be responsible for you, boy. Do you understand me? Seth nodded. I don't know what's going to happen out there myself. Not exactly... I only know that a lot of powerful minds have been wiped clean. Gone just like that, because they got to the dance and found they didn't know the steps. He shrugged and sighed. I don't know what I feel for you, Seth, but I know I don't want to leave you a vegetable. I couldn't forgive myself that. On the other hand, he took hold of the boy's chin, his thumb in the cleft. Something about our destinies seems to be intermingled. Seth opened his mouth to speak, but Owen hushed him with a look. I don't want another word on this subject, he said. I wasn't going to say a word. Yes, you were. Not about that. What then? I was just going to say, I hear the band. Listen. He was right. 
The distant sound of brass and drum was drifting in through the broken window. The parade started, Seth said. At last, Owen replied, his gaze going past Seth to the crossroads below. Oh, my boy, now we shall see. Four. I suggest you stand still for a moment, Raoul said. Tesla stopped in her tracks, bringing Phoebe to a halt beside her. Very still. There was movement in the mist, ten or twelve yards ahead of them, Tesla saw. Four figures. One of them was the hammerer, she thought, moving across the slope. Phoebe had seen them too, and was holding her breath. If any of the quartet glanced in their direction, the game was up. With luck, Tesla thought she might take out two of the four before they reached the spot where Phoebe and she were standing, but any one of the quartet looked fully capable of killing them both with a blow. Not the prettiest things in creation, Raoul remarked. That was an understatement. Each displayed a particular foulness, which fact was emphasized by the way they hung upon each other's shoulders like brothers in grotesquerie. One was surely the thinnest man alive, his black flesh pasted over his sharp bones like tissue paper, his gait mincing, his eyes fiery. At his side was a man as gross as the first was wasted, his robes, which were pale and mutter blood-spattered, like his brother's, open to his navel. His breasts were pendulous and covered in bruises, the source of which was a creature that resembled a cross between a lobster and a parrot, winged, clawed, and scarlet that clung to his tits like a suckling child. The third member of this quartet was the hammerer. He was the most brutish of the four, with his iron shovel head and his bullish neck, but he whistled as he went, and the melody was sweetly lilting, like an Irish air. On his right, and closest to the woman, ran the runt of the litter, a full head shorter than the hammerer. His skin was the color of bile, and had a clammy gleam to it, his scrawny form full of ticks and stumbles. As for his features, they were testament to calamitous inbreeding, eyes bulging, chin receding, his nose no more than two slits that ran from between his eyes to just above his twisted mouth. They didn't seem to be in any great hurry. They took their time, chattering and laughing as they went, sufficiently entertained by one another's company that they didn't even glance down the slope towards the women. At last the mist closed around them, and they were gone. Horrible! Phoebe said softly. I've seen worse, Tesla remarked, and started up the slope again, with Phoebe still clinging to her arm. There was a subtle ebb and flow in the mist around them now, which became more pronounced the higher they climbed. Oh, my lord, Phoebe murmured, pointing to the ground. The same motion was visible underfoot, the grass, the dirt, even the rocks strewn around, being pulled by some force further up the mountain, and then released, only to be plucked up again seconds later. Some of the smaller pebbles were actually rolling uphill, which was odd enough, but odder still was the way the solid rock of the mountain responded to the summons. Here, close to the threshold, it hadn't cracked, it hadn't softened, and was subject to the same motion as mist, dirt, and grass. "'I think we're getting warmer,' Tesla said, seeing the phenomenon. This was the same extraordinary sight she'd witnessed at Buddy Vance's house. Apparently, solid objects losing faith in their solidity and bending out of true. The Vance house had been a maelstrom. This was not. It was a gentle, rhythmic motion. Tidal, Raoul quietly observed, the rocks being coaxed rather than bullied into surrendering their solidity. Tesla was still too traumatized by Lucian's death to be in any state to enjoy the spectacle, but she could not help but feel a twinge of anticipation. They were close to the door. She didn't doubt it. A few yards more, and she'd have sight of quiddity. Even if the doped singer was right, and there were no wonders to be found on the shore, it would still be an event of consequence to see the ocean where being was born. Laughter erupted somewhere nearby. This time the women didn't stop climbing, but instead picked up their pace. The motion of mist and ground was more urgent with every yard they covered. It was like an undertow, tugging at their feet and ankles, and though it didn't have sufficient strength to overturn them yet, it would only be a matter of time, Tesla guessed, until it did. I feel a little strange, Raoul said. Like how? Like, I don't know, like I'm not quite secure in here, he replied. Before she had a chance to quiz him further on this, 
A particularly powerful wave passed through ground and air, parting the mist in front of them. Tesla let out a gasp of astonishment. It was not the mountain top unveiled before them, but another landscape entirely, a sky of roiling colors and a shore upon which the waters of the dream sea threw themselves dark and foamy. Phoebe let go of Tesla's arm. I don't believe it, she said. I see it, but I don't. Tesla. Amazing, huh? Hold on to me. What are you talking about? I'm losing my grip. So what else is new? Tesla, I mean it. He sounded panicky. Don't get any closer. I've got to, she said. Phoebe was already three strides ahead of her, her eyes fixed on the shore. I'll be careful. She called out to Phoebe. Slow down! But her request was ignored. Phoebe hurried on as though mesmerized by the spectacle ahead, until, without warning, the motion in the ground escalated and she was thrown off her feet. She went down with a cry loud enough to rouse anyone within a twenty-yard radius, and had difficulty getting back onto her feet. Tesla stumbled to her aid, the earth and air increasingly agitated, as if stirred up by their very presence. She grabbed hold of Phoebe's arm and helped her to her feet, which was no minor task. "'I'm all right,' Phoebe gasped. "'Really, I am?' She looked round at Tesla. "'You can go back now,' she said. "'Listen to her,' Raoul said, his voice quivering. "'You've done everything you can,' Phoebe went on. "'I can make it from here.' She threw her arms around Tesla. "'Thank you,' she said. "'You're an amazing woman, you know that?' "'Take care of yourself,' Tesla said. "'I will,' Phoebe replied, breaking their embrace now and turning her gaze and her body towards the shore. "'I meant what I said,' Tesla called after Phoebe. "'What's that?' "'I wasn't—' She didn't have time to finish, distracted as she was by a figure who appeared on the shore ahead of Phoebe. He was, of all the creatures she'd seen at work and play here, the most authoritative— a fleshy, imperious individual, with sly, hooded eyes and a dozen or so small, gingerish beards sprouting from his cheeks and chins, each teased and twirled so they resembled horns. In one hand he carried a small staff. The other he was using to lift up his voluminous robes, allowing three children, identical to one another and to the laughing child Phoebe and Tesla had encountered on the slope below, room to play tag between his bare and spindly legs. He was not so diverted by their frolics, however, that he didn't see the women in his path, and by the look on his face it was plain he knew they were not part of his retinue. Instantly he raised a shout. Gamaliel, to me! Mutep, to me! Martho, Swanky, to me, to me! Phoebe turned and looked back at Tesla, her face a picture of despair. The shore lay ten strides from her at most, and now the way was blocked. Duck! Tesla yelled and pointed lured at the man in the robes. He raised his staff the same instant. There was energy skittering about it, she saw, gathering coherence. It's a weapon, Raoul yelled. She didn't wait for proof. She simply fired. The bullet struck the man in the middle of his belly, lower than she'd aimed. He dropped his robes and his staff and let out a cry of such shrillness she'd thought maybe she'd missexed him. The children's giggles turned to shrieks, and they raced around him as he tottered forward, the cry still coming between his tiny teeth. One of the children pushed past Phoebe, ignoring or indifferent to the gun, yelling, "'Somebody help Blessed Missouri!" "'Go!' Tesla yelled to Phoebe, but the order got lost in the din of Zuri's agony and the children's shrieks. The mist didn't mute the cacophony. It served as a roiling echo chamber, the tumult gathering so much power it made the soft ground shudder. By the panicked look on Phoebe's face, it was plain she was too confused to take advantage of the chance while she had it. Yelling to her again, Tesla started through the shallows to press her on her way. No farther, Raoul was yelling in her head. I can't hold on. He wasn't alone in this. The assault of noise and motion threw Tesla's senses into confusion. Her sight seemed to fly ahead of her, drummed from her skull, and for several sickening heartbeats she was looking back at herself from the very threshold between Cosm and Shore. She might have been claimed completely, but that Phoebe reached out for her, and the contact brought her sight to heal. "'Get going!' she yelled to Phoebe, glancing towards Zuri. He was in no condition to protest Phoebe's departure. He was bent double, puking up blood. "'Come with me!' Phoebe hollered. "'I can't!' "'You can't go back that way!' Phoebe said. "'They'll kill you!' "'Not if I'm—' "'Tesla!' Raoul was yelling. "'Quick, go on, for God's sake!' "'Tesla!' "'All right!' she said to him, and pushed Phoebe from her, down towards the shore. Phoebe went— wading through a swamp of softened rock. Tesla! 
We're going, Tesla said, and turning from Phoebe, started back towards solid ground. As she did so, there was a moment of utter disorientation, as though her sanity suddenly fled her. She halted in mid-stride, her purpose, her will, her memory, gone from her, in a blaze of white pain. There was a blank time when she felt nothing, no pain, no fear, no desire for self-preservation. She simply stood teetering in the midst of the tumult, lured, slipping out of her hands, and lost in the tidal ground. Then, as quickly as her wits left her, they returned. Her head ached, as it had never ached in her life, and blood ran from her nose, but she had sufficient strength to continue her stumbling journey to safe ground. There was bad news ahead, however, and it came in four appalling shapes. Gamaliel, Mutep, Bartho, and Swanky. She had no strength left in her limbs to outrun them. The best she could hope now was that they not execute her on the spot for wounding Zuri. As the hammerer closed upon her, she glanced back over her shoulder, looking for Phoebe, and was pleased to see that she had crossed the threshold and was gone. That's something, she thought to Raoul. He made no reply. I'm sorry, she said. I did my best. The hammerer was within a stride of her, reaching to seize her arm. Don't touch her, somebody said. She raised her spinning head. The somebody was striding out of the mist, carrying a shotgun. It was pointed past Tesla towards the wounded Blessedman. "'Walk away, Tesla,' the shotgun wielder said. She narrowed her eyes to better make out the face of her savior. "'Demur?' He gave her a wearily wolfish grin. "'None other,' he said. "'Now, do you want to just walk this way?' The hammerer still stood within striking distance of Tesla, plainly eager to do her damage. "'Move him,' the moor told Zuri. "'Or else—' Bartho, the blessed man said, let her pass. Whining like a frustrated dog, the hammerer stepped out of Tesla's path, and she stumbled down the slope to where Demur stood. Gamaliel, Harry said. The black stick man turned his seared head in Demur's direction. You explain to the brothers Grimm here that I've got sights on this gun that can see through fog. You understand what I'm telling you? Gamaliel nodded. And if any of you move in the next ten minutes, I'm going to blow the old fuck's head off. You don't think I can? He took a bead on Zuri. Gamaliel whimpered. Yeah, you get it, he said. I can kill him from a long way down the hill with this. A long, long way, okay? It wasn't Gamaliel who spoke, but his obese brother. Okay, he said, raising his fat-fingered hands. No shoot, okay? We not move, okay? You not shoot, okay? Okay, okay, the Moor said. He glanced round at Tesla. You fit to run? He whispered. I'll do my best. Go on, then, the Moor replied, slowly backing away. Tesla started off down the slope, slowly enough to keep the Moor in view, while he retreated from Zuri and the brothers. He kept retreating until he could no longer be seen, then he turned and raced down to join Tesla. We've got to make this quick, he said. Can you do it? Can I do what? Pick Zuri off in the fog? Hell no, but I'm betting they won't risk it. Now let's get going. It was easier descending than climbing, even though Tesla's head felt as though it were splitting. Within ten minutes the fog ahead of them brightened, and a short while after they stumbled into the bright summer air. I don't think we're out of trouble yet, Harry said. You think they'll come after us? I'm damn sure they will, he said quickly. Bartho's probably making crosses for us right now. The image of Lucian flashed into her head, and a sob escaped her. She put her hand to her mouth to stop another, but tears came anyway, pouring down. They're not going to get us, Demore said. I won't let them. It's not that, Tesla said. What is it, then? She shook her head. Later, she said, and turning from him, started on down the slope. The tears half-blinded her, and several times she stumbled, but she pushed her exhausted limbs to their limits until she made the relative safety of the tree-line. Even then she only slowed her pace a little, glancing back now and again to be certain she hadn't lost Demur. At last, with both of them gasping so hard they could barely speak, the trees began to thin out, and a mingling of sounds came drifting up towards them. The rush of Unger's Creek was one, the murmuring roar of the crowd was another, and the thump and blare of the town band as it led the parade through the streets of Everville was a third. It's not quite Mozart, Tesla thought to Raoul. Sorry. Her tenant didn't reply. 
Raoul, she said, this time aloud. Something wrong? Damore wanted to know. She hushed him with a look and turned her attention inward again. Raoul, she said. Again there was no answer. Concerned now, she closed her eyes and went looking for him. Two or three times during her travels he had hidden from her in this fashion, out of anger or anxiety, and she'd been obliged to coax him out. She took her thoughts to the divide between his territory and hers, calling his name as she went. There was still no response. A sickening suspicion rose up in her. "'Answer me, Raoul,' she said. She was again met with silence, so she crossed over into the space he occupied. She knew the instant she did so that he'd gone. When she'd trespassed here on previous occasions, his presence had been all-pervasive, even when she hadn't been able to make him speak to her. She'd felt his essence, as something utterly unlike her, occupying a space which most people lived and died believing theirs and only theirs, their minds. Now there was nothing. No challenge, no complaint, no wit, no sob. "'What's wrong?' Demur said, studying her face. Raoul, she said, he's gone. She knew when it had happened. That moment of agony and temporary madness at the threshold had marked his departure, her mind convulsing as he was ripped out of it. She opened her eyes. The world around her, the trees, the sky, Demur, the sound of creak and crowd and band, were almost overwhelming after the emptiness where Raoul had been. Are you sure? De Moore said, I'm sure. Where the hell did he go? She shook her head. He warned me when we were close to the shore. He said he was losing his grip. I thought he meant he was going crazy. Yes, she growled at her own stupidity. Christ, I let him go. How could I have let that happen? Don't beat yourself up because you didn't think of everything. Only God thinks of everything. Don't get Christian on me, Tesla said, her voice thick. That's the last fucking thing I want right now. We're going to need help from somewhere, the Moor said, casting his eyes back up the mountain. You know what they're doing up there, don't you? Waiting for the Eid. Right. And Kassoon's head of the welcoming committee. You know about Kassoon? the Moor said, plainly surprised. So was Tesla. You know about him, too? I've been following him across the country for the last two months. How did you find out he was here? A woman you know, Maria Nazareno. How'd you come to find her? She found me the way she found you. Tesla put her hand to her face, wiping away some of the sweat and dirt. She's dead, isn't she? I'm afraid she is. Kassoon traced her. We're a lethal pair, Demore. Everybody we touch... She let the thought go unfinished, simply turned from him and continued her descent through the trees. What are you going to do now? Sit, think... Mind if I come with you? Have you got some last-minute maneuver up your sleeve? No. Good, because I'm sick of believing there's a damn thing we can do about any of this. I didn't say that. No, but I did, Tesla said, marching on down the slope. They're coming, Demore, whether we like it or not. The door's open and they're coming through it. I think it's about time we made our peace with that. Harry was about to argue the point, but before he could find the words... He remembered the conversation he'd had with Norma. The world could change, she said, but it can't end. And where was the harm in change? Was it so dandy the way it was? He looked up through the swaying branches at the gleaming blue sky while the music of the town band came to him on a balmy breeze, and he had his answer. The world's just fine the way it is, he said, loud enough for Tesla to hear it. She didn't answer him, just marched on down to the creek and waited over. Just fine, he said to himself, asserting with that his inalienable right to defend it. Just fine. Five. One. After her literal fashion, Phoebe had expected to find a door awaiting her at the end of her trek. It would more than likely be fancier than any door she'd seen, and she wasn't so naive as to expect a bell and a welcome mat. But to all intents and purposes, it would be a door. She would stand before it, turn the handle, and with a majestic sigh, it would open before her. 
How wrong she'd been. Passing between worlds had been like having ether at the dentist's in the bad old days, her mind fighting to hold on to consciousness and losing, losing, losing. She didn't remember falling, but when she opened her eyes again she was face down on snow-dusted rocks. She lifted herself up, her body chilled to the bone. There were drops of blood among the snowflakes and more falling from her face. She put her hand up and cautiously touched her mouth and nose. It was the latter that was bleeding, but there was very little pain, so she assumed she hadn't broken it. She dug for a handkerchief in the pocket of her dress, which she'd chosen for its skimpiness, in expectation of Joe seeing her in it, a decision she now regretted, and found a balled-up tissue to clamp to her nose. Only then did she start to take much notice of her surroundings. Off to her right was the crack through which she'd come, the day on the other side brighter and warmer than the purplish gloom in which she found herself. Off to her left, partially surrounded in mist, was the sea, its dark waves almost viscous, and on the shore between, squatting in countless numbers, were birds that vaguely resembled cormorants. The largest, perhaps two feet tall, their bodies mottled and almost waxen, their heads, some of which were decorated with crests of green feathers, others of which were completely bald, tiny. The closest of them were perhaps two yards from her, but none showed the slightest interest in her. She got to her feet, her teeth chattering with the cold, and cast a glance back the way she'd come. Was it worth risking a return journey just to find herself some more adequate clothing? Without something to cover her up, she was going to be dead from the cold in a very short time. She only contemplated this for a moment. Then she caught sight of one of the Blessed Men's children on the other side, apparently staring in her direction, and the horror of all that she'd experienced to get here came flooding back. Better the cold than the crosses, she thought, and before the child could summon someone to come after her, she retreated down the shore towards the water, the veil of mist between her and the doorway thickening with every step until she could no longer see it, nor, she prayed, be seen. It was still colder by the water's edge, a chilling spray rising off every breaking wave. But there was compensation. Off to her right the mist was patchy, and she caught sight of lights twinkling some distance along the shore and the vague silhouettes of roofs and spires. Thank God, she thought, civilization. Without delay she started towards it, staying within sight of the water at all times, so as not to get lost in the mist. As it turned out, it thinned and disappeared after she had been walking for five minutes, and she finally had an uninterrupted view of the landscape before her. It was not a reassuring sight. The city lights seemed to be no nearer than they'd been when she'd first spotted them, and the rest of the scene, the shore, the rocky terrain beyond it, and the dream sea itself, was desolation, or near enough. The only color was in the sky, and that was a fretful stew of bruisy purples and iron grays. There were no stars to light her way, nor any moon, but the spattering of snow upon the scene lent it an eerie luminescence, as though the ground had stolen what little light the sky had owned. As for life, there were the birds, whose numbers were now very considerably thinned, but were still dotted along the shore, like an army awaiting orders from some absentee general. A few had left their stations and were diving after fish in the shallows. It was not a difficult task. The waves were fairly brimming with tiny silver fish, and she saw a few of the divers emerging from the water with their beaks and gullets so stuffed with thrashing fish she wondered they didn't choke. The sight reminded her of her own hunger. It was six hours or more since the breakfast she and Tesla had snatched before setting out. By now, even on a diet day, she'd have snacked twice and eaten lunch. Instead, she'd climbed a mountain, viewed a crucifixion, and crossed into another world. It was enough to make anybody's stomach grumble. One of the birds waddled past her, and as it flung itself into the water in search of nourishment, her gaze went up the beach a yard or two to the place where it had been squatting. Was that an egg nestling between the stones? She strode to the spot and picked it up. It was indeed an egg, twice the size of a hen's egg, and subtly striped. The notion of eating it raw was less than appetizing, but she was too hungry to fret. She cracked it open and poured the contents into her mouth. 
It tasted more pungent than she anticipated, almost meaty, in fact, with a texture of phlegm. She swallowed it down to the last drop, and was just casting her eyes around for another when she heard a vehement squawking sound and swung round to see the irate egg layer charging up the shore towards her, its head down, its rough of feathers raised. Phoebe was in no mood to indulge its tantrum. Shoo, birdie, she told it. Go on, damn you, shoo. The bird was not so easily driven off. Its din rousing similar squawkings from all the birds in the vicinity, it kept coming at Phoebe, and its darting beak caught her shin. The wound stung. She yelped and hopped back from the bird to keep out of its range, her advice to it less gentle now. "'Piss off, will you?' she yelled at it. "'Damn thing!' She glanced down at her stinging leg as she retreated, and her heel slipped on the snow-slickened stones. Down she went for the second time in half an hour, for once glad her buttocks were well padded. Her fall had landed her in more trouble, however, not just from the egg-layer, but from several of its fellows, who plainly viewed her fall and the howl of rage that accompanied it as a threat. Crests and ruffs erected on all sides, and two or three dozen throats gave up the same shrill squawk. This was no longer a little inconvenient. Ludicrous though it seemed, she was in trouble. The birds were coming at her from all directions, their attacks capable of doing no little damage. She went on yelling in the hope of keeping them at bay, while attempting to scramble to her feet. Twice she almost did so, but her heels slid over the rocks. The closest of the birds were in pecking distance now, beaks stabbed at her arms and shoulders and at her back. She started to flail wildly, catching birds with her hands and even knocking a few of them over, but there were too many to floor. Sooner or later one of the beaks would puncture an artery or stab her eye. She had to get to her feet, and quickly. Shielding her face with her arms, she got onto her knees. The birds didn't have much room in their skulls for brains, but they sensed her vulnerability and escalated their assault, pecking at her back and buttocks and legs as she struggled to rise. Suddenly a shot, then another, and a third, this accompanied by a hot spray against Phoebe's left arm. The tone of the squawking instantly changed from mob mania to panic, and parting her arms, Phoebe saw the birds retreating in disarray, leaving three of their flock dead on the ground. Not just dead, in fact, almost blown apart. One was missing its head, another half its torso, while the third, which was the sprayer, still twitched beside her with a hole the size of her fist in its abdomen. She looked for their slaughterer. "'Over here,' said a faintly bemused voice, and a little way along the shore stood a man wearing a coat of furs, his cap fashioned from an animal pelt, with a snout as a peak. In his arms a rifle. It was still smoking. "'You're not one of Zuri's mob,' he observed. "'No, I'm not,' Phoebe replied. The man pushed back the peak of his hat. To judge by his features, he was of the same tribe as the hammerer, his head flat and wide, his lower lip bulbous, his eyes tiny. But whereas the crossmaker had been unadorned, this creature's face was decorated from brow to chin, his cheeks pierced with rings perhaps fifty times, from which tiny ornaments dangled, his eyes ringed with scarlet and yellow paint, his hair teased into ringlets which softened his beetling brow. "'Where are you from?' he said. "'The other side,' Phoebe said, the correct vocabulary momentarily deserting her. "'You mean the Cosm?' "'That's right.' The man shook his head, and his decorations danced. "'Oh,' he sighed, "'I hope that's the truth.' "'You think I'd dress this way if I was a local?' Phoebe said. "'No, I don't suppose you would.' the man replied. "'I'm Hoppo Musnikov. And you?' "'Phoebe Cobb?' Musnikov had unbuttoned his coat and now shrugged it off. "'We're well met, Phoebe Cobb,' he said. "'Here, put this on.' He tossed the coat to Phoebe. "'And let me escort you back to Liverpool.' "'Liverpool?' That sounded like a mundane destination after such a journey. "'It's a glorious city.' Musnikov said, pointing towards the lights along the shore. "'You'll see.' Phoebe put on his coat. It was warm and smelled of a sweet perfume tinged with oranges. She plunged her hands into the deep, fur-lined pockets. "'You'll soon warm up,' Musnikov said. "'I'll attend to those wounds of yours while we go. I want you to be presentable for the mistress.' "'The mistress?' "'My employer,' he replied. 
She sent me along here to see what Zuri was up to, but I think she'd be happier if I forsook the spying and brought you home instead. She'll be eager to hear what you have to tell her. About what? About the Cosm, of course, Mustakov replied. Now will you let me give you a hand? Please. He came to her. The perfume on the coat was his, she discovered. He reeked of it, and putting his arm through hers, escorted her over the slithery rocks. That's our transport, he said. There was a many-coloured horse, as bright as a peacock's tail, a little way ahead of them, grazing on the coarse grass that spurted between the slabs of what had once been a fine road. King Texas had this highway laid when he was wanting to impress the mistress. Of course it's gone to ruin since. Who's King Texas? He's the rock, Musnikov replied, slamming his foot down. Crazy now, since she left him. He loved her beyond love, you see. Rock can do that. You know, I don't have a clue what you're talking about, don't you? Phoebe said. Let's get you up on the nag, eh? Musnikov said. That's it. Right foot in the stirrup, and up. Good, good. He flipped the reins over the horse's head so as to lead it. Are you secure? He asked. I think so. Take hold of her mane. Go on, she's not going to complain. Phoebe did as she was instructed. Now, said Musnikov, gently coaxing the animal into a walk, let me tell you about the mistress and King Texas, so you'll understand her insanities better when you meet her face to face. 2. It was the sound of panicked shouts that roused Joe from his stupor. He lifted his head up off the fine red sand of Memebekater Sabat's shore and turned it back towards the sea that had delivered him here. Two or three hundred yards from the beach was the good ship Fanakapan, loaded down with passengers. They squatted on the wheelhouse roof, they clung to the mast and ladders, one even hung on the anchor. But their weight and agitation was proving too much for the vessel. Even as Joe watched, the Fanakapan tipped over sideways, pitching two dozen of its passengers into the water, where their shouts were redoubled. Joe got to his feet, watching the disaster unfold with sickened fascination. The people in the water were now scrabbling to climb back on the boat, their efforts assisted by some of their fellow passengers and violently opposed by others. Whatever the intention, the effect was the same. The Fanakapan tipped over completely, clearing decks, wheelhouse, mast, and ladders in two seconds, and as it did so, its timbers cracked, and with startling suddenness it proceeded to sink. It was a pitiful sight. Small though the vessel was, its descent through the dream sea into a fair frenzy, the waters churned and spumed, seeming to seize many of the people in the water and pluck them down. They went shrieking and cursing as though to their deaths, though Joe supposed it could not be by drowning. After all, he'd lingered under water for several minutes with Phoebe, and had not lacked for air. Perhaps these panicky souls would discover the same, but he suspected not. Something about the way the waters circled these flailing souls made him think there was sentience there that the dream sea would be as cruel to these failed voyagers as it had been kind to him. He turned his back on the sight and scanned the shore. It was far from deserted. There were people along the beach in both directions as far as his eyes could see, which was a long way. The gloomy sky had given way to an exquisite luminescence, the source of which was not a heavenly body, but objects themselves. Everything was shining with its own light, some of it steady, some of it glittering, but glorious in its sum. Joe looked down at his body, at his blood-stained clothes and his wounded flesh, and saw that even he was shining here, as though every pore and crease and thread wanted to make itself known. The sight exhilarated him. He was not unmiraculous in this miraculous place, but came with glories of his own. He started up the shore now, towards the groves of titanic trees that lined it, so vast he could see nothing of the island itself. This was, he was certain, Mema Pegeta Sabat. On the voyage Noah had rhapsodized about the color of its sand. There was no shore so red, he boasted, nor any other island so fine. Beyond that Joe had little sense of what to expect. The Ephemeris was not one island, but many, he knew that. An archipelago formed, so tradition had it, around pieces of debris from the cosm. Some of that debris was alive, the tissue of trespassers, which the dream sea had transformed and fantasticated, using the minds of those men and women as inspiration. 
Most of the debris was dead stuff, however, fragments of the helter incendo that had slipped through a crack. With time and with Quiddity's attentions, these became the lesser, plainer islands in the group. Though they numbered in their thousands, Noah had said, most of them were deserted. So, Joe had asked, what man or woman had founded the island that Noah had constantly referred to as my country? Noah had replied that he didn't know, but there were those in the great city of Baketer Sabat who knew, and perhaps Joe would find favor with one of them and be initiated into that mystery. A frail hope even then. Now it was not worth entertaining. The people on the shore were plainly refugees, most likely from that very city. If Baketer Sabat still stood, it probably stood deserted. Joe intended to see it, nevertheless. He had come so far, and at such cost, not to see the city which had been, according to Noah, the jewel of the ephemeris, its Rome, its New York, its Babylon, would be defeatist. And even if he didn't make it, even if there was only a wasteland on the other side of the trees, anything was better than lingering here among these desolate people. So thinking, he started up the shore, the dream of power with which he had begun this journey entirely dashed, and in its place the simple desire to see what could be seen and know what could be known, before he lost the power to do either. 6. 1. Though Liverpool had seemed charmless to Phoebe when she and Musnakoff first entered, its public buildings austere and grimy, its private houses, either tenement rows or gloomy mansions, they soon encountered signs of an inner life that quite endeared the place to her. There were noisy parties going on in a number of residences they passed by, with parties spilling out onto the sidewalk. There were huge bonfires blazing in several of the squares, surrounded by dancing people. There was even a parade of children singing as they went. "'What's the celebration?' she asked Musnikov. "'There isn't one,' he replied. "'People are just making the most of what little time they think's left to them.' "'Before the Eid comes?' he nodded. "'Why don't they try and leave the city? A lot of folks have. But then there's a lot more who think, what's the use? Why go and shiver in Trofetta, or Plathosiak, where the Eid's going to find you anyway, when you could be at home drinking yourself stupid with your family around you?' Do you have a family? The mistress is my family, the fellow replied. She's all I need, all I've ever needed. You said she was insane. I exaggerated, he replied fondly. She's just a little loopy. They came at last to a three-story house standing on its own in a snow-dusted garden. There were lights burning in every room, but there were no party-goers here. The only sound was the din of seagulls who sat on the roof and chimneys, staring out to sea. They had quite a view. Even from the street Phoebe was able to gaze down over a chilly but spectacular vista of roofs and spires, all snow-dusted, to the docks and the many dozens of sailing ships at anchor there. She knew very little about ships, but the sight of these vessels moved her, evoking as it did an age when the world had still possessed mystery. Now perhaps the only sea left to explore was the sea that stretched beyond the harbor, the dream sea, and it seemed right to her that these sleek, elegant vessels be the ones to ply it. That's how the mistress made herself, Musnikov remarked, coming to Phoebe's shoulder to share the panorama. Ships? Sailors, he replied. She traded in dreams, and it made her rich beyond counting. Happy, too, till King Texas. As he'd promised, Musnikov had spoken about King Texas on the journey, and it was a sad tale. He had seduced the mistress in her prime, so Musnikov explained, and then, tiring of her, had left her for another woman. She had pined for him pitifully, and had several times attempted to kill herself, but life, it seemed, hadn't been done with her, because each time she'd survived to grieve another day. And then, many years after his departure, he'd suddenly returned, begging her forgiveness, and asking to be allowed back into her arms and bed. Against all expectation she had refused him. He had changed, she said. The man she had loved and lost, the man she still mourned, and always would, was gone. Had you been with me, she'd said, we might have changed together, and found new reasons for love, but there's nothing left of you for me to want, except the memory. 
The story seemed to Phoebe ineffably sad, as did the notion of trading in dreams, though she had no little difficulty imagining what that actually meant. "'Can dreams be bought and sold?' she asked Musnikov. "'Everything can be bought and sold,' he replied, looking at her quickly. "'But you know that, coming from the Cosm. "'But dreams?' He raised his hand to ward off further questions, and led her to the gates of the house, which he unlocked with a key hanging at his belt, then ushered her up to the front steps. Here he paused to offer one last piece of advice before they entered. "'She'll want to quiz you about the Cosm. Tell her it's a veil of tears, and she'll be happy.' "'That's no lie.' Phoebe said, Good, he replied, and started up the stairs. Oh, one more thing, he said as he went. You may want to tell her I saved you from certain death. Please feel free to lie a little about that, just to make it seem more... Heroic? Dramatic. Oh, yes, dramatic, Phoebe said with a little smile. Don't worry. Only I'm all she's got left now, that the sailors don't come. And I want her to feel protected, you understand? I understand, Phoebe said. You love her as much as King Texas. I didn't say that. You didn't have to. It's not even... I mean, she doesn't... All his confidence had suddenly drained from him. He was trembling. You're saying she doesn't know? I'm saying... He studied the steps. I'm saying she wouldn't care even if she did. Then, not meeting Phoebe's eyes, he turned from her and hurried up the icy steps to the front door. It was open in an instant, and he went inside, where the lamps were turned to tiny glittering flames, and he could wrap his sorrow in the shadows. Phoebe followed him up and in. He directed her down a narrow, high-ceilinged passage to the back of the house. "'You'll find plenty of food in the kitchen. Help yourself.' Then he headed up the lushly carpeted stairs, as a scent announced by a tinkling of tiny bells. The kitchen, Phoebe discovered, had probably been modern in 1920, but it was a reassuring place to sit and rest her heavy body. There was an open fire, which she fed with a few logs. There was an immense black iron stove, pots large enough to cook for fifty, and the raw materials for such an enterprise arrayed everywhere. Shelves of canned goods, bowls and baskets of fruit and vegetables, bread and cheese, and coffee. Phoebe stood in front of the fire for a couple of minutes to get some warmth back into her chilled limbs, then set to constructing herself a substantial sandwich. The beef was rare and soft as butter, the bread still warm from the oven, the cheese ripe and piquant. By the time she'd finished putting the sandwich together, her mouth was awash. She took a hearty bite, it was better than good, then poured herself a cup of fruit juice and settled down in front of the fire. Her thoughts drifted as she ate and drank back along the shore, through the crack and down the mountain to Everville. It seemed like days since she and Tesla had waited in the traffic on Main Street and talked about whether people were real or not. The conversation struck her as even more nonsensical now than it had at the time. Here she was in a place where dreams were traded, eating rare beef in front of a warm fire. Things were as real here as they'd been in the world she'd left and that was a great comfort to her. It meant she understood the rules. She wouldn't fly here, but nor would she be chased by the devil. This was just another country. Of course it had its share of strange customs and wildlife, but so did Africa or China. She just had to get used to its peculiarities, and she'd be able to make her way here without difficulty. The mistress wants to see you, Musnikov announced from the doorway. Good, she said, and started to rise. She instantly felt light-headed. Boy, oh boy, she said, picking up her cup and peering into it. That juice has got a kick to it. Musnikov allowed himself a smile. It's morning, Berry, he said. Are you not familiar with it? She shook her head, which was a mistake. Her senses swam. Oh, Lord! she said, and started to sit down again. Maybe I should just wait a few minutes. No, she wants to see you now. Trust me, she's not going to give a shit if you're a little tipsy. She's scarcely ever sober herself. He came over to Phoebe and persuaded her back to her feet. Now, remember what I told you. King Texas, Phoebe mumbled, still trying to order her thoughts. No, he yelped. Don't you dare mention him. What then? 
she said. The Veil of Tears, he reminded her. Oh, yes, I remember. The Cosm's A Veil of Tears, she repeated it to herself, just for safety's sake. Have you got it? I've got it, she said. Musnikov sighed. Well, then, he said, I can think of no excuse to put this off any further. And duly escorted her out of the kitchen, along the passageway, and up the stairs to meet with the mistress of the strange house. 2. Though the trees that bounded the shore of Ephemeris grew so close together, their exposed roots knotted like the fingers of praying hands, and the canopy overhead was so dense the sky was blotted out altogether, there was not a leaf, twig, or patch of moss that didn't exude light, which eased Joe's progress considerably. Once in the midst of the forest he had to rely upon his sense of direction to bring him out the other side, which, indeed, it did. After perhaps half an hour the trees began to thin, and he stumbled into the open air. There a scene lay before him of such scale he could have stood and studied it for a week, and not taken in every detail. Stretching in front from his feet for perhaps twenty miles was a landscape of bright fields and water meadows, the former blazing green and yellow and scarlet, the latter sheets of silver and gold. Rising overhead like a vast wave that had climbed to titanic height and now threatened to break over the perfection below was a wall of darkness, which surely concealed the Eid. It was not black, but a thousand shades of grey, tinged here and there with red and purple. It was impossible to judge the matter of which it was made. It had the texture of smoke in some places. In others it glistened like skinned muscle. In others still it divided in convulsions, and divided again as though it were reproducing itself. Of the legion or nation that lurked behind it there was no sign. The wave teetered and teetered and did not fall. But there was another sight that was in its way more extraordinary still, and that was the city that stood in the shadow of this toppling sky. The Keter Sabbat. The glory of the ephemeris, Noah had called it, and had Joe's journey taken him not one step closer to the city's limits, he would have believed the boast. It was shaped, the city, like an inverted pyramid, balanced on its tip. There was no sign of any structure supporting it in this position. Though there were a myriad means of ascent from the ground to its underbelly, which was encrusted with what he assumed to be dwellings, though their occupants would have to have the attributes of bats to live there, the sum of these ladders and stairways was nowhere near sufficient to bear the city's weight. He had no way to judge its true scale, but he was certain Manhattan would have fitted upon the upper surface with room to spare which meant that the dozen or so towers that rose there, each resembling a vast swathe of fabric, plucked up by one corner and falling in countless folds, were many hundreds of stories high. Despite the lights that blazed from their countless windows, Joe doubted the towers were occupied. The Keter Sabat's citizens were choking the roads that led from the city, or rising from its streets and towers in wheeling flocks. Such was the sheer immensity of the spectacle. He was almost tempted to find himself a comfortable spot among the roots, and watch it until the wave broke, and it was obliterated. But the same curiosity that had brought him from the shore now pressed him on, down the slope and across a swampy field, where a crop of crystalline flowers sprouted to the nearest of the roads. Despite the vast diversity of faces and forms in the throng upon that road, there was a certain desperation in their faces, and in their forms a common dread. They shuddered and sweated as they went. Their eyes, white, golden, blue, and black, cast over their shoulders now and again towards the city they deserted, and the teetering darkness that shadowed it. Few showed any interest in Joe, and those few that did looked at him pityingly, judging him crazy, he supposed, for being the only traveller on this highway who was not fleeing Beketer Sabat but heading back towards it. 3. Musnakov's mistress was sitting in a bed so large it could readily have slept ten, propped up on twenty lace pillows and surrounded by a litter of torn paper, which was so light that the merest breath of wind from window or hearth was enough to raise fifty of the scraps into the air and make the sheets rustle like leaves. 
The chamber itself was absurdly overwrought. The smoke-stained ceiling painted with naked deities cavorting, the walls lined with mirrors, some cracked, the rest in severe decay. The same might have been said for the mistress herself. Decayed she was, and plainly cracked. For fully five minutes Phoebe and Musnikov waited at the end of her bed while she tore up pieces of paper into yet smaller pieces, muttering to herself as she did so. What light there was came from the oil lamps on the various tables, which were, like those in the rest of the house, turned down so that they barely glimmered, lending the whole chamber a troubled air. Its ambiguity did little to flatter the woman. Even by this subdued light she was a grotesque. Her sparse hair dyed a lush black, which only served to emphasize her parchment pallor. Her cheeks furrowed, her neck like a fraying rope. At last, without looking up from her litter-making, she spoke, her thin lips barely moving. "'I could have used a woman like you in the old days. You've got some meat on your bones. Men like that.' Phoebe didn't respond. Not only was she intimidated by this crone, she was afraid her lack of sobriety would be all too evident if she spoke. "'Not that I care what men like or don't like,' the mistress went on. "'I'm past that. And it feels fine not to care.' She looked up now. Her eyes were roomy, and roved back and forth in Phoebe's general direction, but didn't come to rest. "'If I cared,' she said, "'you know what I would do?' She paused. "'Well, do you?' she demanded. "'No.' "'I would dream myself a beauty,' she replied, chuckling at the notion. "'I would make myself over as the most fetching woman in creation, "'and I would go out in the streets and break every heart I could.' "'The chuckle disappeared. "'Do you think I could do that?' she said. "'I, I dare say you could.' "'You dare say, do you?' the mistress responded softly. Well, let me tell you. I could do it as easily as piss. Oh, yes, no trouble. I dreamed of the city, didn't I? Did you? I did. ta -da, my little labore. It's true, Musnikov replied. She dreamed this place into being. So I could dream myself a fetching woman just as easily? Again she paused. But I choose not to. And you know why? "'Because you don't care?' Phoebe ventured. The paper the woman was in the middle of tearing fell from her fingers. "'Exactly,' she said with great moment. "'What's your name? Felicia?' "'Phoebe. Even worse.' "'I like it,' Phoebe replied, her tongue responding before she could check it. "'It's a vile name,' the woman said. "'No, it isn't.' If I say it's a vile name, then vile it is. Come here. Phoebe didn't move. Did you hear me? Yes, I heard you, but I don't care to come. The woman rolled her eyes. Oh, for God's sake, woman, don't take offense at a little remark like that. I'm allowed to be objectionable. I'm old, ugly, and flatulent. You don't have to be, Phoebe said. Says so. You, Phoebe reminded her, glad she'd had all those years of dealing with obstinate patience. She was damned if she'd allow the harridan to intimidate her. Two minutes ago you said... She caught Musnikov frantically gesturing to her, but she'd begun now and it was too late to stop. You said you could just dream yourself beautiful. So dream yourself young and gasless at the same time. There was a weighty silence, the mistress's eyes roving maniacally. Then she began to chuckle again, the sound escalating into a full-throated laugh. "'Oh, you believed me, you believed me, you sweet thing,' she said. "'Do you truly think I would live with this?' She raised her skeletal hands in front of her. "'If I had any choice in the matter?' "'So you can't dream yourself beautiful? "'I might have been able to do it when I first came here. "'I was barely a hundred back then. "'Oh, I know it sounds old to you, but it's nothing, nothing.' I had a husband whose kisses kept me young. This is King Texas, Phoebe said. 
The woman's hands dropped back into her lap, and she uttered a shuddering sigh. No, she said. This was in the chasm in my youth. A soul I loved far more than I ever loved Texas, and who loved me back to distraction. An expression of utter loss crossed her face. It never passes, she murmured, the pain of losing love. It never truly passes. I'm afraid to sleep some nights. Abre knows, poor Abre. I'm afraid, because when I sleep I dream he's returned into my arms and I into his, and the hurt of waking is so great I can't bear to close my eyes for fear the dream will come again. She was suddenly weeping, Phoebe saw, tears pouring down her gouged cheeks. Oh, Lord, if I had my way, I'd unmake love. Wouldn't that be fine? No, Phoebe said softly. I don't think that would be fine at all. You wait until you've outlived all those you care for or lost them. You wait till all you've got left is a husk and some memories. You lie awake the way I do and pray not to dream. She beckoned to Phoebe. Come closer, will you? She said. Let me see you a little more clearly. Phoebe duly moved to the side of the bed. Abre, that lamp, bring it closer. I want to see the face of this woman who's so in love with love. Better, better. She lifted her hand as if to touch Phoebe's face, then withdrew from the contact. Are there any new diseases in the cosm? She said. Yes, there are. Are they terrible? Some of them, yes. Phoebe said. One of them's very terrible indeed. She remembered Abre's phrase. The cosm's a veil of tears, she said. It did the trick. The mistress smiled. There, she said, turning to Abre. Isn't that what I always say? That's what you say, Usnikov replied. No wonder you fled it. The woman said, turning her attention back to Phoebe. I didn't... What? Flee? I didn't flee. I came because there's somebody here I want to find. And who might that be? My... lover. The mistress regarded her pityingly. So you're here for love? She said. Yes, Phoebe replied. Before you ask, his name's Joe. I had no intention of asking. The mistress rasped. Well, I told you anyhow. He's somewhere out there at sea, and I've come to find him. You'll fail, the harridan said, making no attempt to disguise her satisfaction at the thought. You know what's going on out there, I presume? Vaguely. Then you surely know there's no chance of finding him. He's probably already dead. I know that's not true, Phoebe said. How can you know? The mistress said. Because I was here in a dream. I met him out there in quiddity. She dropped her voice a little for dramatic effect. We made love. In the sea? In the sea. You were actually coupled in quiddity, Musnikov said. Yes. The mistress had picked up a sheet of paper from the bed. It was covered, Phoebe saw, with line upon line of spidery handwriting, and proceeded to tear it up. Such a thing, she said, half to herself. Such a thing. Is there any way you can help me? Phoebe said. It was Musnikov who replied, I'm afraid he got no further. Maybe, the mistress said. The sea doesn't speak, but there are those in it that do. She had reduced the first sheet of paper to litter, and now picked up a second. What would I get in return? she asked Phoebe. How about the truth? Phoebe replied. The mistress cocked her head. Have you lied to me? she said. I said what I was told to say, Phoebe replied. About what? About the cosm being a veil of tears. Is that not so? the mistress said, somewhat testily. Some of the time. People live unhappy lives, but not all the time, and not all of the people. The mistress grunted. I guess maybe you don't want to hear the truth after all. Maybe you're happier just sitting tearing up love letters and thinking you're better off here than there. How did you know? What, that they were love letters? By the look on your face. He's been writing to me every hour on the hour for six years. 
tells me he'd let me have this whole damn continent if I'd only grant him a kiss, a touch. I've never answered a single billet doux. But still he writes them, reams and reams of sentimental nonsense, and every now and then I take a day or so to tear them up. If you hate him that much, Phoebe said, you must have loved him. I told you I've loved one creature in my life, and he's dead. In the cosm, Phoebe said. It was not a question, it was a statement, plain and simple. The mistress looked up at her. Do you read minds? she said, very softly. Is that how you know my secrets? It wasn't much of a leap, Phoebe replied. You said you dreamed this city into being. You must have seen the original once. I did, the mistress said, a very long time ago. I was a mere child. Did you remember much? More than I care to, the woman said, far more. I had great ambitions, you see, and they came to nothing. Well, almost nothing. What ambitions? To build a new Alexandria, a city where people would live in peace and prosperity, she shrugged. And what did I end up with? What? Everville. Phoebe was flummoxed. Everville, she said. What on earth could this bizarre creature have to do with safe, smug little Everville? The woman dropped the love letter she was tearing and stared into the flames. Yes, you may as well know the whole truth for what it's worth. She looked from the fire to Phoebe and made a tiny smile. My name's Maeve O'Connell, she said, and I'm the fool who founded Everville. 7. 1. Until the early eighties, the route of the Saturday parade had been simple. It had started at Sears Bakery on Poppy Lane and proceeded along Acres Street to Maine, where it had moved, in about an hour, to its conclusion in the town square. But as the scale of both the parade and the crowd attending it had grown, a new route had to be devised that would allow breathing room for both. After several six-to-midnight meetings in their smoke-filled room above Dorothy Bullard's office, the festival committee had hit upon a simple but clever solution. The parade would describe an almost complete circle around the town, setting out from behind the town hall. This almost tripled the length of the route. Main Street and the town square would still remain the prime sites for viewing, of course, but the spectators there would be obliged to wait somewhat longer for the show to come their way. For the impatient, then, or those with impatient kids, the streets closer to the starting place were preferable, while for those folks who thrived on anticipation and were happy to eat, drink, and swelter for an hour and a half while the music grew tantalizingly louder, there was still no better place to be than on the bleachers, fire escapes, and window sills of Main Street. "'The band's never sounded better,' Maisie Waits said to Dorothy as the two women stood in the sun outside Kitty's diner, watching the parade slowly make its way towards the crossroads. Dorothy beamed. She couldn't have been more proud, she thought to herself, if she'd given birth to every one of these musicians herself, and was about to say so when she checked herself. Wherever that notion had popped up from, it was perhaps better left unspoken. Instead, she said, We all loved Arnold, of course, speaking of Arnold Langley, who had led the band for twenty-two years, until his sudden death of a stroke the previous January. But Larry's really worked on updating the repertoire. Oh, Bill just thinks the sun shines out of Larry, Maisie remarked. Her husband had played the trombone in the band for a decade, and he loves the new uniforms. They'd cost a tidy sum, but there was no doubt the money had been well spent. Along with Larry Gladowski's recruiting drive, which had brought a number of new younger players into the ranks, all but one of them from out of town, the uniforms had given the band a fresher, snappier appearance, which had in turn improved their marching and their playing. There had even been talk of the band entering one of the big interstate competitions in the next couple of years. Even if it didn't win, the publicity would only help the festival. Not that it needed help, Dorothy thought, her gaze moving from band to crowd. There were about as many people here as the streets would bear, five or six deep in some places, their weight putting the barricades under considerable strain, 
Their din so loud it drowned out all but the band's bass drum, which thumped away in Dorothy's lower belly like a second heart. "'You know I really should eat something,' she said to Maisie. "'I'm feeling a little floaty.' "'Oh, well, that's no good,' Maisie said. "'We'll have to get some food inside you.' "'I'll just wait until the band gets here,' Dorothy said. "'Are you sure?' Of course I can't miss the band. I feel like a damn fool, Rowan said. Dolan grinned. Nobody can see us but us, he pointed out. Oh, come on, lighten up, Irwin. Didn't you always want to march in a parade? Actually, no, Irwin replied. They were all there, Nordhoff, Dickerson, even Connie, marching among the glittering ranks, all playing the fool. Irwin couldn't see the joke. Not today, when plainly there was so much wrong with the world. Hadn't Nordhoff himself said that they had to somehow protect their investment in Everville? And here they were, capering like children. "'I'm done with this,' he said sourly. "'We should be after that bastard in my house.' "'We will be,' Dolan said. "'Nordhoff told me he had a plan.' "'Somebody taking my name in vain?' Nordhoff called over his shoulder. "'Erwin thinks we're wasting our time.' "'Do you indeed?' Nordhoff said, swinging round and marching backwards while he addressed the question. "'It may seem like a pathetic little ritual to you, marching with a town band, but it's like that jacket you're wearing.' "'This thing?' Erwin said. "'I thought I'd given it away.' "'But you found the pockets full of keepsakes, didn't you?' Nordhoff said. "'Little pieces of the past?' "'Yes. It was the same for all of us.' Nordhoff replied, plunging his hand into the pocket of his less-than-perfect tux and pulling out a handful of bric-a-brac. "'Either our memories or some higher power supplied us with these comforts, and I am grateful.' "'What's your point?' Erwin pressed. "'That we have to stay connected to Everville the way we stay connected to ourselves. Whether it's an old shirt or an hour with a town band, it doesn't matter. They serve the same function. They help us remember what we loved.' "'What we still love,' Dolan said. "'You're right, Richard, what we still love. "'You see the point, Erwin?' "'I can think of better ways to do it than this,' Erwin growled. "'Doesn't a band make your heart strike up?' Nordhoff said, raising his knees a little higher with each step. "'Listen to those trumpets!' "'Raucous,' Erwin said. "'Jesus Toothacre!' Nordhoff said. "'Where's your sense of celebration?' This is what we're fighting to preserve. Then God help us, Erwin said, at which reply Nordhoff turned his back and, picking up his pace, marched off through the brass section. Go after him, Dolan told Erwin. Quickly, tell him you're sorry. Go to hell, Erwin said, peeling off from the ranks and heading for the choked sidewalk. Dolan went after him. Nordhoff's not a very forgiving man, Dolan said. I don't care, Erwin said. I'm not going to abase myself. He stopped, his gaze fixed on somebody in the crowd. "'What is it?' Dolan wanted to know. "'There,' Erwin said, pointing to the bedraggled woman moving through the crowd. "'You know her?' "'Ah, oh, yes.' Tesla was about a hundred yards from the crossroads when she realized where she was. She halted. It took Harry just a second or two to catch up with her. "'What's the problem?' he hollered to her. "'We shouldn't have come this way.' she yelled back. You know a better one? Tesla shook her head. Perhaps with Raoul's aid she'd have been able to plot an alternative route to Phoebe's house, but from now on she'd have to start working these problems out for herself. So we just have to plow on, Harry said. Tesla nodded and did just that, plunging on into the press of bodies with the abandon of an orgiast. If only there was some way to harness the power of this communion, she thought to turn it to practical purpose, instead of letting it evaporate. What a waste that was! What a pitiful waste! Caught in the grip of the crowd, unable to entirely control her route, nor entirely concerned to do so, she felt curiously comforted. The touch of flesh on flesh, the stench of sweat and candy-sweetened breath, the sight of oozing skin and glittering eye, all of it was fine, just fine. Yes, these people were vulnerable and ignorant. Yes, they were probably crass, most of them, and bigoted and belligerent. But now, right now, they were laughing and cheering and holding their babies high to see the parade. And if she did not love them, she was at least happy to be of their species. 
Listen to me! Erwin yelled at her. The woman showed no sign of hearing, but the expression on her face gave Erwin hope that maybe she could be persuaded to hear. Her eyes had a lunatic gleam in them, and there was a twitching smile on her lips. He could not feel her temperature, but he was certain she was running a fever. Just tune in, will you? he hollered. Why are you bothering? Dolan wanted to know. Because she knows a damn sight more than we do, Erwin told him. She knew that thing in my house by name. I heard her call it Kisoon. What about him? Tesla said to Harry, throwing the question over her shoulder. What about who? Harry replied. You said Kisoon. I didn't say a word. Well, somebody did. She heard me! Erwin whooped. Good girl, good girl! Dolan was intrigued now. Maybe she'd hear better if we said it together, he suggested. Not a bad idea. After three. This time Tesla stopped. You didn't hear that either? She said, Harry. He shook his head. Okay, she said. No big deal. What are you talking about? She pushed through the crowd to an empty doorway, with Harry following. The store, a florist's, was closed, but the scent of flowers was powerful. There's somebody talking to me, Harry, besides you. His name's Toothacre. And where is he? I don't know, she said. I mean, I know he's dead. I was in his house. That's where I saw Kassoon. She kept scanning the crowd while she spoke, hoping to catch a glimpse of the presence, or rather presences, she'd heard. He's not alone this time. I heard two voices. They want to get through to me. I just don't know how to tune in. I'm no help, I'm afraid, Harry said. I'm not saying they're not here. It's okay, Tesla told him. I just have to listen. You want to find somewhere quieter? She shook her head. I might lose them. You want me to step away? Don't go far, she said, and closing her eyes, tried to shut out the din of the living and listen for the voices of the dead. Dorothy caught hold of Maisie's arm very tight. "'What's wrong?' Maisie said. "'I really don't—I don't feel too good at all,' Dorothy said. Her surroundings had started to throb in rhythm with a band, as though everything had a heart sewn inside it. Even the sidewalk, even the sky. And the closer the band came, the harder those hearts beat until it seemed they would surely burst, every one of them burst wide open, and tear a hole in the world. "'Shall I get you something to eat?' Maisie said. The drums were louder with every beat, booming and booming. "'Maybe a tuna salad, or—' Without warning, Dorothy bent double and puked. The knot of people in front of her parted, not quickly enough to keep themselves from being spattered, but fast, as she heaved up what little her stomach contained— Maisie waited until the spasms had stopped, then tried to coax her out of the sun into the shade of the diner. But she wouldn't go, or couldn't. "'It's going to burst,' she said, staring down at the ground. "'It's all right, Dottie.' "'No, it isn't. It's going to burst.' "'What are you talking about?' Dorothy shook off Maisie's grip. "'We've got to clear the street,' she said, stumbling forward. "'Quickly!' "'What's going on down there?' Owen said, leaning out of the window. "'Do you know that woman?' "'The one who just puked? Yeah, it's Mrs. Bullard. She's a real bitch.' "'Extraordinary,' Owen said. Dorothy was pushing and shoving her way through the crowd. She was yelling something, but Owen couldn't catch it over the din of the approaching band. "'She looks really upset,' Seth said. "'That she does,' Owen said, leaving the window and heading for the stairs. Maybe she saw the avatars, Seth yelled after him. The same thought occurred to me, Owen said. The very same. Dorothy Bullard's warning had not gone unheard by the crowd around Kitty's diner. As she strode forward, they cleared a path for her in case she intended to puke again. One girl, perhaps a little worse for drink, failed to get out of her way fast enough and was shoved aside as Dorothy charged the barricade. It fell before her, and she ran out into the middle of the crossroads, waving her hands wildly. At the head of his shining ranks, Larry Glodowski saw the Bullard woman flailing in front of him, and was presented with a choice. 
Either he brought the band, and thus the parade, to a halt in the next ten seconds, or trusted that somebody would have the presence of mind to get the bitch out of his way before there was a collision. In truth, it was no dilemma at all. She was one, they were many. He lifted his baton a little higher, and marked the beats with sharper motions than ever, as if to erase the woman from the street in front of him. I'm listening, Tesla murmured. I'm listening as hard as I can. Every now and then she heard what might have been a murmur, but her mind was whining with hunger and heat. Even if it was the ghosts speaking, she could make no sense of the sounds. And now there was yet another distraction, some kind of brouhaha up at the crossroads. The crowd had become more frenzied than ever. She went up on her tiptoes in the hope of seeing what was happening, but her sight was blocked by heads and balloons and waving hands. Harry had the scoop, however. There's a woman in the middle of the street yelling. Yelling what? Harry listened for a moment. I think she's telling people to get off the street. An instinct she would once have called Rowell's had her out of the doorway in a moment back into the swelter and stench of the crowd, pushing Harry ahead of her. Clear the way, she yelled to him. Why? It's the crossroads. It's something to do with the fucking crossroads. Do you see them? Seth said, as he and Owen carved their way to the front of the crowd. Owen didn't answer him. He was afraid if he opened his mouth he'd cry out, in hope, in pain, in expectation. He ducked under the barricade and out into the open street. This was the most dangerous of moments, he knew, when everything could be gained or lost. He hadn't expected it to come upon him so suddenly. Even now he wasn't certain this was indeed the moment of moments, but he had to act as though it were. The sun suddenly seemed merciless, beating on his bare head, softening his thoughts, and on the bare street, softening that too. It would flow soon, the way it had in the vision he'd shared with Seth, flow into the place where flesh met flesh, and the art ignited. "'Get away!' Dorothy yelled, turning to appeal to the crowd. "'Get away, before it's too late!' "'She has seen something,' Owen thought. There were people converging on the woman from all sides, intent on silencing her, but Owen put on a burst of speed to reach her first. "'It's all right,' he yelled as he went. "'I'm a doctor!' It was a trick he'd used before, and as before it worked. He was given clear access to the crazed woman. Larry saw the doctor wrap his arms around poor Dorothy and offered up a little prayer of thanks. Now all the guy had to do was get the Bullard woman out of the way. But quickly, quickly, and the rhythm of the band would not be broken. He heard somebody in the ranks calling, Larry, we gotta stop! Larry ignored the cry. They still had another ten strides before they would reach the spot where the doctor was talking to Dorothy. Nine now, but nine was plenty. Eight. What are you seeing? Owen demanded of the woman. It's all going to burst! She said to him, Oh, God, oh, God, it's all going to burst. What is? he asked her. She shook her head. Tell me, he yelled at her. The world, she said. The world! Harry had no difficulty clearing a way through the crowd for Tesla. Now he lifted the barricade, and she ducked under it, out into the open street, delivering her into the arena. There were perhaps a dozen players ahead of her, excluding the band, but only three were of significance. One was the woman at the very center of the crossroads, another the bearded man, who was presently talking to her, the third the young man a few yards ahead of her, who was calling out, Budenbaum! The bearded man glanced round at his companion, and Tesla had a clear look at his face. The expression he wore was grotesque, every muscle in his face churning, and his eyes blazed, Mine! he yelled, his voice shrill, and swung back towards the woman, who was in some delirious state of her own, her eyes rolling in her sockets. She started to pull herself free of Budenbaum, and in doing so, her blouse tore open from neck to belt, exposing bra and belly. She scarcely noticed, it seemed, but the crowd did. A roar rose from all sides, gasps, wolf whistles, and applause all mingled. Flailing, the woman stumbled away from Budenbaum. Larry couldn't believe it. Just as he thought things were in hand, Dorothy pulled away from the doctor, practically showing her all to the world in the process, and reeled round straight in front of the band. Larry yelled, Halt! But it was too late to prevent catastrophe. 
The Bullard woman collided with him, and he staggered backwards into the trumpet section. Two of the band members went over like bowling pins, and Larry fell on top of them. There was another roar from the spectators. Larry's spectacles had come off in the melee. Without them, the world was a blur. Detaching himself from the knot of trumpeters, he started to search the ground, patting the warm asphalt. "'Nobody move!' he yelled. "'Please, nobody move!' His plea went unheard. People were moving all around him. He could see their blurry forms. He could hear their shouts and curses. "'We're all going to die!' he heard somebody sob nearby. He was sure it was Dorothy, and good man that he was, forsook his search a moment to comfort her. But when he looked up from the street to seek out the blur that most resembled her, something else came into view. It was a woman, but she was not blurred, far from it. He could not have wished for a vision more perfectly in focus. She was not standing in the street, but hovering a little distance above it. No, not even hovering, standing. She was standing in the air with a silk robe loosely knotted around her. Very loosely, in fact. He could see her breasts. They were glossy and full, and a hint of what lay between her legs. He called out to her, "'Who are you?' But she didn't hear him. She just moved off, climbing the air, as though ascending a flight of invisible stairs. He started to get to his feet, wishing he could follow, and as he did so, she looked back, coquettishly, not at him, he knew, but at somebody whom she was coaxing to follow her. Oh, how she smiled at him, the lucky bastard, and plucked at her robe to tease him with a glimpse of her beautiful legs. Then she continued to climb, and a few steps up the flight seemed to encounter another woman, this one descending the contact briefly illuminating the second beauty. Larry, what was he seeing? I got your spectacles. Huh? Your spectacles, Larry? They were thrust in front of him, and he fumbled for them, not wanting to take his eyes off the woman. What the hell are you looking at? Don't you see them? See what? The women. Put your damn spectacles on, Larry. He did so. The world came into focus around him, in all its confusion— but the woman had gone. God, no! He pulled his spectacles off again, but the vision had escaped him into the bright summer sky. In the midst of this confusion, Dorothy Bullard escaping, Buddenbaum going after her, the band falling down like tin soldiers, Tesla had made her way to the center of the crossroads. It had taken her perhaps five seconds to do so, but in those seconds she had been assailed by a legion of sensations. Her spirits lifted one moment and dropped the next, her body racked and caressed by turns, as though whatever lay at the heart of the crossroads was testing her wits to breaking point. Clearly the town woman had failed the test. She was bawling like an abandoned child. Buddenbaum, however, was made of sterner stuff. He was standing a couple of yards from Tesla, staring down at the ground. "'What the fuck's going on?' she yelled to him. He didn't look up, didn't even speak. "'Can you hear me?' "'Not another step,' he said. Despite the cacophony and the fact that he spoke in a near whisper, she heard him as clearly as if he'd murmured in her ear. A terrible suspicion rose in Tesla, which she instantly voiced. "'Are you soon? she said. This certainly got his attention. Kassoon, he said, his lip curling. He's a piece of shit. What do you know about him? That answered her question plainly enough, but it begged another. If he wasn't Kassoon, but he knew who Kassoon was, then who was he? He's just some name I heard. His face was quite a sight, a mass of bulges about to burst. Some name, he said, reaching for her. Kassoon's not some name. She dearly wanted to retreat from him, but a part of her was irrationally possessive of this contested ground. She stood it, though he took hold of her by the neck. Who are you? She was afraid for her life. Tesla Bombeck, she said. You're Tesla Bombeck, he said, plainly amazed. Yes, she said, barely able to get the words out from under his thumbs. Do you mind— letting go. He drew her closer to him. Oh, God, he said with a twisted little smile on his face. You're an ambitious little bitch, aren't you? I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, you don't. You came to take away all I've worked for, and I haven't come to take anything, Tesla gasped. Liar, Buddenbaum said, tightening his hold on her neck. 
She reached up to his face and jabbed her finger in his eye, but he wasn't about to let go. The art's mine, he yelled. You can't have it. You can't. She had no breath left to contest her innocence, not much strength to fight him off. The world began to throb to the rhythm of her pulse, pulsing with every heartbeat. She kicked at his legs, hoping she might knock him off his feet, but he seemed to feel nothing, to judge by his unchanging face. He just kept saying, Mine! Mine! though his voice, like the whole world, was growing paler and thinner, preparing to disappear completely. "'Don't we know that woman?' somebody said nearby. "'I believe we do.' came the reply. She couldn't turn to see the speakers, but she didn't need to. She knew them by their voices. The leader of the phantoms she'd met in Toothaker's house was here, and not alone. Buddenbaum's face was barely visible now, but just before it flickered out completely, she saw him raise his eyes, looking past her at something nearby. He spoke, but the words were white noise. Then there was a burst of heat, and a red mark appeared above his right eye. She squinted hard, trying to make sense of it, but before she could do so, his fingers relaxed, and she slipped from his grasp. Her legs were too weak to bear her up. They folded beneath her, and down she went. She drew a breath as she collapsed, and her grateful brain rewarded her with a sliver of comprehension. Buddenbaum had been shot. The mark on his face was a bullet hole. She didn't have a chance to take satisfaction in the fact. When she struck the ground, her thoughts flickered out. One shot, and the crowd was in turmoil. Cheers turned to screams, laughter to panic. Suddenly people were running in every direction except towards the gunman and his victim. Damour slipped his gun into his jacket and started towards the middle of the street. The man he'd shot was still standing, despite the blood flooding from his brow, which fact supported the suspicion that there was magic here. Despite the sun, despite the crowds, a suit had been worked and was still being worked, in fact. The closer he got to the place where Tesla was lying, the more his ink itched. There were other signs, too, that he did his best to keep at bay. The ground under his feet seemed to brighten and shift when he looked at it, as though it was trying to flow towards the middle of the crossroads. And there was a brightness in the air, gossamer shapes moving across his field of vision, shedding beads of light. There was more here than an invocation, he knew, far more. Reality was soft here, and getting softer. Things meeting, intersecting, trying, perhaps, to flow together. If so, he had no doubt as to who was masterminding the affair. It was the man he'd just shot, who now, with consummate indifference, had actually turned his back on Harry and was studying the departing crowd. Harry turned his gaze on Tesla, who was lying quite still. "'Don't be dead,' he said to himself, and, almost closing his eyes completely to fend off the blandishments of sky and street, he stumbled on towards her. The avatars were here. Owen knew it. He could feel their eyes upon him, and it was a feeling like no other he knew, like being spied on by God, terrible and wonderful at the same time. He wasn't the only one feeling such confusions, he knew, though the crowd scattering around him did not possess the knowledge he possessed. They were all of them even the dullest and the dumbest, sensing something untoward. The shot that had wounded him had wounded them, too, in a different fashion, loosed a flood of adrenaline rather than blood, thus alerting their staled senses to signs they would have otherwise missed. He could see the recognition in their faces, wide with awe and terror. He could read it off their trembling lips. It wasn't the way he'd intended things, but he didn't care. Let them gape, he thought. Let them pray. Let them tremble. They'd have to do a lot more of that before this day of days was done. He gave up on looking for the avatars. As long as they were there, what did it matter what shape they'd taken, and went down on his haunches to touch the ground. Though there was blood running into his right eye, he could see better than he'd seen in his long life. The ground was turning to ether below him, the medallion buried far below him, blazing in its bed. He pressed his hand against the ground and let out a low moan of pleasure as he felt his fingers slip and slide down into the warm asphalt towards the cross. There were phenomena on every side, voices speaking out of the ether. Revenants, he thought, and why not? The more the merrier. Vague, wispy forms riding on the air to left and right of him. Too perfect for the past, surely. Perhaps the future, coming to find the moment when it ceased to matter. 
agitations in the ground and sky. He would paint the heavens with stone when he remade the world, and make the earth sprout lightning. So much happening, and all because of the object that lay inches from his fingers, the cross that had accrued the power to change the world, buried here at the crossroads. You're beautiful, he murmured to it, the way he might have cooed to a pretty boy. So, so beautiful. His fingers were almost there. Another foot and a half, no more. Erwin had followed Tesla as far as the edge of the crowd, but then, seeing the chaos in front of him, had held back. It was no use trying to speak to her in the midst of such tumult, he'd realized. Better to wait. Dolan had not been so reluctant. Ever eager for fun, he'd slipped through the barricade and out across the melting ground. He'd been inches from Dorothy Bullard when her blouse tore, cause for much hilarity, and had actually stood in the path of the bullet that had struck Buddenbaum, amused to see it pass straight through him. Suddenly the clowning had ceased. From his place on the sidewalk, Irwin saw Dolan's expression becoming troubled. He turned to Nordhoff, who was bending over the fallen Tesla, and let out a moaning word, Whoa! Nordhoff didn't reply. He was staring down at the wounded man, who was plunging his hand into too solid ground and as he stared his face grew longer as though he was about to be transformed into a dog or a camel. His nose lengthened, his cheeks puffed up, his eyes were sucked from his sockets. Oh, help! Dolan moaned, and turning on his heel started back towards the sidewalk. It wasn't safe terrain. Though Erwin was a good deal farther from the source of this phenomenon, he too felt something plucking at his self-invented flesh. The pockets of his coat were torn off, and a number of the keepsakes carried away towards the epicenter. His fingers were growing longer, his face, he was sure, the same. Dolan was in even worse condition. Though he was further from the hub than Nordhoff, Dickerson, and the rest, the claim of whatever force had been unleashed there was irresistible. He dropped to his knees and dug his nails into the ground, hollering at Irwin for help as he did so. But his matter had no purchase on the asphalt, and he was dragged back towards the hub, his body growing softer and longer until he began to resemble a stream of melting flesh coursing across the street. Erwin covered his ears to shut out the din of his shrieks, and retreated back down the rapidly emptying street. It was hard going. The power at the hub of the crossroads was growing apace, and with every step he took it threatened to overwhelm him and drag him to his destruction. But he resisted its claim with all his will, and after twenty yards he began to outpace it. After thirty, its hold on him was dwindling rapidly. After forty, he felt sufficiently confident to slow a little and look for Dolan. He'd gone. So had Nordhoff. So had Dickerson. So had they all. All melted and run away into the ground. The sound of sirens drew his gaze off down the street. Jed Gilholly was getting out of his car along with two of his officers, Cliff Campbell and Floyd Weeks, neither of whom looked very happy with their lot. Erwin didn't wait to see what the trio made of the forces awaiting them at the crossroads, or indeed what those forces made of them, but instead slipped away while the going was good. He had believed in the law once, valued it, served it, and trusted its power to regulate the world. But those certainties belonged to another life, and, like that life, had slipped away. 8. 1. When Tesla opened her eyes, Damour was already holding her to her feet. "'We've got more problems,' he said, nodding down the street. She started to follow his direction, but her gaze was distracted by the strange sights surrounding them, the band members crawling away on all fours like beaten animals, the remnants of the crowd, many of them sobbing uncontrollably, others praying the same way, standing or kneeling in a litter of forsaken belongings, purses, hot dogs, baby carriages. And beyond all this, the police approaching the crossroads with leveled guns. Stand still, one of them yelled. All of you, stand still. We'd better do it, Tesla said, glancing back towards Buddenbaum. He had both hands in the ground, up to his elbows, and he was working them in and out, in and out, with a motion she could not help but think of as sexual, easing open this hole in the solid world. The air around them all was as hazy as ever, and its contents as incomprehensible. "'What the fuck is he doing?' Damour murmured to her. "'He's after the art,' Tesla said. "'You two, shut up!' the lead officer yelled at them. Then to Buddenbaum, "'You, get up! I want to see your hands!' 
Budenbaum showed no sign of even hearing the order, much less obeying it. The order came a second time, with little variation. Again it was ignored. I'm going to count to three, Jed warned. Go on, Tesla muttered. Shoot the fucker. One. Jed continued his steady advance as he counted, his officers keeping pace with him. Two. Hey, Jed, Floyd Weeks said. Shut up. I don't feel so good. And Jed glanced round at Weeks. The man had gone the color of a urinal, and his eyes were swiveling up into his sockets. Don't do this, Jed ordered him. This order was no more obeyed than that he'd given Budenbaum. The gun fell from Weeks' trembling fingers, and he let out a gasp that was as much pleasure as it was capitulation, and he fell to his knees. I never knew, he murmured. Oh, God, why didn't... why didn't anybody tell me? Take no notice of him, Jed said to Cliff Campbell. The man obeyed, but only because he had delusions of his own to deal with. What's going on, Jed? he murmured. Where'd these women come from? What women? Jed said. They're all around us, Kimball babbled, turning as he spoke. Don't you see them? Gil Holly was about to shake his head when he let out a low moan. Oh, my lord, he said. Are you ready? the moor murmured to Tesla. As ready as I'll ever be. Harry went back to watching Gil Holly, who was fighting to keep a hold on his senses. This isn't happening he murmured, glancing over at Campbell for support. He got none. His deputy had fallen to his knees and was laughing to himself like a crazy. In desperation, Jed pointed his gun at the forms drifting in front of him. Stay out of my way, he yelled at them. I mean it. I'll use this if I have to. Let's go, Harry said, while he's distracted. And he and Tesla started away from the middle of the street. Jed saw their escape attempt. You, stay! He faltered in the middle of the order as if he'd forgotten the words. Oh, Jesus, he said, his voice trembling now. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Then finally he, too, dropped to his knees. In the middle of the street, Budenbaum let out a howl of frustration. Something was wrong here. One moment the crossroads had been melting beneath him, power flowing into its heart. The next, the taste he'd had in his tongue had soured, and the dirt was hardening around his arm. He pulled it out. It was like extracting his hand from the bowels of something dead or dying. A shudder of revulsion coursed through him, and stinging tears sprang into his eyes. Owen? The voice was Seth's, of course. He was standing a yard or two away, looking fretful and afraid. Has something gone wrong? Budenbaum nodded. Do you know what? Maybe this, Owen said, putting his hand up to his wounded head. Maybe it simply distracted me. Come away, Seth said. Owen raised his wounded head and studied the air. What do you see? he said. The women, you mean? Owen squinted. I just see bright shapes. Are they women? Yes. You're sure? Yes. Then it's some kind of conspiracy, he said. He reached up and grabbed hold of Seth's arm, putting himself to his feet. Somebody put them there to block the working. Oh, I don't know, Budenbaum said. Somebody who knows. He halted, turning his gaze in Tesla's direction. Bombeck, he murmured, then shouted, Bombeck! What's his problem? Harry said as Budenbaum started towards them. He thinks I'm here to take the art. Are you? Tesla shook her head. I saw what it did to the Jeff, she said, and he was ready for it, or thought he was. Budenbaum was closing on them. Harry went for his gun, but Tesla said, that's not going to stop him. Let's just get the hell out of his way. She turned from Budenbaum, only to find that in the seconds she'd been looking back, a little girl had stepped into their path and was studying them gravely. She was absurdly perfect, a petite, blonde, ringleted five-year-old in a white dress, white socks, and white shoes. Her face was rose-pink, her eyes huge and blue. Hello, she said, her voice sweet and cool. You're Tesla, aren't you? Tesla wasn't in any mood to be chatting to kids, however perfect they were. You should go find your mommy and daddy, she said. I was watching, the child said. This isn't a good thing to watch, honey, Demore said. Where are your mom and dad? They're not here. You're on your own? No, she replied. I've got Hawhead with me, and... Yeah. 
She glanced back towards the ice cream parlor. There, sitting on the step, was a man with the face of a born comedian, jug-eared, wall-eyed, rubber-mouthed, who had six cones of ice cream in his hands and was looking from one to another with a look of great concentration. Beside him was another child, this a boy, who looked nearly moronic. "'Don't worry about me,' the little girl said. "'I'm fine.' She studied Tesla carefully. "'Are you dying?' she said. Tesla looked at Demore. "'This is not a conversation I want to have right now.' "'But I do,' Miss Perfection said. "'It's important.' "'Well, why don't you ask somebody else?' "'Because it's you we're interested in,' the little girl replied gravely. She took a step towards Tesla, lifting her hand as she did so. "'We saw your face, and we said, "'She knows about the story tree.' "'About what?' The story tree, the child replied. What the fuck is she talking about? Tesla said to Demore. Never mind, came another voice, this from behind them. Tesla didn't need to look round to know it was Buddenbaum. His voice was curiously hollow, as though he was speaking from an empty chamber. You should have kept out of my business, woman. I've no interest in your business, Tesla said. Then, suddenly inquisitive, she turned to him. But just for the record, what is your business? Buddenbaum looked terrible, his face more bloody than not, his body trembling. That's for me to know, he said. At this, the little girl piped up. You can tell her, Owen, she said. Buddenbaum looked past Tesla at the child. I've no wish to share our secrets with this woman, he said stiffly. But we do, the child replied. Tesla studied Buddenbaum's face through the odd exchange, trying to decode its signs. Plainly he knew the girl well, and equally plainly was somewhat nervous of her, perhaps wary rather than nervous. Once again Tesla missed Raoul's incisive grasp of such signals. Had he been with her, she was certain he could have armed her with insights for whatever encounter lay ahead. "'You look sick,' Buddenbaum said. "'You and me both.' Tesla replied. "'Ah, but I'll mend,' Buddenbaum went on. "'You, on the other hand, are not long for this world.' He spoke lightly enough, but she couldn't miss the threat in the words. He was not simply prophesying death, he was promising it. "'I suggest you start making your farewells while you can.' "'Is this all part of it?' the little girl said. Tesla glanced back at her. She was wearing a coy little smile. Is it Owen? Yes, Buddenbaum said. It's all part of it. Oh, good, good. The child shifted her attention back to Tesla. We'll see you later, then, she said, stepping aside to let them pass. I don't think that's very likely, Tesla said. Oh, but we will, the girl said, for sure. We're very interested in you and the story tree. Tesla heard Buddenbaum mutter something behind her. She didn't hear what, and she was in no state of mind or body to make him repeat it. She simply returned the child's sweet smile, and with Harry at her side left the crossroads, with the sound of the officer's bewildered worship floating after them on the summer breeze. Two. Though it was next to impossible that news of what had happened at the crossroads had already reached the ears of every man, woman, and child in Everville, the streets Tesla and Harry walked to get back to Phoebe's house were preternaturally quiet, as though people had read the trembling air and judged silence the safest response. Despite the heat, doors were closed and windows shuttered. There were no children playing on the lawns or in the street. Not even dogs were showing their twitching noses. It was doubly strange because the day was so perfect, the air candied with summer flowers, the sky flawless. As they turned the corner onto Phoebe's street, out of the blue, Harry said, God, I love the world. It was such a simple thing to say, and it was spoken with such easy faith Tesla could only shake her head. You don't? Harry said. There's so much shit, she said. Not right this minute. Right this minute... It's as good as it gets. Look up the mountain, she said. I'm not up the mountain, Harry replied. I'm here. 
Good for you, she said, unable to keep the edge from her voice. He looked across at her. She looked, he thought, about as frail and weary as any living soul could look and still be living. He wanted to put his arm around her just for a little while, but he supposed she wouldn't thank him for the gesture. She was in a space all of her own, sealed off from comfort. It took her a little time fumbling with the spare keys Phoebe had given her before they gained access to the house. Once inside, she said, I'm going to go get some sleep. I can't even think straight. Sure. She started up the stairs, but turned back a couple of seconds later, staring down at Damore with those empty eyes of hers. By the way, she said, thank you. For what? For what you did on the mountain. I wouldn't be here. Lord, you know what I'm saying. I know, and there's no need. We're in this together. No, she said softly. I don't think that's how it's working out. If you're thinking about what the kid said to you, it's not the first time I've thought about it, Tesla said. I have been pushing myself to the limits for five years, Harry, and it's taken its toll. He started to say something, but she raised her hand to hush him. Let's not waste time lying to each other, she said. I've done what I can do, and I'm used up. Simple as that. I guess as long as I had Raoul in my head, I could pretend I was making sense of things, but now... Now he's gone, she shrugged. I don't want to carry on any longer. She tried a tiny smile, but it was misbegotten. She let it drop, and, turning her back on Harry, traipsed up to bed. Harry brewed himself some coffee and sat down in the living room among the out-of-date copies of TV Guide and the overfilled ashtrays to think things through. The coffee did its job. He was wide awake, despite the exhaustion in his limbs. He sat staring up at the ceiling and turned over the events that had brought him to this confounded state. He'd gone up the mountain, under the cover of mist and Voigt's tattoos, to search for Kassoon. But he'd not found the man, at least not in any form he recognized. Children, yes. The brothers Grimm, yes. A blessed man. Three crucified souls, and Tesla Bombeck, yes. But the man who'd murdered Ted Dusseldorf and Maria Nazareno had evaded him. He thought back to Morningside Heights, to that squalid room where his enemy had slept, wondering if perhaps there had been some clue to Kassoon's present form that had seemed inconsequential at the time. He recalled nothing useful. But he did remember the deck of cards he'd found there. He dug in his jacket pocket and brought them to light. Was there a clue here, he wondered, in these images? He cleared the coffee table and laid them out. Ape. Moon. Fetus. Lightning. Potent symbols, every one. Lighting, hand, torso, hole. But if it was a game, then he didn't know the rules, and if it wasn't a game, then what the hell was it? Barely conscious of what he was doing, he arranged and rearranged the cards in front of him, hoping some solution would appear. Nothing did. Despite the power of the symbols, or perhaps because of it, there was no clarity, just a sense that his mind was too lightweight to deal with such issues. He was in the midst of these musings when the telephone rang. The Cobb household did not believe in answering machines, it seemed, because the ringing went on uninterrupted until Harry picked up. There was a well-worn voice at the other end of the line. "'Is Tesla there?' the man said. Harry paused before replying, during which time the man said, "'It's urgent. I have to talk to her.' This time Harry recognized the speaker. "'Grillo?' he said. "'Who is this?' "'It's Harry.' "'Jesus, Harry, what are you doing there?' "'Same thing Tesla's doing.' "'Is she around?' "'She's asleep.' "'I have to talk to her. I've been calling all day.' Where are you? About five miles outside town. Which town? Everville, for God's sake! Now can I talk to her? Can't you call back in an hour or so? No! Grillo yelled, then more quietly. No. I need to talk to her now. Wait a minute, 
Harry said, and putting down the phone he went up to wake Tesla. She was slumped on the double bed, fully dressed. A look of such exhaustion on her sleeping face he couldn't bring himself to deny her the slumber she so plainly needed. It was a good thing. By the time he got back down into the hallway, the line was dead. Grillo had gone. 3. In sleep, Tesla found herself walking on an unearthly shore. Snow had lately fallen there, but she felt none of its chill. Light-footed, she wandered down to the sea. It was thick and dark, its turbulent waters scummy, and here and there she saw bodies in the surf, turning their stricken faces her way as if to warn her against entering. She had no choice. The sea wanted her and would not be denied. Nor, in truth, did she want to resist it. The shore was drear and desolate. The sea, for all its freight of corpses, was a place of mystery. It was only once she was wading into the surf, the waves breaking against her breasts and her belly, that her dreaming mind put words to what place this was, or rather one word, quiddity. The dream sea leapt up against her face when she spoke its name, and its undertow pulled at her legs. She didn't attempt to fight it, but let it lift her off her feet and carry her away like an eager lover. The waves, which were substantial enough at the shore, soon grew titanic. When they raised her up on their shoulders, she could see a wall of darkness at the horizon, the likes of which she remembered from her last moments in Kisun's loop. The Eid, of course. Mountains and fleas. Fleas and mountains. When they dropped her into their troughs, and she plunged below the surface, she glimpsed another spectacle entirely, vast shoals of fish moving like thunderheads below her, and weaving between the shoals luminous forms that were, she guessed, human spirits like herself. She seemed to see vestigial faces in their light, hints of the infants, lovers, and dying souls who were dreaming themselves here. She had no doubt as to which of the three she was. Too old to be a baby, too crazy to be a lover, there was only one reason why her soul was journeying here tonight. Miss Perfection had been right. Death was imminent. This was the last time she would sleep before her span as Tesla Bombeck was over. Even if she'd been distressed at this, she had no time to feel it. The adventure at hand demanded too much of her attention. Rising and falling on shoulder and in trough, she was carried on towards a place where the waters, for some reason she could not comprehend, grew so utterly calm, they made an almost perfect mirror for the busy sky. She thought at first she was alone in these doldrums, and was about to test her powers of self-propulsion, in order to escape them, when she realized that a light was flickering beneath her. She looked down into the water and saw that some species of fish with luminous flesh had congregated in the deep and was now steadily rising towards the surface. When she raised her head from the water again, she found that she was not alone. A long-haired, bearded man was casually crouching on the water as though it were as solid as a rock, idly creating ripples on the glassy surface. He had been there all along, she assumed, and she'd missed him. But now, as if roused from some reverie by her gaze, he looked up. His face was scrawny, his bones sharp, his black eyes sharper, but the smile he offered was so sweetly tentative, as though he was a little embarrassed to have been caught unawares, that she was instantly charmed. He rose, the water dancing around his feet, and ambled over to her. His water-soaked robes were in tatters, and she could see that his torso was covered with small, pale scars, as though he'd been wrestling in broken glass. She sympathized with his condition. She, too, was scarred, inside and out. She, too, had been stripped of all she'd worn in the world—her profession, her self-esteem, her certainty. "'Do we know each other?' he said to her as he approached. His voice lacked music, but she liked the sound of it nevertheless. No, she said, suddenly tongue-tied, I don't believe so. Somebody spoke of you to me, I'm certain. Was it Fletcher, perhaps? You know Fletcher? Then it was, the man said, smiling again. You're the one who martyred him. I hadn't thought of it that way, but yes, I guess that was me. 
You see, he said, he went down on his haunches beside her, while the water buoyed her up. You wanted connections, and they're there to be found. But you have to look in the terrible places, Tesla, the places where death comes to take love away, where we lose each other and lose ourselves. That's where the connections begin. It takes a brave soul to look there and not despair. I've tried to be brave, she said. I know, he said softly. I know. But I wasn't brave enough, is that what you're saying? The thing is, I didn't ask to be part of this. I wasn't ready for it. I was just going to write movies, you know, and get rich and smug. I guess that sounds pathetic to you. Why? Well, I don't suppose you get to see a lot of movies. You'd be surprised, the man said, with a little smile. Anyway, it's the stories that matter, however they're told. She thought of the child at the crossroads. We saw your face, and we said, she knows about the story tree. What's the big deal about stories? she said. You love them, he said, his gaze leaving her face and slipping down to the water. The glowing forms she'd seen rising from below were within a few fathoms of the surface now. The water was beginning to simmer with their presence. You do, don't you? he said. I suppose I do, she said. That's what the connections are, Tesla. Stories? Stories. And every life, however short, however meaningless, it seems, is a leaf. A leaf. Yes, a leaf. He looked up at her again and waited, unspeaking, until she grasped the sense of what he was saying. On the story tree, she said. He smiled. Lives are leaves on the story tree. Simple, isn't it? He said. The bubbles were breaking all around them now, and the surface was no longer glacial enough to bear him up. He started to sink into the water, slowly, slowly. I'm afraid I have to go, he said. The shoe have come for me. Why do you look so unhappy? Because it's too late, she said. Why did I have to wait until now to know what I was supposed to do? You didn't need to know. You were doing it. No, I wasn't, she said, distressed now. I never got to tell a story I gave a damn about. Oh, but you did, he said. He was almost gone from sight now. What story was that? she begged him, determined to get an answer before he disappeared. What? Your own, he told her, slipping from sight. Your own. Then he was gone. She stared down into the bubbling water and saw that the creatures he'd called the shoe, which resembled cuttlefish as far as she could see, and were congregated below her in their many millions, were describing a vast spiral around the sinking man as though drawing him down into their midst. The vortex made no claim on her spirit stuff, however. She felt a pang of loss, watching him disappear into the bright depths. He had seemed wise, and she had wanted to speak to him longer. As it was, she had something to take back with her, the observation that the story she'd told was her own. It meant little to her right now, but perhaps if she succeeded in carrying it into the waking world, it would comfort her. And now, as the spiral of Shu faded into the depths, there was news from that world, a telephone ringing, and then the sound of footsteps on the stairs. Tesla, she opened her eyes. Harry had his head around the door. That's Grillo, he said. He needs to talk to you. He's called once already. She vaguely remembered hearing a telephone ring as she'd wandered the snowy shore. Sounds like he's in bad shape. She got up and went downstairs. There was a stub of pencil beside the telephone. Before she spoke to Grillo, she wrote, I told my own story on the telephone directory in case the conversation drove the dream from her head. Then she picked up the receiver. Just as Harry had said, Grillo sounded to be in bad shape. Terrible shape, in fact. Like her, Demur, like the water walker in her dream. It was as though everybody around her was winding down. I'm at a place called the Sturgis Motel, he explained, with Howie, Joe Beth, and their kid Amy. Where? A few miles outside Everville. What the hell are you doing there? We had no choice. We had to move quickly, and I knew we were going to need serious help. To do what? Tommy Ray's coming after Joe Beth. Tommy Ray? Grillo began to relate to her the events of the last few days. She gave all but five percent of her attention to the account, the remaining portion dedicated to holding on to the dream from which she'd awakened. But the images of terror and flight that spilled from Grillo 
steadily supplanted her memories of the becalmed sea and of the man who had known Fletcher. "'I need your help, Tess,' Grillo was saying. She clung to the memory of the water-walker's face for a few desperate moments. "'Tess, are you there?' Then she had no choice but to let it go. "'Yeah, I'm here. I said I need some help. You don't sound so good, Nathan. Did you get hurt? It's a long story. Look, give me your address. We'll drive into town.' She flashed on the swathed Tommy Ray, the death boy, along with his army of phantoms, had cut through Paloma Grove. Hadn't he brought down his own house and his enthusiasm for destruction with his mother inside it? If he was unleashed in Everville, especially at a time of mass exodus, which couldn't be far off, the death toll would be appalling. Stay where you are, she said. I'll come to you. Grillo didn't argue. He was clearly too desperate to have her with him as soon as possible. He gave her the motel's whereabouts and urged her to be quick. That was that. Harry was in the kitchen, burning toast. She told him all that Grillo had said. He listened without comment until she got to the part about her leaving. So Everville's my baby now, he said. It looks that way. She wanted to tell him that she'd dreamed her final dream and that he should not expect her to return, but that sounded hopelessly melodramatic. What she needed was something pithier, a throwaway line that would seem blasé and wise when she was gone. But nothing came to mind. As it was, Harry had a farewell of his own to offer. "'I'm thinking I might go back up the mountain after dark,' he said. "'If the Eod's coming through, I may as well get a ringside view, which means we probably won't be seeing each other again.' "'No, I suppose not. We've had quite a time of it, haven't we? I mean, our lives, they've been weird. Extraordinary, Harry said. She shrugged. It was true, of course. I'm sure we've both wished it could have been different, but I guess somewhere deep down we must have wanted it this way. I guess. The exchange faltered there. Tesla looked up and saw that Harry was staring straight at her, his lips pinched together as though to keep from weeping. Enjoy the sights, she said. I will, he replied. You take care. She broke the look between them, went to pick up her jacket, and headed outside. As she reached the front door, she almost turned round and went back to embrace him, but she resisted. To do so would only extend the agony. Better be gone now, and off on the open road. The parade-watching crowds had long since vacated Main Street, but there were still plenty of people out and about, shopping for souvenirs or looking for somewhere to eat. The evening was balmy, the sky still cloudless, the party atmosphere a little subdued by the fiasco of the afternoon, but not vanquished altogether. An earlier Tesla might have brought her Harley to a screeching halt in the middle of Main Street and yelled herself hoarse, trying to get people to leave before the E had came, but she knew better than to waste her breath. They'd shrug, laugh, and turn their backs on her, and in truth she could scarcely blame them. She'd caught her reflection in the bathroom mirror just before she'd left Phoebe's house. The lean woman she'd admired a few days before, the woman marked by her journey, the woman proud of her scars, was now a bag of bones and despair. Besides, what use would such warnings be, even if they were attended to? If the Eod was indeed all it had been promised to be, then there was no escape from it. Perhaps these people, celebrating in the shadow of death and snuffed out before they even knew what force had snuffed them, would be thought the lucky ones in time, gone too quickly to fear or hope, worst of all, hope. Though it was a detour to return to the crossroads, she did so, just to see what clues, if any, remained to the mysteries of the afternoon. Though the streets had been given back to traffic, there were very few cars passing in either direction. There was foot traffic, however, and plenty of it people lingering outside the diner and in front of the crossroads. A few even had their cameras out to immortalize the spot. Of the people Tesla had last seen on their knees here, praying to the visions they were witnessing, there was now no sign. They had gone home or been taken. As she was putting her helmet back on, she heard a shout from the opposite side of the street and turned to see her nemesis from Kitty's diner, Bosley the Righteous, striding towards her. "'What did you do?' he yelled, his face blotchy with rage. "'About what?' she said. "'You had a hand in this abomination,' he said. "'I saw you right in the middle of it.' He halted a couple of yards from her, as though fearful she might infect him with her godlessness. "'I know what you're up to.' "'You want to explain it to me?' she snapped. 
And don't give me some shit about the devil's work, Bosley, because you don't believe that any more than I do, not really. He flinched, and she saw such fear in him, such a profundity of dread, that the rage went out of her, drained away from her all at once. You know what, she said, I think I met Jesus this afternoon. Bosley looked at her warily. At least he was walking on water, and he had a lot of scars, so it could have been him, right? Still Bosley said nothing. I'm sorry we didn't get round to talking about you, but if we had, I'd have said he should drop by your place sometime, have a piece of pie. You're crazy, Bosley said. You and me both, Tesla said. Take care of yourself, Bosley. And with that, she put on her helmet and drove off. Once she was outside the town limits, she gunned the bike, certain that the chief of police and his awestruck deputies would not be watching out for speed freaks tonight. She was right. With an empty road and no law-keepers to flag her down, she roared on her way as though to meet with Grillo, though the embrace that awaited her at the end of this ride was colder and more permanent than human arms could ever offer. 9. 1. There would be other years, Dorothy Bullard thought, as she sat in a mildly sedated haze beside her living room window. Other festivals, other parades, other chances for things to be perfect. She had a mercifully confused memory of what had happened at the crossroads, but she'd been assured by a number of kind folks that it had not been her fault, no, not at all. She'd been under a lot of pressure, and she'd done a fine job, a wonderful job, and next year, oh, next year, it'll be perfect. "'What did you say, dear?' Maisie had just come in with some fluffy scrambled eggs and a little bran muffin. "'Next year everything will be perfect, you'll see.' "'Let's not even think about next year,' Maisie said. "'Let's just take things as they come, shall we?' For Larry Glodowski it was not pills that were keeping the memories hazy, it was beer, and plenty of it. He had been propped up at Hamrick's Bar for two and a half hours now, and he was finally getting to feel a little better. It was not what he'd seen at the crossroads he was dulling with alcohol. It was the pain of their departure. The women on the stairs had given him a glimpse of bliss. He'd thought his heart would crack with loss when they faded and disappeared. "'You want another of those?' Will Hamrick asked him. "'Keep em coming. You want to talk about it?' Larry shook his head. "'None of it makes much sense,' he said. Will passed another bottle down the bar. "'I had a guy in here the day before yesterday. It really spooked me,' he said. Like how? It was just after Morton Cobb died. He was saying how it was better that he'd been killed that way, because it was a better story. A better story? Yeah, and I was a—what the fuck did he call me? A disseminator, I think that was it. Yeah, a disseminator. And people liked to hear really brutal stories. He lost his way in the midst of his recollections and threw up his hands. I don't know. He just seemed like a sick son of a bitch. He had this voice. It was kind of like a hypnotist or something. The notion rang a bell. "'What did he look like?' Larry asked. "'About sixty, maybe. Had a beard. Broad guy, wearing black. "'That's him,' Will said. "'You know him?' "'He was there this afternoon,' Larry said quickly. "'I think he was the one who fucked everything up. "'Somebody should talk to Jed about him.' "'Jed,' Larry growled. "'He's no damn good to anyone.' He chugged on his beer. "'I'm going to talk to some of the band. "'They were really pissed with what happened this afternoon.' "'Be careful, Larry,' Will advised. "'You don't want Jed on your back for taking the law into your own hands.' Larry leaned over the bar until he was almost nose to nose with Will. "'I don't give a shit,' he slurred. "'Something's going on in this city, Hamrick, and Jed's not got a handle on it.' "'And you have?' Larry dug in his pocket and tossed three tens over the counter. "'I will have soon enough,' he said, pushing off from the bar and heading for the door. I'll give you a call, tell you when we're ready for action. Elsewhere in town, a fair appearance of normality had been re-established. In the town hall, the first partners for the waltz were already warming up. At the library annex, which had only been completed two months ago, Jerry Totland, a local author who'd made a nice reputation for himself, penning mysteries set in Portland, was reading from his newest opus. In the little Italian restaurant on Blaisemont Street, there was a line of twenty customers waiting to taste the glories of Neapolitan cuisine. There were mutterings, of course, rumors and gossip about what had brought the parade to a halt that afternoon, but by and large they simply added a little piquancy to the evening's exchanges. 
there was little genuine unease, more a mild amusement, especially among the visitors, that the event had gone so hopelessly awry. It would be a story to dine out on, wouldn't it, when they got back home? How Everville had overstepped itself and fallen flat on its ambitious face? 2. After the horrors of the afternoon, Irwin had not known what to do with himself. He had lost, in one fell swoop, all the friends he'd had, as surely as if they'd been massacred at the dinner-table. He had no real comprehension of what had happened at the crossroads, nor did he really want to know. Death had shown him some strange sights in the last few days, and he'd quickly learned to take them in his stride. But this was beyond him. He wandered the streets like a lost dog for a couple of hours, looking for some place to sit and listen to a conversation that did not remind him of his fear. But everywhere he looked for solace, he found people talking in whispers about the things that discomforted him. Few of these exchanges were overtly concerned with the events of the afternoon, but all of them had been inspired by it, he was certain. Why else were people confessing their sins to their loved ones tonight, asking for forgiveness or understanding? They had smelled their mortality today, and it had made them maudlin. He passed from one place to another, looking for solace, and, finding none, he returned at dusk to the only place he was certain to get some peace and quiet, the cemetery. There he wandered among the tombs as the sun set, idly perusing the epitaphs, and turning over events that had brought him to this sorry state. What had he done to deserve it? Wanted a little fame for himself? Since when had that been a capital crime? Dug too deep into secrets that should have been left to lie? That was no sin either, not that he knew of. He'd simply had a patch of bad luck. He took a seat at last on a tombstone close to the tree where he'd first met Nordhoff and the rest. His gaze fell on the stone in front of him, and he read aloud to himself the inscription there. What Thomas doubted, I believe, that from death's hand there is reprieve. That, I, laid here, will one day rise, and smell the wind, and meet the skies. My hope is tender, though, and must be kept from harm by those that dust has blinded. So I pray, deliver me from the faithless kin of doubting Tom. The simplicity and the vulnerability of the words moved him deeply. As he reached the end of the poem, his voice thickened, and tears came, copious tears, pouring down. He buried his face in his hands and rocked back and forth, unable to stop weeping. What was the use of living in hope of life after death, if all it amounted to was this absurd empty round? It was unendurable. Is the poem so bad? said a voice somewhere above him. He looked over his shoulder. The tree was in its last lushness before autumn, its branches thick with leaves, but he caught a glimpse of somebody moving up there. "'Show yourself,' he said. "'I prefer not to,' came the reply. "'I learned a long time ago that there's safety in trees.' "'Don't kid yourself,' Erwin said. "'What's the problem?' "'I want to be back in the world.' "'Oh, that,' said the man in the tree. "'It cannot be had, so don't break your heart wanting it.' There was a shaking of the canopy as the man adjusted his position. "'They've gone, haven't they?' he said. "'Who?' Oh, the fools who used to gather here, Nordhoff and Dolan, he practically spat the word Dolan out, and the rest. I came down the mountain to finish my business with them, but I don't see them, and I don't smell them. No? No, all I see is you. Where did they go? It's difficult to explain, Erwin said. Do your best. He did, described all that he'd seen and felt at the crossroads, though his lawyerly vocabulary was barely adequate. It was the unburdening he'd sought, and it felt good. So they were whisked away, huh? That's what it looked like, Erwin said. It was bound to happen, the occupant of the tree said. There was a bloody business started here, and it had to be finished sooner or later. I know what you're talking about, Erwin said. I read a confession. Whose? His name was McPherson. The man loosed a guttural growl that made Irwin shudder. "'Don't speak that name,' he said. "'Why not?' "'Just don't!' the man roared. "'Anyway, it's not his atrocities I was referring to. There was another slaughter up on Harmon's Heights, before it ever had a name, and I've waited a long time to see its consequences.' "'Who are you?' Irwin said. "'Why are you hiding up there?' 
I think you've seen enough strangeness for one day, the man replied, without laying eyes on me. I can deal with it, Erwin replied. Show yourself. There was silence from the tree for a few moments. Then the man said, As you wish. And the foliage sighed as he clambered down into view. He wasn't so strange, scarred, certainly, and somewhat bestial, but he resembled a man. There, he said, when he reached the bottom of the tree, now you see me. I'm glad to know you, Erwin said. I was afraid I was going to be alone. What's your name? Erwin Toothaker. And yours? The wounded beast inclined his head. I am pleased to meet you, he said. My name is Coker Amiano. Part Six The Grand Design One. One. It took Musnikov an hour or more to prepare his mistress for the journey out into the chilly streets of Liverpool, during which time Phoebe was given permission to wander the house. It was a melancholy trek. The rooms were, for the most part, beautifully appointed, the beds vast and inviting, the bathrooms positively decadent, but there was dust on every surface and gull shit on every window, a sense everywhere of the best times having passed by. There was no sign of the individuals who had lived in this house, who had admired the view from its windows or laid their heads on its pillows. Had they dreamed? Phoebe wondered. And if so, of what? Of the world that she'd come from? It amused her at first, thinking that the people who'd lived in these fine rooms might have yearned for the cosm the way she'd yearned for some unreachable dream-place. But the more she pondered it, the more melancholy it seemed, that people on both sides of the divide lived in discontent, wishing for the other's lot. If she survived this journey, she thought, she would return to Everville, determined to live every moment as it came, and not waste time pining for some sweet far away. When she emerged from one of the bedrooms, she looked into a mirror in the hallway and told herself aloud, "'Enjoy it while you can, every minute of it.' "'What did you say?' Musnikov asked her, stepping from a doorway along the passage. She was embarrassed to have been caught this way. "'How long have you been watching me?' she wanted to know. "'Only a moment or two, he replied. "'You make a fine sight, Phoebe Cobb. There's music in you.' "'I'm tone-deaf,' she told him a little sharply. "'There's music and music,' Usnikov replied. "'Your spirit sings even if your throat doesn't. "'I hear drums when I look at your breasts, "'and a choir when I think of you naked.' "'She gave him the forbidding stare "'that had terrorized a thousand tardy patients, "'but it didn't work. "'He simply grinned at her, his decorated cheeks twinkling. "'Don't be offended,' he said. "'This house had always been a place "'where people talk plainly about such matters.' "'Then I'll talk plainly, too,' Phoebe said. "'I don't appreciate you ogling me when my back's turned, "'and drums or no drums, I'll thank you not to look at my breasts.' "'Do you not like your breasts?' "'That's between me and my breasts,' Phoebe said, "'realizing as the words came out how absurd they sounded. "'Musnikov erupted with laughter, and try as she might, "'Phoebe could not help but let go a tiny smile herself, "'the sight of which only made Musnikov gush further. "'I'll say it again.' Musnikov told her, "'This house has seen many fine women, but you are among the finest, the very finest.' It was so nicely said, she could not help but be flattered. "'Well,' she said, "'thank you.' "'The pleasure's mine,' Musnikov said. "'Now, if you're ready, the mistress's bearers have arrived. I believe it's time we all went down to the water.' Two. It took less than an hour of travelling on the road to Beketer Sabat, for Joe to lose most of his sympathy for the refugees flooding in the opposite direction. He witnessed countless acts of casual cruelty in that time. Children more heavily burdened than their parents, whipped along. Animals abused and beaten into a frenzy. Rich men and women hoisted up onto the backs of imperious cousins to the camel, cutting a bloody swan through those careless enough to stumble into their path. In short, all that he might have expected to see in the cosm. When these sorry spectacles became too much, however, he simply set his sights on the city itself, and his weary limbs found fresh strength. The people who had lived in Beketer Sabat were as petty and barbarous as the citizens of any terrestrial city, but the edifice they were vacating was without parallel.
As for the wave of the Eid, it seethed and divided, but did not advance. It simply hovered over the city like a vast beast, mesmerized by something in its shadow. He only hoped that he could reach the city and walk its streets and climb its blazing towers before the Eid's interest staled and it delivered the coup de grace. As he came within a quarter mile of the nearest ladders, the city looming like an inverted mountain before him, he heard a shrill shout above the din, and an ashen creature dug its way through the throng to block his way. Afrik, he said, Afrik, you're alive! The creature laid his webbed hands upon Joe's chest. You don't know me, do you? No, should I? I was on the ship with you! the man said, and now Joe recognized him. He was one of the slaves Noah had seconded to crew the Fenacapan, a broad, burly fellow with sluggish, frog-like features. His manner, now that he was once again his own man, belied his appearance. He had a quick, lively quality about him. "'My name's Wexel Fee, Afrique, he said, covered in smiles, "'and I am very glad to see you, very, very glad.' "'I don't know why,' Joe said. "'You were treated like shit.' I heard what you said to Noah Summer Summamentus. You tried to do something for us. It's not your fault. You failed. I'm afraid it is, Joe said guiltily. Where are the others? Dead. All of them? All. I'm sorry. Don't be. They weren't friends of mine. Why did you not die, and they did? Noah said when he was done with you. I know what he said. I heard that, too. I have very sharp ears. I also have a strong will. I was not ready to die. So you heard, but you couldn't act for yourself? Exactly so. I'd lost my will to his suit. So you were hurting. Oh, yes, I was hurting. Fee lifted his right hand into view. Two of his six fingers were reduced to gummy stumps. And I would have gladly killed the man when I woke. Why didn't you? He is mighty a freak. Now he's back in Beketisabat. Well, I am very far from home. He looked past Joe now, towards the sea. There are no ships, Wexel. What about the Fanakapan? I saw it sink. He took the news philosophically. Ah, so perhaps I did not outlive the others so that I could go home. He made the first smile Joe had seen on this woeful road. Perhaps I try to meet you again, Afrik. My name's Joe. I heard my enemy call you by that name, Fee replied. Therefore I cannot use it. This is the etiquette in my country, so I will call you Afrique. Joe didn't much like the dubbing, but this was no time to offend the man. And I will come with you back to Baketa Sabat, yes? I'd certainly like your company, Joe said. But why would you want to come? Because there are no ships, because I found you in a crowd of ten thousand souls, and because you may be able to do what I could not. Kill Noah. From your lips, Afrique. From your lips. 3. The caravan that descended the steep hill from the house on Canning Street was nine souls strong. Phoebe and Musnikoff, both on foot. Mave O'Connell, travelling in an elaborate sedan chair, borne by four sizable men, plus an individual leading the way and one tagging along behind, both of them very conspicuously armed. When Phoebe remarked upon this, Musnikoff simply said, these are dangerous days. Who knows what's loose? Which was not the most reassuring of replies. Come walk alongside me, Maeve said as they went. It's time you kept your side of the bargain. Tell me about the Cossum. No, forget the Cossum. Just tell me about my city. First, said Phoebe, I've got a question. What is it? Why did you dream this city instead of another Everville? I was a child in Liverpool and full of hope. I remember it fondly. I didn't remember Everville the same way. But you still want to know what's happened to it? Phoebe pointed out. So I do, Maeve replied. Now tell. Without knowing what aspect of Evervillian life would most interest the woman, Phoebe began a scattershot account of life at home. The festival, the problems with the post office, the library annex— Jed Gilholly, the restaurants on Main Street, Kitty's Diner, the old schoolhouse, and the collection it contained, the problems with the sewage system. Wait, wait, Maeve said. Go back a little. You spoke of a collection. Yes. It's about the history of Everville, you say? That's right. And you're familiar with it? 
I wouldn't say, yet you didn't know who I was. Maeve said, her face more pinched than ever. I find that strange. Phoebe kept her silence. Tell me, what do they say about the way Everville was founded? I don't exactly remember, Phoebe replied. Suddenly the virago started to yell, Stop! Everybody stop! The little procession came to a ragged halt. Maeve leaned out of her chair and beckoned Phoebe closer. Now listen, woman, Maeve said. I thought we had a bargain. We do. So why aren't you telling me the truth, huh? I don't want to hurt your feelings, Phoebe said. Mary, mother of God, I've sufferings to my name, the likes of which— She stopped and started to pull at the collar of her robe. Musnikov started to say something about not catching cold, but she gave him such a venomous look he was instantly silenced. Look at this, she said to Phoebe, exposing her neck. There was a grievous scar running all the way around her neck. You know what that is? It looks like... Well, it looks like somebody tried to hang you. They tried, and they succeeded. Left me swinging from a tree along with my child and my husband. Phoebe was appalled. Why? she said. Because they hated us and wanted to be rid of us, Maeve said. Musnikov, cover me up. He instantly set to doing so while Maeve continued her story. I had a very strange, sour child, she said, who loved nothing in all the world, certainly not me, nor his father, and over the years people came to hate him in return. As soon as they had reason to lynch him, they took it and took my poor husband, too. Coker wasn't of the Cosm, you see. He'd come there for my sake, and he learned to be more human than human, but they still sniffed something in him they didn't like. As for me, she turned her head from Phoebe and peered down the hill. As for you, Phoebe said, I was what they wanted to forget. I was there at the beginning. No, that's not right. I was the beginning. I was Everville, sure as if it had been built of my bones. And it didn't suit the Brawleys and the Gilhollies and the Hendersons and all the other fine upstanding families to remember that. So they murdered you for it? They turned a blind eye to a lynching, Maeve said. That's murder, I'd say. Why aren't you dead? Because the bow broke. Simple as that. My sweet loving Coker was not so lucky. His bow was strong, and by the time I came out of my faint, he was cold. That's horrible. I never felt love for any creature the way I felt love for him, Maeve said. As she spoke, Phoebe felt a mild tremor in the ground. Musnikov apparently felt it, too. He turned to his mistress with a look of alarm. "'Maybe it would be best not to speak of this,' he said, "'not out in the open.' "'Oh, pish!' Maeve said to him. "'He wouldn't dare touch me, not for telling what he knows is the truth.' The exchange puzzled Phoebe, but she didn't let it distract her from her questions. "'What about your son?' Phoebe said. "'What happened to him?' "'His body was taken by beasts.' He always had a stench to him. I dare say he made a better meal than Coker or me. She pondered for a moment. This is a terrible thing to say about your own flesh and blood, but the fact is my son was not long for this world one way or another. Was he sick? In his head, yes, and in his heart. Something in him had curdled when he was a child, and I thought for the longest time he was a Cretan. I gave up trying to teach him anything, but there was malice in him, I think. Terrible malice, and he was best dead. She gave Phoebe a sorrowful look. Do you have children? She said, No. Count yourself lucky, Maeve replied. Then, abruptly shaking off her melancholy tone, she waved Phoebe away, shouting, Rouse yourselves! to her bearers, and the convoy went on its way, down the steep hill. The state of the dream sea had changed considerably in the hours in which Phoebe had been a guest in Maeve's house. The ships in the harbour no longer lay peaceably at anchor, but pitched and bucked, tearing at their moorings like panicked thoroughbreds. The beacons that had been burning at the harbour entrance had been extinguished by the fury of the waves, which mounted steadily as the party descended. "'I begin to think I'll not be able to keep my end of the bargain,' Maeve said to Phoebe once they were on flat ground. "'Why not?' "'Use your eyes,' Maeve replied, pointing down towards the beach, where the breakers were ten or twelve feet high. I don't think I'll be speaking to the shoe down there. Who were the shoe? Tell her, Maeve instructed Musnikov. And you, set me down. Once again the convoy came to a halt. Help me out of this contraption, Maeve demanded. The bearer sprang to do just that. Do you need help? Musnikov asked her. 
If I do, I'll ask for it, Maeve replied. Get on with educating the woman, though Lord knows it's a little late. Tell me who the shoe are, Phoebe said to Musnikov. Not who what, Musnikov replied, his gaze drifting off towards his mistress. What is she doing? We're having a conversation here, Phoebe snapped. She's going to do herself some harm. I'm going to be doing some harm of my own if you don't finish what you were saying. The shoe— Our spirit pilots, pieces of the Creator, or not. There, satisfied? He made to go to his mistress's side, but Phoebe caught hold of him. No, she said, I'm not satisfied. Unhand me, he said, sniffily. I will not. I'm warning you, he said, jabbing a beringed finger at her. I've got more important business than— A puzzled look crossed his face. Did you— Feel that? The tremor, you mean? Yeah, there was one a few minutes ago. Some kind of earthquake. I wish it were, Musnikov said. He stared at the ground between them. Another tremor came, this the strongest so far. What is it, then? Phoebe said, her irritation with Musnikov forgotten. She got no answer. The man just turned his back on her and hurried away to the spot on the cobbled stones where Maeve was standing. She could not do so without help. Two of her bearers were supporting her, and a third waiting behind in case she should topple. "'We must move on,' Musnikov called to her. "'Do you know what happened on this spot?' she said to him. "'Lady, do you?' "'No. This is where I was standing when he first came to find me.' She smiled fondly. "'I told him right at the beginning. I said to him, "'There'll never be anyone to replace my coker, because coker was the love of my life.' At this the ground shook more vehemently than ever. "'Hush yourself,' Musnikov said. "'What?' said Mr. O'Connell. "'Hushing me? I should beat you for that!' She raised her stick and swung at Musnikov. The blow fell short of its mark, and Maeve lost her balance. Her bearers might have saved her from falling, but she was in a fine fury and kept flailing even as she toppled. The stick struck the bearer to her right, and he went down, bloody-nosed. The man who had been watching over her from behind stepped in to catch hold of her, but as he did so, she took another stumbling step towards Musnikov, swinging again. This time she connected, the blow so hard her stick broke. Then she went down, carrying the bearer to her left, who had not relinquished his hold on her for an instant, down with her. As she struck the ground, her fall cushioned by the sheer profusion of her shirts and coats, the ground shuddered yet again, but this time the tremor did not die away. It continued to escalate, turning over the unattended sedan, and sending the guard who had been leading the procession scurrying back up the hill. "'Damn you, woman!' Musnikov hollered to Maeve as he went to help pick her up. "'Now look what you've done!' "'What's happening?' Phoebe yelled. "'It's him!' Musnikov said. "'He heard her! I knew he would!' "'King Texas?' Before Musnikov could reply, the street shook from end to end, and this time the ground cracked open. These were not fissures like those Phoebe had skipped on Harmon's Heights. There was nothing irregular about them, nothing arbitrary. They were elegantly shaped, carving arabesques in the paving, and everywhere joining up, so that within moments the entire street looked like an immense jigsaw puzzle. "'Everybody stay where they are,' Musnikov said, his voice trembling. "'Don't anybody move!' Phoebe did as she was instructed. "'Tell him you're sorry!' Musnikov yelled to Maeve. "'Quickly!' With the help of her two conscious bearers, the woman had got to her knees. "'I've got nothing to apologize for,' Maeve said. "'God, you are a stubborn woman!' Musnikov roared and raised his arm as if to strike her. "'Don't!' Phoebe yelled at him. She'd lost most of her patience with Maeve in the last half-hour, but the sight of her about to be struck brought back painful memories. She had no sooner spoken than the divided ground shook afresh, and pieces of the jigsaw fell away, leaving holes three, four, even five feet across in a dozen places. The chill out of them made the icy air seem balmy. "'I told you,' Musnikov said, his voice dropped to a hoarse whisper. Phoebe's eyes darted from one hole to the next, wondering which one the lovelorn King Texas was going to emerge from. We should never, never have come, Maeve was murmuring. You talked me into it, woman! She jabbed her finger in Phoebe's direction. You're in cahoots with him, aren't you? She started to struggle to her feet with the aid of her bearers. Admit it, she said, the words flying from her mouth along with a spray of spittle. Go on, admit it! You're crazy, 
Phoebe said. You're all crazy. Now there's a woman knows what she's talking about said a voice from the earth, and from every one of the holes rose a column of writhing dirt, which within seconds had climbed up to twice human height. The sight was more remarkable than intimidating. Gasping with astonishment, Phoebe turned around to see that on every side the tips of the columns were already sprouting branches like spokes, which spread and knotted together overhead. Musnikov, Phoebe said, what's happening? It was Maeve who replied. He's making shade for himself, she said, plainly unimpressed by the display. He doesn't like the light, poor thing. He's afraid it's going to make him wither away. Look who's talking, said the voice out of the ground. You wrote a book on withering, love of my wretched life. Am I supposed to be flattered? Maeve said. No, the voice from the ground replied. You're supposed to remember that I always tell you the truth, even when it stings a little. And, sweetness, you look old. No, strike that. You look forlorn, forsaken, empty. That's rich. Coming from a hole in the ground? Maeve snapped. There was laughter now out of the earth, soft, ripe laughter. Are you going to show yourself? Maeve said. Or are you too ugly these days? I'm whatever you want me to be, my little pussy rose. Don't be crude for once. I'll be a monk for you. I'll never touch myself. I'll— Oh, God, how you talk, Maeve said. Are you going to show yourself or not? There was a short silence. Then the voice simply said, Here. And up out of one of the halls, between Maeve and Phoebe, came a stream of muddy matter that began to congeal— even before it had finished rising, into a vaguely human form. It had its back to Phoebe, so she had no sense of its physiognomy, but to judge by the dorsal view it was an unfinished thing, a man of dust and raw rock. Satisfied? it drawled. I think it's too late for that, Maeve replied. Oh, no, baby, that's not true. It's not true at all. He raised his arm, his hand was the size of a snow shovel, as if to touch the old lady, but he refrained from contact, his lumpen fingers hovering an inch from her cheek. "'Give up your flesh,' he said, "'and come in and be rock with me. We'll melt together, baby. We'll let people live on our backs, and we'll just be down there warm and cozy." Phoebe studied Maeve's face through this strange seduction, and knew she'd heard or read these words countless times. "'You'll never have another wrinkle,' King Texas went on. "'You'll never have your bowels seize up. You'll never ache. You'll never wither. You'll never die.' He ran out of sweet-talking there, and seeing that his words were having no effect, turned to Phoebe. "'Now I ask you, he said, as she'd suspected his face was barely sketched in clay. Does that sound so damn bad? His breath was cold and smelled of the underworld. Caves and pure water, things growing in darkness. It was not unpleasant. Well, does it? he said. Phoebe shook her head. No, she replied. It sounds fine to me. There, said Texas, glaring back over his shoulder at Maeve, but almost instantly returning his gaze to Phoebe. She understands me. Then take her. Write your damn letters to her. I want no part of you. Phoebe saw a wounded look cross King Texas's unfinished face. You won't get another chance, he said to Maeve, still studying Phoebe as he spoke. Not after this. The Eid's gone to destroy your city, and you'll go with it. Don't be so sure, Maeve replied. Oh, wait now. King Texas said, can you be thinking of going back into business? He swung his huge head round to peer at Maeve. Why not? she said. Because the Eid have no feelings, nor do they have much between the legs. So you've seen them, have you? Dreamed them, King Texas said. Dreamed them over and over. Well, go back to your dreams, Maeve said, and leave me to get on with what's left of my life. You've got nothing I need. Oh, that hurts, King Texas said. If I had veins, I'd bleed. It's not just veins you're missing, Maeve replied. 
The king's gigantic form shuddered, and he growled out a warning. Be careful, he said, but the words went unheeded. You're old and womanly, Maeve said. Womanly! Now the street rocked again. Phoebe heard Musnikoff muttering to himself and realized it was a prayer she knew. Mary, Mother of God. I'm a lot of things, King Texas said, and some of them I'm none too proud of, but womanly. His head had started to sprout snaky shapes as thick as fingers, hundreds of them running from his scalp in writhing streams. Does this look womanly to you? he demanded to know. His entire body was transforming, Phoebe saw, his anatomy bulging and rippling. As it did so, he stepped out of the hole from which he'd risen onto solid ground, detaching himself from the flow of rock. He stood before Maeve like a shaggy titan, with a growl in his throat. I could take you all down with me, he said, reaching to seize the cobbled street, the way somebody might catch hold of a rug. Let you see what it's like in my beautiful darkness. He tugged on the street, just a little. Musnikov was thrown off his feet and instantly slid towards one of the holes. Please, God, no! he shrieked. Mistress, help me! Just stop it! Maeve said, as though speaking to a fractious child. Much to Phoebe's surprise, the tone worked. King Texas let go of the ground, leaving Musnikov sobbing with relief. Why do we always end up arguing? Texas said, his tone suddenly placatory. We should be spending this time reminiscing. I've got nothing to reminisce about, Maeve said. Not true, not true. We had fine times, you and me. I built you a highway, I built you a harbor. Maeve looked up at him, unmoved. What are you thinking of? King Texas said, leaning a little closer to her. Tell me, Blossom. Maeve shrugged. Nothing, she said. Then let me think for us both. Let me love for us both. What I feel for you is more than any man ever felt for any woman in the history of love, and without it— Don't do this— Maeve whined. Without it, I am in grief, and you— Why won't you listen? You are forgotten. At this, Maeve bristled. Forgotten? She said. Yes, forgotten, Texas replied. This city will be gone in a few hours. Our harbor, your fine buildings— He waved his huge hands in the air to evoke their passing. The Eid will wipe it all away. And as for Everville— I don't want to talk about that. Is it too painful? I don't blame you. You were there at the beginning, and now they've forgotten you. Stop saying that, Maeve raged. Jesus and Mary, will you never learn? I am not going to be bullied or shamed or tempted or seduced into ever loving you again. You can build me a thousand harbors. You can write me a love letter every minute of every day till the end of the world, and I will not love you. With this, she turned to the closest of her bearers. What's your name? she said. Noos Cataglia. Your back, Noos. I beg you, turn around. I want to climb on your back. Oh, yes, of course. The man duly presented his back to Maeve, who, with his help, began to scramble up onto it. What are you doing? King Texas said quietly. I'm going to prove you wrong, Maeve said, grabbing hold of her mount's collar. I'm going back to Everville. For the first time in several minutes, Phoebe piped up. You can't, she protested. You tell her, King Texas said. She won't listen to me. You promised to help me find Joe, Phoebe went on. I'm afraid he's lost, Phoebe, Maeve said. So let it go. She pursed her lips. Look, I'm sorry, she said, though plainly the apology was hard. But didn't I say to you, don't put your faith in love? If you did, I wouldn't believe you. Listen to this woman, King Texas said to Maeve. She's wise, wise. She's as much a fool for love as you are, Maeve said, her roomy gaze going from Phoebe to Texas and back again. You deserve each other. Then she tugged on her mount's collar. Move yourself, she said. As the poor man started away up the gradient, King Texas looked down at Musnikov, who had cautiously scrambled to his feet during this exchange. Woman! Texas yelled to Maeve. If you go, I'll kill your little bootlicker. Maeve cast a glance over her shoulder. You wouldn't be so petty, she said. I'll be whatever I like. 
Texas roared. Now you come back. I'm warning you. Come back. Maeve simply dug her knees into Gatalgia's flanks. He has seconds left to see the sky, woman, Texas yelled. I mean it. Musnikov had started to let out a pitiful mewling sound and was retreating from the closest of the holes. You are cruel, Texas hollered after Maeve. Cruel! Cruel! With that, he seemed to lose all patience and reached down to tug at the ground. Don't, Phoebe said, but her appeal was drowned out by Musnikov's shriek as he was thrown from his feet. He scrambled at the cobbles as the street tipped beneath him, but his fingers found too little purchase and he tumbled towards the hole. Phoebe couldn't stand by and watch him go to his death. Yelling to him to hold on, she raced towards him, arms outstretched. He raised his head, a brief glimpse of hope appearing on his ashen face, and reached out towards her. Before her fingers could find his, however, he lost what hold he had and fell. For a fraction of a second their eyes locked, and she saw how terrible this was. Then he was gone, screaming and screaming. She retreated from the hole, letting out a sob of horror, and more of rage as she did so. Now hush, King Texas said. She looked up at him. He was just a looming form, blurred by her tears, but that didn't stop her speaking her mind. You did this for love, she said. Do you blame me, that woman? You just killed somebody. I was trying to make her change her mind he said, his voice thickening. Well, you didn't. You just made more grief. Texas shrugged. He'll be safe down there. It's quiet. It's dark. She heard him sigh heavily. All right, I was wrong. Phoebe sniffed hard and wiped the tears from her eyes. I can't bring him back, Texas went on, but please let me comfort you. He raised his vast hand as he spoke, as if to touch her. It was the last thing she wanted. She tried to wave it away, but in doing so lost her balance. She flailed, attempting to recover it, but her foot somehow missed the street completely. She looked down, and to her utter horror saw that the hole where Musnikov had gone was there beneath her. Help! she yelled, and reached out for Texas, but his sluggish body was too slow to catch her. The sky slipped sideways. Then she was falling, falling, the last of her tears whipped from her eyes, but her cleared sight showing her nothing except darkness and darkness and darkness all the way down. 2. 1. As Joe and Wexel Fee emerged from the laddered tunnels of Beketer Sabat's belly into the incandescent streets of that city, Joe asked Fee, what does Beketer Sabat mean? The man shrugged. Your guess is as good as mine, he replied. The fact of Fee's ignorance was curiously comforting. Plainly, they would both be exploring the city new to its mysteries, and perhaps it was better that way, better to wander here without hope of comprehending what lay before them, and instead simply enjoy it for the miracle it was. The basic elements of construction were not so different from those of an American city. There was brick and wood, there were windows and doors, there were streets and sidewalks and gutters and lamps. But the architects and the masons and the carpenters and the road layers had brought to every slab and cornice and threshold a desire to be particular, to find some quality that made that slab, that cornice, that threshold, unlike any other. Some of the buildings were, of course, stupendous, like the towers Joe had first seen from the trees beside the shore, but even when they were of more modest scale, as most were, they'd plainly been built with a kind of tenderness which made each of them a presence unto itself. Though the streets were virtually empty of citizens, and the winged Caterians had almost all cleared from the skies, there was a strange sense, more comforting than eerie, that the creatures who had raised this miraculous place were still present, and would live on while their masterworks still stood. If I'd built even a little piece of this city, Joe said. I couldn't leave it for anything. Not even for that, Wexel said, glancing up at the churning wall of the Eid. Especially for that, Joe said. He stopped walking to study the wall. It's going to destroy the city, Afrik, and us along with it. It doesn't seem to be in any hurry, Joe said. True enough. I wonder why. Don't bother, 
he said. We'll never know what's going on inside it, Afrique. It's too different from us. I've heard that said about me more than once, Joe replied. They didn't call me Afrique, but that's what they were thinking. Did I offend you? If I did, no, you didn't offend me. I'm just saying maybe it's not as different as we think it is. We'll never know which of us is right, Maxwell replied, because we're never going to see inside its heart. With that they moved on, wandering where their noses led, astonished at every corner they turned. In one square they found an immense carousel, turning in the wind without making so much as a creak. In place of carved and painted horses, however, there was a succession of figures that seemed to represent humanity's ascent from apehood, and its subsequent return, as the carousel spun, a loop of evolution and devolution passed before them. In another spot was a stand of several hundred columns, on the tops of which large geometrical forms that gleamed like polished copper hovered, trembling slightly. Though Joe had made a pact with himself not to ask what couldn't be answered, he here voiced his puzzlement nevertheless, and was surprised to find that Wexel was able to solve the mystery. "'They are the shapes behind our eyelids,' he said. "'I have heard the Katerians deem them holy, because they are at the very heart of what we see when the world is shut out.' "'Why would anybody want to shut out this place?' Joe remarked. "'Because if you wanted to build something of your own—' he said, you'd need to dream at first. I'm already dreaming just by being here, Joe said, aren't I? The complexities of this, being awake in a place his species only visited when sleeping, had baffled him from the outset, and continued to do so. This whole adventure was more than a dream, he knew that, but when he slept here, and dreamed, was he entering yet another reality, beyond this one, where he might also sleep and dream? Or was the metacosm the other half of the world he'd left, the half people yearned after, prayed for, dreamed of, but only in moments of epiphany dared believe real. "'It's not wise to dwell on these mysteries,' Wexel said, a little superstitiously. "'Great souls have doomed themselves thinking of such things.' The exchange ended there, and on they went, altogether less voluble now. Indeed, they didn't say more than a word or two until their wandering brought them to a bridge that looked to be made of porcelain, which arched over a pool so tranquil it formed an almost perfect mirror. They gazed down into it a while, Joe almost mesmerized by the sight of his own face laid against the billows of the Eid. "'It looks kind of comfortable,' he said to Wexel. "'You would lie on it, huh? Lie on it, make love on it. It would swallow you up,' he said. Maybe that wouldn't be so bad, Joe said. Maybe there's something wonderful inside. Like what? Joe thought of their exchange among the columns. Another dream, maybe, he said. Wexel didn't reply. Joe looked round at him to see that he was walking back the way they'd come. Listen to that, he said. There was a murmur of shouts and what seemed to be the clash of arms. Hear it? I hear it. You want to stay here or see what's happening? Wexel asked him. Plainly, he was going to do the latter. He was already off the bridge. I'll come, Joe told him, and took his reflection from the pool. The elaborate construction of the streets made the sounds difficult to follow. Joe and Wexel were several times tricked by echoes and counter-echoes before they found the battle they'd heard from the bridge. When they finally turned a corner and came in sight of it, they discovered their search had brought them by some obscure route back to the Plaza of Columns, which had become a battlefield in the little time since they'd walked there. The ground between the columns was littered with bodies, through which the survivors of this fracas fought, most of them armed with short stabbing blades. They were by no means all male. A goodly portion of them were women, fighting with the same mixture of finesse and brutality as their brothers. Overhead, swooping down between the columns to pick off their opponents, were perhaps a dozen winged Katerians. The first Joe had been close to. They were frail creatures, their bodies the size of a human child of six or so, their bare limbs thin and scaly. Their wings were brilliantly colored, as were their voices, which rose in whoops and squeals and hollers, sufficient for half a hundred species. Like so much else Joe had witnessed on this journey, the scene won a confusion of feelings from him. He'd grown out of his appetite for fighting a long time ago. The sight of wounding and death was simply revolting. 
but the furious passion of these people could not help but excite him a little, that, in the spectacle of the winged Katarians rising up with their pavanine wings spread against the dark wall of the Eid. "'What are they fighting about?' Joe yelled to Fee over the din of battle. "'The dynasty of Sama Salamentus and that of Ezo Etherium have fought forever,' he said. "'The reason is deeply obscure.' "'Somebody must know. None of these,' Fee said. "'That's certain.' "'Then why do they continue to fight?' Joe said. Waxel shrugged. "'For the pleasure of it?' he ventured. "'There are as many dreams of war as of peace, are there not? "'It expresses something in the nature of your species that must be necessary.' "'Necessary,' Joe said, looking at the bloodshed in front of him. "'If it was indeed an expression of human necessity, "'then perhaps his species had lost its way.' I don't want to watch this any longer, Joe said. I'm going back to the pool. Yeah? You stay if it turns you on. I just don't want to spend my last minutes watching people killing each other. I will stay, Wexel said, a little awkwardly. Then I'll say goodbye, Joe said. The sometime slave extended his hand. Goodbye, he said. They shook, and Joe headed back towards the bridge, but he'd gone less than ten yards when he heard a cry behind him and turned to see Wexel stumbling towards him, clutching his belly, there was blood spurting between his fingers, splashing down his legs. A freak! he sobbed. A freak! He's here! Joe started back towards him, but the man shouted for him to keep his distance. He's crazy, A freak! He's. At that moment, Noah appeared round the corner behind Fee, in his hands a stabbing sword, soiled with blood, in his eyes the pleasure of harm. His time in Biketus about had brought him to full flower. His body had thickened, his limbs swelled. Joe, he said lightly, as though the dying man did not stand between them, I thought it must be you. He caught hold of Wexel by the back of his neck. What were you doing with this? he said. He's probably got more fleas and sicknesses. Leave him alone, Joe said. Run, Afrique! I think he's afraid I'm going to do you some harm, Noah said. And are you? He calls you Afrique, Joe. Is that some term of endearment? No, it's an insult, then? He pulled Wexel's head back. I thought so. In an instant he had the blade to Fee's neck. Joe started towards them, an appeal on his lips, but before he could finish, Noah slid the sword across Wexel's neck. Blood came. Noah smiled and let the dying man drop. There he said. He won't insult you any longer. He wasn't insulting me, Joe yelled. Oh, well, no matter. Should I be calling you Afrik? Don't call me anything. Just get the fuck out of my sight. Noah stepped over Wexel's body and strode towards Joe. But I want us to go on together, he said. Go on where? To get what's owed to you. Noah said. When I saw you across the plaza, I knew that was why you'd come. We have unfinished business, you and me. I promised you power, and then I lost you. I thought you were dead, Afrique. And now here you are again in the flesh. I must assume our destinies are interwoven. I don't. Noah strode towards him until the blade was inches from Joe's belly. Allow me to prove it to you, he said. Isn't it a little late for this? Joe said. Late? The Eard's going to come down on this city any moment. I think something's holding it back, Noah said. Do you know what? I have a suspicion, he said, but I'll need you to help me confirm it. He studied Joe a moment. Well, he said, do we go as friends, or do I threaten you with this? He jabbed the sword at Joe. We're never going to be friends, Joe said, but I don't need that either. Noah lowered his sword. I'll come with you, if you'll tell me something. Anything. You're promising me? Yes, I am promising you. What do you need to know that's so important? There was a twinge of anxiety in Noah's voice, which Joe took pleasure in hearing. I'll tell you when I choose, he said. Now, where are we going? Two. 
On the far side of the plaza of columns stood a building that was in some ways the paradigm of Caterian aesthetics. It was at first sight a simple two-story structure, but as Noah and Joe approached it, skirting the now dwindling battle, it became clear that every stone of its unadorned walls had been chiseled to illuminate some particular felicity, so that each was in its simple way a different form of perfection. The sum was breathtaking, like a page of poetry laid line on line. But Noah had not time for the study of stone. He led them round to a simple door, and there, taking Joe by the arm, he said, I promised you power. It's in there. What is this place? A temple. To whom? I think you know. The Zarapushu? Joe said. Of course. They like you, Afrique. If anybody is allowed access to this place, it'll be you. And what's inside? I told you. Power. Then why don't you go in? "'Because I am not pure enough,' Noah said. Joe found it in him to laugh, even under these grim circumstances. "'And I am,' he said. "'You're Sapa Sumana, Afrique. "'Pure Sapa Sumana. "'And the shoe like that?' "'I believe they will.' "'And if they don't,' Joe said, coming close to Noah now, "'what happens?' "'Death happens,' he said. "'Simple as that?' "'Simple as that.' Joe looked at the door. Like the wall into which it was set, it possessed a physical beauty that took its breath away. What it lacked was a handle or a keyhole. If I open the door and don't get killed, you follow. Is that the idea? Always so swift, my friend, Noah said. Yes, that's the idea. Joe glanced back at the door, and a wave of curiosity rose up in him to know what lay on the other side. He had looked into the eyes of the shoe twice now, once on the shore and once in the weed bed, and each time had felt touched by a mystery that he desperately wanted to solve. Perhaps he could do it here. Concealing his eagerness, he turned back to Noah. Before we go in, he said, answer my question. Ask it. I want to know what it is the families have been arguing about all these years. I want to know what's made them kill each other. Noah said nothing. You promised me... Joe prompted him. Yes, he said at last. I did. So tell me. Noah shrugged. What does it matter now? He said to himself. I'll tell you. He looked back towards the battlefield once. Then, his voice lowered to a whisper, he said, The dynasty of Ezo Etherium believed that the Eid exists because Sapa Sumana dreamed them into being that the Eid are the darkness in the collective soul of your species. And your family? We believe the other way about, Noah said. It took Joe a little time to realize what he was being told. You think we're something the Eid Ouroboros dreamed up? Yes, Afrique. That's what we believe. Who invented this crap? Noah shrugged. Who knows where wisdom comes from? That's not wisdom... Joe said, it's fucking stupidity. Why do you say so? Because I'm not a dream. If you were, why do you suppose you'd know it? Noah said. Joe didn't try to get his head around that notion. He simply threw up his hands and said, let's just get the hell on with this. And turning his back on Noah, he pressed against the door. It didn't swing open, but nor did he remain on the outside of it. Instead, he felt a sudden ache through his body, almost like an electric shock, and the next moment he was standing in a buzzing darkness on the inside of the temple. He waited for the ache to subside, and then looked around for Noah. There was a motion in the murk behind him, but he was by no means sure it was his fellow trespasser, and before he could look again, he heard somebody call his name. He looked ahead of him, and saw that the dark ground at the center of the chamber was glittering, the light coming down upon it from a round hole in the roof. Joe crossed the floor to study the phenomenon better, and as he did so, realized that he was looking at a pool, perhaps twelve feet across. It was filled with quiddities waters. He had no doubt of that. He could smell the piquancy of the dream sea, and his skin tingled with the subtle energies it gave off. But as he came to the edge of the pool, he had further proof that this was indeed an annex of quiddity. There, a little way beneath the surface, lurked a shoe so large it could barely be contained in the pool, but was wrapped around itself in a tangle of encrusted tentacles, from the nest of which one of its eyes, which was from rim to rim a yard across or more, stared up and out gleaming gold. Its gaze was not upon Joe, 
at least not directly, the creature was looking up through the roof of the temple, into the roiling wall of the invader. It's holding the Eid, Joe breathed. My God, my God, it's holding the Eid. He had no sooner spoken than he heard Noah from somewhere in the dark. Do you feel it? he said. Do you feel the power in this place? Oh, yeah, Joe said softly. It was so palpable that it almost felt like an act of aggression. His flesh ran with sweat, and every bruise and wound his body had sustained, back to the beating he'd taken from Morton Cobb, ached with fresh vigor, as though it had just been sustained. But still he wanted to get closer to the pool, to see what the Eid was seeing, when it gazed into the shoe's majestic eye. He took another step towards the water, his body racked with shudders. Speak to it, Noah said. Tell it what you want. It doesn't matter what we want, Joe said. We're nothing here. Do you understand? We're nothing at all. Damn you, Afrique, Noah said, his voice closer to Joe now. I've done all the suffering I intend to do. I want to live in glory when the Eids passed by. He drew closer still. Now put your hand in the water. What happened to all that talk about being buried in your own country? I'd forgotten how fine it was to be alive, especially here. There is no finer place in your world or mine than this city, and I want to be the one who heals it after the cataclysm. I want to be its protector. You want to own it, Joe said. Nobody could ever own Beketa Sabat. I think you're ready to try, Joe said. Well, that's between me and the city, isn't it? Noah said, moving to press the blade against Joe's back. Go on now, he said. Touch the waters for me. And if I don't? Your body will touch the waters, whether there's life in it or not. It's holding the Eid. Very possibly. If we disturb it. The Eid finishes its business here and moves on. It's going to happen sooner or later. If you make it sooner, then you've changed the course of history and maybe got yourself power at the same time. That doesn't sound so terrible, does it? He pushed the blade a little harder. It's what you came here for, remember? Joe remembered. The pain in his balls was a perfect reminder of why he'd made this journey, to never be powerless again. But in the process of coming here, of seeing all that he'd seen and learning all that he'd learned, the pursuit of power had come to seem like a very petty thing. He'd had love, which was more than most people got in their lives. He'd had physical pleasures. He'd known a woman whose smile made him smile, and whose sighs made him sigh, and whose arms had been an utter comfort to him. They would not come again, those smiles, those sighs, and it was a worse ache than the sum of his wounds to think of that, but life hadn't cheated him, had it? He could die now and not feel his time had been wasted. I don't want power, he said to Noah. Liar, said the face in the darkness. You can say what you want, Joe replied. I know what's true, and that's all that matters. The words seemed to dismay Noah. He made a little moan, and without another word of warning, drove his blade into Joe's gut. Oh, God, but it hurt! Joe let out a sob of pain, which only inspired Noah to press the blade home. Then he twisted it and pulled it out. Joe entertained no hope of doing his killer damage in return. He'd invited this after his fashion. He put his hands to the wound, hot blood running through his fingers and slapping on the ground between his legs. Then he started to turn his back on Noah. The darkness was becoming piebald, gray blotches appearing at the corners of his sight. But he wanted to look at the shoe one last time before death took him, just to meet its golden gaze. He started to turn, pressing both hands against the wound now, to keep his body from emptying. There was still pain, but it was becoming more remote from him with every heartbeat. He had just a little time. Hold on, he murmured to himself. He had the gaze in the corner of his eye now, and it was vast. A ring of gold and a circle of darkness, beautiful in its perfection and in its simplicity. Round and round, gleaming gold, uninterrupted, unspoiled, glorious, glorious. He felt something shifting in his head, as though he was slipping towards the golden circle. Going, going, and oh, it felt fine. 
He was done with his wounded flesh, done with bruises and bleeding balls, done with Joe. He felt his body start to fall, and as it did so, as the life went out of it utterly, he fell into the circle of the shoe's eye. He was granted a moment of rest there, but a moment filled with such grace and such ease it wiped all the sufferings of the days that had brought him here and of the years that had preceded them. There was no confusion nor fear. He understood what had happened to him with absolute clarity. He'd died on the edge of the pool, and his spirit had fallen into the eye of the Zarapushu. There in that gilded round it stayed for a blissful moment. Then it was gone, up and away along the line of Shu's sight towards the cloud of the Eid. In the temple below him he heard Noah let out a cry of rage, and for an instant, though he had neither eyes nor head to put them in, his spirit saw quite plainly what was happening below. Noah had stepped over Joe's corpse and had plunged his blood-stained hands into the pool of Quiddity's waters. The shoe had responded to the trespass instantly. Its tentacles had started to flail wildly, and one of them, whether by intention or chance, Joe would never know, had wrapped around Noah's arm. Enraged and revolted, Noah picked up the sword he'd just set aside, and even as Joe watched, he plunged the blade into the shoe's unblinking eye. A tremor passed through Joe's world, through the gaze in which he traveled, through the temple below, and out across the plaza of columns and through the streets of Beketer Sabat. He knew on the instant what had happened. The shoe's hold on the E had slipped, and the great wave that had been frozen over the city began to curl. Joe turned his spirit sight up towards the Eid, and to his astonishment saw that he was almost upon it, flying like an arrow into its roiling substance. Below him the city shook itself into despair, and the island of mem er beketer Sabat fell beneath the Eid's shadow. And he, Joe Flicker, who had given up life but had not perished, flew into the heart of the city's destroyer, and lost himself there as surely as if he had died. 3. 1. The Sturgis Motel was a modest establishment, set a quarter of a mile back from the road along what was little more than a gravel-strewn track, barely wide enough to allow two cars to pass. The motel itself was a single-story wooden structure built around two and a quarter sides of a parking lot the quarter being the office, over which a fitfully illuminated sign boasted that there were no vacancies. Apparently most of the occupants were out having a high time in Everville, because when Tesla drove in the lot was empty but for three vehicles. One was a flatbed truck, parked outside the office, one a beaten-up Mustang, which Tesla assumed was Grillo's, and the third was an even more dilapidated Ford Pinto. She had not even turned off the engine of her bike when the door of room six opened and a scrawny, balding man in a shirt and pants several sizes too big for him stepped out and said her name. She was about to ask him if they knew each other when she realized it was Grillo. There was no way to conceal her shock. He seemed not to notice, however, or perhaps not to care. He opened his arms to her, so thin, oh, so thin, and they embraced. "'You don't know how glad I am to see you,' he said. "'The frailty wasn't just in his body, it was in his voice, too. "'He sounded remote, as though his sickness, whatever it was, "'was already carrying him away. "'Both of us,' she thought, "'not long for this world. "'There's so much to tell you,' Grillo was saying, "'but I'll keep it simple.' "'He halted, as though waiting for her permission to tell. "'She told him to go on. "'Well, Joe Beth's behaving really strangely.' Some of the time she's so excitable I want to gag her. The rest of the time she's practically catatonic. Does she talk about Tommy Ray? Grillo shook his head. I've tried to make her talk, but she doesn't trust me. I'm hoping maybe she'll talk to you, cause we need some inside track here or we're fucked. You're sure Tommy Ray's alive? I don't know about alive, but I know he's around. And what about Howie? Not good. We're all playing some kind of end game here, Tess. It's like everything's coming together in the worst way. I know that feeling, she told him. And I'm too old for this shit, Tess. Too old and too sick. 
I can see things aren't good, she said to him. If you want to talk— No, he said hurriedly. I don't. There's nothing worth saying anyway. It's just the way things go. One question? All right, one. Is this why you didn't want me to come see you? Grillo nodded. Stupid, I know, but I guess we all deal with shit the best way we know how. I decided to hide away and work on the reef. How's it going? I want you to see it for yourself, Tess, if we come out of this. She didn't tell him she wouldn't, just nodded. I think maybe you'd make more sense of it than I have. You know, make the connections better? He put his arm around her shoulder. Shall we go in? He said. 2. Once, somewhere on the road, Tesla had contemplated setting the story of Joe Beth McGuire and Howie Katz down for posterity. How in the sunny kingdom of Paloma Grove these two perfect people had met and fallen in love, not realizing that their fathers had sired them to do battle. How their passion had enraged their fathers, and how that rage had erupted into open warfare in the streets of the Gilded Kingdom. Many had suffered as a consequence. Some had even perished. But by some miracle the lovers had survived their travails intact. It was not the first time a story of ill-matched lovers had been told, of course, but more often than not it was the couple who suffered and died, perhaps because people wanted the perfect pair snuffed out before their love could lose its perfection. Better a murdered ideal, which at least kept hope alive, than one that withered with time. While making her notes for the story, Tesla had several times wondered what happened to the golden lovers of Palomo Grove. Here, in room six, she had her answer. Despite the warning Grillo had given, she was not prepared to find the couple so changed, both grey-faced, their speech and action devoid of any spark of vitality. When, after some wan greetings had been exchanged, Howie began to describe for Tesla the events that had brought them to this sorry place and condition, the pair scarcely glanced at each other. "'Just help me kill the son of a bitch.' How he said to Tesla, the subject of the death boy's dispatch, rousing a passion in him absent until now. She told him she didn't have any answers. Perhaps the nuncio had bestowed some form of invulnerability upon him. After all, he'd escaped the conflagration in the loop. You think he's beyond death, right? Grillo said. It's possible, yes. And that's from the nuncio? I don't know, Tesla said, staring down at her palms. I have a taste of the nuncio myself, and I'm damn sure I'm still mortal. When she looked up at Grillo again, she saw such despair in his eyes she could only hold his gaze for a moment before looking away. It was Joe Beth, who had added little to the exchange so far, who broke the silence. I want you to stop talking about him now, she said. Howie threw his wife a sour, sideways glance. We're not done yet, he said. Well, I am, Joe Beth said a little more forcibly, and crossing to the bed, she picked up the baby and headed for the door. Where are you going? Howie said to her. I'm going to get some air. Not with a baby, you're not. There was a litany of suspicions in these few words. I'm not going far. You're not going anywhere, Howie shouted. Now put Amy back on the bed and sit down. Before this escalated any further, Grillo stood up. We all need some food in our stomachs, he said. Why don't we go get some pizza? You go, Joe Beth said. I'll be fine here. Better still, Tesla said to Grillo. You and Howie go. Let me and Joe Beth sit and talk for a few minutes. There was some debate about this, but not much. Both men seemed relieved to have a chance to escape the confines of the motel for a few minutes, and from Tesla's point of view it offered an opportunity to speak to Joe Beth alone. You don't seem very afraid that Tommy Ray's coming to find you, she said to Joe Beth when the men had left. The girl looked across at the baby on the bed. No, she said, her voice as pale as her face. Why should I be? Well, because of what might have happened to him since you saw him last, Tesla replied, trying to put her point as delicately as possible. He's not the brother you had in Paloma Grove. I know that, Joe Beth said with a tinge of contempt in her voice. He's killed some people. 
and he's not sorry. But he's never hurt me. He wouldn't ever do that. He might not know his own mind, Tesla replied. He might hurt you or the baby without being able to help himself. Jo Beth simply shook her head. He loves me, she said. That was a long time ago. People change, and Tommy Ray's changed more than most. I know, Jo Beth replied. Tesla didn't reply. She just waited in silence, hoping that Jo Beth would talk about the death boy a little. After a few moments, she did just that. He's been all over, she said, seeing the world. Now he's getting tired. He told you that? She nodded. He wants to be quiet for a little while. He says he's seen some things that he needs to think over. Did he say what? Just things, she said. He's been traveling around working for a friend of his. Tesla hazarded a guess. Kisoon, she said. Jo Beth actually smiled. Yeah. How'd you know? It's not important. Jo Beth raked her fingers through her long, unwashed hair and said again, He loves me. So does Howie, Tesla pointed out. Howie belongs to Fletcher, Jo Beth said. Nobody belongs to anybody, Tesla replied. Jo Beth looked at her, saying nothing, but the look of utter abjection in her eyes was chilling. Would nothing be saved, Tesla thought. There was Grillo, playing his end game, thinking of the nuncio as some last reprieve, but not truly believing it, Damour climbing the mountain to spend his last hours where the crosses stood, and this poor girl who had been so blithe and so effortlessly beautiful, ready to be taken by the death boy because love had failed to save her. The world was turning off its lights, one by one. A gust of wind shook the window pane. Joe Beth, who had turned from Tesla to tend to the baby, looked round. What is it? Tesla said softly. There was another gust now, this time at the door, as though the wind was systematically looking for some way in. It's him, isn't it? Tesla said. The girl's eyes were glued to the door. Joe Beth, you have to help me here. Tesla crossed to the door as she spoke and gingerly turned the key in the lock. It was a pitiful defense, she knew. This was a force that brought down houses. But it might earn them a second or two's grace, and that might be the difference between saving a life or losing it. Tommy Ray's not going to solve anything, Tesla said. You understand me? He's not. Joe Beth was bending to pick up little Amy. He's all we've got, she said. The wind was rattling both the window and the door now. Tesla could smell it as it gusted through the keyhole in the cracks. Death was here, no doubt of that. Amy had begun to sob quietly in her mother's arms. Tesla glanced down at the child's tiny knotted face and thought of what such innocence might rouse in the death boy. He'd probably be proud of infanticide. The floor was shaking so hard the key was rattled from its slot, and somewhere in the gusts there were voices, or the fragments of same, some speaking in Spanish, some Tesla thought in Russian one of them nearly hysterical, one of them sobbing. She caught only a smattering of their words, but the gist of it was plain enough. "'Come outside,' they were saying. "'He's waiting for you.' "'Doesn't sound all that inviting,' Tesla whispered to Jo Beth. The girl said nothing. She just stared at the door, gently rocking the troubled baby, while the voices of dead pined and moaned and muttered on. Tesla let them speak for themselves. To judge by the look on Jo Beth's face, they were doing a far better job of dissuading her from stepping over the threshold than Tesla could have done. "'Where's Tommy Ray?' Jo Beth said at last. "'Maybe he didn't come,' Tesla replied. "'Do you maybe want to slip out the bathroom window?' Jo Beth listened for a few seconds longer. Then she nodded. "'Good,' Tesla said. "'Make it fast. I'll keep them busy.' She watched Jo Beth retreat to the bathroom, then she turned and went to the door. The ghosts on the other side seemed to sense her approach because their voices dropped to a murmur. "'Where's Tommy Ray?' Tesla said. There was no coherent response, just more distressing din, and a further rattling of the door. 
Tesla glanced over her shoulder. Joe Beth and Amy were out of sight, which was something. At least now, if the ghosts tried to break in. Open, they were murmuring. Open, open. And while they murmured, they escalated their assault on the door. The wood around the hinges began to splinter, and around the lock, too. It's okay, Tesla said, fearful that their frustration would make them more dangerous than ever. I'll unlock the door. Just give me a moment. She stopped and picked up the key, slid it into the lock, and turned it. Hearing this, the ghosts were quieted, the gusts hushed. Tesla took a deep breath and opened the door. The cloud of phantoms retreated from her in a dusty wave. She looked for Tommy Ray. There was no sign of him. Closing the door after her, she walked out into the middle of the lot. She'd written an execution scene in one of her failed opuses, a terrible screenplay called As I Live and Breathe. This walk put her in mind of it. All that was missing was the warden and the priest. She started to turn, looking for the death boy, and her eyes came to rest on an area of stunted trees and ambitious weed on the far side of the lot. There were lanterns hanging in the branches, she saw, giving off a sickly phosphorescence, and somebody standing in their midst, more than half hidden. Before she could start towards the place, a voice behind her said, "'What the hell's going on out here?' She looked back to see the motel manager appearing from his office. He was sixty or more, with a bald pate, a gravy-stained shirt, and a can of beer in his hand. By his staggering step it was plain he was the worse for its influence. "'Go back inside,' Tesla told him. But the man had seen the lights in the thicket now, and he strode on past Tesla towards them. "'You put them up?' he demanded. "'No,' Tesla said, following after him. "'Somebody very—' "'That's my property. You can't just go hanging—' He stopped in mid-stride as he came close enough to see exactly what these lanterns were. The can of beer dropped from his hand. "'My God!' he said. The branches of the trees and bushes had been hung with horrific trophies, Tesla saw. Heads and arms, pieces of a torso, and much else that was not even recognizable. All of them shone, even the scraps— charged up with the luminescence she assumed was the death boy's gift. The manager, meanwhile, was stumbling back the way he'd come, his throat loosing a series of panicked animal noises. Instantly the cloud of phantoms rose up, excited by his terror, and moved to intercept him. He was swept off his feet and pitched ten yards or more, coming to rest a little way from his office door. "'Tommy Ray!' Tesla yelled back into the thicket. "'Stop them!' Getting no response, she strode towards the bushes, haranguing the death boy. "'Call them off, damn you! Hear me!' Behind her, the manager had started to shriek. She looked back in time to glimpse the man in the midst of the swarming cloud, sinking to the ground. He went on shrieking for a little longer while they tore at his head. It was twisted, left, then right, then left again, with such violence his neck ripped. The shriek stopped. The head came off. "'Don't look,' the man in the thicket said. She turned back and stared into the mesh of twigs, trying to see him better. The last time she laid eyes on Tommy Ray McGuire, back in Cassoon's loop, he'd been a shadow of his former glory, wasted and crazed. But it seemed the years had been kinder to him than anybody else in this drama. Whatever duties he'd performed for Cassoon, and whatever he'd witnessed, or perpetrated, along the way, his blonde beauty had been preserved. He smiled at her out of his grove of lanterns and it was a dazzling smile. "'Where is she, Tesla?' he said. "'Before you get to Joe Beth.' "'Yes?' "'I just wanted to talk a moment, compare notes. About what?' "'About being nunciates.' "'Is that what we are?' "'It's as good or bad as any.' "'Nunciates.' He turned the word on his tongue. "'That's cool.' Being one seems to suit you. Oh, yeah, I feel fine. You don't look so good yourself. You need to get some slaves like me instead of wandering around on your own. His tone was completely conversational. You know, a couple of times I almost came to find you. Why would you do that? He shrugged. I guess I felt close to you, both of us having the nuncio, both of us knowing Kassoon. What's he doing here, Tommy Ray? What does he want with Everville? Tommy Ray took a step towards her. She had to fight the instinct to retreat before him. 
Any sign of weakness, she knew, and her status as fellow nunciate would be forfeited. As he approached, he answered the question. He lived there once, Tommy Ray said. In Everville? He was almost free of the thicket now. There were blood stains on his jeans and T-shirt, and on his face and arms a gloss of sweat. Where is she? he said. We were talking about Kassoon. Not any more, we're not. Where is she? Just give her a little time, Tesla replied, glaring back towards the room as though she expected Joe Beth to emerge at any moment. She wanted to look her best. She was excited? Oh, yes. Why don't you go fetch her? She won't be— Fetch her! There was a murmur from the ghosts, who were still attending upon the headless body. Sure, Tesla said. No problem. She turned back towards the motel and started across the lot, taking her time. She was about five yards from the door when Joe Beth stepped into view, with Amy cradled in her arms. I'm sorry, she said to Tesla under her breath. We belong to him. It's as simple as that. From the lot behind her, Tesla heard the death boy sigh at the sight of his sister. Oh, baby, he said, you look so fine. Come here. Joe Beth stepped over the threshold. Tesla made no attempt to stop her. She'd only lose her head for her troubles. Besides, by the look on Joe Beth's face, it was plain she was happy to be going into her brother's embrace. The wind, whether natural or no, had died away completely. Night birds had started to sing, and crickets to chirp in the grass as though conspiring to celebrate this reunion. As she watched Tommy Ray open his arms to welcome his sister, Tesla caught sight of a pale form out of the corner of her eye, and looked round to see Buddenbaum's little girlfriend, the Avatar, still dressed in white from bow to shoes, staring down at the manager's corpse. She didn't peruse it for long, but wandered in Tesla's direction, leaving her two companions, the clown and the idiot, to study it in her stead. The latter had found the dead man's head, and had it tucked up under his arm. The girl in white, meanwhile, was now close enough to Tesla to murmur, "'Thank you for this.' Tesla looked down at her with a mixture of confusion and disgust. "'This isn't a game,' she said. "'We know. People have died.' The girl grinned. "'And there'll be more, won't there?' she said lightly. "'Lots more.' As though her words had pressed the drama into a higher gear, the sound of a badly tuned engine reached Tesla's ears, and Grillo's Mustang appeared on the dirt road leading into the lot. Before it had even come to a halt, the passenger door was flung open, and Howie was out, gun in hand, screaming at Tommy Ray, "'Get away from her!' The death boy unglued his eyes from his sister and lazily stared in Howie's direction. "'No,' he said. Without further warning, Howie fired. His aim was pitifully poor— the bullet struck the ground closer to Joe Beth than Tommy Ray. Amy, who had been hushed so far, started to bawl. A flicker of concern crossed the death boy's sweaty face. "'Don't shoot!' he yelled to Howie. "'You'll hurt the kid!' At Tesla's side, the girl in white murmured a long, "'Oh!' as though she had new comprehension of what was happening here, and like two members of an audience, one prompted by the other into recognition of some wit or irony, Tesla saw a connection here she had not vaguely suspected. A breath of something like to pleasure caressed her nape, seeing this bud on the story tree ready to burst. What next? the little girl said. A little part of Tesla simply wanted to stand back and see, but she couldn't. Never had, never would. Howie, she said, come away. N n n not without m m my wife, Howie said. You did good, Tommy Ray said, watching over him for me. But you're out of the picture now. They're coming with me. Howie dropped his gun in the dirt and raised his hands. Look at m m me, Joe Beth, he said. I'm n n not going to m m make you do anything you d don't want to, but, baby, it's me, it's <laughs> Howie. Joe Beth said nothing. She simply looked down at the baby, as if deaf to Howie's appeals. He tried again, or began to, but he'd got no further than her name when Grillo put his foot down and drove directly towards Joe Beth. Howie flung himself aside, going down hard, as the car skewed around, kicking up a fan of dirt. 
The deaf boy let out a yell to his legion, but before they could come to order, Gurlo had brought the car to a halt and hauled Joe Beth and Amy into the vehicle. Tommy Ray made a move towards it, arms outstretched, and might have somehow checked Gurlo's escape, had Howie not risen from the dirt and flung himself at the deaf boy. His fingers went to Tommy Ray's perfect face and gouged at his eyes. Gurlo, meanwhile, was backing the vehicle up, yelling to Tesla, "'Get in! Get in!' She waved him on. "'Go!' she hollered. "'Quickly!' She caught a glimpse of his face through the insect-spattered windshield. There was exhilaration in his eyes. He offered her a tight, grim smile, then he swung the car round and drove off. Howie, meanwhile, had done some superficial damage to Tommy Ray, gouging several furrows down the side of his face and neck. There was no blood. There was instead a brightness beneath the flesh, like the phosphorescence with which he'd lit his lanterns. And it was to the thicket where those lanterns hung that Tommy Ray now headed, casually pushing Howie to the ground as he did so. Howie started to get to his feet again, plainly intending to assault the death boy afresh, but Tesla held him back. You can't kill him, she said. He'll just end up killing you. On the fringe of the thicket, Tommy Ray turned back. That's it. You tell him. He looked at Howie. I don't want to kill you, he said. In fact, I swore to Joe Beth I wouldn't, and I don't break my word. Again to Tesla. Make him understand. She's never coming back to him. Not tonight, not ever. I've got her now, and that's where she wants to be. With that, he stepped into the thicket, whistling for the cloud of ghosts to come to him. They came, gushing across the lot and entering the thicket to conceal the death boy from view. He's going to go after her, Howie said. Of course. So we have to get to her first. That's the theory, Tesla said, already heading for her bike. Howie stumbled after her. As she crossed the lot, the girl in white called to her. What's next, Tesla? What's next? God knows, Tesla said. No, we don't, said the girl's idiot companion, which much entertained all three. We like you, Tesla, the girl in white said. Then stay out of my way, Tesla said, climbing onto the bike. Howie hopped on behind. As she turned the key in the ignition, there was another gust of wind, and the death boy's legion rose up out of the thicket, taking the lanterns and the man who'd lit them away in its billows. Tesla caught a glimpse of Tommy Ray as the cloud passed by. He seemed not to be walking, but to be borne up by the cloud and carried... As for his face, it was already healing, the wounds closing to conceal the brightness that blazed behind. "'He's going to get to her first, Howie said, sounding close to tears. "'Hold on,' Tesla told him. "'It's not over yet.' Four. One. "'Forgive me, Everville.' "'That's what he wrote. "'That's what he wrote. "'The hypocrite!' They were walking, Erwin and Coger Amiano, along Poppy Lane. It was a little before nine o'clock in the evening, and to judge by the noise from every bar and restaurant along the lane, festivities were in full swing. They forget so easily, Erwin said. Just this afternoon. I know what happened, Amiano replied. I felt it. Well, like smoke, Erwin said, remembering Dolan's first lessons in ghosthood. We're not even that... At least smoke can make people weep. We can do nothing. That's not so, Erwin told him. You'll see when we find this woman Tesla. She can hear me. At least she could once. She's quite a woman, believe me. The way she acts, it's like she couldn't give a damn whether she lived or died. Then she's a fool. No, I mean, she's brave. When she was at my house, I told you about Kassoon. I remember, Erwin, Coker said politely. I never saw anything braver. You're talking like you're in love, my friend. Nonsense. I believe you're quite enamored. Don't be embarrassed. I'm I'm not. You're blushing. Erwin put his palms to his cheeks. It's so absurd, he said. What is? That I have no blood in my body, don't even have a body, yet I blush. I've had a lot of time to try and puzzle that out, Coker Amiano said. And did you come to any conclusions? A few. Tell me. We invented ourselves, Erwin. Our energies belong to some great oneness. I don't care to give it a name, or I'd be trying to invent that, too. And we've used them, these energies, in the recreation of Erwin Toothaker and Coker Amiano. 
Now, those men are dead, and much of that power has returned to its source. But we hold on to a bit of it, just to keep our fictions alive a little longer. And we clothe ourselves in what's familiar, and we fill our pockets with things to comfort us. But it can't go on forever. Sooner or later, he shrugged, we'll be done. Not me, said Irwin. I saw what happened to Dolan and Nordhoff, and what things look like from the outside, and what they are on the inside, can be very different, Irwin. Perhaps all that was happening at the crossroads was that Dolan was going back where he came from. Into your oneness? It's not mine, Irwin. He paused, musing on this. Then he said, No, I take that back. I think it is mine. And you know why? No, but I think you're about to enlighten me. Because once I'm there, I'm everywhere. He smiled, well pleased by this. And the oneness is mine as much as it is anybody else's. So why haven't you just given in to it? Irwin wanted to know. I wish I had an answer to that. I think sometimes it must be some evil in me. Evil? As in something done in error, against what's good. I know— Irwin interrupted him in mid-flow. That man, he said, pointing across the street. I see him. He was with Tesla. His name's Damour. He's in quite a hurry. I wonder if he knows where she is. There's only one way to find out. Follow him? Precisely. 2. Damour had put in a call to New York before he left the Cobb house. Norma had been pleased to hear from him. I had a visitor yesterday, she said, sounding more unnerved than Harry could ever remember her sounding before. She just came in through the window and sat down in front of me. Who the hell was it? She said her name was Lazy Susan, at least at first. Then it changed its mind, and God knows probably its sex as well, and started calling itself the Hammermite. Then Peter the Nomad? It got round to him after a while, Norma said. So is this thing what it claims it is? Yes. It killed Hess? It was one of many. What did it want? What do these things ever want? It crowed a bit. It did a dump on the floor, and it asked to be reminded to you. How, exactly? Norma sighed. Well, it started talking about how the devil was coming, how we'd all be crucified for what we'd done. It harped on that quite a bit, gave me a brief history of crucifixion which I could have done without. Then it said, Tell Damour. Let me guess. I am you, and you are love. He didn't bother to finish. That's it, Norma said. Then what? Nothing. It told me I had very lovely eyes, and it was sure they were all the prettier because they were useless. Then it left. I still can't get rid of the smell of its shit. I'm sorry, Norma. It's okay. I got some air freshener. No, I mean a whole damn thing. I tell you what, Harry, it made me think. About? About our conversation on the roof, for one. I have thought a lot about that myself. I'm not saying I was completely wrong. The world does change, and it keeps changing, and I don't think it's going anywhere soon. But this thing, this lazy Susan... The words fell away for a moment. All Norma could find to say was, Horrible. Harry said nothing. I know what you're thinking, Norma said. You're thinking, why doesn't the old cow make up her mind? No, I wasn't. Truth is, I don't know any more. Don't let it get you crazy. Oh, it's too late for that, Norma said, the laughter coming back into her voice. What is it with these demons, anyhow? Why are they so damn excremental? Because that's what they want the world to be, Norma. Shit. Shit. They'd talked on for a while, but it had been little more than chatter. Only at the end, when Harry said he had to be going, did Norma say, Where? Up the mountain, he told her, to see what the devil looks like face to face. Now, an hour after that conversation, he was climbing, the trees so dense he was almost blind as Norma, and after all the pursuits and losses of recent times, Dusseldorf's death, the massacre of the Zion Karasophia, the events in the Badlands, and the murder of Maria Nazareno. It was a relief that things were coming to an end. He thought of the portrait Ted had made, the Moor in Wickoff Street, with that black snake crushed under a hero's heel. 
How simple that seemed, how blissfully simple. The demon writhes, the demon withers, the demon is gone. It had never been that way, except in stories, and despite what the child at the crossroads had said, leaves on the story tree, Harry had no expectation of a happy ending. 3. Despite his hectoring and cajoling, only four members of the band had turned up at Larry Gladowski's house, Bill Waits, Steve Alstead, Denny Gipps, and Chas Reidlinger. Larry broke out the scotch and laid out his interpretation of events. "'What we've got here is some kind of mind manipulation,' he said. "'Maybe chemical, maybe something put in the water.' "'At least it's not in the scotch,' Bill said. "'This is serious,' Larry said. "'We've got a catastrophe on our hands, gentlemen.' "'What did everyone see?' Gipps asked the room. "'Women,' said Alstead. "'And light,' Rydlinger added. That's what they wanted us to see, Larry said. Who's they? Waits wondered. I mean, we got over the Red Menace, we got over UFOs. So what the hell is it? Don't get me wrong, Larry, I'm not saying you're crazy, because I saw some shit, too. I'd just like to know what we're up against. We're not going to find out sitting here, Alstead replied. We have to go look for ourselves. And what are we going to defend ourselves with? Waits wanted to know. Trumpets and drumsticks? At this juncture, Bosley Cowhick appeared at Gladowski's front door, warning to be included in the ranks. He'd heard about the gathering from his sister, who was a close friend of Alstead's wife, Rebecca. None of the five were at ease with Bosley's brand of glassy-eyed fervor, but with their ranks so woefully thin, it was impossible to say no. And, to be fair, Bosley did his best to restrain his apocalyptic talk, limiting it to a few remarks about how they were all in danger of losing the town to forces— terrible forces, and he was willing to die in its defense. Which remark brought them back to the business of the guns? It was not a difficult problem to solve. Gipps's brother-in-law up on Coleman Street had been fixated on what he called killing sticks since he'd first got his tongue around the words. And when the six-man posse turned up on his doorstep, a little before ten, practically requisitioning the damn things, he was pathetically happy to oblige. Gladowski felt it only polite to invite the brother-in-law along on the venture. The man declined. He was sick, he said, and would only slow things down, but if they needed more guns, they knew where to come. Then it was off to Hamrick's Bar, this at Bill Waits's suggestion, to toast the venture with a scotch. Rydlinger was against it. Couldn't they just get on with doing whatever they were going to do? There was still debate as to what that might be. Then they could all go home and sleep. He was outvoted. The posse headed down to Hamrick's, and even Bosley was talked into a shot of brandy. "'People just don't care,' Bosley remarked, staring around the bar. It was about as full as the fire department would allow, and everyone seemed to be having a good time. "'Thing is, Bosley,' Bill Waite said, "'nobody's quite sure what they saw. I bet if you asked people what happened this afternoon, they'd all say something different.' "'That's the way the devil works, Mr. Waite,' Bosley replied without a trace of self-importance. He wants us to argue among ourselves, and while we're arguing, he gets on with his work. "'And what work would that be?' Bill said. "'Exactly?' "'Leave it alone, Bill,' Chaz said. "'Let's just get out there and—' "'No,' Bosley said, his words a little slurred. "'It's a legitimate question. "'And what's the answer, Bosley?' "'It's the same work the devil's been doing since the beginning of time.' While Bosley talked, Alstead put a second brandy into the man's hand, and Bosley, barely aware that he was doing so, drank it in one, then went on. He wants to take us from God. I left a long time ago, Waite said. He wasn't joking. I'm sure God misses you, Bosley replied with equal sincerity. The two men stared at each other for a long moment, saying nothing. Hey, Bosley, give it a rest, Alstead said. You're creeping me out. And have another brandy. 4. The bullet in Buddenbaum's brain had done nothing to subdue his fury. They are the most ungrateful, hypocritical, petty, paltry, witless, chicken-brained sons of bitches it's ever been my misfortune to work for. He raged, his hand clamped to his healing head. Oh, lay on another show for us, Owen. A nice assassination. A little crime passionel. 
something with children, something with Christians. He turned to Seth, who had been standing at the window overlooking the crossroads, listening to this tirade for the better part of thirty minutes. And did I ever say no? He paused, waiting for an answer. Probably not, Seth said. Damn right. Nothing was too much trouble for them. They wanted to see a president die, no problem. They fancied a massacre or two, it could be arranged. There was nothing they asked for I didn't supply. Nothing. He strode to the window now, casually fingering the wound. But the moment I fumble, just a little tiny mistake, then they're sniffing after that cunt bomb bank, and it's see you later, Owen. We'll take her off and talk about the fucking story tree. He stared at Seth, who stared back. You've got a question in your face, Buddenbaum said. And you've got blood on yours, Seth said. Has something changed between us? Yes, Seth said simply. The fact is, every hour, every minute, I think something different about you. So how would you have it between us? Seth pondered a moment. I wish we could start again, he said. I wish you were just coming up to me under the stars and I was telling you about the angels. Another pause. I wish I still had the angels. I took them away from you. Is that what you're saying? I let you do it, Seth replied. The question... Huh? You had a question on your face? Yeah. I was just wondering about the story tree, that's all. There is no tree, if that's what you're asking, Buddenbaum said. Seth looked disappointed. It's just a phrase some lousy poet came up with. What does it mean? Owen's voice had lost its venom now. He leaned back against the wall beside the window from which he'd fallen two days before. What does it mean? he said. Well, it means that stories are seeds, stories are blossoms, stories are fruit, picked and pressed and eaten. Then we shit out the seeds. Back into the ground? Back into the ground. On and on, Buddenbaum sighed. On and on, he said. With or without us. You don't mean us. Seth said softly. There was no accusation in this, just a melancholy statement of fact. Buddenbaum started to speak, but Seth cut him off short. I was down there, Owen, he said, nodding at the street. You were going to go without me, wherever it was. I got distracted, Owen said. That's all. I've waited so long for this. I couldn't afford to let it slip. It slipped anyway, Seth reminded him. It won't happen again. Owen replied tersely. By God, it won't. How will you prevent it? I need your help, Seth, Buddenbaum said. And I promise, don't promise me anything, Seth said. It's better that way. Buddenbaum sighed. It's taken us so little time to grow apart, he said to Seth. It's as though we've had half a lifetime together in forty-eight hours. Seth gazed out of the window. What do you want me to do? he said. Find Tesla Baum back and make peace with her. Tell her I need to see her. Say whatever you have to say to bring her here. No, not here. He thought of Rita, hair piled high. There's a little cafe I went to. I don't remember the name. It had a blue sign. The Nook. That's it. Bring her there, and tell her to keep the avatars out of earshot, huh? How will she do that? She'll find a way. Okay. And you want me to bring her to the nook? If she'll come. And what if she won't? Then it will all have been for nothing, Owen said. And I'll be wishing I had your angels to listen for. Five. When Harry emerged from the trees, the night had become completely still. There was not a murmur in the air, nor in the grass, nor in the cracks of the rocks. Once he'd climbed far enough to be able to see over the tops of the trees, he'd looked back down at Everville, half expecting that some order to evacuate had gone out, and he would see the town deserted. But no, the lights still burned. There was still traffic in the streets. It was simply that the mist that covered the door at the top of the slope soaked up every sound, leaving the area so hushed he could hear his own heart beating in his head. This is where it happened, 
Coker Amiano said to Erwin as they followed Demur across the slope towards the mist. The hangings? No. The great battle between the families of Summa Summamentus and Ezza Etherium. A very terrible day brought about by a child. You were there? Oh, yes, I was there. And I married the child a little later. Her name was Maeve O'Connell, and she was the most miraculous woman I ever encountered. How so? Everville was her dream, passed down to her by her father, Harmon O'Connell. Harmon as in Heights? The same. Did you know him, too? No, he was dead before I met her. She was wandering here alone, and she came where she was not welcome. It was a simple mistake. And just by coming here she caused a slaughter? By coming here and speaking. Speaking? There was a wedding, you see, being celebrated up there, he pointed towards the mist, and it was the belief in the world from which the families came that silence was sacred, because it preceded the beginning. Love was made in silence, and anyone who broke such a silence was counted the enemy. So why didn't they just kill the girl? Because the families were old enemies, and each thought the child was an agent of the other. As soon as she spoke, they massacred each other. Right here? Right here, Coca said. If we wanted to, I'm sure we could sink into the earth and find their bones. I'll stay where I can see the sky, Erwin said. It is very beautiful tonight, Coca said, throwing back his head to study the stars. Sometimes it seems I've been alone for a hundred lifetimes. And sometimes, tonight, for instance, it's as if we only parted glances a few hours ago. He let out a strange sound, and when Erwin looked at him, he saw that tears were spilling down his cheeks. Hers were the last eyes I saw. I felt them on me as I was dying, and I tried to hold on to life just a while, tried to keep looking at her, to comfort her the way she was comforting me. He had to stop for a moment to recover himself, but the life went out of me before it went out of her. And when I came into this, he opened his hands in front of him, this life after death, her body had been taken, and so had my son's. No wonder you hated Dolan so much. Oh, I hated him. But he was human. He couldn't help himself. Were your people so perfect, then? Erwin said. There's no difference between my people and yours, Coca replied. Give or take a wing or a tail. We're all the same in our hearts, all sad and cruel. He paused, wiping the tears away, and, as he did, glanced up the slope. "'I think our friend Demur is having a problem,' he said. In the last few minutes, during their tearful exchange, Irwin and Coker had dropped maybe fifty yards behind Demur, who was within a few strides of the mist. Plainly he had sensed the enemy, because he now fell to the ground behind a boulder and lay still. Moments later, the problem Coker had spoken of emerged from the mist in the form of not one, but four individuals, each of them of competitive ugliness, one a sliver, one obese, one bovin, one bilious. The thinnest of them was also the most eager, and came down the slope twenty yards, passing by the place where Demur lay, sniffing the air. "'I think maybe it's us they're after,' Coker said. "'What the hell are they?' Creatures of quiddity, Coker replied. Appalling. I'm sure they'd say the same about you, Coker remarked. The thin creature was heading on down the incline, and it did indeed seem that he was closing on the ghosts. What do we do? Erwin said. The closer the creature got, the more distressing he appeared to be. He can't do us any harm, Coker said. But if they see Demur... The rake-thin creature seemed to be staring right at Irwin, which he found deeply disquieting. "'It sees me,' Irwin said. "'I doubt it.' "'It does, I tell you. Well, you were carping about being invisible on the way up. You can't have it. Damn!' "'What? They found him.' Irwin looked past the thin man and saw perhaps the most brutal of the creatures catching hold of the moor and dragging him to his feet. "'This is our fault,' Coker said. "'I'm damn sure it's us they came looking for.' Irwin was not so certain, but there was no doubt that Damour was in serious trouble. One of the quartet had disarmed him, another was beating him about the face. As for the creature that had come down the slope, it had turned from Irwin and Coker, and was making its way back to join its companions, 
who were now dragging their prisoner into the mist. "'What do we do?' Erwin said. "'We follow,' Coker said. "'And if they kill him, we apologize. Last time Harry had climbed the heights, Voigt's tattoos had allowed him to reach the very threshold undetected. But the trick hadn't worked this time. He didn't know why, and in truth it didn't matter. He was in the hands of his enemies. Gamaliel, the stick insect, Bartho, the crucified, Mutep, the runt, and Swanky, the obese. There was nothing to be done about it. He didn't attempt to resist them, in part because he knew it would only invite violence, and in part because, after all, he'd come up the slope to see what the devil looked like, and they were taking him to the door through which it would come, so why resist? And there was a third reason. These creatures were cousins of the demon that had taken Father Hess's life. He didn't understand the genealogy of it, but he knew by their chatter and their frenzy and their stench that they were somehow connected. Perhaps then, in the final minutes before the Eads' arrival, he might learn from one or other of these horrors what the message from Lazy Susan meant. I am you, and you are love. Even at the end, was love what made the world go round? 5. 1. It wasn't dark in the belly of the Eod Ouroboros, nor was it light. There was only an absence of light and dark of height and depth, of sound and texture, that might have passed for oblivion itself had Joe not been able to list all that it lacked. The oblivion, he was sure, would be a thoughtless condition. So what was this place, and he in it? Was he a ghost of some kind haunting the Eod's head, or a soul trapped in the flesh of the beast until it puked him up or perished? He felt no threat to his existence here, but he suspected his hold on who he was would quickly become slippery. It would only be a matter of time before his thoughts lost coherence, and he forgot himself completely. That prospect had seemed attractive enough when he'd been standing by the pool in the temple. He'd lived his life and was ready to give it up. But now, as he floated, if a thing without substance could be said to float, in the emptiness he wondered if perhaps his presence here had been planned or predicted by the Zarapushu. He remembered how hungrily the first shoe he'd encountered on the shore outside Liverpool had studied him. Had it, or the mind of which it was part, been sizing him up for some role in events to come, peering beyond the flesh of him, to see if he'd be worth a dam in the belly of the Eod? If so, if there was indeed a purpose in his being here, then it was his duty to the shoe, whose gaze was without question one of the most wonderful experiences of his travels, to preserve whatever part of him remained, his memory, his spirit, his soul, and not succumb to forgetfulness. Name yourself, he thought. At least remember that. He had no mouth, of course, nor tongue, nor lips, nor lungs. All he could do was think. I am Joe Flicker. I am Joe Flicker. Doing so had an instant effect. The featureless state convulsed, and forms began to become available to his soul's senses. He had no way of knowing his true scale here, of course. Perhaps he was tiny in this formless form, like a moat seen in a shaft of sunlight, in which case all that was congealing around him was not titanic as it seemed, but he, its witness, a fleck. Whichever was true, he felt insignificant in the presence of these cohering shapes. He turned his sight around, and in every direction, rising to the domed darkness above him, where ragged shapes moved as though it were the breeding place for men of war, down to the pit, lined with heaving abstractions, below him was a latticework of encrusted matter. He was by no means certain that these sights were real, the way the body lying beside the temple pool below had been real. Perhaps they were simply thoughts in the head of Eod Ouroboros, and he was present in the midst of some eotic vision of heaven and hell, a firmament of unfinished angels, a pit of nonsenses, and in between a sprawling and infinitely complex web of knotted and corrupted memories. There were places he saw where the strands seemed to become clotted, forming large, almost egg-shaped masses. His curiosity as to their nature was enough to propel him, he no sooner puzzled over them than his spirit was moving towards the largest in his immediate vicinity. 
The closer he came to it, the more its appearance distressed him. Whereas the incrustations on the web were organic, the surface of the egg was of another order completely. It was a mass of overlapping forms, like the pieces of a lunatic jigsaw, each failing to quite mesh with the one below, and each worked with an obsessively complex design. Nor was its appearance the only source of distress. A sound was emanating from it, or rather several sounds swarming together. One was like the whispers of children, one was a slow, arrhythmical throb, like the beat of a failing heart and the third was a whine that wormed its way into Joe's thoughts as if to disconnect them. He was tempted to retreat, but he resisted and pressed his spirit on, more certain with every moment that there was great pain here, nearly unendurable pain, in fact. The surface of the form was a catalogue of lunatic motions, ticks and spasms and twitches, the jigsaw's pieces coming away in a hundred places like shed scales while others, thorny and raw in their budding form, unfurled. Off to his left something iridescent caught his eye, and he looked its way to see that the shedding had momentarily revealed what lay beneath this maddened, whispering mass. He moved towards it, and for the first time since approaching the egg had the sense that his presence had been noted. The motions became more fevered the closer to the sliver of iridescence he came, and all around the place the scaly pieces oozed a dark fluid, as if to conceal the spot while they bred a more permanent cover. Joe was not deceived. He closed on the sliver, certain there was some vital mystery here, and in response the motions became more frenzied, until suddenly the tremors seemed to reach critical mass, and a dozen shapes rose from the surface surrounding him. None of them made much literal sense. He could not distinguish a limb or a head, much less an eye or a mouth, but they gaped and twitched and swelled in ways that evoked a parade of abominations. Something gutted but living. Something aborted but living. Something decayed into muck, but living and living. Though he'd left his body behind him and thought himself free of it, these horrors reminded him of every wound he'd ever suffered, of every sickness, of every weakness. He had come too close to the iridescence to be frightened off, however. Turning his sight from these manifestations, he slipped through their net and into the midst of whatever secret they concealed. He was delivered into a curving channel, down which he flew, it rapidly began to narrow and narrow as though he were in an ever-closing spiral. The light that had called him here did not diminish as he traveled, but remained steady as the curves tightened the channel so narrow now he was certain a hair could not have been threaded through it. And still it grew narrower, until he began to think it would wink out of existence completely and perhaps take him along with it. He no sooner formed this thought than his progress seemed to slow until he was barely moving. Even at a creeping pace, however, the spiral was here, so tight he kept turning and turning on himself, until at last all motion ceased. He waited in the gleaming channel, puzzled. And then slowly the realization rose in him that he was not alone. He looked ahead, and though he could see nothing, he was aware that something was staring back at him. He returned the gaze without fear, and as he did so, images began to erupt among his thoughts— beautiful, simple images of the world he'd left behind. A field of lush grass, through which a tidal wind was moving. A porch overgrown with scarlet bougainvillea, where a child with white blonde hair was laughing. A doughnut shop at dusk, with the evening star above it set in a flawless blue. Somebody was dreaming here, he thought, yearning for the helter in Sendo and it was someone who had been there and seen these sights with their own eyes. Human. There was something human here, a prisoner of the Eid, he assumed, trapped in this gleaming spiral and guarded by reminders of its flesh and its frailties. He had no way of questioning it, no way of knowing if it had simply folded him into its visions, had comprehended that it was no longer alone. If the latter, then perhaps he could liberate it lead it out of its dreaming cell. He turned his curious spirit around and began to make his way back along the channel, hoping that the prisoner would follow. He was not disappointed. After a few seconds of travel, the channel widening once more, he glanced back and felt the eyeless stare upon him. 
The escape, however, was not without consequence. Even as he picked up his pace, fractures appeared in the walls around them, and the fluid he'd seen ooze between the scales when he'd first approached the channel trickled into view. It was not, he now comprehended, the blood of the eared, but rather its raw stuff, turning even as it appeared into the same wretched, sickening forms. But for all their burgeoning vileness, there was something about their spread that smacked of desperation. Did he dare believe that they, or the mind that directed them, was afraid? Not of him, perhaps, but of whatever came on his spirit heels, the dreamer he'd woken with his presence. The further the two spirits travelled, the more certain he became that this was so. The fractures were fissures now, the Eid's mud spilling into their path, but they were quicksilver. Before the Eid could block their path with atrocities, they were escaping the spiral, dodging between the entities that had risen from the prison in all directions. Some seemed to have fashioned wings from their flayed hides, others had the appearance of things turned inside out, others still were like flocks of burned birds, sewn into a single anguished form. They came after the escapees in a foul horde, their whispers rising to shrieks now, their bodies colliding with the strands and dragging them after, so that when Joe glanced back the web was shaking in all directions and sending down a rain of dead matter, which beat upon his spirit like a black hail. It rapidly became so thick, this hail, that he lost contact with the dreamer completely. He tried to turn back and find his fellow spirit, but the horde had grown apace and came at him like a raging wall, pressing a gust of hail ahead of it. He felt himself struck over and over, each assault beating him back and blinding him as it did so, until he could no longer see the dome or the pit or anything between. He reeled in darkness for a few moments, not knowing which way he had come, and then, to his astonishment, a blaze of light enveloped him, and he was falling through the empty air. Below him he saw the dream sea churned into a frenzy by the Eard's approach, and beyond it a city in whose harbour the ships were lifted so high they would soon be pitched into the streets. It was Liverpool, of course. In the time he'd adventured in the Eid's head or belly, the creature had strode across quiddity, and was almost at the threshold between worlds. He had time, as he fell in the midst of Eid's hail, to look along the shore towards the door. It was still wreathed in mist, but he could see the dark crack, and thought perhaps he glimpsed a star gleaming in the sky over Harmon's Heights. Then he struck the waters amid a hail of the attic matter, and before he could free his spirit of its weight, a wave rose beneath him, and, bearing him up amid a raft of detritus, carried him on towards the city streets, where it left him, stranded in the shadow of the power that had shat him out. 6. 1. Lucky Joe said the face, looming over Phoebe. It was as cracked as Unger's Creek in a drought. Phoebe raised her head off the hard pillow. What about him? I'm just saying he's damn lucky the way you talk about him. What was I saying? Mostly just his name, King Texas replied. She looked past his muddy shoulder. The cave behind him was vast and filled with people standing, sitting, lying down. Did they hear me? she asked Texas. He smiled conspiratorially. No, he said, only me. Have I broken any bones? she said, looking down at her body. Nothing, he said. I'd never let a woman's blood be spilled down here. What is it? Bad luck? The worst, he said. The very worst. What about Musnikov? What about him? Did he survive? King Texas shook his head. "'So you saved me, but not him?' "'I warned her, didn't I?' he said, almost petulantly. "'I said I'd kill him if she didn't turn back.' "'He wasn't to blame.' "'And neither am I,' Texas said. "'She's the trouble. Always was.' "'So why don't you just put her out of your mind? You've got plenty of company.' "'No, I don't.' "'What about them?' she said, pointing to the assembly on his back. Look again, he said. Puzzled, she sat up, and, scanning the assembly, realized her error. What she had taken to be a congregation of living souls was, in fact, a crowd of sculptures, some set with fragments of glittering ore, some roughly hewn from blocks of stone, some barely human in shape. Who made them? she said. You? Who else? You really are alone down here. 
Not by choice, but yes. So you made these to keep you company? No, they were my attempts to find some form that would win Mistress O'Connell's affections. Phoebe swung her legs off the bed and got to her feet. Is it all right if I look at them? she asked him. Help yourself, he told her, standing aside. Then, as she walked past him, he murmured, I could forbid you nothing. She pretended not to hear the remark, suspecting it would only open a subject she was not willing to address. Did she ever see any of these faces? she asked him, wandering between the statues. One or two, he replied somewhat mournfully, but none of them made any impression upon her. Maybe you misunderstood, Phoebe began. Misunderstood what? The reason she doesn't care for you any longer? I'm sure it's nothing to do with the way you look. She's half blind anyway. So what does she want from me? King Texas wailed. I built her highways, I built her a harbor, I leveled the ground so that she could dream her city into being. Was she beautiful? Phoebe said. Never. Not even a little? No, she was antiquated even when I met her, and she'd just been hanged, filthy, foul-mouthed. But? But what? There was something you loved. Oh, yes, he said softly. What? The fire in her, for one, the appetite in her. And the stories, of course. She told good stories? She's got Irish blood, so of course, he smiled to himself. That's how she made the city, he explained. She told it. Night after night, sat on the ground and told it. Then she'd sleep, and in the morning what she'd told would be there. The houses, the monuments, the pigeons, the smell of fish, the fogs, the smoke— that's how she made it all, stories and dreams, dreams and stories. It was wonderful to watch. I think I was never so much in love as those mornings, getting up and seeing what she'd made. Listening to his reverie, Phoebe found herself warming to him. He was probably a fool for love, just as Maeve had said, and clearly that had made him a little crazed. But she understood that feeling well enough. There was a rumbling now from somewhere up above them, a patter of dust fell from the cracked ceiling. The Eid has arrived, he said. Oh, my God! His pebble eyes rolled in his sockets. I think it's overturning her city, he said. There was a calm sadness in his voice. I don't want to be buried down here. You're not going to die, he said. What I told Maeve is true. The Eid will pass over, but the rock will remain. You're safe here with me. The tremors came again. Phoebe shuddered. Come into my arms if you're nervous, Texas said. I'm okay, she replied. But I would like to see what's going on up there. Easy, he replied. Come with me. As he led her through the labyrinth of his kingdom, on the walls of which he'd configured and reconfigured his face ten thousand times, rehearsing it for a love scene he'd now never play, he meditated aloud about life in the rock. But with the turmoil from above escalating with every stride she took, and the walls creaking and stones pattering down, she caught only fragments of what he was saying. "'It's not solid at all,' he said at one point. "'Everything flows if you watch it for long enough.' And a little later, "'A fossil heart, that's what I've got, but it still aches and aches.' And later still, "'San Antonio is the place to die.' I wish I had flesh still to lay down in the Alamo. Finally, after maybe ten minutes of such bits and pieces, he led her into a sizable chamber, the entire floor of which was raked and polished. There, in the very ground beneath her feet, was a periscopic reflection of what was going on above ground. It was an awe-inspiring sight. The seething darkness of the Eod's body invading the streets of the city she had been walking in just hours before carrying before it remnants of the places it had laid waste on its way here. She saw a head lopped from some titanic statue rolling down one of the streets, felling entire buildings as it went. She saw what looked to be a small island deposited in the middle of a city square. Several ships had come to rest among the spires of the cathedral, and their sails had unfurled as if to bear it away before the next wind. And among this debris— in numbers beyond counting, were creatures trawled from the depths of the dream sea by the Eod's passage. The least of them were fantasias on the theme of fish, 
gleaming shoals of visionary life thrown up in waves above the city's roofs, then falling in glorious profusion. Far more extraordinary were the creatures drawn up, Phoebe supposed, from Quiddity's deepest trenches, their forms inspired by, or inspirations for, the tales of mariners the world over. Was that glistening coil not a sea serpent, its eyes burning like twin furnaces in its hooded head? And that beast wrapping its arms around the masks of a grounded cutter, was that not the mother of all octopi? Damn it! King Texas said. I never liked competing with that city of hers for her attention, but this is no way for it to end. Phoebe said nothing. Her gaze had gone from the debris to the Eid itself. What she saw put her in mind of a disease, a terrible, implacable, devouring disease. It had no face. It had no malice. It had no guilt. Perhaps it didn't even have a mind. It came because it could, because nothing stopped it. It's going to destroy Everville, she said to Texas. Maybe. There's no maybe about it, she protested. Why should you care, he said. You don't love it there, do you? No, Phoebe said. But I don't want to see it destroyed, either. You don't have to, Texas said. You're here with me. Phoebe pondered this a moment. Plainly, she wasn't going to get him to intervene on her behalf. But maybe there was another way. If I were Maeve she began. You're too sane. But if I were, if I'd founded a city the way she'd founded Everville, not with dreams, but with plain hard work, yes, and somebody protected it for me, kept my city safe, she let the notion trail. There was fifteen seconds of silence, while Liverpool shook and trembled under their feet. Then he said, Would you love that somebody? Maybe I would, she said. Oh, my lord, he murmured. It looks like the Eads giving up on the city, she said. It's starting to move along the shore. My shore, King Texas said. I'm the rock, remember? He crossed the mirror to where she stood and laid his mud hand upon her cheek. Thank you, he said. You've given me hope. He turned from her, saying, Stay here. I don't stay, I said, and watch. 2. During the voyage to Meme Beketer Sabat, Noah Summa Summamentis had spoken of the Eid Ouroboros's power to induce terror by its very proximity. But until now, when Joe entered the streets of Liverpool, he had seen no evidence of that power. In Beketer Sabat, the Eid's malevolence had been held in thrall to the shoe, and by the time it had been unleashed, Joe was a spirit, and apparently immune to its influence. But the survivors who wandered through the shaking desolation were plainly victims, shrieking and sobbing for relief from the madness overwhelming them. Some had succumbed to it, and sat in the rubble with blank faces. Others were driven to terrible acts of self-harm to stop the horrors, beating their heads against stones or tearing at their chests to still their hearts. Powerless to help them, Joe could only wander on, determined to at least be a witness to what the E had perpetrated. Perhaps there was some higher court in which its crimes would be judged. If so, he would testify. There was a large bonfire burning in the street ahead, its flames brightening the filthy air. Approaching, he saw that it was attended by perhaps twenty people who were circling it hand in hand, praying aloud. You who are divided, be whole in our hearts. Surely they were appealing to the shoe, he thought. You who are divided. Their prayer apparently went unheard, however. Though the Eid had left off its destruction of the city, there were remnants of its shadow presence haunting the streets, and one such portion, no more than a dozen feet tall and resembling a pillar of darkness, was approaching the fire from the far end of the street. One of the group, a young woman with a mouth that resembled a fleshy rose, broke the circle and started to retreat from the fire, shaking her head wildly. The worshipper to her left caught hold of her hand and proceeded to haul her back to the fire. Hold on, he said to her. It's our only hope. But the damage had been done. The circle, once broken, had lost any charm it might have possessed, and now each of the worshippers succumbed to the Eid's baleful influence. One of the men pulled out a knife and proceeded to threaten the air in front of him. Another reached into the flames, searing his hand and yelling for some horror or other to keep away from him. 
As he did so, he looked up through the fire, and his agonized face suddenly cleared of its confusions. He pulled his hand out of the fire and stared at Joe. Look, he murmured. Joe was as astonished as the man witnessing him. You see me? he said. The man failed to hear him. He was too busy yelling for his fellow worshippers to, Look! Look! Another had seen him now, a woman whose face was a mass of bruises, but who at the sight of him broke into an ecstatic smile. Look how it shines, she said. It heard, somebody else murmured. We prayed, and it heard. What are you seeing? Joe said to them. But they made no sign of hearing him. They simply watched the place where his spirit stood, and wept and gaped and offered up thanks. One of their number looked back down the street towards the approaching Eid. It was approaching no longer. Either it had been recalled into the body of its nation, or else it had retreated from the force of joy that suddenly surrounded the fire. The young woman who had first broken the circle now approached Joe. There were tears running down her cheeks, and her body was shaking, but she was fearless in her desire to touch this vision. Let me know you, she said, as she raised her hand towards Joe. Be with me forever and ever. The words and the need in her eyes disturbed him. Whatever had happened here, it was nothing he comprehended, much less sought. He was still Joe Flicker, still and only. I can't, he said, though he knew they couldn't hear him, and willed himself away from the place. It was harder to leave than it had been to arrive. Their gazes seemed to slow him, and he had to struggle to free himself from them. Only when he was fifty yards away down the street, and their desire no longer held a claim over him, did he dare look back. They were in each other's arms, weeping for joy, all except the woman who'd tried to touch him. She was still looking down the street in his direction, and though he was too far from her to see her eyes, he felt her gaze upon him, and knew he would not readily be free of it. Three. Texas! Phoebe yelled. Damn you! Can you hear me? She had long ago vacated the mirror chamber for the very good reason that it was close to collapse. Now, in a tunnel lined with his faces, she stood and demanded his presence. He didn't come, however. Remembering how much the thought of a woman's blood being spilled here had distressed him, she dug through the rock shards underfoot until she located something sharp, pulled up her sleeve, and without giving herself time to think twice, opened a four-inch cut just above her wrist. Her blood had never looked redder. She squealed with the pain of it, but she let it flow and flow, sinking back against the wall as her head spun. "'What are you doing?' Almost instantly he rose before her in the form of liquid rock, raging. I told you, no blood! So get me out of here, she said, chilly with a sudden sweat. Or I'll just keep bleeding. The shaking was getting worse by the moment. In the walls there was a grinding sound, as though some vast engine was slipping its gears. I am the rock, he said. So you keep saying. If I said you were safe, then safe you were. The wall behind her shook so violently, several of his rejected faces cracked and fell to the ground. "'Are you going to take me up or not?' she said. "'I'll take you,' he said, unknitting his feet from the floor of the passage and approaching her. "'But you must come with me on my terms.' She looked at him through a throbbing haze. "'What are your terms?' she said. His face was cruder than she'd previously seen it, she realized, like a mask hewn with a dull axe. If I take you, he said, then it must be here. He opened his arms. For your safety you must be cradled in the rock, agreed? She nodded. It was not such a terrible idea. He was a king, he was a rock, and he had a heart for love, even if it was a fossil. Agreed, she said, and clamping her hand to her cut arm to stem the flow, let him gather her into his embrace. 7. One. Grillo was no expert when it came to babies, but he was damn sure the sound coming from the child in Joe Beth's arms wasn't healthy. What's wrong with her? he said. I don't know. It sounds like she's choking. I think maybe you should stop. The baby seemed to be having minor convulsions now, and with every bump in the road they were worsening. Grillo slowed it down a little, but Joe Beth wasn't satisfied. Stop, she said, just for a minute or two. He glanced down at little Amy, who was making a pitiful sobbing sound. Reluctantly, he pulled over and brought the car to a halt. 
She wants her daddy, Joe Beth said. He'll catch us up. I know, the girl went on. The child's sobs were subsiding now. Why don't you leave us here? She said. He won't come looking for you as long as he's found us. What the hell are you talking about? I know you did what you thought was right, but it wasn't. Amy knows it, and so do I. You're talking about Tommy Ray, Grillo said softly. We have to be together, she said, or we'll die. We'll all of us die. Grillo looked back down at the child in her arms. I don't know whether you're mixed up, fucked up, or just plain crazy, but I'm not trusting you with Amy any longer. He reached down to take the baby from her. She instantly drew the child tight to her body, but Grillo wasn't about to be denied. He dug his arm down around the bundle and pulled Amy out of her mother's arms. To his surprise, Joe Beth didn't attempt to reclaim her. Instead, she glanced back down the road. He's coming, she said, reaching for the handle of the door. Stay inside. But he's coming. I said, too late. She had the handle down and was pushing open the door. He grabbed for our arm and caught it momentarily, but she slipped him and stumbled out into the road. Get back in here, he yelled. A gust of wind rocked the car, then a second more violent than the first. Joe Beth was standing in the middle of the road now, turning on her heels and lightly touching her breasts. Again the car rocked. This time Grillo knew he couldn't wait for her. If he got out to fetch her, she'd outrun him, and all the time her beloved death boy was getting closer, closer. He gently laid the child on the passenger seat and was reaching over to pull the door closed when a blast of bitter, dirty air hit him in the face, sending him sprawling across the seat. The back of his skull hit the window hard, but grabbing the wheel, he started to haul himself up again, reaching for the baby with his free hand as he did so. The dust was filling the interior, forming fingers to scrabble at his eyes and reaching down into his throat to choke him. Blinded, he kept reaching for the child as the car's rocking became steadily more violent. He found the blanket and began to pull it towards him, but as he did so, the ghosts pushed the car over onto two wheels, where it teetered, its metalwork creaking. He inched the blanket towards him, fearful that at any moment the dusty dead would claim the baby from its folds while the legion threw its will and wind against the car, plainly determined to overturn it. Perhaps some of his tormentors had been summoned to help, because the fingers tearing at his eyes and throat had retreated. He wiped his face against his shoulder to clear his sight and opened his eyes only to find that the blanket in his hand was empty. Grabbing the dashboard, he hauled himself up towards the open door, determined to get Amy back. The windshield shattered as he climbed, and through the dust he saw the abductors' faces, four or five of them carved of the dirty air and leering at his desperation. "'Bastards!' he yelled at them. "'Bastards!' The sound of his voice brought a sob, not from the ghosts, but from Amy. They'd not taken her, after all. She'd slipped between the front seats and was lying, as yet unharmed, on the floor behind him. "'It's okay,' he said to her, forsaking his handhold to reach for her. As he did so, the car's teeterings reached the point of no return, and it was flung over onto its side. Through the din of breaking glass and concertinaed metal, he heard the voice of the death boy, roaring, "'Stop!' The order came too late. The car was pushed over onto its roof, which buckled under the impact. The remaining windows blew inwards. The glove compartment spilled its contents. Tumbling in a hail of trash, Grillo's instincts overtook his conscious thought, and he drew the baby into his arms as he fell. His frail body snapped and tore. He felt something in his belly and chest like a sudden dyspepsia. Then the vehicle rocked to a halt, and there was something close to silence. For a moment he thought the child was dead, but it seemed she was simply shocked into silence, because he heard her ragged breathing close to him in the darkness. He was upside down, his legs akimbo, and something hot was running down his body from his groin. He smelt it now, sharp and familiar. He was pissing himself. Very gingerly he tried to shift himself, but there was something preventing him doing so. He reached up to his chest, and his fingers found a spike of wet metal sticking out of his body a few inches behind his left clavicle. It gave him no pain, though there was little doubt he was skewered from back to front. Oh, Lord! he said to himself very softly, then feebly reached out towards the source of Amy's breathing. The motion seemed to take an age. He had time, while he reached and reached, to think of Tesla and hope she would be spared the sight of him like this. She had endured so much, and after all her searching and suffering had gained so very little. His fingers had found Amy's face, and inch by inch he passed his hand over her tiny body. His hand was becoming numb, but 
As far as he could gather, she was not bloodied, which was some comfort. Then, as he once again reached up to her face, she took hold of his finger and grasped it. He was astonished at her strength, delighted, too, for it surely meant she'd not sustained any significant harm. He demanded his body draw a little extra breath, and his muscles obliged him. He drew a sip of air into his seeping lungs, enough for a word or two. He used it wisely. I'm here, he said to Amy, and died so quietly she didn't know he'd gone. Two. Even before they rounded the corner, Tesla heard the ghost's cacophony, a rising wail of complaint. She pulled the bike over and parked on the curve, just out of sight. Whatever we find around that corner, she told Howie as they dismounted, keep control of yourself. I just want my wife and baby back. And we'll get them. Tesla said. But Howie, brute force isn't going to do us any good. One word and we're both dead. Think about that. You're not going to be much use to Joe Beth and Amy dead. Point made, Tesla headed off round the corner. There were no street lights along the road, but there was enough light from moon and stars for the scene to be plain enough. Grillo's car sat battered and overturned. Joe Beth was standing clear of it, apparently unharmed. There was no sign of either Grillo or the baby. As for Tommy Ray, he was disciplining his troops. The ghosts gathered round his feet like a pack of beaten curs. Fucking stupid! he yelled at them. Stupid! He reached down into their shifting substance and hauled two ragged handfuls of it up towards his face. It hung from his fingers in tatters. Why don't you learn? he raged. The murmurs of the ghosts grew more panicky. Some of them turned their wretched faces up towards him in supplication. Others hid their heads, apparently knowing what was coming. Tommy Ray opened his mouth, wider than any natural anatomy allowed, and put the muck-laced ether between his teeth. Then he literally inhaled it, sucking the dirty air into his body. Tesla saw two phantom faces, sobbing and gasping, disappear down the death boy's gullet, while the next in line scrabbled to avoid joining them. But the lesson was apparently over, because now he grabbed the strands of matter that hung from the corners of his mouth and bit down on them, grinding them between his teeth. The ether dropped away from either side of his chin. He let the severed ends drop. The survivors murmured their gratitude and shrank away. The whole episode had taken perhaps fifteen seconds, during which time Tesla and Howe had halved the distance between the corner and the wreckage. They were now no more than twenty-five yards from the car and in danger of being seen if Tommy Ray chanced to look in their direction. Luckily, he had another distraction, Joe Beth. He had gone to her and was speaking to her face to face. She didn't retreat from him, even when his hands went up to her face, stroked her cheek, her hair, her lips. She stood unmoving before him. Christ, how he murmured. Tesla glanced over her shoulder. There's something alive in there she said, nodding back at Grillo's car. How he looked. I don't see anything, he said, his gaze returning to the dalliance between the twins. He can't do that, he growled, and pushing past Tesla, started towards them. He was gone so fast, Tesla had no choice but to act out at the same time. She moved off towards the car, scanning the dark snarl of metal for further evidence of life. She found it, too. A tiny motion. She was perhaps a dozen yards from the car now, the stinging smell of gasoline filling her head. Bending low and moving fast, she moved round the far side of the vehicle, putting the wreckage between her and Tommy Ray. Though she tried to tune out his voice, snatches of what he was telling Joe Beth drifted her way. There'll be more, he murmured, lots more. She knelt in the pooled gasoline and peered into the wreckage, using Tommy Ray's talk to cover her calling. Grillo? As she spoke, her eyes began to make sense of the tangled forms in front of her. There was an upturned seat, a letter of maps, and there among them—oh, God, there was Grillo's arm. She reached out and touched it, whispering his name again. There was no response. Ducking her head through the broken window, she started to pull at the debris, blocking her way to him. A drizzle of oil fell on her hair and ran down her face. She wiped it away from her eyes with the back of her hand and attacked the wreckage afresh. A portion of the seat came away this time, which she shoved to the side, offering her a fuller view of him. His face was half turned towards her, and seeing him, she said his name again, knowing in the same moment that her breath was wasted. He was dead, pierced by a spike of metal. 
Despite the horror of this, it seemed from his expression that he had not died in anguish. His worn face, which she had reached up to touch, was almost serene. As her fingers grazed his cheek, something moved in the darkness beyond him. Amy, it was Amy! Tesla inched into the creaking wreckage until her face was inches from Grillo's pierced chest and peered over him. There was the baby, her eyes wet and wide in the murk, her hand clutching the index finger of Grillo's left hand. There was no hope of moving the dead man, Tesla was certain. He and the vehicle were inextricably connected. Her only hope, and Amy's, was to reach over the body past the spike that had skewered Grillo and ease the child between the ragged metal overhead and the corpse below. She crawled as far into the wreckage as space would allow and stretched her arms across Grillo's body, her breasts pressed against his sticky torso, to take hold of the infant. As she did so, she heard Tommy Ray's voice. Dead, he was saying. This time there was an audible response, not from Joe Beth, but from Howie. Tesla caught only a few of the words, enough to know he was addressing Joe Beth, not her brother. Keep talking, Tesla murmured. The longer Howie kept Tommy Ray distracted, the more hope she had of getting the child out. With some gentle persuasion she succeeded in loosing Amy's hand from Grillo's finger, and now began to lift her over Grillo's body, shimmying backwards as she did so, belly to the roof of the car. The baby was eerily quiet throughout. Shock, Tesla presumed. It's okay, she cooed, attempting a smile of reassurance. Amy looked back at her blankly. They were almost free of the wreckage now. Certain that she would not lay eyes on Grillo again, she took a moment to study his face. Soon, she promised him. Very soon. Then she knelt up, gathering the baby to her body, and started to get to her feet. On the other side of the wreckage, Tommy Ray was yelling. There was a complexity in his voice Tesla had never heard before, as though he had assembled a chorus of the dead he'd devoured, and they were weaving their voices with his. "'Tell him,' the voices were saying to Joe Beth, "'tell him the truth!' Clear of the wreckage now, Tesla dared to stand, assuming, correctly, the death boy would be too preoccupied to look in her direction. He was standing a little way behind his sister, his hands on her shoulders. "'Tell him how it is between us,' the voices out of him said. Joe Beth's features were no longer a blank. Face to face with her husband, whose distress was all too apparent, she could not help but be moved. Tommy Ray shook her a little. "'Why don't you just spit it out?' he said. Finally she spoke. "'I don't know any more,' she said. At the sound of her voice, the baby in Tesla's arms began crying. Tesla froze as three pairs of eyes were turned towards her. "'Amy!' Joe Beth sobbed, and breaking from her place between the two men, she started towards Tesla, arms outstretched. "'Give it to me!' She was a yard or two from the wreckage when Tommy Ray yelled, "'Wait!' There was such vehemence in his voice she obeyed on the instinct. "'Before you touch that kid,' Tommy Ray demanded, "'I want you to tell him who it belongs to.' Tesla could see Joe Beth's face. The men could not. She could see the conflict written on it. W -w "'What are you t -t 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 talking about?' How he said. "'I don't think she wants to tell you,' Tommy Ray said. "'But I do. I want you to know once and for all.' I came calling quite a while back just to see how my little sister was doing, and we got together. Like you wouldn't believe. The kid's mine, cats. Howie's eyes were on Joe Beth. Tell him he's a liar, he said. The girl didn't move. Joe Beth? Tell him he, he, he's a liar. He had taken the gun out of his jacket. Tesla had seen him drop it in the parking lot. He'd obviously snatched it up again before climbing on the back of the bike and he waved it in Joe Beth's general direction. "'I w w want you to t t tell him!' he yelled at her. He he "'He's a liar!' Tesla's gaze went from his face to the gun, to Joe Beth, to the wet ground, and images of the mall in Palomo Grove filled her head. Fletcher, soaked in gasoline and eager for death by fire, the gun clutched in her own hand, ready to strike a spark. "'Not again,' she prayed. "'Please, God, not again!' Tommy Ray was still ranting. You never had her, cats, not really. You thought you did, but she goes deeper than you could ever get. He jiggled his lips as he spoke. Real deep. Howie looked down at the gasoline around his enemy's feet and without hesitation fired. 
the whole sequence of events. The looking and the firing could only have occupied three or four seconds, but it was long enough for Tesla to wonder what place synchronicity had upon the story tree. Then the spark came, and the flame followed, and the air around Tommy Ray turned gold. Howie let out a whoop of triumph. Then he turned his gaze on Joe Beth. You still want him? he yelled. Joe Beth let out a sob. He loves me, she said. No, Howie yelled, striding towards her now. No, no, no. I am the one who loves you. He stabbed at his chest with his finger. Always did. Before I met you, I loved you. As he approached her, the fire that had bloomed around the death boy moved across the ground in her direction. She didn't see it. She was too busy yelling at Howie to, Stop! Please stop! Howie! Tesla yelled. He looked her way. The fire, Howie! He saw it now, dropped his gun and raced towards Joe Beth, shouting to her as he went. Before he'd halved the distance between them, the flames that had obscured the death boy parted like a curtain, and Tommy Ray strode into view. He was blazing from head to foot, fire spurting from his mouth and eye sockets, from his belly, from his groin. His immolation seemed not to concern him over much, however. He advanced upon his sister with an almost casual lope. She had seen his approach, and would surely have run from him, but the ground at her feet was alight, and as she retreated the flames ignited her dress. She began to shriek and beat at the fire with her hands, but it quickly consumed the light fabric, leaving her nearly naked for its play. Howie was a couple of yards from the flames now, and without hesitation he plunged into them, arms outstretched to claim his wife. But the death boy was a yard from him and caught hold of his jacket collar in his fiery fist. Howie half turned to beat him back, grabbing at the shrieking Joe Beth with his free hand. The fire had reached her long hair, and it suddenly ignited, a column of fire rising off her scalp. Howie reached for her, plainly intending to carry her out of the fire. Her arms were open, and as he took hold of her, they closed around him. Tesla had witnessed horrors aplenty along the road that had brought her to this moment, but nothing, not in the loop, not at point zero, as terrible as this. Joe Beth was no longer shrieking now. Her body was jerking around as though she was in the throes of a fit, her spasms so violent Howie could not carry her out of the fire, nor could he detach himself. Her blackened arms were molded around him, keeping him a prisoner in the midst of the pyre. Tommy Ray had started to shout now, a shrill, lunatic din. He started to tear Howie away from Joe Beth, or at least tried to, but the fire had spilled from wife to husband, and their bodies had become a single column of flame and flesh. Joe Beth's spasms had ceased. She was surely dead. But there was life left in Howie still, enough to raise his hand behind his wife's head and let it loll on his shoulder as though the heat were nothing and there was slow dancing in the flames. This tender gesture was his last. His withered legs gave out, and he went down onto his knees, carrying Joe Beth down with him. He made no sound, even to the last. The couple seemed to kneel face to face in the flames, Howie's hand still cradling Joe Beth's head. Joe Beth's head still laid upon Howie's shoulder. As for Tommy Ray, he now retreated from the bodies towards the far side of the road, where his ghost legion lingered after their punishment. Whether at his instruction or no, they came to him and rose around him, blanketing him. The flames were smothered, and he sank down into the midst of his entourage. Sobs escaped him. So did his sister's name, repeated over and over. Tesla looked back at the fire around Howie and Joe Beth. With its fuel almost devoured, it had quickly died down. The bodies were shriveled, but it was still possible to make out their arms, wrapped tightly around one another. Behind her, Tesla heard somebody sob. She didn't bother to turn. She knew who it was. Satisfied now, she said to the little girl. Going to go home? Soon, came the reply. This time it was not the floating voice of the child who replied. Puzzled, Tesla looked round. There was a grassy slope behind her with perhaps half a dozen large bushes planted upon it, all dead. The three witnesses were perched upon the uppermost branches, but so lightly it seemed unlikely they had any weight whatsoever. They had put off their previous appearances in favor of what Tesla assumed were their real faces. They reminded her of porcelain puppets, their heads small, their features simple, their skin nearly white. They were cocooned, however, in garments of papal excess, layer upon gilded layer, there was very little variation among their appearance, but she assumed the individual closest to her had been little Miss Perfection. By the way, she now addressed Tesla. I knew we chose well, she, he, or it said. 
You are all we hoped you'd be. Tesla glanced back at Tommy Ray. He was still blanketed in mist, still grieving, but he'd come for the child sooner or later. This was no time to be quizzing her unwanted patrons in depth. Just a few questions, and she'd have to go. Who the hell are you? We are Jai Wai, the creature replied, and I am Rare Utu. Ya and ha you already know. That doesn't tell me anything, Tesla replied. I want to know what the fuck you are. Too long a story to tell you now, Rare Utu replied. That I'm never going to hear it, Tesla said. Perhaps it's better that way, Ya yeah, replied. Better you go on your way. Yes, go on, the third of the trio said. We want to know what happens next. Haven't you seen enough? Tesla said. Never, said Rare Utu, almost sorrowfully. Budenbaum showed us so much, so much. But never enough, he said. Maybe you should try getting involved, Tesla said. Rare Utu actually shuddered. We could never do that, she said. Never. Then you'll never be satisfied, Tesla said, and turning from them, she started back towards her bike, casting glances at Tommy Ray now and again. She needn't have worried. He was still smothered in the mists of his legion. She broke a couple of bungee cords out of the toolbox and carefully secured the baby to the back seat. Then she started the engine, half expecting the sound to bring the legion scurrying to find her. But no. When she rounded the corner, the death boy and his ghosts had not moved. She drove on past them, glancing back once to see if the Jai Wai had gone from the slope. They had. They'd had the pleasure of the triple tragedy here, damn them, and moved on to find some other entertainment. She felt nothing but contempt for them. Plainly they were of some higher order of being, but their vicarious interest in the spectacle of human suffering sickened her. Tommy Ray couldn't help himself. They could. And yet, for all her rage towards them, the phrase they had repeated over and over kept returning, and would, she supposed, until death deafened her. What next? That was the eternal inquiry. What next? What next? What next? Eight. One. Are they planning to crucify you, Damour? Harry turned from the crosses in front of which he stood and looked at the monkish fellow who was emerging from the mist. He was a study in simplicity, his dark clothes without a single concession to vanity, his hair cropped until it barely shadowed his scalp, his wide, plain face almost colorless. And yet there was something here, Harry knew, something in the eyes. Kisun. The man's blank expression soured. It is, isn't it? How did you know? On tether me and I'll tell you, Harry said. He'd been tied to a stake driven into the ground. I am not that interested, Kisun replied. Did I ever tell you how much I like your name? Not Harold. Harold's ridiculous. But de Moore. I may take it when you're up there. He nodded towards the middle cross. Gamaliel and Bartha were in the midst of taking down the woman's body. Maybe I'll have a hundred names, Gassoon went on, then dropping his voice to a whisper, maybe none at all. This seemed to please him. Yes, that's for the best. To be nameless. His hands went up to his cheek. Maybe faceless, too. You think the Eid's going to make you king of the world? Harry said. You've been talking to Tesla. It's not going to happen, Kasson. Are you familiar with the works of Philip the Chantiac? No. He was a hermit, lived on an island, a tiny island, close to the coast of Almuth's Saw. Very few people dared go there. They feared the currents carrying them past their Chantiac's island and washing them up on the Eads shore, but those who did came back with fragments of his wisdom. Which were? I'll get to that. The thing is, Philip the Chantiac had been the ruler of the city of Beketer Sabat in his time, 
and he'd been all the things we pray for our leaders to be. But even so, there was dissension and violence and hatred in his city. So one day, he said, I can't deal with the taint of Sapa Sumana any longer, and took himself off to his island. And at the end of his life, when somebody asked him what he wished for the world, he said, I dream only of an end to courage and compassion and devotion, an end to human strength and to human endurance, an end to brotherhood, an end to sisterhood, an end to defiance in grief and consolation in laughter an end to hope. Then we may all return to fishes and be content. And that's what you want, Harry said. Oh, yes. I want an end. To what? To that damn city, for one, Kisun replied, nodding down the mountain in the direction of Everville. He came a little closer, Harry scrutinized his face, looking for some crack in the mask, but he could see none. I spent a lot of time sealing up Narika across the continent, he said, making sure that when the Eid finally came through, it would be over this threshold they came. You don't even know what they are. It doesn't really matter. They're bringing the end of things. That's what's important. And what will happen to you? I'll have this hill, Kassoon said, and I'll look down from it on a world of fishes. Suppose you're wrong. About what? About the Eid. Suppose they're pussycats. They're everything that's rotted in us, Damour. They're every fetid, fucked-up thing that feeds on our shit and waits to be loosed when nobody's looking. He came closer still until he was just out of Harry's range. His hand had gone to his chest. Have you looked into the human heart recently? He said. Not in the last couple of days, no. Unspeakable, the things in there. And you, maybe. Every one to more. Every one. Rage and hatred and appetite. He pointed back towards the door. That's what's coming to more. It won't have a human face, but it'll have a human heart. I guarantee it. Behind Harry, the body of Kate O'Farrell was dropped to the ground. He glanced back at her, the agony of her last moments fixed upon her face. A terrible thing, the human heart, Kassoon was saying. A very terrible thing. It took Harry a moment to persuade his eyes from the dead woman's face, as though some idiot part of him thought he might learn some way to avoid her suffering by studying it. When he looked back at Kassoon, the man had turned away and was heading up the slope again. "'Enjoy the view, Damour, he said, then was gone. Two. As Joe left the city streets to follow the Eid along the shore, to witness, if nothing more, to witness, the ground began to shudder. To his left, the dream sea threw itself into a greater frenzy than ever. To his right, the highway that ran along the edge of the beach cracked and buckled, falling away in places. The mass of Eid, which was now within two hundred yards of the door, was apparently indifferent to the tremors. It had resembled many things to Joe in his brief time knowing it. A wall, a cloud, a diseased body. Now it looked to him like a swarm of minute insects, so dense it kept every speck of light and comprehension out as it seethed towards its destination. The door had gone considerably in the hours since he'd first stepped through it, Though its lower regions were still wreathed in mist, its highest point was now several hundred yards above the beach, and rising even as he watched, cracking the heavens. If there were angels on the other side, he thought, this would be the time for them to show their faces, to swoop and drive the Eid back with their glory. But the crack went on growing, and the Eid advancing, and the only response was not from heaven, but from the earth on which his spirit stood. The rock's convulsions did not go unfelt on Harmon's heights. The tremors ran through ground and mist alike, causing some measure of alarm amongst Zuri's faction. Harry couldn't see them, but he could hear them well enough, their songs of welcome, which they had only recently begun, decaying into sobs of fearful expectation as the violence in the rock escalated. 
Something's happening on the shore, Coker said to Irwin. We should stay away, the lawyer counseled, casting a fearful look up at the crosses. This is worse than I thought. Yes, it is, Coker said, but that doesn't mean we should be cowards. He hurried on, past the crosses and the tethered demur, up the slope which was rolling in mounting waves. Reluctantly, Irwin followed, more out of a fear that he would lose his one companion in this insanity than from any genuine urge to know what lay ahead. He wished, ah, how he wished, for the life he'd led before he'd found Macpherson's confession. For pettiness, for triviality, for all the little things that had vexed him. Digging through his fridge for something that smelled bad, finding a stain on his favorite tie, standing in front of the mirror wishing he had more hair and less belly. Perhaps it had been a bland life, puttering on without purpose or direction, but he'd liked its banality, now that he was denied it. Better that than the crosses, and the door, and uh, whatever was coming through it. "'Do you see?' said Coker, once Irwin had caught up with him. He saw. How could he not? The door, stretching up through the mist, as if eager to pierce the stars. The shore on the far side of it, every rock and pebble upon it rising in a solid wave. And worst of all, the swarming wall of energies approaching across that shore. "'Is that it?' he said to Coker. He'd expected a more palpable manifestation of the harm it brought. A devourer's tools, a torturer's stare, a lunatic's frenzy, something to advertise its evil. But instead, here was a thing he could have discovered by closing his eyes, the busy darkness behind his lids. Coker yelled something over his shoulder by way of reply, but it was lost in the tumult. The shore beyond the threshold was convulsing, as though it were a body in the throes of a grand mal, each spasm throwing boulders the size of houses up into the air. And up and up again, the scale of the seizure increasing exponentially as Irwin watched. Coker, meanwhile, strode on, the ground around him growing increasingly insolid. Stones, dirt, and plant life melted into filthy stew. It had mounted up to his waist now, and it seemed even his phantom body was subject to its currents, because he was twice thrown off his feet and washed back in Irwin's direction. He wasn't daring the tide simply to get a better view of the quaking shore. There were two other figures in the grip of this liquid earth, an old woman hanging on to the back of a man who looked to be in the last moments of life, and Coker was struggling to reach them. Blood ran from a grievous wound on the side of the man's head, where something, perhaps a rock, had sheared off his ear and opened his scalp to his skull. Why Coker was so interested to study these unfortunates was beyond Irwin, but he strode into the melted dirt himself to find out. This time he heard what Coker was hollering. Oh, Mary, Mother of God, look at her, look! What is it? Erwin yelled back. That's Maeve Toothacre! That's my wife! The escalating turmoil had not dissuaded Bartho from his task. The more the ground swayed and shook, the more attentive to his duties he became, as though his redemption lay in finishing the business of crucifying de Moor. He was bending to the task of untethering Harry to bring him to the cross, when one of the blessed men Zuri's acolytes, a creature with a round piebald face and the bow-legged gait of a midget, rolled into view and picked up Bartho's hammer. The crucifier instructed him to put it down, but instead the acolyte rushed at him and struck him in the face, the blow so fast and fierce the bigger man was felled. Before he could get up again, the acolyte struck him a second and third time. Pale fluid sprayed from Bartho's cracked skull and he let out a rhythmical whoop. If it was a call for help, it went unanswered, or perhaps unheard, given the din that was shaking earth and air. With his whoop failing him, Bartho started to rise, but the hammer was there to meet him, and this time cracked his face from chin to brow. He sank down, the blood gushing from him, and lay twitching under the empty cross. Harry had, meanwhile, been working at his knotted wrists with his teeth, but before he could free himself, the acolyte tossed the bloodied hammer away, pulled a knife from Bartho's belt, and waddled over to free the prisoner. "'Doesn't take much, does it?' the man said to Harry, his voice a nasal whine. "'One rope, and you're reduced to an animal.' He worked at the knot with a blade, his back to the crack. "'What's going on over there?' he wanted to know. "'I can't make out. The rope was cut and fell away. "'Thank you,' the Moor said. "'I don't know why. It's me, Harry. It's Raoul.' Raoul? The round face beamed. I finally got a body of my own, he said. Well, not quite. There's something else in here with me, but it's virtually cretinous. 
What happened to Tesla? I was separated from her at the threshold. The power there, it's overwhelming. It pulled me out of her head. Well, where is she now? She went to look for Grillo, I think, Raul said. I'm going to go look for her before it's all over. I want to make my farewells. What about you? Harry's gaze went back to the maelstrom around the door. When the Eid comes, Raoul said, I know, it'll take hold of my head and fill it with shit. There were already signs of the Eid's proximity in the air. Harry's eyes were stinging, his head whining, his teeth aching. Is it the devil, Raoul? If you want it to be, Raoul replied. Harry nodded. It was as good an answer as any. You're not coming, then? Raoul said. No. Harry replied, I came up here to see what the enemy looks like, and that's what I'm going to do. Then I wish you luck, Raoul said, as another wave of shudders passed through the ground. I'm out of here, Damour. With that, he turned and stumbled away between the crosses, leaving Harry to continue his interrupted ascent. There were fissures gaping in the ground around him, the widest of them a yard across, and growing. A viscous mess of liquefied earth was rolling down from the area around the crevices and running off into them. And beyond it, the Narika itself, which was now fully thirty yards wide, offering Harry a substantial view of the shore. It was no longer the seductive place he'd glimpsed from the chambers of the Zion Carasophia. The Eid's titanic form blocked out the dream sea, and the shore itself was a rising hail of rock and dirt. It didn't block the Eid's influence upon his mind, however. He felt a wave of intense self-revulsion taint his thoughts. It was a sickness in him, the taint told him, wanting to see this abomination face to face, a disease from which he would deservedly die. He tried to shake the poison from his head, but it wouldn't go. He stumbled on with images of death filling his mind's eye, Ted Dusseldorf's body on a gurney, covered by a sheet, the mangled flesh of the Zion Carasophia sprawled around their chamber, Maria Nazareno's corpse, slumped in front of a candle flame. He heard them sobbing all around him, the dead, demanding explanation. You never did understand. He looked off to his right, and there, wedged in a fissure, his arms trapped at his sides, was Father Hess. He was wearing the wound Lazy Susan had given him all those years ago, and they were as fresh as if he'd just received them. I'm not here to accuse you, Harry, he said. You're not here, period. Harry said. Oh, come on, Harry, Hess said. Since when did that matter? He grinned. It's not reality that causes the trouble, Harry. It's illusions. You should have learned that by now. That was all this was, Harry knew. An illusion. He was conjuring it up, every word, every drop of blood. So why couldn't he just tear his eyes from it and move on? Because you loved me. Hess said, as though Harry had asked the question aloud. I was a good man, a loving man, but when it came down to it, you couldn't save me. He coughed, bringing up a gruel of bilious water. It must have been terrible, he said, to be so powerless. It stared at Harry pityingly. The truth is, you still are, he said, still looking to see the enemy clearly, just once, just once. Are you finished? Harry said. A little closer, Hess begged. What? Closer, I said. Harry approached the martyr. That's better, Hess said. I don't want this spread around. He dropped his voice to a growl. It's all done with mirrors, he said, and suddenly his arm sprang from the fissure and seized hold of Harry's lapels. Harry wrestled to escape the illusion's grip, but it dragged him down, inch by inch, and as it did so, the flesh of its face seemed to slide away in ribbons. There was no bone beneath, just a brownish pulp. See, it said, its mouth a lipless hole, mirror men, both of us. Fuck you, Harry yelled, and pulling himself free of Hess's grip, he stumbled backwards. Hess shrugged and grinned. You never did understand, he said again. I told you over and over and over and over. Harry turned his back on the pulpy face. And over and over. And looked back towards the door. He had a second, perhaps two, to realize that the Eid, or some part of it, was no longer in that world but this. 
Then the ground around the Ouroboros rose up in a solid wall, and all that had gone before, the din, the tremors, the revulsion, seemed like a dream of perfect peace. 3. It was the ride of Phoebe's life. Cocooned in a stony womb, and carried in the grip of the rock as it rose to block the Eads' way, Texas had promised she'd be safe, and safe she was, her capsule borne through the convulsing ground and up on fountains of liquid rock with such ease she could have threaded a needle had she wished to take her eyes off the sight he was showing her. The rock was a protean face, shaped and driven by his will. One moment she was plunged into grottoes with aquidity, ran in icy darkness. The next the strato were dividing before her life so many veils, the next she seemed to be in the midst of a vital body, with liquid rock blazing in its veins, and the king's fossil heart beating like thunder all around. Sometimes she heard his voice in the walls of her womb, telling her not to be afraid. She wasn't, not remotely. She was in the care of living power, and it had made her a promise she believed. The Eid, on the other hand, for all its motion and its purpose, reminded her of death, or rather of its prelude, of the torments and the hopelessness she'd seen death bring. As it approached the door, and the earth rose up to block its passage, the rock pierced it in clusters of dark matter, almost like eggs, spilled from it, all the fouler for their glittering multiplicity. Even if they were eggs, Phoebe thought, there was death in every gleaming one. When they struck the shore, they burst, and their gray fluids raced over the stones as if nosing out the darkness beneath. Wounded though it was, its appetite for the cosm was not dulled. Besieged by the rock, it continued to advance, though the very shore it was crossing had become a second sea, a surf of stone rising up to drive it back. It was difficult for Phoebe to make out quite what was happening in the chaos, but it seemed that the Eid had pressed a portion of its body towards the threshold and was in the act of crossing over when Texas raised a wall of earth with such speed that he severed the questing limb from the main. The Eid let out a sound the like of which Phoebe had never heard in her life, and as it was reeling in its anguish, the whole landscape lay before her. Highways, dunes, and shore was simply upended. She saw the Eid topple bursting in a thousand places, spilling its substance, as what had been horizontal moments before rose in a vertical mass above the enemy. It teetered there a long moment. Then it descended upon the Eid, a solid sky, falling and falling, driving the wounded mass into the pit where the shore had been. Even as this spectacle unfolded, Phoebe felt the cocoon shudder and she was carried away from the maelstrom at speed, deposited at last close to the city limits, where the shore was still intact. She had no sooner come to rest than the cocoon cracked and deteriorated, leaving her exposed. Though she was perhaps two miles from the doorway, the ground was shaking violently, and a hail of rock fragments was falling all around, some of the shards big enough to do her damage. Texas had exhausted all his strength, she assumed, to do what he'd done. She could not expect his protection any longer. She got to her feet, though it was difficult to stand upright, and, shielding her head with her hands, she stumbled back in the direction of the city. She returned her gaze along the shore once in a while, but the rain of dust and stones went on relentlessly, and she could see very little through the pole. Nothing of the Eid, certainly, nor of the door through which she'd stepped to come into this terrible world. Both had disappeared, it seemed, enemy and door alike. 4. The first casualty on the heights was Zuri, who had been standing at the threshold when the door on the other side erupted. Caught by a blast of fractured rock, he was thrown back into the liquefied ground. His acolytes went to dig him out, while the Eid's vanguard, severed from the main by the wall, thrashed in its fury, stirring earth and air alike into chaos. Overturned in the dirt, the blessed men's rescuers drowned along with their master. As for the Eid, though it was but a small part of the invader, it was still immense. A ragged, roiling mass of form, spilling its blood in the Nerica's vestibule. The crack convulsed from end to end, as though the violence done in its midst was unmaking it. On the far side, earth and sky seemed to switch places. Then a storm of stones descended, the crack closed like a slammed door, and all that was left on the heights was chaos on chaos. Harry had been flung to the shuddering ground before the E had appeared, and certain he would be flung down again if he attempted to rise— stayed where he was. From this vantage point he saw Kassoon walk on the liquefied rock towards the wounded Eid. He seemed indifferent to the tremors, and fearless, his head thrown back to study the invader in its frenzy. It seemed to be unraveling, 
Pieces of its substance, ten, fifteen feet in length, were spiraling skyward, trailing sinew. Other fragments, the smallest the size of a man, the largest ten times that, were circling in the air as though hungry to devour themselves. Others still had dropped to the fluid ground and were immersing themselves in the dirt. Kassoon reached into his coat and pulled from its folds the rod Harry had seen him wield in the Zion Karasophius chamber. It had been a weapon then, but now, when he raised it above his head, it seemed to offer a point of focus for the Eid. They closed upon it from all directions, their torn bodies spilling their filth upon him. He raised his face to meet it, as though it were a spring rain. Harry could watch this no longer. His head was awash with images of the dead and death, his eyes stinging from the sight of Kassoon bathing in the Eid's filth. If he didn't go now, despair would have him. He crawled away on his belly, barely aware of his direction, until the crosses came in sight, stark against the sky. He had not expected to see them again, and his aching eyes filled with tears. "'You came back,' said a voice out of the darkness. It was Raoul. "'And you stayed,' Harry said. Raoul came to his side, and, crouching, gently coaxed Harry to his feet. "'I was curious,' he said. "'The door's closed. I saw.' And the Eid that's here? Yes. Harry cleared the tears from his eyes and stared up at the cross where he'd come so close to being nailed. It bleeds, he said, and left. Nine. One. In Everville, the denial had stopped, and so had the music. Not even those so drunk with liquor or love they'd forgotten their names could pretend all was well with the world. There was something happening on the mountain. It shook the sky, it shook the streets, it shook the heart. Some of the celebrants had come out into the open air to get a better look at the heights and exchange theories as to what was at hand. Some of the proffered explanations were rational, some ludicrous. It was an earth tremor. It was a meteor crashing. It was a landing from the stars. It was an eruption from the earth. We should get out of here, said some, and began their hurried departures. We should stay, said others, and see if something happens we'll remember for the rest of our lives. Alone in the now vacated nook, Owen Budenbaum sat and obsessed on Tesla Bombeck. She had been a late addition to this drama, but now she was beginning to look distressingly like its star. He knew her recent history, of course. He'd made it his business. She hadn't proved herself any great visionary, as far as he could gather, nor had she shown evidence of any thaumaturgical powers. Tenacious she was, oh yes, certainly that. But then so were terriers. And, though it didn't please him to grant her this, she had a measure of raw courage, along with an appetite for risk. There was one story about her that nicely illuminated those aspects of her nature— it had Bombeck bargaining with Randolph Jaffe in or under the ruins of Palomo Grove. By this stage of events, Jaffe had failed in his aspirations as an artist, and was reduced, so the story went, to a volatile lunatic. She had needed his help. He had been loath to give it. She'd goaded him, however, until he'd handed her one of the medallions, like that buried under the crossroads, and told her that if she comprehended its significance within a certain time period, she would have his help. If she failed, he would kill her. She had accepted the challenge, of course, and had succeeded in decoding the cross, thus making the Jaff her ally, at least for a time. The fact that she'd worked out what the symbols meant was not of any great significance in Budenbaum's estimation. The fact that she'd put her life on the line while she grappled with the problem was. A woman who would take such a risk was more dangerous than a visionary spirit. If Seth brought her to him, he would have to be ready to dispatch her at the flicker of an eye. 2. Tesla was halfway down the path to Phoebe's front door before she saw the figure rising from the step. "'I've been looking all over for you,' he said. It was the boy from the crossroads, Budenbaum's sallow apprentice. "'I'm Seth,' he said. "'What do you want?' "'It's not really what I want. Whatever you're selling, I'm not interested,' she said. "'I've got a baby here needs tending to. Let me help.' Seth replied. There was something almost pitiful in his appeal. I'm good with kids. She was too exhausted to refuse. She tossed the keys in his direction. Pick them up and open the door, she told him. While he did so, she cast a glance up at the mountain, which was just visible between the houses opposite. 
There was a smoking spiral of mist around the summit. Do you know what's going on up there? Seth said. I've got a pretty good idea. It's dangerous, right? That's an understatement. Budenbaum says, have you got the door open yet? Yeah. He pushed it wide. Put on the light. He did so. I don't want to talk about Budenbaum till I'm sure the kid's okay, she said, stepping into the house. But he says... I don't give a shit what he says, she told him calmly. Now, are you going to help me, or are you going to get out? 3. Harry and Raoul were almost at the tree line when Raoul stopped in his tracks. Somebody's talking, he said. I don't hear anything. Well, I do, Raoul replied, looking around. There was nobody in sight. I heard voices like this before when I was sharing Tesla's head. Who the hell is it? The dead, I think. Hmm. Aren't you bothered? Depends what they want. He's saying something about his wife. Finding his wife. He hears me, Coca yelled. Thank God he hears me. Erwin looked back up at the mountaintop, thinking again of what Dolan had said, standing outside his candy store. We're like smoke. Maybe it wasn't so bad as that, being smoke, if the world was going to be overtaken by what he'd seen up there, coming through a crack in the sky. Coca, meanwhile, was still talking to the creature who'd saved Demora, directing him into the trees. There were two people there in the shadows, one a woman of some antiquity, sitting with her back to a tree trunk, drinking from a silver flask, the other a man lying face down a few yards from her. He's dead, the woman said as Harry leaned over to examine the man. Damn him. Are you one of Zuri's people? Harry asked her. The woman hacked up a gob of phlegm and spat on the ground inches from Harry's foot. Mary, mother of God, do I look like one of Zuri's people? She jabbed her finger in Raoul's direction. That's one of his. He may look like one, Harry replied, but he's got the soul of a man. Thank you for that, Raoul said to Harry. Well, and are you man enough to carry me down? The woman said to Harry. I'd like to see my city before the world goes to hell. Your city? Yes, mine. My name's Mabel O'Connell, and that damn place, she pointed down through the trees towards Everville, wouldn't even exist if it weren't for me. Listen to her, Coca rhapsodized. Oh, Lord in heaven, listen to her. He was kneeling beside the harridan, his bestial face covered in bliss. I know now why I didn't go to oblivion, Erwin. I know why I waited on the mountain all these years, to be here to see her face, to hear her voice. She'll never know, Erwin said. Oh, but she will. This fellow, Raoul, will be my go-between. She's going to know how much I loved her, Erwin, how much I still love her. I don't want your hands on me, Maeve was roaring at Raoul. It's this man's back I'll be on, or I'll damn well crawl down there on my hands and knees. She turned to Harry. Now, are you going to pick me up or not? That depends, said Harry. On what? On whether you can shut your mouth or not. The woman looked as though she'd just been slapped. Then her narrow mouth twitched into a smile. What's your name? She said. The Moor. As in love? As in love. She grunted. That never got me any place I wanted to go, she said. She doesn't mean that, Coker said. She can't. People change, Erwin said. How many years has it been? I haven't changed, Coker said. You can't be the judge of that, Erwin replied. It's no use breaking your heart over this. Easy for you to say. What did you ever feel? Less than I should, Erwin replied softly. I'm sorry, Coker said. I didn't mean that. Whether you meant it or not, it's the truth, Erwin said, turning his gaze from the woman, who was now clambering up onto Demore's back, and again studying the heights. You think there's more time than there is, he said half to himself, and there's always less, always. Are you going to come with us? Coker said. I'm glad for you, Erwin replied, seeing your wife again. I'm really glad. I want you to be part of it, Erwin. That's nice to say, but I'm better staying here. I'll be in the way. Coker slipped his arm around Erwin's shoulder. What's to see here? He said. Come on, they're leaving us behind. Erwin glanced round. 
The trio were already twenty yards away down the slope. "'Come see the city my sweet lady built,' Coker said. "'Before it disappears forever.' Ten. One. After the tumult, silence. The rain of stones dwindled to a drizzle and then ceased altogether. The sea calmed its frenzy and came lisping against the shore, its waters thickened into mud. There was no sign of life moving in its shallows unless the glistening remnants of Eod's eggs, bobbing in the filth, could be called life. Nor were there birds. Phoebe sat amid the rubble of what had once been Liverpool's harbour and wept. Behind her the ships that had once swayed at anchor here were smashed in the streets, streets that had been reduced to gorges between piles of smoking debris. What now? she thought. Plainly there was no way home, and little or no hope of finding Joe now that she'd lost her guides in this wilderness. She could bear the idea of never seeing Everfield again, easily. But the thought of being separated from Joe forever was unendurable. She would have to hide that likelihood from herself for a while, or else she'd lose her sanity. She turned her thoughts to the fate of King Texas. Could Rock die, she wondered, or was he simply lying low for a while to recover his strength? If the latter, perhaps he might show his face again and help her in her search. A negligible hope, to be sure, but enough to keep her from utter despair. After a time her stomach began to rumble, and knowing that hunger would only make her weepier, she got up and headed into the devastation in search of sustenance. Just a couple of miles from where she wandered, Joe stood in the veils of dust still falling where the door had been, and turned over the significance of all he'd witnessed. This was not, he knew, a total victory, not by any stretch of the imagination. For one, some portion of the year it had found its way over the threshold into the cosm, before the shore rose to annex it. For another, he was by no means certain the greater part, which now lay buried somewhere under his spirit's feet, was dead. And for a third, he doubted the continent from which this force had come was now deserted. The invasion party might have been defeated, but the nation that had sent it out was still intact, somewhere beyond the ephemeris. It would come again he knew, and again and again. Whatever the Eid were, the dreamers or the dreamed, whatever ambitions they nurtured, they had today sent a force into the helter in Sendo, where it would doubtless be able to prepare for a larger and perhaps definitive invasion. Whether he would have any part to play in the defense of the Cosm he didn't know, and for now at least he didn't much care. He had the more immediate of his own identity to solve. It had been a fine adventure that had brought him in a circle back to this spot, the voyage on the Fanacapan, that sweet reunion with Phoebe in the weeds, the journey to Beketer Sabat, his final encounter with Noah and his discoveries in the belly of the Eid, all of it extraordinary. But now the journey was over. The Fanacapan was sunk. Phoebe was somewhere in Everville mourning him. Beketer Sabat was presumably in ruins. Noah dead. The Eid buried. And what was he who had taken that journey? Not a living man, for certain. He lost all that he could have identified as Joe, except for the thoughts he was presently shaping, and how certain were they? Was he then some function of the dream scene, or a sliver of the Zarapushu, or just a memory of himself that would fade with time? What? Damn it. What? At last, exasperated by his own ruminations, he decided to make his way back into the street in search of the fire-watchers, who had seemed to see him in the form of their answered prayers. Perhaps if he discovered one among them who understood the rudiments of life after death, he might find some way to communicate, and learn to understand his condition. Or, failing that, to simply come to peace with it. Phoebe returned to Mave O'Connell's house on Canning Street more by accident than intention, though when she finally found herself standing before its gates she could not help but think that her instincts had brought her there. The house was in better shape than most she'd passed, but it had not survived the cataclysm unscathed. Half of its roof had fallen in, exposing both beams and bedrooms, and the path to the front door was littered with slate, guttering, and broken glass. Once inside, however, she found the lower level almost exactly as she left it. 
With her stomach demanding its due, she went straight to the kitchen, where mere hours before she'd got herself tipsy on morningberry juice, and made herself something to eat. This time there was no judicious sandwich construction. She simply heaped cold cuts and pickles and bread and cheese and a variety of fruits into the middle of the table and set to. Her stomach was tamed after ten minutes or so, and she slowed her rate of consumption somewhat, washing her food down with a spritzer made of two parts water to one of the juice. After half a glass of this, a pleasant languor crept upon her, and she allowed herself to muse on the subjects that had earlier brought tears. Perhaps, after all, she had a few things to be grateful for. She wasn't dead, which was a wonder. She wasn't crazy. She'd never again sleep and wake in the bed she'd shared with Morton all those years, nor turn up to work on a drizzling Monday morning and find half a dozen flu-ridden depressives dripping on the step. But was any of that cause for sorrow or self-pity? No. She had followed her best hope for happiness through a door that had slammed behind her. There was no way back, and it was no use sniveling about it. The wind had risen while she was eating and was blowing dust against the kitchen window, darkening the interior. She got up and found an oil lamp, which she lit and carried upstairs, lighting lamps as she went. It was a little eerie. The empty passageways, the empty rooms, the paintings on the walls— which she'd really not noticed when she'd first explored the house, but which were almost all risque, staring down at her. Every now and again the rock beneath the city would growl and settle, the walls would creak, the windows would rattle. Eventually she found her way up to Maeve O'Connell's suite, the ceiling of which was still intact, and feeling like a thief, and enjoying the feeling, she examined the contents of the three wardrobes and the chest of drawers. There were clothes in abundance, of course, and hats and books and perfumes and bric-a-brac, endless bric-a-brac. Had the old woman dreamed all this into being, Phoebe wondered, the way King Texas had described her dreaming the city? Had she spoken the clothes, then slept and woken to find them hanging here, ready to be worn and fitting perfectly? If so, Phoebe was going to have to learn the trick of it, because nothing in these wardrobes was faintly suitable— and her summer dress had been reduced to filthy tatters. And while she was dreaming things up, maybe she'd supply herself with a few luxury items. A television. Would she have to dream the programs, too? If so, they'd all be reruns. A modern toilet. The plumbing in the house was primitive. Perhaps an ice cream maker. And maybe eventually a companion. Why not? If she was going to live the rest of her life here— and it seemed she had no choice in the matter, then she was damned if she'd spend those years alone. Sure, she'd seen some survivors in the ruins on her way here, but why look for solace among strangers when she could conjure up somebody for herself? At last, having searched the room from one end to the other, she realized that she hadn't opened the drapes, and with much effort—there were several thicknesses of fabric, and they'd not been moved, she guessed, in many years—she managed to haul the drapes apart. She was not prepared for the splendor of the sight that awaited her. The window that the drapes had concealed was huge. It offered her a panorama of what had once been the harbor, and beyond it, quiddity, its once crazed waters placid. Though there was no sun in the sky, there was nevertheless a pinprick clarity to the scene. If she'd had the desire and the patience, she could surely have counted every ripple on the face of the dream sea. Gazing out over the waters, she remembered with a sigh her meeting with Joe in the bed of weeds, remembered how she'd almost lost herself into the bliss of formlessness, while he and they had pleasured her. Was it possible, she wondered, to dream Joe, to close her eyes and raise from memory the man she had lost? It wouldn't be the real thing, of course, but better some semblance of him, like a treasured photograph, than nothing at all. Perhaps he might even share a bed with her. She put her hand to her cheek. She was hot. You should be ashamed, Phoebe Cobb, she told herself with a little smile. Then she dragged a coverlet and a pillow off Maeve's four-poster. She couldn't bring herself to sleep among the litter of King Texas's love letters. And making a bed for herself in the glittering light off the dream sea, she lay down to see if she could bring herself a likeness of the man she loved. Eleven. One. There's somebody outside, Seth said. They were in the kitchen, 
Tesla at the table, trying to coax Amy into eating a few spoonfuls of cereal mushed up in warm milk, Seth eating baked beans cold from the can while he gazed out of the dark yard. You think it's the avatars? Probably, Tesla said. She glanced up and stared out into the gloom. She couldn't see them, but she could feel their gaze. Owen told me, Seth said. Owen? Buddenbaum? He says we're like apes to them. When they watch us, it's like us going to the zoo. Is that right? Tesla said. Well, for what it's worth, I've been taught a thing or two by an ape in my time. You mean Raoul? She looked at the boy. How do you know about Raoul? Owen told me all about you. He knows everything about who you are, where you've been, who you've hooked up with. Why the hell would I be of any interest to him? He said you were... You were... The gist'll do. A significant irrelevancy, Seth beamed. That's what he said exactly. I asked him what that meant, and he said you being here was all an accident, because you don't belong in this story. Fuck the story. I don't see how we can, Seth said. Whatever we do, wherever we go, we're still telling the story. Puddenbaum again. No, Seth Lundy. He set down his can of beans. Here, he said, let me have a go at feeding her. Tesla didn't argue. She let Seth relieve her of the baby, who had so far refused her ministrations, and headed out into the backyard, where she guessed she'd have a view of the heights. The guess was good. She had to wander twenty, twenty-five yards from the house before the summit cleared the roof, but when it came into view there was much to see. The mist circling the summit had become ragged, and when she studied the holes she glimpsed large, clotted forms moving there. The Eads here, she announced. We didn't know until now, said a voice out of the darkness. She didn't bother to look round to find the speaker. It was one of the trio. Which one of them was academic? Buddenbaum didn't tell you, Tesla said. No. Strange. We're not certain he knew, said another voice. This she recognized as that of the little girl, Rare Utu. I find that hard to believe, Tesla said, still studying the mountain. What were they doing up there? Nesting? You're here. The Eards here. That's no accident. You're right, came the reply. But that doesn't mean it was planned. The history of Sapas Humana is filled with synchronicities. She turned to them now. They were standing in the darkness a dozen yards from her, barely delineated by the light from the kitchen windows. Looking at them now, she realized they were not as indistinguishable from one another as she'd thought. Rare Utu stood a little way to the right, her face carrying just a trace of the girlishness she had pretended. Some distance from her was the individual who passed himself off as a jug-eared comedian. Ha ha! Again, though the signs of his public face were subtle, they were there to be seen, and closest to Tesla, his features the most plainly tainted by his assumed personality, was the moronic child. Yeah. Of the three, it was he who regarded Tesla with the most suspicion. You seem to know human beings very well, she said. Oh, yes, ha ha replied. We never tire of seeing the great and secret show played out. My God, she said. Were you in Paloma Grove? Regrettably not, Rare Utu told her. We missed that one. That was the beginning of our discontent with Owen, truth to tell, ha ha said. We were growing tired of the same old slaughters. We had an appetite for something more. How shall I put it? Apocalyptic, he yeah, prompted. So he arranged this, Tesla said. So it seems, said ha but his genius has deserted him. This afternoon, for instance. It should have been a triumph, but it just fizzled out. We were very disappointed. That's why we came after you. We want another Paloma Grove. People driven mad by their own nightmares. Have you no sympathy? Tesla said. Of course, said Rare Utu. We suffer a great deal at the sight of your suffering. If we didn't, why would we seek it out? Give me that again, Tesla said. Better to show her, I have said. Are you sure that's wise? He has said. His beady eyes had narrowed to slits. I trust her, I have replied, descending the shadows and bypassing here to stand a few yards from Tesla. As he did so, his cocooning robes unfolded. 
They were more magnificent inside than out, the garments freighted with gems whose colors she could put no name to. Some were the size of fruits, peaches and pears, all overripe, all oozing liquid light. This one, Ahe said, gesturing to a jewel the size of an egg with his vestigial arm. I got it in the moin, watching the most terrible tragedy. Three generations, or was it four? Four, Rare Utu said. Four generations killed in one night in a gas main explosion. An entire family name wiped out. Oh, it was pitiful. And this one, he said, indicating a gem that had more shades of amber than a Key West sunset. I got in Arkansas at the execution of a man who'd been wrongly convicted of murder. We were watching him fry in the knowledge that the true culprit was smothering infants at that very moment. That was hard, very hard. Sometimes I see a milkiness in the blebs, you know, and I think it's there to remind me of the babes. While he maundered on, Tesla realized that the finery he'd unfurled was not a garment at all. It was his body. The gems, the blebs, as he'd called them, were indeed a kind of fruit, grown from flesh and sorrow. Part remembrance, part decoration, part trophy. They were gorgeous scabs, marking the places where he'd been pierced by feeling. I see you're amazed, Rare Utu said. And revolted, I think, he said. A little, Tesla said. Well, Rare Utu replied appreciatively, that's something to savor. She stared hard at Tesla. Buddenbaum was always very careful never to let us know what he felt. It's a consequence of his inversion, I think, the ease with which he conceals himself. Or as you, I have said. You are so naked, Tesla. Utu said. Simply being with you is a show unto itself. We could have such times, Ahe cooed. Aren't you forgetting something? Tesla said. What's that? When you first met me, you said you knew I was going to die. And as it happens, I know for a fact that's true. Details, details, Rare Utu replied. Life is in our gift, Tesla. Why, you've seen for yourself how Buddenbaum outruns death. He took a bullet to the head this very afternoon, and by now he'll be nearly mended. We can't confer immortality upon you, Haha said. Nor would we want to, he uh, pointed out. But we can offer you our extended lifespan, considerably extended, if we find our relationship productive. So... If I say yes, I get to live as long as I create experiences for you. Precisely. Make us feel, Tesla Bombeck. Give us stories to wring our hearts. While Rare Utu was speaking, two contrary voices raged in Tesla's head. Take it, one yelled. It's what you were born to do. This isn't churning out movies for popcorn-gobbling imbeciles. You'll be writing life. The other voice was equally adamant. It's grotesque. They're emotional leeches. Work for them, and you throw your humanity to the wind. We need an answer, Tesla, Ahe said. Explain one thing to me, she said. Why don't you just do this yourselves? Because we must not become involved, Rare Utu replied. It would dirty us, taint us. Ruin us, said Ye. I see. Well, said Ahe, do you have an answer? Tesla pondered a moment. Then she said, Yes, I have an answer. What? said Rare Utu. She thought a moment longer. Maybe, she replied. When she got back inside the house, she found Seth had taken Amy into the living room and was sitting on the sofa, gently rocking her. Did she eat anything? Yeah, he said quietly. She's okay. He looked down at Amy's fondly. Sweet little face, he said. I heard you talking to them out there. What do they want? My services, Tesla said. In place of Owen? Tesla nodded. He figured that's what they were up to. Where is he now? He'd said he'd wait for you at the Nook. It's a little restaurant off Main Street. Then I shouldn't keep him waiting any longer, Tesla said. 
Seth got to his feet very slowly, so as not to disturb any. I'll come with you. I'll watch over the baby while you deal with Owen. You should know something about Amy. She's not yours, is she? No. Her mother and the man I thought was her father are dead, and the guy who may be her real father will be coming looking for her. Who is he? His name's Tommy Ray McGuire. But he prefers to be called the Death Boy. While she was explaining this, her eyes went to the card spread out on the coffee table. Are these yours? she asked. No, I thought they were yours. She knew at a glance what they represented, of course. Lightning, cloud, ape, cell. All stations of Quiddity's Cross. Must be Harry's, she said, and sweeping them into a little pack, pocketed them and headed for the door. Two. Two-thirds of the way down the mountain slope, passing through a patch of trees more thinly spaced than elsewhere, the woman on Harry's back said, Stop a moment, will you? She surveyed the terrain. I swear, this is where my daddy was murdered. Was he lynched, too? Raoul replied. No, she said, shot by a man who thought my daddy was a servant of the devil. Why do you think that? It's a long story and a bitter one, the O'Connell woman said but I found a way to keep his memory alive. "'How did you do that?' said Harry. "'His name was Harmon,' she replied, and as they moved on away from the place, she told Harry and Raoul the whole bitter story. She told it without a melodrama and without rancor. It was simply a sorrowful account of her father's last hours and of how he had passed his vision of Everville to his daughter. "'I knew it was my duty to build a city and call it Everville, but it was hard.' Towns don't just spring up because people dream them. Well, not in this world, at least. There has to be a reason, a good reason. Maybe there's a place on a river where it's easy to cross. Maybe there's gold in the ground. But my valley just had a piddling little creek, and nobody ever found gold here. So I had to find some other reason for people to come here, and build houses and raise families. That wasn't easy, even at the best of times, and these weren't the best of times. See, the man who killed my daddy became a preacher in Silverton, and he used the pulpit to spread all kinds of rumors about how there was a hole to hell right here on Harmon's Heights, and devils flew out of it at night. So after a couple of years of being almost alone here, I decided to take myself off to Salem, where maybe I'd find some people who hadn't heard what the preacher Whitney was saying. And one day I'm talking to this man in a feed store, and I'm telling him about my valley, my sweet valley, and how he should come look at it for himself, and suddenly he digs out a silver dollar and slaps it on the counter and says to me, Show me. And I say to him, It's quite a ways from here. And he puts his hand on my leg and starts to pull up my skirt, and he says, No, it's real near. Then I realized what he was talking about, and I called him every kind of name under the sun, and I took myself off in a high old fury. But as I was walking home, I got to thinking about what he'd said, and I thought maybe the best way to bring men to my valley was first to bring women. Clever, said Raoul. Men don't always follow religion. They don't always follow common sense. But women they follow. Women they'll suffer every kind of privation for. This has been proved over and over. She tapped Harry on the shoulder. You've been stupid for women, have you not? It's been known, said Harry. So, you see, I had my method. I knew how I would bring men to fill up my valley, and once they were there, they'd start to build my daddy's dream city for me. I got the theory of it, Raoul said. But how did it work? Well, my father had been given a cross by a man called Buddenbaum. Buddenbaum, Harry said. It can't be the same man. You've heard of him? Heard of him? I shot him this afternoon. Dead? No, he was very much alive when I saw him last. But like I said, it can't be the same Buddenbaum. Oh, I think it could, Maeve said. And if it is. Oh, if it is, I have some questions I want that bastard to answer. 3. Larry Glodowski and his soldiers had staggered out of Hamrick's bar, feeling ready to take on anything that crossed their path. They had guns, they had guard, and they could all whistle Sousa. What more did an army need? The civilian population was not so sanguine, however. 
A lot of people, particularly the tourists, had decided that whatever was happening on the mountain, they'd prefer to see it on tomorrow's news than experience it in the flesh, and they were beating a hasty and disorderly retreat. More than once, as the men made their way down Main Street, they had to step aside to let a carload of vacationers careen by. "'Cowards!' Waits yelled after one such vehicle had almost mounted the sidewalk to avoid them. "'Let them go,' Gladowski slurred. "'We don't need bystanders that only get in the way.' "'You know what?' Rydlinger said, seeing a sobbing woman bundling her kids into an RV. "'I'm going to have to leave you guys to it. I'm sorry, Larry, but I got kids at home, and if anything happened to them—' Gladowski gave him the fisheye. "'Okay,' he said. "'So what are you waiting for?' Rydlinger started to apologize again, but Gladowski cut him short. "'Just go,' he said. "'We don't need you.' Rydlinger made a shamefaced departure. "'Anybody else want to go while the going's good?' Larry asked. Alstead cleared his throat and said, uh, "'You know, Larry, we've all of us got responsibilities. I mean, maybe we're better leaving this to the authorities.' "'Are you deserting, too?' Gladowski wanted to know. "'No, Larry, I'm just saying—' Bosley interrupted him. "'Well, now—' he said, and pointed down the block at the two people coming in their direction. He knew and despised them both, the woman for her foul mouth, the youth at her side for his sodomitic ways. "'These two are dangerous,' he said. "'They're accomplices of Buddenbaum's.' "'There's not two of them,' Bill Waits observed. "'There's three. Lundy's carrying a baby.' "'Stealing children now,' said Bosley. "'How low will they stoop!' "'Wasn't she the one at the crossroads?' Larry said. "'She was.' "'Gentlemen, we've got work to do,' Larry declared, stepping past Bosley. "'I'll front this. You just keep your eyes open.' Tesla and Seth had seen the quartet by now and were crossing the street to avoid them. Gladowski stepped off the sidewalk to intercept them, demanding as he approached, "'Whose kid is that?' His inquiry was ignored. "'I'm not going to ask again,' he said. "'Whose baby have you got there?' "'It's none of your damn business,' Tesla said. "'What are you going to do with it?' Bosley said, his voice shrill. "'Shut up, Bosley,' Larry said. "'They're going to murder it!' "'You heard him, Bosley,' said Tesla. "'Shut the fuck up!' Now Bosley overtook Larry, pulling out his gun as he did so. "'Put the baby down!' he squealed. "'I said I'd deal with this,' Godowski snapped. Bosley ignored him. He strode on towards Tesla, leveling his gun at her as he did so. "'Jesus,' Tesla said. "'Haven't you got anything better to do?' She jabbed her finger in the direction of the heights. "'There's something coming down that mountain, and you don't want to be here when it arrives.' As if to punctuate her warning, the street lamps began to flicker, and then went out. There were cries of alarm from all directions. "'Do we run?' Seth murmured to Tesla. "'We can't risk it,' she said. "'Not with Amy.' A few lights came back on again, but they were dim and fitful. Bosley, meanwhile, had stepped in to claim the baby from Seth's arms. "'You've got no right to do this,' Seth protested. "'You're a cocksucker, Lundy,' Halstead said. "'That gives us all the right we need.' Bosley had a grip on the baby now, but Seth refused to relinquish her. "'Halstead!' Bosley hollered. "'Give me a hand here.' Halstead didn't need a second invitation. He came around the back of Seth and grabbed hold of his arms. Larry, meanwhile, had taken out his own gun— and had it leveled at Tesla to keep her from intervening. "'What's going on up there?' he said to her, nodding in the direction of the heights. "'I don't know. But I do know we're all in deep shit when it gets here. If you want to do some good, why don't you evacuate the people who need help instead of baby-snatching?' "'She's got a point, Larry,' said Waits. "'There's a lot of old folks.' "'We'll get to them,' Gladowski blustered. "'I got it all planned.' Amy began bawling now, as Bosley rested her from Seth's arms. "'She's missing your tits, Lundy,' Alstead leered, reaching out to paw his captive's chest. Seth responded by jabbing his elbow on Alstead's belly, hard enough to drive the wind from him. Cursing, Alstead spun Seth around and punched him in the face, twice, three times, solid blows to nose and mouth. Seth stumbled backwards, his legs betraying him, and fell to the ground. Alstead moved in to kick the youth, but Waits held him back. "'Come on, enough! Little cocksucker! Leave him alone, for Christ's sake!' Waits hollered. We didn't come out of here to beat up kids. Larry! Gladowski glanced over at Waits, and as he did so, Tesla ducked beneath his arm and flew at him, intending to disarm him. She failed. There was a brief, ragged struggle, the gun twice discharged into the air, 
Before he caught her a backhanded blow, she reeled before it. Waits, meanwhile, was hauling the bloodied Seth to his feet, while yelling at Allstead to keep his distance, and Barsley was fumbling for his own gun, which he'd pocketed before snatching the child. Tesla! Seth hollered. Look out! She shook the blotches from in front of her eyes in time to see not one but two weapons being leveled at her. Run! Seth told her. She had a moment only in which to decide, and her instinct carried the day. Before Glodowski or Bosley could get a bead on her, she was away, pelting down the block. Behind her, she heard Glodowski yelling. Then he fired. The bullet carved a niche in the sidewalk, a yard to her right. Larry, stop! Waits was shouting. Are you crazy? Glodowski simply fired again. This time the bullet shattered a store window behind her. She made the corner without a third shot being fired and glanced round to see that Waits had caught hold of Glodowski and was attempting to wrest the weapon from him. She didn't wait for the outcome, but darted out of sight and range. She bitterly regretted losing Seth and Amy, but the encounter had served a purpose Glodowski and his bully boys would regret. If there was power to be begged, stolen, or borrowed from Buddenbaum, then she'd have it. And damn the niceties. 4. As Harry, Maeve, and Raoul crossed Unger's Creek, the lights in the streets ahead, which had been flickering for a quarter of an hour, gave up completely. The trio halted for a moment. Their other senses attenuated in the sudden darkness. There was no comfort to be had from them, however. They heard only panicked cries from the city, and from the thicket and trees, silence, as though every night bird and insect knew what Sapasumana did not. That death was coming, and the loudest would be found first. As for the other senses, their news was no better. For all the balm of the summer air, it carried that tang Harry had nosed, entering the building at ninth and thirteenth. Rotten fish and smoking spice. It was on the tongue, too, tempting the stomach to rebellion. They're coming, Raoul said. It had to happen. Will you hurry yourself, then? Maeve said. I want to see my city before we all go to hell. Anywhere in particular? Harry said. Yes, as you're asking. Maeve replied. There's a crossroads. What is it about those damn crossroads? Harry said. It's where I lived, where we built our house, my husband and me. And let me tell you, that house was a glory, a glory, until the sons of bitches burned it down. Why do they do that? Oh, the usual. Too much righteousness and too little passion. What I would give for a taste, just a taste, of the way it was at the beginning— when we still had hope. She fell into silence for a few moments. Then she erupted afresh. Take me there, she hollered. Take me there. Let me see the ground where it all began. Twelve. One. Tesla found Buddenbaum sitting in the nook, as Seth had told her she would. The little coffee shop was deserted and dark, but for the fire Buddenbaum had started on a plate in front of him, feeding it with scraps of menu. I was about to give up on you, he said, with a smile that was very nearly sincere. I got waylaid. By some of the locals? Yes. She came to his table and sat down opposite him, plucking a napkin from the dispenser to mop the sweat from her face. Then she plucked another and blew her nose. I know what you're thinking, Buddenbaum said. Oh, do you? You're thinking, why should I give a shit about these fucking people? They're cruel and they're stupid, and when they're afraid, they just become more cruel and more stupid. You're exempting us from this, of course. Of course. You're an unseat. And I'm the Jai Wise Man. Buddenbaum grimaced. Do they know you've come here? I told them I was going walkabout to think things through. She dug in her pocket and pulled out the cards. Ever seen these before, by the way? She laid them on the table. Buddenbaum regarded them almost superstitiously, his mouth tight. "'Whose are they?' he said, his fingers hovering over them but not making contact. "'I don't know.' "'They've been in powerful hands,' he said appreciatively. Tesla went back into her pocket in pursuit of a stray card and brought out the remains of the reefer she'd confiscated from the crucifixion singer. She sniffed it. Whatever it contained, it smelled appealingly pungent. She plucked a spill of burning cardboard off the plate, and, putting the reefer to her lips, lit it. "'Will you work for them?' Buddenbaum said. "'The Jaiwai?' she said. He nodded. "'I doubt it.' "'Why not?' 
They're psychotic, Budenbaum. They get a buzz out of seeing people suffer. Don't we all? No. She inhaled, just half a lungful, held the smoke. Oh, come on, Bombeck, Budenbaum replied. You wrote for the movies. You know what gives people the thrill. She exhaled a breath of lilac smoke. The difference is, this is real. Budenbaum leaned forward. Are you going to share that? he said. She passed the joint over the fire. It had induced some subtle visual hallucinations. The flames had slowed their licking, and the beads of sweat on Budenbaum had become crystalline. He drew on the joint and spoke as he held his breath. What's real to us isn't what's real to the rest of the world. You know that. He turned his gaze towards the dark street. A family of five was hurrying along the sidewalk, the children sobbing. Whatever their suffering, he said, exhaling now, and I don't mean to diminish them in saying this. It's an animal response. That's not real in any absolute sense. It will pass. All things pass sooner or later. She remembered Kisoon in Toothacre's house. This had been his wisdom, too. The life of the flesh, the animal life, is transient. It melts, it fades away. But what's hidden in the flesh, the enduring spirit, that has permanence, or at least the hope of permanence. It's up to us to make that hope a reality. Is that why you want the art? Budenbaum drew on the joint again, passed it back to Tesla, and leaned back in his chair. Ah, the art, he said. I was there when the Jaff got it. You know that? Of course. He didn't exactly flourish. I know that, too, Budenbaum said. But then he was weak and crazy. I'm neither. I've lived two and a half lifetimes preparing for what's about to happen here. I'm ready to handle power. So why do you need me? Budenbaum rolled his eyes to the ceiling. This Ganga's good, he said. The truth is, it's not you I need, Tesla. It's the Jai Wai. I'm afraid so. Do you want to tell me why? Budenbaum considered this for a moment. If you want my help, Tesla said, you're going to have to trust me. That's difficult, Budenbaum said. I've had so many solitary years keeping my secrets. I'll make it easy for you, Tesla said. I'll tell you what I know, or what I've guessed. She picked up the cards and shuffled them in the firelight, her eyes on Budenbaum as she spoke. You buried one of the Shoals medallions at the crossroads, and over the years it's been gathering power somehow, and now you're ready to use it to get you the art. Good, said Budenbaum. Go on. She pushed the fireplate aside and started to lay the cards out on the table one by one. The Jaff taught me something, she said. When we were together under the grove, I was looking at the cross he had, trying to work out what the symbols meant. These symbols, she waved the cards, and he told me, to understand something is to have it. When you know what a symbol means, it's no longer a symbol. You have the thing itself in your head, and that's the only place anything needs to be. She looked down at the cards for a moment. When she glanced back up at Budenbaum, his gaze was icy. Everything dissolves at the crossroads, doesn't it? Flesh and spirit, past and future, it all turns into mind. She had found all the cards picturing the body spread-eagle to the center of the cross, and now proceeded to assemble them. But for you to access the art, you need to have all the possibilities there in the stew, there at the crossroads, the human pieces, the animal pieces, the dreaming pieces. She stopped stared at him. How am I doing? she said. I think you know, said Budenbaum. So, where was I? Dreaming pieces. Oh, yes, and the last pieces, of course, the pieces that complete the pattern. She had the very card in her hand, the symbol at the top of the vertical arm. She turned it to him. The pieces of divinity. Budenbaum sighed. The Jai Wai, she said, and tossed the card down onto the table. There was twenty, maybe thirty seconds of silence. Finally, Budenbaum said, 
Can you imagine how difficult it's been to arrange this, to find a place where I had a hope of all these forces coming at some point or other? This wasn't the only spot I buried across, of course. I put them all over. But there was something about this place. And what was that? He considered a moment. A little girl called Maeve O'Connell, he said. Who? She's the one who buried the cross for me back before this little burg existed. I remember hearing her father call her name, Maeve, Maeve, and I thought this is a sign. The name's Irish. It's a spirit who comes to men in their dreams. And then when I met the father I realized how easy it would be to inspire him. Make him build me a honey pot of a city, where every manner of creature came, and there in the middle of it my little cross could be gathering power. Everville's your creation? No, I can't make that claim. The inspiration was mine, but that's all. The rest was made by ordinary men and women going about their lives. So did you keep an eye on it? For the first three or four years I came looking, but the seed had failed to take. The father had died in the mountain, and the daughter had married a damn strange fellow from the other side, so people kept their distance. But the city got built anyway. Eventually, though I'm damned if I know how. I didn't come back here for a long time, and when I did, what do you know? There was Everville. Not quite the Byzantium I'd envisaged, but it had its possibilities. I knew that wanderers from the metacosm came here now and again for sentimental reasons, and they crossed paths with Sapa Sumana, and they went their way, and all the while the medallion gathered its powers underground. You waited a long time. I had to be ready in myself. Randolph Jaffe isn't the only one who lost his wits thinking he could handle the art. As I said before, I've lived several lifetimes thanks to Rare Utu and her buddies. I've used the years to rarefy myself. And now you're ready? Now I'm ready. Except that one piece of the puzzle I need has deserted me. So you want me to bring them to you? If you'd be so kind, Buddenbaum said with a little inclination of his head. If I succeed, you'll help me keep the Eid from destroying the city? That's my promise. How do I know you won't just piss off into your higher state of being and let the rest of us go down in flames? You have to believe I won't break the last promise I made as a mortal man, Buddenbaum replied. It wasn't an airtight offer, Tesla thought, but it was probably the best she was going to get. While she was turning it over, Buddenbaum said, One more thing. What's that? Once you've brought the Jai Wai to the crossroads, I want you to get out of the city. Why? Because this afternoon, when I had everything in place, the working failed because of you. How'd you work that out? There was no other reason, Buddenbaum replied. You're a nunciate. The power couldn't choose which of us to flow to, so it stayed where it was. All right, so I'll get out. Now I'm the one who needs the promise. You've got it. Good enough. Buddenbaum said. Now, why don't you burn the cards? Why? As a gesture of goodwill? Tesla shrugged. Whatever, she said, and gathering them up, she tossed them into the slow flames. They caught quickly, flaming up. Pretty, said Buddenbaum, rising from his chair. I'll see you at the crossroads, then. I'll be there. Two. She felt the presence of the enemy the moment she stepped out into the street. Memories of Point Zero came flickering back into her head, the desolation, the dust, and the Eid, rising like a seething tide. They would be here soon, bringing their madness and their appetite for madness, turning over the city whose only crime was to have been founded in the name of transcendence. And once it was trampled, what then? out into the Americas, to find new victims, new adherents. She knew from her years of wandering that it would not go unwelcomed. There were people across this divided nation hungry for catastrophe, 
plotting to welcome the millennium men with bloodshed and destruction. She'd heard them at diner counters, muttering into their coffee, seen them at the side of highways, raging and raging, brushed by them in busy streets, passing for sane, most of them, dressed and polished and civil, people who wanted to murder the world for disappointing them. Once the E had arrived, they wouldn't need to talk to themselves any longer. They wouldn't need to berate heaven or put on smiles when all they wanted to do was scream. They would have their day of wrath, and the power she'd seen unleashed at point zero would be suddenly inconsequential. God help her, in her time, she might have numbered herself among them. She didn't have to go far to find the Jaiwai. A hundred yards from the nook she heard a great commotion, and seeking out its source found the chief of police, along with two of his officers, attempting to calm a mob of perhaps fifty Everbillians, all of whom were demanding he do something to protect their city. Many of them had flashlights and had them trained on the target of their ire. Ashen and sweaty, Gilhali did his best to calm them, but circumstances were against him. The Eid's influence was getting stronger as they descended from the heights, and the already demented crowd was steadily losing its grip of reality. People started to sob uncontrollably, or shriek at the limit of their lungs. Somebody in the throng began speaking in tongues. Realizing he was losing what little grip he had, Gilhali pulled out his gun and fired it into the air. The crowd simmered down a little. "'Now listen up!' Gilhali yelled above the murmurs and sobs. "'If we just stay calm, we can ride this out. I want everybody to go to the town hall, and we'll wait there until help arrives.' "'Help from where?' somebody asked. "'I got calls out all over, don't you worry,' Gilhali replied. "'We'll have support from Molina and Silverton in the next half hour. We're going to get the lights back on, and—' "'What about what's going on on the mountain?' "'It's all going to get taken care of,' Gilhali said. "'Now will you please clear the streets so when help gets here nobody's hurt?' He pushed through the crowd, beckoning for folks to follow. "'Come on now, let's get going!' As the mob began to move off, Tesla glimpsed a white dress, and, making her way towards it, found Vare Utu, her girlish guise as flawless as ever, watching the scene with a smile on her face. It broadened into a grin at the sight of Tesla. "'They're all going to die,' she beamed. "'Won't that be fun?' Tesla deadpanned. "'Have you made up your mind?' "'Yes,' said Tesla. "'I accept the offer, with one proviso.' "'And what's that?' said Yia, stepping out of the retreating crowd, wearing his human face. "'I don't want to be the one to tell Buddenbaum. You have to do it.' "'Why do we even need to bother?' Ha Ha said, emerging at Yia's side. "'Because he served you all those years,' Tesla said, "'and he deserves to be treated with some dignity.' "'He's not going to perish the moment we leave,' Ha Ha pointed out. He'll have a quick decline as the years catch up with him, but it won't be so terrible. Then tell him that, Tesla said. She looked back at Rara Utu. I don't want him coming after me with a machete because I took his job. I understand, the girl said. Ia scowled. This is the first and last time we accede to your desires, he said. You should be grateful to be serving us. I am... Tesla said, I want to tell you wonderful stories and show you wonderful sights, but first— Where is he? said Ahaha. At the crossroads. 3. Thank God for the darkness, Maeve said as they made their way through the murky streets. I swear if I saw this ugliness in the plain light of day, I'd weep. She demanded to be set down in front of the hamburger hang-up so that she could be appalled. "'Ugly, ugly, ugly,' she said. "'It looks like something made for children.' "'Don't break your heart over it,' Owl said. "'It won't be standing much longer.' "'We were going to build a city that could stand forever,' Maeve said. "'Nothing lasts that long,' said Harry. "'Not true,' said Maeve. "'Great cities become legends, and legends don't die.' She scowled at the hamburger hangout. "'Anything would be better than this.' she said. A pile of rubble, a hole in the ground. Can we get a move on? Harry said, glancing back towards the mountain. 
They had been meandering through the streets for maybe twenty minutes now, with the O'Connell woman confidently giving directions back to the place where she'd lived, though it was increasingly plain that she was lost. Meanwhile, Kassoon and his Eadic legion had been descending from the heights. Their tangled mass was now no longer visible, which surely meant they'd reached the bottom of the slope. Perhaps they were already in the city, and the demolition Maeve so relished underway. "'It's not far now,' the old woman said, making her way unaided to the nearest intersection and looking in all directions. "'That way,' she said, pointing. "'Are you sure?' said Harry. "'I'm sure,' she said. "'It was at the very centre of the city, my whorehouse. The first house that was ever raised, in fact.' "'Did you say whorehouse?' "'Of course they burned it down. Did I tell you that? Burned down half the neighbourhood at the same time when the fire spread.' She turned back to Harry. Yes, I said whorehouse. How do you think I built my city? I didn't have a river. I didn't have gold. So we built a whorehouse, Crooker and me, and I filled it with the most beautiful women I could find. And that brought them in. And some of them stayed, unmarried, and built houses of their own, and— She opened her arms, laughing out loud. Lo, and behold, there was Everville! 4. Laughter? Bosley thought, hearing Maeve's amusement echo through the streets. How pitiful! Somebody had lost their mind in all this chaos. He was sheltering in the doorway of the Masonic Hall at present, to keep himself, and the baby he was still carrying, out of the way of people and vehicles. Ten yards down the block Larry had the Lundy kid up against the wall and was interrogating him. He wanted to know where the sodomite Buddenbaum was hiding out, but Seth wasn't letting on. Every time Seth shook his head, Larry traded him a blow. A tap sometimes, sometimes not. Waits and Alstead hung around at a distance. Waits had broken into Dan's liquor store on Coleman Street and got himself a couple of bottles of bourbon, so he was quite happy, watching the interrogation over Larry's shoulder. Alstead was sitting on the sidewalk, with his shirt hiked up, examining the abrasions he'd suffered during the earlier skirmish with Lundy. He had already told Larry that when the questioning was finished he would be taking over. Bosley didn't give much for Lundy's chances. Quietly he began to pray, not just for his own salvation and that of the child, but so that he could explain to the Lord that this was not the way he'd intended things to be, not remotely. "'I just wanted to do your will,' he said, doing his best to ignore the sound of Seth's moans and of the blows that kept landing. "'But everything's got so confused. I don't know what's right any more, Lord.' A fresh chorus of cries rose from somewhere nearby and drowned out his pleas. He closed his eyes, trying hard to keep his thoughts coherent. But with one of his senses sealed, he became aware of information the others were receiving. There was a smell in the air, like the garbage behind the diner in a heat wave, only tinged with a sweetness that made it all the fouler. And along with the stench there was a sound, deep in his head, as though somebody was testing a tuning fork against his skull. He couldn't bear to stay where he was any longer. Without announcing his departure to the others, he slipped from the doorstep and down the block, turning the first corner he came to, which delivered him into Clark Street. It was completely deserted, for which he was grateful. From here he could get back to the diner, keeping off the main streets. Once there he'd take a quick rest, then load a few belongings into the back of the car and get out of the city. As for the baby, he'd take her along, protect her in the Lord's name. He was crossing the street when a gust of cold wind found him. Instantly the baby began to sob. "'It's okay,' he murmured to her. "'Now hush, will you?' Another gust came, harder and colder than the first. He drew the child closer to his chest, and as he did so, something moved in the darkness on the opposite side of the street. Bosley froze, but he'd already been spotted. A voice came out of the shadows, as comfortless as the wind that carried it. "'You found her.' it said, and the speaker shambled out of the deepest shadow into plainer view. It was burned, profoundly burned, black in places and yellow-white in others. As it approached, a carpet of living dust lay down before it. Bosley started to pray again. Don't, said the burned man. My mother used to pray. I hate the sound of it. He opened his arms. Just give me my little girl. Bosley shook his head. This was the final test, he thought, the encounter for which the incidents with the virago and the sodomites had been preparing him. This was when he discovered what his faith was worth. You can't have her, he said determinedly. She's not yours. 
Yes, she is, the burned man said. Her name is Amy McGuire, and I am her father, Tommy Ray. Bosley took a backward step, making calculations as he went. How far was it to the corner? If he shouted now, would Gladowski hear him above Lundy's moans? I don't want to do you any harm, Tommy Ray McGuire said. I don't want any more death. He shook his head as he spoke, and flakes of matter dropped from his encrusted face. I've seen too much. Too much. I can't give her to you, Bosley said, striving to sound reasonable. Maybe if you can find her mother. Her mother's dead, Tommy Ray said, his voice cracking. Dead and gone. I'm sorry. The baby's all I've got now, so I'm going to find some place where me and my little girl can live in peace. My little girl. Lord God in heaven, Bosley thought, take this poor man's insanity from him. Relieve him of his suffering and let him rest. Give her to me, the creature said, moving towards Bosley afresh. I'm afraid I can't do that, Bosley said, retreating to the corner. Once there, he loosed a yell. Gladowski! Austed! And pelted back down the block, grateful to find them still tormenting Lundy. Where the fuck did you go? Larry demanded. Bosley felt a chill wind at his back and glanced over his shoulder to see McGuire rounding the corner with a carpet of dust rising around him. Christ almighty, Larry said. Keep running, Halstead hollered. It's closing on you. Bosley didn't need any encouragement. He fled towards the men, the dust swirling around his legs now, as if to trip him up. Out of the way, Larry yelled, racing towards him. Bosley changed direction, and Gladowski fired at McGuire, who stopped in his tracks. The dust kept coming, however, flinging Gladowski against the brick wall. He started to sob for help, but he got out no more than a word or two before his pleas were choked off. In an instant, the dust had enveloped him, and his body was lifted off the ground, still pinned against the wall. Alstead, who had only reluctantly given up his assault on Seth, now let the boy slide to the ground and went to Gladowski's aid. But the dust had done its work. In a matter of ten seconds, if that, it had dashed Larry's brains out against the brick, now it turned on Alstead. He started to back away, raising his hands in surrender, but the dust was on him like a rabid dog, and would surely have slaughtered him too, had Bosley not begged Tommy Ray to call it off. No more death, he said. All right, said McGuire, and called the dust back to his feet, leaving Alstead sobbing on the sidewalk a few yards from Waits, who had passed out in the gutter and remained there, comatose. Just give me the kid, Tommy Ray said to Bosley, and I'm gone. You won't hurt her. Bosley said, No. Don't, Seth murmured, holding himself to his feet. In God's name, Bosley, I've got no choice, Bosley replied and proffered the child. Seth was on his feet, and with a broken cry in his throat, stumbled towards Bosley, but his bruised body couldn't carry him fast enough. Tommy Ray claimed Amy from Bosley's hands, and gathering her to his burned body, whistled for the killing cloud to follow him down the street. Seth was abreast of Bosley now, sobbing out his frustration. How could you do that? I told you I had no choice. You could have run. He would have found me, Bosley replied, staring blank-eyed into the darkness that already enveloped Tommy Ray. Seth didn't waste his breath arguing. He had little enough energy left in his bruised body, and it was a long trek from here back to the crossroads, where all of tonight's journeys were bound to end. 13. 1. At the crossroads, Buddenbaum stared down into the ground, into the dark, where the medallion lay, gathering power. The end's almost here, he thought. The end of the stories I've made and the stories I've manipulated, and those I wandered through like a bit player and those I've endured like a prisoner. The end of all my favorite clichés tragic mismatches and farcical encounters, tearful reunions and deathbed curses. The end of Once Upon a Time, and Now We Shall See, and Can I Believe My Eyes. The end of final acts of funeral scenes and curtain speeches. The end of ends. Think of that. He would miss the pleasure of stories, especially those in which he'd appeared in some unlikely guise or other, but he'd have no need of them very soon. They were solace for the rest of humanity, who were mired in time and desperate to glimpse something of the grand scheme. 
What else could they do with their lives but suffer and tell tales? He would not be of that tribe much longer. I have nothing but you, my sweet Serenissima, he said, turning on his heel, surveying the streets in all directions. You are my sense, my sanity, and my soul. The pain in these words had moved him in the past many, many times. Now he only heard the word music, which was pretty in its simplicity, but not so pretty he would miss hearing it again. Go from me now, and I am lost in the great dark between the stars. As he spoke, he saw Tesla Bombeck approaching down the street, and coming after her the girl, the fool, and the cretin. He went on declaiming, and cannot ever perish there, for I must live until you still my heart. He smiled at Tesla, at them all, opened his arms wide in welcome. Still it now! She looked at him with puzzlement on her face, which he rather enjoyed. Still it now! He said again. Oh, but it was fine, roaring over the din of screams and sobs, while his victims came wandering towards him. I beg thee still it now, and let my suffering cease. Doing her best to conceal her nervousness, Tesla looked back in the direction of the Eard. She could see nothing of the invader itself, but two fires had started in the streets closest to the base of the mountain, and flames from the larger of them were leaping up over the roofs, seeding sparks. Whatever their origins, desperate defense measures or accidents that were going unchecked, the fires would surely spread, in which case the invader would be lording itself over a city of charcoal and ash by morning. She returned her gaze to Buddenbaum, who had given up his theatrics, and was now standing in the middle of the crossroads with his hands behind his back. She was still thirty yards from him, and the only light being that of the distant conflagrations and a few uneasy stars, she could not confidently read his expression. Would he give her a signal, she wondered, when she'd brought the Jaiwai close enough that she could retreat? A nod, a wink? She suddenly berated herself for not prearranging some sign. Well, it was too late now. Buddenbaum, she said. He inclined his head a little. What are you doing here? he said. Not bad, she thought. He was pretty convincing. I came to say, well, I guess to say goodbye. What a pity, Buddenbaum replied. I'd rather hoped we'd have a chance to get to know each other. Tesla glanced back at Rariutu. It's up to you now, she said studying the Jaiwai's face in the gloom. She could see no sign of suspicion, but that didn't mean much. The features were a mask, after all. Maybe I should just head off and leave you to it, she suggested. If that's what you'd prefer, Rari Utu replied, walking on past Tesla to Buddenbaum. I think she should stay, he has said. This isn't going to take very long. Testa looked back at Buddenbaum, who seemed to be staring at his feet. His hands were at his sides now, and tightly clenched. He's holding something down, she thought. He's suppressing some evidence of what's going on here. He wouldn't be able to do so much longer. Hahe had by now wandered on past Tesla, sloughing off his human form as he did so, and he seemed to have become aware that the street was simmering. Do you have some kind of surprise for us, Owen? he asked mildly. I'm always trying my best to to keep you diverted, Buddenbaum replied. The stress of his attempts at containment were audible in his voice. It had lost most of its music. You've done well for us over the years, Rari Utu said. She sounded almost sorrowful. Thank you, Owen replied. I've always tried my best. I'm sure you know that. We also know that great stories have a shape to them, Utu went on. They bud, they come to flower, and then, inevitably... Get on with it, will you? Yes, yeah, said from behind Tesla. She turned her head an inch or two, just glimpsing him from the corner of her eye. He had also given up his human skin in favor of his fleshy cocoon. Even in the murk, the blebs his empathy had nurtured gleamed. 
Without all the man any niceties, he continued. Tell him the truth and let's be done with it. What have you come to tell me? Budenbaum asked. That it's over, Hahe replied gently. That we have somebody new to show us the wonders of the story tree. Budenbaum looked incredulous. Just like that, he said, his voice rising a little. You're replacing me without so much as a word of warning? Oh, that simply breaks my heart. Be careful, Tesla thought. The line about his heart breaking sounded a tad phony. It was inevitable, Rari Utu said, taking a couple of steps towards Budenbaum. Finally, she too was giving up the illusion of humanity, her childish body swelling and glistening as it retrieved its strange divinity. There are only so many stories in one head, Owen, and we've exhausted your supply. Oh, you'd be surprised, Budenbaum replied, amazed even if you knew how much I haven't shown you. Well, it's too late now, Ahe said. Our decision's made and is final. Tesla Bombeck will be our guide as we approach the millennium. Well, congratulations, Budenbaum said to Tesla sourly, and as he spoke, took a step towards her, sliding between Haha and Rariutu. He was close enough now that Tesla could see his face plainly, and she read the look in his eyes. He wanted her gone, and quickly. She retreated from him, as though his proximity distressed her. It wasn't planned this way, she protested. I didn't seek this out. Frankly, he replied, I don't care, one way or the other. He reached out and casually caught hold of Rariutu's frail arm as he spoke. This was plainly an unusual, perhaps even unique, contact, because the Jaiwai shuddered, staring down at his hand in some distress. "'What are you doing, Owen?' she said, the folds of her bejeweled flesh shuddering. "'Just making my farewells,' Owen replied. Hahe's gaze was approaching the spot that Budenbaum had vacated. The asphalt there was brightening and softening. "'What have you been up to?' he said, staring down. Behind Tesla, he uh, murmured, Keep away! But Hahe was deaf to the warning. He took another step, while the street continued to brighten. Rari Utu was meanwhile attempting to shake off Budenbaum's hold, but he refused to let her go. Eyes fixed on Tesla, he smiled through clenched teeth and told her, Goodbye. She started to turn, but as she did so, the ground on which Hahe was standing suddenly blazed, and he was enveloped. Rare Utu loosed the word, Owen, like a shriek, and started to pull at her captor, while Haha's body ran like butter in a furnace, the blebs bursting in wheels of colors and pouring off into the street. Tesla had already seen too much. It was dangerous to stay, lethal, probably, but she'd never been good at averting her eyes, whatever the wisdom of it. She kept drinking down the scene in front of her until Budenbaum screamed, Get the fuck out of here! and as he did so, pitched Rari Utu back into the light that had claimed Hahe. She went shrieking, but her cry was cut short once the light sealed itself around her. Throwing back her head, she opened her arms as though surrendering to the sensation. I said go! Budenbaum yelled at Tesla, and this time she tore her eyes from the spectacle and turned, only to meet a rush of sour cold air and Yia coming at her. You tricked us! he said, his voice like scalpels. It cut her courage to ribbons. She froze, staring into his doll-like face, while at her back Rari Utu uttered a shivering sigh and murmured, This is wonderful. What have you done to her? he had demanded. The question was directed at Budenbaum, but he caught hold of Tesla as he asked it and hauled her close to his body. His limbs were far from strong. She could have broken the hold if she'd wanted to, but she didn't. The influence of this flesh was like peyote. She felt it invade her, lifting her out of her fear. Set them free, he uh, said to Budenbaum. I'm afraid it's too late for that, said Owen. I'll kill your woman if you don't, the Jaiwai warned. She's not mine, came the reply. Do whatever you need to do. Dreamily, Tesla glanced back over her shoulder at Budenbaum, and by the light pouring from the ground saw him plainly for the first time. He was pitifully cold. His humanity consumed long ago in the effort that had brought him to this place. No doubt all he'd boasted in the nook was true. The years had made him wiser than the Jaff, but his wisdom would do him no good. 
The art would break him the way it had broken Randolph, snap his reason, and melt his mind. Beyond him in the blaze, Rari Utu had almost disappeared, but even now, with her substance pouring off into the ground where Hahe had already gone, she spoke. What happens next? she said. Take her out of there! he yelled to Buddenbaum. I told you it's too late, he replied. Besides, I don't think she wants to go. Rare Utu was laughing now. What's next? she kept saying, her laughter growing insubstantial. What? What? The ground at her feet was as soft as she, ribbons of brightness running off along the streets. Stop this! he had demanded again, his din so brutal that this time Tesla's body simply surrendered beneath its assault. Her legs failed, her bladder gave out, and she stumbled from his grip towards the blaze. No, you don't! Buddenbaum snapped, retreating across the incandescent earth to protect the spot where Rare Utu had stood. The art's mine! The art! he said, as though it was only now he understood the purpose of this trap. Never, Buddenbaum! His voice was rising with each syllable. You will not have it! His lacerating din was too much for Tesla's beleaguered body. She felt something in her head break, felt her tongue slacken in her mouth and her lids fall, saw as darkness came the bright ground divide before her. And there it was, shining in the dirt, the cross of crosses, the sign of signs. In the long, slow moments of her dying fall, she remembered with a kind of yearning how she'd solved the puzzles of that cross, seen the four journeys that were etched upon it, one to the dream world, one to the real, one to the bestial, one to the divine. And there, at the heart of these journeys, where they crossed, where they divided, where they finished and began, the human mystery. It was not about the flesh, that mystery. It was not about hanging broken from a cross, or the triumph of the spirit over suffering. It was about the living dream of mind that made body and spirit, and all they took joy in. Remembering the revelation now, the time between that moment and this, the years she'd spent wandering the roads of the lost Americas, folded up and fled. She had glimpsed the vast eternal sitting on the earth beneath Paloma Grove, and now she was dying into it, her lids closing, her heart stopping. Somewhere far off she heard Ie shrieking, and knew the power here had claimed him as it had claimed the others. She wanted to tell him not to be afraid, that he was going into a place where the future of being lay in wait, a time out of time when the singularity from which all things came would be whole again. But she had no tongue, no, nor breath, no, nor life. It was over. Two. Harry, Raoul, and Maeve O'Connell had just come in sight of the crossroads when Tesla slid from Ye'ez's grasp and stumbled forward. Though they were a hundred yards from the spot or more, the light was exquisitely particular, and kept no detail of the expression on Tesla's face from Harry's eyes. She was dead, or dying, but her slackening features carried a look of strange contentment. The luminous ground was no longer solid where she fell. It received her like a shining grave, and she was gone. Oh, Jesus, Harry breathed. Oh, Jesus Christ in heaven! He picked up his pace and raced towards the intersection, following the braided rivulets of light that ran in the ground beneath his feet. Behind him, Maeve had started to shout. I know that man! she hollered. That's Buddenbaum! My Lord, that's Buddenbaum! That's the bastard started all this! Resting herself from Raoul's custody, she started to hobble after Damour. Will you please stop her? Coker yelled in Raoul's ear. Raoul was too distressed by Tesla's disappearance to reply. Coker yelled on until Raoul said, I thought you'd gone. No, never, Coker replied. I was simply silenced by her bitterness. Now I beg you, my friend, don't let her be taken from me. I want her to know what I feel for her just once. Raoul swaddled a sob. So many people already taken, and this last the most unthinkable. Tesla had survived a bullet. 
Kassoon, and enough drugs to fell a horse, but now she was gone. Please, Coca said, go after Maeve. I'll do my best, Raoul said, and started in pursuit of the old woman. For all her frailty, she'd already covered quite a distance. Wait, he called after her. Somebody wants to talk to you. As he caught up with her, she scowled. It's him I want to talk to, she said, nodding in Buddenbaum's direction. He's the one. Listen to me a moment, Raoul said, catching hold of her arm. It wasn't an accident we found you. Somebody led us to you. Do you understand? Somebody who's here right now beside us. Are you crazy? Maeve replied, looking around. You don't see him because he's dead. I don't give a shit for the dead, Maeve snapped. It's the living I want answers from. Budenbaum, she yelled. It was Irwin who piped up now. Tell her who you are, he said to Coker. I wanted it to be a special moment, Coker replied. I wasted my life waiting for the special moments, Irwin told him. Now is all we've got. So saying, he pushed his fellow phantom aside to get access to Raoul's ear. Tell her it's Coker. Go on, tell her. Coker? Raoul said aloud. Maeve O'Connell stopped in her hobbling tracks. What did you say? she murmured. The dead man's name is Coker. Raoul replied. I am her husband, said Coker. He says he's... I know who he is, she said, and drawing a gasping breath, she said, Coker? My Coker? Can this be true? It's true, Raoul said. Tears came, but she didn't stop saying his name. Coker? Oh, my Coker! My sweet Coker! Harry heard Maeve sobbing behind him, and looked round to see her with her head flung back as though her husband was raining kisses on her, and she was bathing in them. When he returned his gaze to the crossroads, Buddenbaum had dropped to the ground where Tesla had vanished, and was beating his fists violently against the now solidified street. He was on the verge of apoplexy, sprays of spittle, sweat, and tears erupting from his face. "'You can't, you bitch!' he shrieked at the street. I won't let you have it. Energies were still pouring up out of the ground, spirals and filigrees rising around him. He tried to snatch hold of them in his bloodied hands, as if they might still transfigure him, but his fists extinguished those he caught, and the rest simply climbed on out of his reach and faded into the darkness above him. His fury and frustration mounted. He began to swing around, unleashing a solid scream of rage. This can't happen! It can't! It can't! Behind him, Harry heard Maeve O'Connell say, Do you see this, Coker, at the crossroads? He sees it, Raoul replied. That's where I buried the medallion, Maeve went on. Does Coker know that? He knows. Maeve had come to Harry's side now. Her face was wet with tears, but her smile was unalloyed. My husband's here, she said to Harry rather proudly. Imagine that. That's wonderful. She pointed down the street. That's where we had the whorehouse, right there. It's no coincidence, is it? No, said Harry. I don't think it is. All that light, it's coming from the medallion. It certainly looks that way. Her smile broadened. I'm going to see for myself. I wouldn't if I were you. Well, you're not me, she said sharply. Whatever's going on there is my doing. She calmed herself a little, and the smile crept back onto her face. I don't think you know what's going on any more than I do, am I right? More or less, Harry conceded. So if we don't know what's to be afraid of, why be afraid? She reasoned. Raoul, I want you on my left side, and Coker, wherever you are, I want you on my right. At least let me go first, Harry said, and without waiting for her permission, headed on towards Buddenbaum, who was once again berating the asphalt. He saw Harry coming from the corner of his eye. "'Keep your distance!' he gasped, his breathing raw. "'This ground's mine, and I've still got power in me if you try to take it from me.' "'I'm not here to take anything,' Harry said. "'You and that bitch Brombeck plotting against me!' "'There was no plot. Tesla never wanted to be a part of this.' "'Of course she did!' Buddenbaum replied. "'She wasn't stupid!' She wanted the art, the same as everyone. He looked round at Damore, his fury decaying into self-pity. 
But you see, I trusted her. That was my mistake. And she lied! He slammed his wounded palms down upon the solid ground. This was my ground. My miracle. Listen to the shit he speaks, Maeve hollered. Harry stood aside to let Buddenbaum see her. You're the liar, she said. That land was, is, and always will be mine. Buddenbaum's expression turned from fury to astonishment. Are you... are you what I think you are? Why do you look surprised? Maeve said. Sure, I got old, but we can't all do deals with the devil. It wasn't the devil I dealt with, Buddenbaum said softly. I might have more to show for it if I had. What are you doing here? I came to get some answers, Maeve said. I deserve some, don't you think, before we both go to our graves? I'm not going to my grave, Buddenbaum said. Oh, are you not? Maeve replied. My mistake. She waved Raoul away so as to proceed unaided to where Buddenbaum knelt. Do you want another hundred, hundred and fifty years? She said to him. You're welcome to them. I'm off after this. Somewhere my bones don't ache. While she was speaking, one of the luminous ribbons rising from the ground strayed in her direction. She reached out towards it, and instead of avoiding her grasp, it wove between her arthritic fingers. Did you ever see the house we built here? she said, as she watched the ribbon at play. Oh, it was such a sight, such a sight. The ribbon went from her fingers now, but Several more strands and particles were rising from out of the earth towards her. "'What are you doing, woman?' Buddenbaum said. "'Nothing,' Maeve shrugged. "'Even if the land isn't mine, the magic is.' "'I'm not taking it from you,' Maeve said mildly. "'I'm too old to be possessive about anything, except maybe my memories. "'Those are mine, Buddenbaum.' The moats were getting busier all the time, as though inspired by what she was saying. And right now they're very clear, very, very clear. She closed her eyes for a moment, and a new wave of luminosity broke from the street, rising to graze her hands and face before darting off. Sometimes I think I remember my childhood more clearly than yesterday, she went on, extending her hand. Coker, she said, are you there? He's right here, said Raoul. Will you take my hand, she said. He says he's doing it, Raoul said. Then after a moment, he's got tight hold of you. Maeve smiled. You know, I believe I can feel it, she said. Buddenbaum caught hold of Harry's sleeve. Is she crazy? No. Her husband's ghost is here. I should have seen, I suppose, he said, his voice a monotone. Final acts. They're a bitch. Better get used to it, Harry said. I never liked the sentimental shit, Budenbaum replied. I think it's more than that, Harry said, looking up at the motes and filaments that had touched Maeve's skin. They were not extinguishing themselves in the night sky as those that had gone before had done, but were roving purposefully like bees in a field of flowers, mazing the air as they went about their purpose. Where they traveled, they left trails of light, which, once loosed, proceeded to elaborate themselves, describing a multitude of forms in the warm night air. It was Raoul who spoke what he saw first. A house, he said in amazement. You see it, Harry? I see it. Enough, said Budenbaum, waving the sight away, as if nauseated. I am done with the past, done with it. Covering his head with his hands, he stumbled off as Maeve's memory raised her whorehouse out of light and air. Walls and windows, staircase and ceilings. Off to Harry's left, a passageway led to the front door and the step beyond. To his right, through another door, there was a parlor, and through another, a kitchen, and through a third, a yard where the trees were blossoming. And everywhere, even as the floors were laid, the rooms were being filled with furniture and rugs and plants and vases— the sheer proliferation of detail suggesting that once the process had been initiated, these objects were coming back into being of their own accord. Their solid selves had gone to dust decades since, but these, their imagined forms, remained encoded at the spot where they'd existed. Now they came again, remembering themselves in all their perfection. 
None was so solid, however, as to keep Harry's eyes from wandering in any direction he wished. He could see the picket fence that bounded the back yard, and the fine Spanish tile on the front step. He could see up the graceful staircase to the second and third floors, each of which boasted two bathrooms and half a dozen well-appointed bedrooms. And now, even before the roof had appeared on the house, the souls who had occupied it began to appear, gracing its rooms. Ah, Raoul cooed appreciatively, the ladies. They appeared everywhere, on the landings and in the bedrooms, in the parlors and in the kitchen, their voices and their laughter like whispering music. There's Bedelia, Maeve said, and Hildegard, and Jenny, oh, my dear Jenny, look at her. It was not such a bad place to be, Harry thought, come the end of the world, surrounded by such memories, though only one or two of the women would have been judged pretty by current standards. There was an air of ease and pleasure here, of a house as much dedicated to laughter as to erotic excess. As for the clients who had patronized the establishment, they were like the ghosts of ghosts, gossamer forms passing up and down the stairs and in and out of the bedrooms and bathrooms, their dress and flesh gray. Once in a while Harry would catch a glimpse of a face, but it was always fleeting, as though the house had conjured the furtiveness of these men rather than the men themselves, caught them turning from scrutiny, ashamed of their desire. There was little evidence of shame among the women. They went bare-breasted on the stairs and naked on the landing. They chatted to one another as they shat or passed water. They helped each other bathe and douche and shave their legs and what lay between. There, said Maeve, pointing to a prodigiously ample woman sitting in the kitchen, taking fingerfuls of pudding from a porcelain bowl. That's Mary Elizabeth. You got a lot for your box with her. She always had a waiting list. And up there... She pointed towards a slim, pale girl feeding a parrot from between her teeth. That's Dolores. And the parrot. What was the parrot's name? She glanced round at Raoul. Ask Coca, she said. The answer came in an instant. Elijah? Maeve smiled. Elijah, of course Elijah. She swore it spoke prophecies. Are you happy here? Harry asked her. It wasn't what I'd expected my life to be, she said. But yes, I was happy. Probably too happy. That made people envious. Was that why they burned the place down? Harry said, wandering to the stairs to watch Mary Elizabeth ascend. Because they were envious? That was some of it, she said. And some of it was sheer self-righteousness. They didn't want me and my business corrupting the citizens. Can you imagine? Without me, without this house and these women... There wouldn't have been any citizens, because there wouldn't have been any city. And they knew that. That's why they waited until they had an excuse. And what was that? Our son, our crazy son, who was too little like his father and too much like me. Coker was always gentle, you see. But there was a streak of the lunatic in the O'Connells, and it came out in Clayton. Not just that, but we made the error of teaching him he was special telling him he'd have power in his hands one day, because he was a child of two worlds. We should never have done that. It made him think he was above the common decencies, that he had the right to be barbarous if he chose, because he was better than everybody else. She grew pensive. I saw him once, when he was maybe ten or so, looking up at Harmon's Heights. And I said to him, What are you thinking? And do you know what he said to me? One day, he said, I'll have that hill, and I'll look down on a world of fishes. I've thought so many times that was the sign. I should have put him out of his misery right there and then. But it had taken Coker and me so much pain and effort to get a child. While well, part of Harry's mind listened to the story of Clayton O'Connell's begetting, how Coker's charms and suits had kept Maeve preternaturally young, but slowed her ovulations to a trickle. How she was almost seventy when she gave birth to the boy, another part turned over what she'd said previously, the child's notion of looking down from Harmon's Heights on a world of fishes, rang some vague bell. What happened to Clayton? he asked her while he puzzled over the problem. He was hanged. You saw him dead? No, his body was taken by wolves or bears. 
and now, thinking of wild beasts up on the mountain, he remembered where he'd heard the words before. Raoul, he said, stay here with Maeve, will you? I'm not leaving, Raoul smiled, his face flushed with voyeuristic pleasure. Don't you go, Maeve said, as Harry left the bottom of the stairs. I'll be back, he replied. You just keep remembering. And heading off down the hallway, he slipped through the unopened front door onto the street. Three. Lives are leaves on the story tree, the man who walked on quiddity had told Tesla, to which she'd replied that she'd never told a story she'd given a damn about. Oh, but you did, he'd said, your own, your own. It was true, of course. She told that story with every blink of her eye, every beat of her heart, with every deed and word cruel and kind alike. But here was a mystery, that now, though her heart was no longer beating and her eyes could no longer blink, though she would never again say or do anything in the living world, cruel or kind, the story refused to finish. She was dead. That much was sure. But the pen moved on, and kept moving. There was more to tell, it seemed. The brightness into which she had fallen was still around her, though she knew it wasn't her eyes that were seeing it, because she could see her own body some distance from her, suspended in the light. It lay face up, arms and legs spread, fingers splayed, in a posture she knew all too well. She dissembled this image in front of Budenbaum half an hour ago. It was the pose of the figure at the center of the medallion. Now it was her dead flesh that took that pose, while her mind drifted around it with a kind of detached curiosity mildly puzzled as to what all this meant, but suspecting the answer was beyond her comprehension. In the ground a little way beneath her body, the source of the energies that had transformed the solid ground into a kind of incandescent soup, was the cross itself, and when her spirit looked its way it transported her thoughts in four directions at once, out along the bright paths that ran from its arms. In one direction lay the human journey, a record of the countless men and women who had come to and crossed to this intersection, all of them carrying their freight of dreams. In the opposite direction came a procession of creatures who resembled humanity, but only remotely, exiles from the metacosm, come to Everville as a place of pilgrimage, and led by their prophetic marrow to this spot. From a third route came the animals, wild and domesticated alike, leashed dogs sniffing for a place to piss, migrating birds wheeling overhead before they turned south, the flies that had been a curse to Dolan and his candy shop, the worms that had massed here and there many millions just the summer before, aspiring forms, even the lowliest. And finally, the most remote element in this conjunction, the divinities whom she'd helped ensnare. What happens next? Rare Utu had waited to know as the blaze had consumed her. It was a question that no longer vexed Tesla. She had her bliss here and was perfectly content. If her consciousness finally caught up with the facts of her demise and flickered out, so be it. And if the pen continued to move, and the story continued to be told, she would accept that too, willingly. Meanwhile she would hover and watch while the ground ran with brightness in every direction, and the steady processes of decay began their work on the body she'd once met in the mirror. 4. Harry was two blocks from the crossroads, heading off towards the place where the Eid was at work, when he heard Budenbaum calling to him. "'Help me, Damore!' he said, stumbling across the street. He had not, it appeared, left the sight of his working completely bereft. A dawn of luminescence clung to his face and hands, an inconsequential reminder of all that he'd failed to acquire. "'I don't blame you,' he said, backing along the middle of the street ahead of Harry. "'She was a friend of yours, so you had to conspire with her. You had no choice.' "'There was no conspiracy, Budenbaum. Whether there was or there wasn't, you can't leave her down there, can you?' He was attempting a tone of sweet reason. "'She's dead,' said Harry. "'I know that.' So wherever she's buried, it's academic. Will you just get the hell out of my way? Where are you going? To find Kassoon. Kassoon? Budenbaum said. What the hell good can he do you? 
More than you can. Not true, Buddenbaum protested. Just give me a few minutes of your time and you'll never look back. There'll be no past to look back to, no future either, just one immortal day. Harry shook his head. Give it up, for God's sake. You had your chance and you blew it. He turned a corner now, and there, at the other end of the street, was the enemy. He halted for a moment to try and make some sense of what he was seeing, but the closest of the fires was several streets away, and what illumination it offered only confounded his gaze. One thing was certain. The Eid was no longer the chaotic, panicked thing, or things, it had been on the mountaintop. Even from this distance, and with so little light, he could see that the enemy had sloughed off its ragged coat, and moved in the air like a serpentine engine, its immense form in constant peristaltic motion. Harry pulled up his sleeves to expose his tattoos. Who knew what good they'd do him? Probably very little, but he needed all the help he could get. What are you going to do? Buddenbaum wanted to know. Challenge it to a fist fight? You don't have a chance, not without some power to wield. Harry ignored him. Drawing a deep breath, he started down the street towards the Eid. You think you're being heroic, is that it? Buddenbaum said. It's suicide. If you want to do some good, we can help each other. Dig for me, Demur. Dig? Buddenbaum raised his hands in front of him. They were a sickening sight. In his frenzy to reclaim what he'd lost, he'd beaten his flesh to a bloody pulp. Several fingers were askew, their bones broken. I can't do it myself, and by the time they heal, it'll be too late. It's not going to happen, Harry said. What the fuck do you know about what's going to happen and what isn't? If you were going to get the art, it would have come to you back there, but it didn't. That was because of Tesla. Maybe, and maybe you just weren't meant to have it. Buddenbaum stopped in his tracks. I won't hear that, he said. So don't, Harry replied, stepping around him. And I won't be denied what's mine, Buddenbaum said, laying one of his broken hands on Harry's shoulder. I don't have much in the way of suits left in me, he said, but I've got enough to cripple you, maybe even kill you. And what good would that do you? I would have laid one of my enemies low, Buddenbaum replied. Harry could feel a pulse of neuralgia pass through his shoulder from Buddenbaum's palm, lending credence to the threat. I'm going to give you one more chance, Buddenbaum said. Harry's tattoos started to itch furiously. His guts twitched. He knew he should run, but the will had gone from his legs. What are you doing, Owen? somebody said. The itch was an ache now, and the twitch was almost convulsions. Harry tried to turn his head towards the speaker, but it wouldn't move. All he could do was shift his eyes, and there, on the periphery of his vision, he saw the boy from the crossroads. His pallid face was bruised and bloodied. Let him go, Owen, he said. Please. Buddenbaum made a sound Harry couldn't quite interpret. Was it perhaps a sob? Stay away from me, Seth, he said. What happened? The boy wanted to know. I was cheated, Buddenbaum replied, his voice thickening with tears. I had it in my grasp. And this man took it? No. So what? You're just killing anybody who gets in your way? You're not that cruel. I will be. Buddenbaum said. From now on, no mercy, no compassion. No love? No love, he yelled. So you stay away from me, or I'll hurt you too. No, you won't, Seth said, his words a gentle certainty. Harry felt the pain in his body easing, and the power over his muscles was returned to him. He made no sudden movements for fear of inflaming Buddenbaum afresh, but slowly turning his head, he saw that Seth had lifted the man's hand off Harry's shoulder and had drawn it up to his lips. "'We've all been hurt enough for one lifetime,' he said softly, kissing the broken hand. "'We've got to start healing, Owen.' "'It's too late for that.' "'Give me a chance to prove you wrong,' the boy replied. Harry looked round at Buddenbaum. His rage had passed, leaving his face drained of expression. You'd better go, Seth said to Harry. Will you be all right with him? Sure, Seth replied gently, slipping his arm around Woodenbaum's shoulder. We'll be fine. We go way back, him and me. Way back. There was no time for further exchange. Leaving the pair to make what peace they could, Harry headed on down the street. In the minute or so since he'd last looked the Eads' way, 
It had advanced against the largest building in the vicinity, either the courthouse or the town hall, Harry guessed. The site was no more than a hundred and fifty yards ahead of him, and now with every step the e its pernicious influence grew. He felt its needles at the base of his skull and the corners of his eyes, heard its witless noise behind the din of the world. It was almost welcome, that witlessness, given the alternative, the shrieks and screams coming from those trapped in the besieged building. He was puzzled as to why the victims didn't escape out the back until he saw Gamaliel running down the side of the building with something that looked like a human head in his hand. If Gamaliel was here, so were his brothers, and probably the surviving members of Zuri's clan, too, all here to enjoy the spectacle. So where was Kasun? He'd masterminded this night of retribution. He was surely here to witness it. Shouting for Kasun as he went, Harry broke into a run. It sounded strange to be calling a man's name in the midst of such utter bedlam, but hadn't it been Kasun himself who'd said that whatever the E had looked like, they'd have a human heart? Men were not nameless. Every one of them had a past, even Kasun, who had spoken so fondly of being nobody, just eyes on a mountain looking down on a world of fishes. The walls of the town hall were cracking as the great wheel of the Eid pressed against it. The closer Harry came to the place, the more the Eid's name made sense. Oroboros, the self-devouring serpent, encircling the earth while it ate its own tail. An image of power as a self-sufficient engine, implacable, incomprehensible, inviolate. This time there were no hallucinations in its proximity, no Father Hess accusing from a makeshift grave, no demon spouting enigmas, just this ring of malice, cracking the shell that kept it from its victims. He saw it more clearly all the time. It seemed to him it was displaying itself, tormenting him with the fact that despite the clarity there was no comprehension to be had, no place where its intricacies resolved themselves into something recognizable, a head, a claw, an eye, just shapes in nauseating abundance, flukes and scraps and scabs, hard forms of indeterminate color, bluish here, reddish there, or neither, or nothing, all soulless, all passionless. There was, of course, no human face here either, only repetition, like a scrawl caught between mirrors, its echoes looking like order, like meaning, but being neither. He had to find the heart. That was his only hope, find the heart. The noise in his head had grown so loud now, he was sure it would burst his skull, but he kept walking towards its source, and the closer he came, sixty yards, fifty, forty, the more clearly he heard a whisper beneath the din. It was calm, this whisper. It's nothing to be afraid of, he was telling himself. He was surprised at his own courage. Nothing you haven't seen before. Surprised and reassured. Just let it embrace you. Wait, he thought, where did that idea come from? There'll only be the two of us very soon. That isn't me, it's the Eid. Oh, but there's no way to divide us, the whisper replied, receding now that it had been identified. You know that in your heart, it said. In your human heart. Then it was gone, and he was ten yards from the vast, slow wheel, the screams from the building drowned out by the mindless noise in his head. Off to his right he saw Gamaliel striding in his direction. It would slaughter him on the instant, he knew. No prayer, no hesitation, just the killing stroke. He had seconds to live, seconds to bring Kasun to him. He drew a deep breath, and though he could no longer hear his own voice, yelled into the bedlam, "'I'm looking for Clayton O'Connell!' There was no response at first. The wheel kept moving, senseless form upon senseless form, passing in front of his exhausted eyes. And then, with Gamaliel a yard from him, its hand stretched to rip out his throat, the Eid's motion began to slow. Some unheard order must have gone out, because Gamaliel stopped in mid-stride, and then retreated a little way. The din in Harry's head retreated, too, though it didn't disappear and he stood before the Eid, gasping like a prisoner whose restraints had been loosened enough to let him breathe. There was some movement amid the Eid's anatomy. It unknotted itself, parted, and there, enthroned in its entrails, which were the same incomprehensible stuff of its outward appearance, was Kisun. 
He looked much as he had on the mountain, simple and serene. How did you work out who I was? he said. Though there was a considerable distance between them, his voice sounded as intimate as the Eid's whispers. I didn't, Harry said. I was told. By whom? Kassoon wanted to know, rising and stepping out of the living sanctum, down onto the street. Who told you? Your mother. The face before him remained impassive, not a twitch, not a flicker. Her name's Maeve O'Connell, in case you've forgotten, Harry said, and she was hanged on a tree alongside your father and you. You talk to the dead, Kassoon said. Since when? She's not dead. She's very much alive. What kind of trick is this? Kassoon said. You think it's going to save anybody? She escaped, Clayton. The bow broke, and she found a way through to quiddity. Impossible. The door was always up there, open just a crack. How could she have got through it? She had suits of her own, didn't she? And the will to make them work. You should see what she's done at the crossroads. Harry glanced back over his shoulder. That light, he said. There was a noticeable glow in the sky around the region of the whorehouse. That's her handiwork. Gassoon gazed at it a moment, and Harry had the satisfaction of seeing a flicker of doubt upon his face. A tiny flicker, to be sure, but it was enough. I don't know about you, Damore. You keep surprising me. You and me both. If you are lying about this, what would be the point? To delay me? Why would I bother? Harry replied. You're going to do what you're going to do, sooner or later. And I still will, Kassoon said. Mother or no mother. He stared on at the glow in the sky. What's she doing? he said. She reconstructed the whorehouse, Harry said. For old time's sake. Kassoon mused on this for a few moments. Then he said, Old times? Fuck old times. And without further word he strode off down the street towards the crossroads, leaving Harry to follow after him. Harry didn't need to look back to know that the Eid had left off its assault on the town hall, and was also trailing after Kassoon, as though for all its legendary malevolence it didn't have the will, or perhaps the desire, to act without instruction. The noise in Harry's head had dwindled to a murmur, and he took a moment to turn over the options that lay ahead, assuming that the Eid was by now indifferent to his thought processes. Plainly, the possibility of his mother's survival had done nothing to mellow Kassoon. He was going to meet her, it seemed, more out of curiosity than sentiment. He had his agenda. He'd had it since childhood. The fact that the woman who had brought him into the world had survived her lynching would not dissuade him from wanting that world filled with fishes. Harry entertained a remote hope that in the midst of the reunion Kassoon might lay himself open to attack, but even if he did, what weapon would touch him? And while an attempt upon his life was being made, would the Eid simply stand by and let it happen? Unlikely, to say the least. It's not what you expected, is it? Kassoon said as they turned the corner. The Eid, I mean. Harry watched the great wheel appear behind them, its form spilling and curling as it came, like a wave perpetually threatening to break. It seemed almost to usurp and transfigure the air on its way, turning the very darkness to its own purpose. I don't know what I expected, Harry replied. You had any number of devils to choose from, Kassoon pointed out but I don't think this was one of them. He didn't wait for confirmation or denial. It will change, of course, and change and change. The one thing it will never be is dead. Harry remembered Norma's wisdom about the world. Was that true of the Eid, too? Changing, but inextinguishable? And, of course, it's just a tiny part of what's waiting on the other side. I'm glad I won't be here to see it, Harry said. Are you giving up, then? That's wise. You don't know up from down any longer, do you? And that fills you with terror. Better to surrender. Go watch TV until the end of the world. You hate the world that much? 
I was taken from a tree by wolves, Damour. I woke up in the dark with a rope around my neck being fought over. And when I'd gutted them, when I was standing among the bodies, drenched in their blood, I thought, these were not my enemies. These were not the creatures that took me naked from my bed and hanged me. It's their blood I have to bathe in. It's their throats I have to take out. The question was, how? How was a half-crazy nobody, with a brothel-keeper for a mother and a drunken freak for a father, to find a way to take out the throat of Sapasumana? He stopped, turned, smiled. Now you know. Now I know. One question for you, Damore, before we get there. Yes? Tesla Bombeck. What about her? Where is she? Dead. Gassoon studied Harry for a little time, as if looking for some sign of deception. Finding none, he said, She was quite remarkable, you know. I look back on our time together in the loop almost fondly. He made a tiny smile at the foolishness of this. Of course, finally, she was a featherweight, but disarming in her way. He paused, staring past Harry at the Eid. Do you know why it eats its own tail? he said. No. To prove its perfection, Gassoon replied, and turning his back on Harry, strode on to the next intersection. Turning it, they finally came in sight of the crossroads, and of the house that Maeve had built there. It looked almost solid, like a drawing made of light, worked over and over and over again obsessively. A figure added here, a window there, some steps, some guttering, memory upon memory. Kassoon made no audible response to the spectacle, but proceeded towards it, his stride somewhat slower than it had been. "'Where's my mother?' he wanted to know. "'Somewhere inside, I suppose,' Harry replied. Go fetch her for me. I don't want to go in. It's just an illusion, Harry said. I know that, Kassoon replied. Was there a subtle tremor in his voice? Again he said, I want you to go fetch her for me. Okay, Harry replied, and walked on past Kassoon to the front steps. The door before him seemed to stand open, and he slipped through it into a kind of erotic wonderland. The walls were covered with brocade now, and hung with paintings, most of them titillative works passing themselves off as classical subjects. The Judgment of Paris, Leda and the Swan, The Rape of the Sabine Women. And all around him the feminine flesh, so lovingly daubed on these canvases, rendered in light, seemingly more real than when he'd left. Women in their camisoles and knickers, chattering in the parlor, women with their hair unbraided, bathing their breasts, women lying in bed, their hands between their legs, toying and smiling for their phantom clients. Moving down the thronged passageway in search of Maeve, Harry's spirits rose, despite all that reason dictated. Doubtless life had been hard here. There had been disease and brutality and bastard children. Doubtless these women had endured the contempt of the very men who'd paid for their services, and longed, while they plied their trade, to escape. But that was not recorded here. It was the joy of this house Maeve had chosen to remember, and though Harry knew none of this was permanent, it didn't matter. He accepted the pleasure this illusion offered him with gratitude. Harry! There in the kitchen, idling in the midst of a group of chattering women, was Raoul. Where did you get to? I went to find Maeve's offspring. Where is she? She's out back, Raoul said. Did you say offspring? Cassoon, Raoul, Harry said, heading on towards the back of the house. He's Clayton O'Connell. Raoul came after him, forsaking the company of the women. Does he know? he said. Of course he knows. Why wouldn't he? I don't know. It's just... It's difficult imagining Maeve's kid being the one who murdered the shoal or created the loop. Everyone begins somewhere, Harry said to him, and everyone has their reasons. Where is he now? At the front of the house, Harry replied, with the Eid. 
He was at the back door now, into the garden. Maeve had remembered it the way it must have looked some distant spring, the cherry trees heavy with blossom, the air as heady as liquor. She wasn't alone out here. One of the women was sitting on the grass, star-watching. "'Her name's Christina,' Maeve said. "'She knows all the constellations.' "'I found Clayton,' Harry told Maeve. "'You've what?' "'He's here.' "'Impossible,' she said. "'Impossible! My son's dead.' "'It might be better for us all if he was,' Harry replied. "'He's the one who brought the Eid through, Maeve. "'It's his revenge for what happened to you all.' "'And are you expecting me to teach him some compassion?' "'If you can.' She looked away, first to the star-watcher, then up to the stars. I was having such a time out here. It was almost as though I'd never left. He wants me to bring you to him. She looked towards Raoul, who was standing on the back doorstep. Is my coker here? Raoul nodded. So he knows? Again Raoul nodded. And what does he think? Raoul listened for the dead man to speak. He says be careful. The boy was always wicked. Not always, Maeve said quickly, moving back towards the house. He wasn't wicked in my belly. We taught him, Coca. Lord knows how, but we taught him. She stepped inside, her face stony, and refusing Harry's aid, made her way back through the kitchen and the parlor towards the front door. It was still open. Kassoon was at the threshold, and by the stare on his face it was clear he'd been watching his mother for some time through the veils of the whorehouse. The monkish face he'd worn was tainted now. He looked pinched and bitter. "'Look at you,' he said, as Maeve approached the door. "'Clayton?' she said, halting to study him. "'How sick you look!' The sight of a frailty apparently giving him courage. He stepped inside. "'You should be dead, Mama," he said. "'So should you.' "'Oh,' he cooed, "'I am, Mama. "'All that's left alive is the hate in me.' "'He was picking up his speed, "'raising his left hand as he closed on her. "'In it, the rod he'd wielded twice before, "'the murderous rod. "'Yelling a warning, Harry raced to intercept the blow, "'but Gassoon was too quick. "'He struck his mother's head with a rod, "'and down she went, an arc of blood "'splashing on the carpeted ground. In the bright grave below, Tesla felt the murder like a second death. Her spirit shaken, she looked up to see a stain spreading across her sky, while a woman's voice unleashed a sob of agony. Harry caught hold of Kassoon's arm and tried to pull him away from his mother, but the man was too strong. With a simple shrug, he flung Harry off him, sending him stumbling through the gossamer walls to land on his back beneath the kitchen table. As he got to his feet, he saw Raoul throw himself upon Kassoon, but his assault was of such little consequence, Kassoon didn't bother to dislodge his attacker. He simply fell to his knees beside Maeve, his rod raised to finish his matricide. Once, twice, three, four times the weapon fell, the house shaking with each blow as the mind that had conjured it was snuffed out. By the time Harry reached Kassoon, it was over. Spattered with Maeve's blood, his eyes spilling tears, he hauled himself to his feet. He wiped his nose like any backstreet thug and said to Harry, Thank you. I enjoyed that. Tesla didn't want to hear, didn't want to move, didn't want anything but to float here as long as this limbo would have her. But the cruelty came down from above, loud and clear, and try as she might, she couldn't keep the anger from burgeoning in her. Her agitation informed the ground around her, and its motion drove her back towards her floating body. The closer she came to it, the more frenzied the energies surrounding her became. They were eager for this reunion, she realized. They wanted her returned into her flesh. And why? She had the answer the moment she slid back into the space behind her eyes. It wanted to make her heart leap. It wanted to make her lungs draw breath. And most of all, it wanted to come into her living body and let that body be the crux of all that flowed here. A place where the mind could make sense of the flesh's confusions. A place where beasts and divinities could be dissolved and get about the work of oneness. In short, it wanted to give her the art. 
and there was no refusing it. She knew the moment it passed into her that the gift was also a possession, that she would be changed in ways that were presently unimaginable to her, changes that made the difference between life and death look like a nuance. There was perhaps a moment between the first heartbeat and the second, when she might have rejected the gift and fled her body, let it die again and wither, but before she quite realized the choice was hers she'd chosen. And the art had her. What is this? Kassoon said, watching as the ground on which his mother's body lay was pierced and a thousand pinprick shafts of light broke from it. Harry had no answers. All he could do was watch while the spectacle escalated, the old woman's corpse withering where it lay, as if the light, which gave off no discernible heat, was cremating it. If so, it was as adept a creator as destroyer, for even as Maeve O'Connell's corpse went to ash, another form, another woman, was resurrected in the midst of her pyre. Tesla! She looked like a tapestry sewn from fire. But it was her. God in heaven! It was her! Harry heard the drone of the eid in his skull turn to the lowing of a fretful animal. Kassoon was retreating towards the front door, clearly as spooked as his faceless ally, but before he could reach the threshold, Tesla called to him by name. Her voice was no more mellifluous for her transfiguration. This is unforgivable, she said. The fire threads, embers now, her body almost her own. Here of all places where both of us were born. Both of us, said Gassoon. I am born here and now, she said. And you are a witness to that which is no little honor. The troubled din of the Eid was continuing to escalate through this exchange. And now, staring past Gassoon into the darkness beyond the faltering walls, Harry saw its abstractions unknitting, its wheel fragmenting. "'Are you doing that?' Harry said to Tesla. "'Maybe,' she said, looking down at her body, which was more solid by the moment. She seemed particularly interested in her hands. It took Harry only an instant to work out why. She was remembering the Jaff, whose hands had blazed with the art, blazed, then broken. Bodenbaum was right, Harry said. About what? You and the art. I didn't plan it this way, she said, her tone a mingling of puzzlement and distress. If he hadn't shed blood... She looked up from her hands, back at Kassoon, who had retreated to the place where the door had once stood. Its conjured memory was barely visible now. As for the Eid, its forms turned in the air behind him, drawing the darkness into their loops as they circled, sealing themselves in shadow. Soon they were just places where the stars failed to shine. Then not even that. This is the beginning of the end, Kassoon said. I know, Tesla replied, with a ghost of a smile on her face. You should be afraid, Kassoon told her. Why? Because your man, capable of killing his own mother? She shook her head. The world's been full of scum like you from the beginning she said quietly, and if the end means there's no more to come, then that's not going to be much of a loss, is it? He stared at her for a few seconds, as if searching for some repost. Finding none, he simply said, We'll see, and turning into the same darkness that had taken the Eid, he was gone. There was another silence then, longer than the one before, while the walls of the whorehouse grew ever more insubstantial, Harry went down on his haunches, his eyes pricking with tears of relief, while the last dreg of the Eid's drone faded and disappeared from the bones of his head. Tesla, meanwhile, wandered a few yards from the place where she'd appeared, which now looked like any other spot in the street, and stared towards the fires. There were sirens whooping in the distance. The saviors were on their way with hoses, lights, and words of reason. How does it feel? Harry asked her. I'm... "'Trying to pretend nothing's happened to me,' Tesla replied, her voice a gravelly whisper. "'If I take it slowly, very slowly, maybe I won't get crazy.' "'So it's not like they say. I can't see the past, if that's what you mean. "'What about the future?' "'Not from where I'm standing.' She drew a deep breath. "'We haven't told that story yet.' 
That's why. There was a peal of laughter from the direction of the garden. Your friend sounds happy, she said. That's Raoul. Raoul? A tentative smile appeared on Tesla's face. That's Raoul? Oh, my lord, I thought I'd lost him. She faltered as her gaze found Raoul standing among the last of the blossoming trees. Look at that, she said. What? said Harry. Oh, of course, she said. I'm seeing with death's eyes. She pondered for a moment. I wonder, she said finally, raising her hand in front of her, index and middle fingers extended, do you want to try something? Harry got to his feet. Sure. Come here. He came to her a little trepidatiously. I don't know if this is going to work or not, she warned. But who knows, maybe we'll get lucky. She laid her fingers lightly against his jugular. Do you feel anything? She said. You're cold. That's all, huh? Okay, let's try here. This time she touched his forehead. Still cold, she said. He didn't reply, just winced a little. You want me to stop? No, he said. No, it's just strange. Take another look at Raoul, she said. He turned his eyes in the direction of the trees, and a gasp of delight escaped him. You can see them? Yes, he smiled. I can see them. Raoul was not in the fading garden alone. Maeve was standing close by him, no longer wrapped in drear and mist, but clothed in a long, pale dress. The years had fallen from her. She was in her prime, a handsome woman of forty or so, standing arm in arm with a man who surely had lion in his lineage. He, too, was dressed for a summer evening, and gazed upon his wife as though this was the first hour of their courtship, and he hopelessly in love. There was a fourth member of this unlikely group, another phantom, Erwin Toothaker, Harry supposed, dressed in a shapeless jacket and baggy pants, watching from a little distance as the lovers exchanged their tender glances. "'Shall we join them?' Tesla said. "'We've got a few minutes before people start to come sightseeing.' "'What happens when they do?' "'We won't be here,' Tesla replied. "'It's time for us all to put our lives in order, Harry, "'whether we're dead, living, or something else entirely. "'It's time to make our peace with things, "'so we're ready for whatever happens next,' she said. "'And you don't know what that'll be?' "'I know what it won't be,' she said, leading the way into the garden. "'And what's that?' he asked, following her through a spiraling shower of petals, like anything we've ever dreamed. Part 7 Leaves on the Story Tree 1. 1. Everville's weekend of portents and manifestations did not go unnoticed. In the days immediately following the events of Festival Saturday and Sunday morning, the city came under the kind of scrutiny usually reserved for communities that have produced mass murderers or presidential candidates. Something of strange consequence had happened there. Nobody contested that. But nor could anybody quite decide what, not even those who had been in the thick of it. In fact, the people who should, in principle, have been the most reliable witnesses, those who had been at the crossroads on Saturday afternoon, those trapped in the town hall around two on Sunday morning, were in one sense the least useful. Not only did they contradict one another, they contradicted themselves from hour to hour, recollection to recollection. Their talk of quakes and fires and rock falls mingled with details so far-fetched as to turn the story into tabloid fodder within a week. No sooner had these details found print along with the inevitable comparisons to other sites of outlandish bloodshed like Jonestown and Waco, then the city came under scrutiny from a very different selection of examiners, psychics, UFOologists, and New Age apocalyptics, their vocal presence further damaging the legitimacy of the story. Television coverage that had been sympathetic on Tuesday was getting wary or even cynical by the end of the week, Time magazine pulled a cover piece on the tragedy before it reached the presses, 
replacing it with a story inside that implied the whole event had been a publicity stunt that had spiraled out of control. The piece was accompanied by an unfortunate and deeply unflattering portrait of Dorothy Bullard, who had been persuaded to be photographed in her nightgown, and was immortalized standing behind her screen door, looking like a lost soul under home arrest. The piece was entitled, Is America Losing Its Mind? There was no denying that people had perished the previous weekend, of course, many of them horribly. The body count finally reached twenty-seven, including the manager of the Sturgis Motel and the three bodies discovered on the road outside the city, two of them burned beyond recognition, the third that of a sometime journalist called Nathan Grillo. There were autopsies. There were overt and covert investigations by the police and FBI. There were public pronouncements as to the various causes of death. And, of course, there was gossip, some of which made it into the tabloids, much of which did not. The story that two skins made of some imitative alien substance were found at the motel did make the pages of the Inquirer. The rumor that three crosses had been found close to the summit of Harmon's Heights, with bodies crucified on two of them and a body of some unearthly creature slumped at the foot of the third, did not. In the second week of reporting, with the loonier opiners and witnesses ever more valuable, and the time interpretation of events gaining adherence daily, the story took on a new lease of life with the suicide of one of Everville's most beloved citizens, Bosley Cowhick. He was found in the kitchen of his diner at 6.15 on Wednesday morning, a week and three days after festival weekend. He had shot himself leaving beside the cash register a note, the contents of which were leaked to the press the following day, despite Jed Gilhawley's best efforts to keep Bosley's last words under wraps. The note bore no address. There were just a few rambling and ill-punctuated lines scrawled on the back of a menu. "'I hope the Lord will forgive me for what I'm doing,' he'd written, "'but I can't go on living any more with all these things in my head.' I know people are saying I'm crazy, but I saw what I saw, and maybe I did wrong, but I did it for the sake of the baby. Seth Lundy knows that's true. He saw it too, and he knows I had no choice, but I keep thinking that God put her into my hands to test me, and I was not strong enough to do his will, even if I did it for the best. I don't want to live any more, thinking about it all the time. I have faith that the Lord will understand and be with me, because he made me, and he knows that I have always tried to do his will. Just sometimes it's too much. I'm sorry for hurting anybody. Goodbye. Inevitably, the mention of Seth Lundy in this pitiful missive set a whole new trail of inquiries in motion, as Lundy was one of the people who was listed as missing after the weekend. Bill Waits admitted witnessing the Lundy boy being assaulted by two of his fellow musicians, but that story remained uncorroborated. One of those two men, Larry Gladowski, was dead under highly suspicious circumstances, while the other, Ray Alstead, was in custody in Salem, suspected of his murder. He was being kept sedated to minimize his eruptions of violence, which seemed to be associated with the fear that the deceased would be coming to find him, because he'd seen more than he was supposed to see. Quite what he'd witnessed, he would not say. But his obsession with the vengeful dead strengthened the belief among the police psychiatrists that he might well have been responsible for a number of the slaughters that night. He had gone on a rampage, the theory went, and was now in terror that his victims would come to claim him. Waits explicitly denied this. He'd been with Alstead most of the evening, he pointed out, but he'd also been in a highly intoxicated state for much of that time, so he was not the most reliable of witnesses. Now, with the death of Bosley Cowhick, the authorities lost a potentially useful witness, and were left with another collection of puzzles. What had happened to Seth Lundy? Who exactly was this child that the God-fearing Bosley had felt so guilty for relinquishing? And if the baby had even existed, to whom had he relinquished her? There were no answers to any of these questions forthcoming in the short term. Bosley Cowick was buried in the Potter Cemetery alongside his mother, father, and maternal grandmother. Ray Alstead remained in a cell in Salem, 
while his lawyer fought to have him released on grounds of insufficient evidence, and as nobody came forward to report a missing baby, the child remained unidentified. As for the disappearance of Seth Lundy, it opened up what was, in a sense, to be the last of the Everville mysteries to reach the eyes and ears of the general public, and that surrounded the figure of Owen Budenbaum. Unlike the baby, nobody doubted Budenbaum's existence. He'd been seen falling from a window. He'd been examined at Silverton Hospital. He'd been in the midst of events on the afternoon of Festival Saturday, which had ended in such turmoil, and he had still been in the city after nightfall, his presence noted and reported by several people. Indeed, he seemed to have been a constant factor in the weekend's events, so much so that in some quarters he was suggested to have been at the center of the whole cycle of events, the Grand Master, lording it over what was either a misbegotten hoax, a paranormal phenomenon, or a case of mass hysteria, depending on your point of view. If he could be found, it was widely believed, and persuaded to speak, he would be able to solve most, if not all, the unanswered questions. A passable artist's likeness was made and appeared in several national magazines, as well as in both the Oregonian and the Evervale Register. Almost immediately the reports began to come back in. He had been seen in Louisiana two years before. He'd been sculling around a pool in Miami just last week. He'd been spotted at Disneyland, moving through the crowd watching the electric parade. There were literally dozens of such sightings, some of them going back more than a decade. But even when the witness had had occasion to interact with the mysterious Mr. Budenbaum, there was little hard evidence about him. He certainly didn't speak of miracles, or Mars, or the secret workings of the world. He came and went, leaving behind him the vague sense of somebody who didn't belong in this day and age. These reports, numerous though they were, were not weird enough to keep Everville's story in the public eye. Once all the funerals were over and the photographers had been up Harmon's Heights to see the summit, which had been so thoroughly scoured by the authorities there was nothing left to photograph but the view, once the bosley Cowhick suicide had been recounted, and the Owen Budenbaum sightings run, the tale of Everville ran out of fuel. By the end of September it was stale, and a month later it was the stuff of Halloween tales, or forgotten. Two. I am born here and now, Tesla had said to Kassoon as she'd stood in the dwindling remains of Maeve O'Connell's house, and that had been the truth. The very ground which she'd assumed would be her grave had proved to be a womb, and she'd risen from it, remade. Little wonder, then, that the weeks that followed resembled a second childhood, far stranger than her first. As she'd told Damour, she felt little sense of revelation, the gift that she'd inadvertently received, or and she did not discount this possibility, unconsciously pursued, had not given her any great insights into the structure of reality, or, if it had, she was not yet resilient enough to open herself up to their presence. Even the minor miracle she'd worked in the whorehouse that night, allowing Harry to see with the eyes of the dead, now seemed foolhardy. She would not be tempted to go around bestowing such visions on people again, not until she was certain she had control of what she was doing, and that certainty, she suspected, would be a long time coming. Her mind felt more closed down now than it had before her resurrection, as though she had instinctively narrowed her field of vision when the prospect of infinite horizons loomed, for fear her thoughts would take flight, and she would lose her grip on who she was completely. Now she was back in her old apartment in West Hollywood, where she had headed immediately after leaving Everville, not because she'd ever felt ecstatically happy there, she hadn't, but because she needed the comfort of the familiar. Many of the neighbors' faces had changed, but the comedies and dramas that surrounded her were essentially the same after five years. Every Saturday night the pre-op transsexual in the apartment below would get maudlin and play torch songs until four in the morning. At least twice a week the couple in the next building would have screaming matches, ending in verbally explicit reconciliations. 
Every day somebody's cat was sick on the stairs. It was less than glamorous, but it was home, and there in that cramped apartment with its cheap furniture and its cracked plaster walls she could pretend, at least for a time, that she was a normal woman living a normal life. Not perhaps the kind of normality Middle America would have recognized, but a reasonable approximation. She'd nurtured her hopes here and wasted time she could have used realizing them. She'd tended her wounded ego when a piece of work had been rejected, tended it, too, when love had dealt her a blow, when she'd caught Klaus cheating, when Jerry had left for Miami and never come back. Hard times, some of them. But the memories helped remind her of who she was, scars and all. Right now that was more important than the pleasures of self-deception. Of course, this was also the apartment where Mary Morales had perished in the coils of Gassoon's licks, and where she and Lucian, poor guiltless Lucian, had talked about how people were vessels for the infinite. It was a phrase she had never forgotten. She might have thought it a kind of prophecy, had she not believed what she'd told de Moore, that the future always remained untold and thus untellable. Prophecy or no? The fact remained that she had become a kind of vessel for what had always been touted as an infinite power. Now she had it. She was determined not to be destroyed by it. She would learn to use the art as Tesla Bombeck, or let it lie fallow inside her. Once in a while, during this period of restoration, she would get a call from Harry in New York, checking in to see that all was well. He was sweetly considerate of her tender condition, and their exchanges were, for the most part, determinedly banal. They never quite stooped to talking politics, but he kept his side of the conversation light and general, waiting for her to deepen the exchange if she felt resilient enough. She seldom did. Most of the time they chatted about nothing in particular and left it at that. But as the weeks went by, she started to feel more confident of her strength, and dared to talk, albeit tentatively, of what had happened in Everville and its long-term consequences. Had he heard anything of the whereabouts of the Eid, for instance, or of Kassoon? The answer to both these questions was no. What about Tommy Ray or little Amy? Again, the answer was no. Everybody's keeping their heads down, is my guess, Harry said. "'licking their wounds, waiting to see who moves first. "'You don't sound all that bothered,' Tesla said. "'You know what? I think Maeve had it right. "'She said to me, "'If you don't know what's ahead of you, why be scared of it? "'There's a lot of sense in that.' "'There's also a lot of people gone, Harry, "'who had good reason to be scared. "'I know. I'm not trying to pretend it's all sunshine and flowers. "'It isn't, and I know it isn't.' But I've spent so much of my life looking for the enemy, and now you've seen it. Now I've seen it. And it sounds like you're smiling. I am. Shit, I don't even know why, but I am. I'm smiling. You know, Grillo used to tell me I was being simple-minded about all this shit, and we kind of fell out about it. But I hope to God he's hearing me, because he was right, Tess. He was right. The conversation more or less petered out there, but Harry's mention of Grillo started her thinking of him, and once she'd begun there was no stopping. Until now she'd actively feared the thought of dealing with her feelings for him, certain she risked her hard-won self-possession if she was drawn into those troubled waters. But caught off guard like this, obliged to let the memories snowball or be mowed down trying to halt them, she surrendered herself, and after all her trepidation it was not so bad. In fact, it was rather comforting, bringing him to mind. He'd changed radically in the eight years she'd known him, lost most of his idealism and all of his certainties, and gained an obsession in their place. But under his increasingly prickly exterior, the man she had first met, charming, childish, irascible, remained visible, at least to her. They had never been lovers, and once in a while she'd regretted the fact but there had never been a man in her life so constant as Grillo, or in the end so unalloyed in his affections. 
even in more recent times, when she'd been traveling and sometimes months would go by without their speaking, it had never taken more than a sentence or two between them before they were talking as though minutes had passed since their last exchange. Recalling those long-distance conversations from truck-stop diners and back-road gas stations, her thoughts turned to the labor that had consumed Grillo in the half-decade since Palomo Grove, the reef. He had described it to her more than once as the work which he'd been put on the planet to perform, and though it demanded more energies and more patience than he had sometimes feared he was capable of supplying, he had kept faith with it, as far as she knew, to the end. Now, she wondered, was it still intact, still gathering tales of unlikely phenomenon from across the Americas? And the more she wondered, the more the notion of seeing for herself this collection of things out of whack and out of season intrigued her. She remembered Grillo giving her a couple of numbers to call if ever she wanted to access the system and leave her own messages, but she'd lost them. The only way to find out whether the reef was still operational was to go to Omaha and see for herself. She didn't want to fly. The idea of relinquishing control of life and limb to a man in a uniform had never appealed to her, and did so now less than ever. If she was to go, it would be on two wheels, like the old days. She duly had her bike thoroughly overhauled, and on the 6th of October she started the journey that would take her back to the city where, many years before, Randolph Jaffe had sat in a dead-letter office, gathering clues to the mystery that now bided its time in her cells. 2. 1. Despite her best intentions, Phoebe had failed to dream of Joe that first night lying under Maeve O'Connell's bedroom window. Instead, she'd dreamed of Morton. Of all things, Morton. And very unpleasant it proved to be. In this dream she was standing on the shore, as it had looked before King Texas had overturned it, down to the birds who'd almost brought her adventures to a premature halt. And there, standing among the flock, dressed only in a vest and his Sunday best socks, was her husband. Seeing him, she instinctively covered her breasts, determined he wasn't going to lay his hands on them ever again, either for pleasure or punishment. As it was, he turned out to have other ideas. Producing a dirty burlap bag from behind his back, he said, "'We're going to go down together, Phoebe. You know that's right.' "'Down where?' she said to him. He pointed to the water. "'There,' he said, approaching her while he reached into the bag. There were stones in it, gathered from the shore, and without another word he proceeded to thrust them into her mouth. Such was the logic of dreams that she now found her hands were glued to her breasts, and she couldn't raise them to prevent his tormenting her. She had no choice but to swallow the stones. Though some of them were as large as his fist, down they went, one after the other, ten, twenty, thirty. She steadily felt herself growing heavier, the weight carrying her to her knees. The sea had meanwhile crept up the shore and plainly intended to drown her. She started to struggle, doing her choking best to plead with Morton. "'I didn't mean any harm to come to you,' she told him. "'You didn't care,' he said. "'I did,' she protested. "'At the beginning I loved you. I thought we were going to be happy forever.' "'Well, you were wrong,' he growled, and started to reach into the bag for what she knew would be the biggest stone of the lot, the stone that would tip her over and leave her struggling in the rising water. "'Bye-bye, Phoebes,' he said. "'Damn you!' she replied. Why can't you ever see somebody else's point of view? Don't want to, he replied. You're such a fool. Now we get to it. Damn you! Damn you! As she spoke, she felt her innards churning, grinding the stones in her belly together. She heard them crack and splinter. So did Morton. What are you doing? he said, leaning over her, his breath like an ashtray. In reply, she spat out a hail of fractured stones, which peppered him from head to foot. They struck him like bullets, and he stumbled back into the surf, dropping his burlap bag as he did so. The wounds were not bleeding. The shrapnel she'd spat at him had simply lodged in his body and weighed him down. In seconds, the eager waters had covered him, and he was gone, leaving Phoebe on the shore, spitting up stone dust. When she woke up, the pillow was wet with saliva. 
The experience dampened her enthusiasm for dreaming things into being. Suppose she hadn't killed Morton in her dream, she thought. Would he have appeared on the doorstep the following day? With his burlap bag in hand? That wasn't a very comforting notion. She would have to be careful in future. Her subconscious seemed to get the message. For the next little while she didn't dream at all. Or if she did, she remembered nothing of it. Time went by, and she determined to settle into the O'Connell house as best she could. She was assisted in this process by the arrival of a strange, tick-ridden little woman called Jarieffa, who introduced herself as Musnikov's second wife. She had been in service at the house, she explained, cleaning and cooking, and wished to be re-employed, happy to work in order to have a roof over her family's head. Phoebe agreed gladly, and the woman duly moved in, along with her four children, the eldest, an adolescent called Enko, who was, he proudly explained, a bastard, got upon his mother by not one but two sailors, now deceased. The children's shouts and laughter quickly enlivened the house, which was big enough that Phoebe could always find a quiet spot to sit and think. The presence of Jarieffa and Brood not only distracted her from the pain of being without Joe, it also helped to regulate the passage of time. Until their arrival, Phoebe had pretty much been driven by a mixture of need and indulgence. She'd slept whenever the whim had taken her, eaten the same way. Now the days began to recover their shape, though the heavens still refused to offer any diurnal regularity, darkening without warning, brightening just as arbitrarily. She quickly trained herself to ignore these signs, and the increasing good order of the house was echoed in the city streets when she went out walking. Restoration was underway everywhere. Houses were being rebuilt and the harbor cleared. Ships were being repaired and relaunched. Plainly, these people didn't have Maeve's ability to dream things into being, or they wouldn't have needed to sweat so much, but they seemed happy enough in their work. A few of her neighbors got to recognize her after a while and would greet her with a surly look when they saw her out and about. They made no attempt to engage her in conversation, however, and her attempts to chat with them were always short-lived. Isolation, she began to realize, could become a problem if she didn't find some way to be accepted into the community, and she started to make a list of possible ways to ease that process. A party, held in the street outside the house, perhaps. Or an invitation to the house for a few choice neighbors to whom she could tell her story. While she was turning these options over, she made a discovery that was to prove strangely influential. She found a cache of reading matter books and newspapers, stuffed at the back of one of the closets. She realized as soon as she'd started to sort through the volumes that they had not been dreamed up by Maeve. More likely, they'd been smuggled over into the metacosm, or carried accidentally, by flesh-and-blood trespassers like herself. How else to explain the presence of a book of higher mathematics, beside a treatise on the history of whaling, beside a water-stained edition of the Decameron? It was this last that most appealed to her, not for the text, which she found dry, but for the black and white etchings scattered throughout it. Two of the artists, the pictures were rendered in three distinct styles, had chosen episodes of great drama to depict, but the third was only interested in sex. His style was far from slick, but he made up for that by dint of his sheer audacity. The people in his pictures were caught in the throes of sexual frenzy, and none of them shy about it. Monks sported huge erections. Peasant women lay on bales of hay with their legs in the air. A couple were fucking in mud, all in bliss. One illustration in particular caught Phoebe's fancy. It pictured a woman kneeling in a field with her dress hitched up so that her amply endowed lover could come into her from behind. As she studied it, a ripple of pleasure passed through her her flesh remembering what her mind had tried so hard to forget, Joe's hands, Joe's lips, Joe's body. She felt his palms against her breasts and belly, felt the pressure of his hips against her buttocks. Oh, God, she sighed at last, and pitched the book back into the closet, slamming the door on it. That wasn't the end of the story, however, not by a long way. When she retired a couple of hours later, the image and its consequences still lingered. She would not be able to sleep, she knew, 
unless she pleasured herself a little. So she lay there on her mattress, which was still where she'd first set it, in front of the window, and with her eyes on the undulating sky she played between her legs until sleep found her. She dreamed of a man, but this time it was not Morton. Joe had never found the fire-watchers who had believed him a manifestation of the shoe, nor, in all his wanderings around the city, did he encounter anybody else whose eyes were acute enough to make him out. Was whatever visible presence he possessed, the shred of self the fire-watchers had seen, dwindling still further? He feared so. If they were to see him now, he doubted they'd be quite so worshipful. Several times he decided to leave Liverpool altogether. He didn't find the sights and sounds of reconstruction comforting. They only reminded him of how removed from life he'd become. But something kept him from leaving. He tried to attach some rationale to his reluctance. He needed time to recuperate, time to plan, time to understand his condition. But none of these explanations touched the truth. Something was holding him in the city an invisible cord around his invisible neck. Then, one gloomy day, while he was loitering down by the harbor, watching the ships, he felt something tug at him. At first he dismissed the sensation as wish-fulfillment. But it came again, and again, and on the third try he dared allow himself a measure of excitement. This was the first time since the fire-watchers he'd felt some interaction with the world outside his thoughts. He didn't resist the summons. Up from the harbor he went, following the unspoken call. Phoebe dreamed she was back in Dr. Powell's office, and Joe was out in the hallway where she'd first seen him painting the ceiling. It was raining hard. She could hear the deluge slapping against the window of the empty wedding room and beating on the roof. Joe, she said. Her lover-to-be was perched on the top of a ladder, naked to the waist, his broad back spattered with pale green paint. Oh, but he looked so fine, with his hair cropped close to his beautiful head, and his ears jutting out, and that patch of hair at the small of his back disappearing under his belt into the crack of his ass. Joe, she said, hoping she could get him to turn around, I've got something to show you. As she spoke, she went to the low table in the middle of the waiting-room, and, clearing off all the dog-eared magazines with one sweep of her arm, she lay on it, facing him. For some reason the rain had started to come through the ceiling, and it fell on her in sharp, straight drops. They did more than drench her. They began to wash the clothes from her body, as if her blouse and dress had been painted on, the colors running off her limbs and pooling around the table, leaving her naked, which was exactly how she wanted to be. "'You can turn round now,' she said to him, putting her hand down between her legs. He always liked to watch her play. "'Go on,' she said to him. "'Turn round and look at me.' He'd passed by this house on the hill before, and wondered who lived here. He would soon find out. He was moving down the path to the steps, up the steps to the door, through the door to the staircase. Somebody at the top of the flight was murmuring. He couldn't quite hear what. He paused a moment to listen. The speaker was a woman. He could make out that much. But he couldn't yet grasp the words, so he started to ascend. Joe? He had heard her. There was no doubt of that. He'd put down his paintbrush and was wiping his hands, taking his time, knowing it only made the moment when their eyes met all the more intense, if it was delayed a little. "'I've waited a long time for this,' she told him. He didn't dare believe what he was hearing, not the words themselves, though they were wonderful, the voice that spoke them. "'Phoebe?' Here? How was that possible? She was in Everville, the world he'd left and lost forever. Not here, not in this musty house, calling to him? That was too much to hope for. Oh, Joe, the woman was sighing, and God in heaven, it sounded like her, so very like her. 
He went to the door, knowing whoever was speaking was on the other side of it, and suddenly afraid to enter, afraid to know it wasn't her. He paused a moment, preparing himself for the pain to come, and slipped inside. The room was huge and chaotic. His gaze instantly went to the bed at the far end. It was piled high with pillows and scattered with pieces of paper, but there was nobody lying there. Then, from the tangle of sheets on the floor, the voice, her voice, warm with welcome. "'Joe,' she said, "'I've missed you so much.' He was looking at her. Finally he was looking at her. She smiled at him, and he smiled back, descending the ladder and sauntering in from the hallway to the table where she lay, her body wet with rain. I'm all yours, she said. It was her. God in heaven, it was her. How she came to be here didn't matter, nor did why. All that mattered was that here she was, his Phoebe, his glorious Phoebe, whose face he despaired of ever seeing again. Did she know he was close? Her eyes were shut, her pupils roving behind her lids, but he didn't doubt she was dreaming of him. There was sweat on her face and on her legs, which were bare. He longed for the fingers to pull away the sheet that lay between, for the lips to kiss that place and the cock to pleasure it, to make again the love they'd made those afternoons in Everville, bodies intertwined as though they'd never be separated. Come closer, she said in her sleep. He did so, stood over the bottom of her bed and looked down on her. If love had weight, she'd feel it now, or if a scent, smell it, or if a shadow, no, it was cast upon her. He didn't care how she came to realize his presence, as long as somehow she did, somehow understood that after the dream of him she would find his spirit waiting close by, ready for the moment when she opened her eyes and made him real. He was standing between her legs now, covered in paint, flecks and splashes of it, all over his face and in his hair, on his shoulders and down over the chest. She reached up towards him, in dreams, and out of them reached up. He felt a touch. Though he had no skin, he felt the contact nevertheless where his belly had been. Look at the state of you, she said, her fingers moving up from his stomach to the muscle of his chest, brushing his invisible presence now with her fingers, now with her thumb. And wherever she'd touched him, he saw the air begin to seethe and knit, as though, dared he even hope, she was dreaming him back into being. The paint was coming off, bit by bit. She brushed a little from his cheek and from the bridge of his nose, from his left ear and from around his eyes. Then, though the job of paint removal was far from finished, she went back down to his belt and unbuckled it. He smiled conspiratorially, and let her unbutton and unzip his pants, which, despite their bagginess, could not conceal his arousal. It seemed her finger had learned the trick of the rain, because the fabric around his groin now ran off as her dress and blouse had done, fully exposing him. He put his hands on his head and thrust his hips forward, grinning while she ran her fingers over his cock and balls. There were no words for this bliss, seeing his flesh knitting together as she stroked it, his balls remade unwounded, his cock as fine as she remembered it, perhaps finer. And then, damn it, from somewhere in the rooms below, the sound of children shouting. Phoebe's hand stopped moving as though the din had reached into her dream. Children? What were children doing in the doctor's offices? Oh, Lord, and here was she stark naked. She froze, hoping they would go away, and for a few moments the hollering faded. She waited, holding her breath. Five seconds, ten seconds. Had they fled? It seemed so. She started to reach for Joe's arm to draw him down onto her and into her, but as she did so, they began again, pounding up the stairs, shrieking in their games. He would gladly have strangled them both at that moment, and there wouldn't have been a lover alive who'd have blamed him for it. But the damage was done. Phoebe's hand dropped back down onto her breast. She let out a soft, irritated moan. 
Then her eyes flickered open. Oh, what a dream, and what a way to be woken from it. She'd have to tell Jari Effa that in future the children... Something moved in front of her, silhouetted against the window. For a heartbeat she thought it was outside, some shreds of cloth or litter rising in a gust of dusty wind. But no, it was here, in the room with her, something ragged retreating into the shadows. She would have screamed, but that the thing was plainly more afraid of her than she of it. And no wonder, it was a tattered, twitching thing, wet and raw. It posed no threat. Whatever the fuck you are, she told it, get the hell out of here. She thought she heard a sound from it, but with so much noise from the kids, who were now just outside the door, she couldn't be certain. She called, stay out, to them, but they either ignored her or missed the warning, because no sooner had she spoken than the door opened and in Jarieffa's youngest pair tumbled, brawling. Out! she yelled again, fearful that even if the interloper was beyond harming them, it would still give them a fright. They ceased their hullabaloo, and the littler of the two, catching sight of the thing in the shadows, began to shriek. It's all right, Phoebe said, moving to usher them out of the room. As she did so, the creature emerged from the murk and headed for the open door, pausing only to look in Phoebe's direction. It had eyes, she saw, human eyes, attached by trailing threads of dark flesh to an ear and a piece of cheek, the air in which the fragments hung buzzing as though it was some way of solidifying itself. Then the creature was gone, out past the panicking children into the hallway. Phoebe heard Jarieffa on the stairs, demanding to know what all the noise was about, but her words were cut short, and by the time Phoebe was out onto the landing, the woman was clinging to the banister, sobbing with fear, watching the creature retreating down the flight. Then, recovering herself, she began up the stairs afresh, yelling for her kids. They're okay, Phoebe told her. Just frightened, that's all. While Jarieffa gathered the children with her arms, Phoebe went to the top of the stairs and looked down after the intruder. The front door stood open. He'd already slipped away. "'I'll fetch Enko,' Jari Effa said. "'It's all right,' Phoebe said. "'He wasn't going to—' The rest of the words failed her, as halfway down the flight, halfway to closing the door to lock the creature out, she realized whose gaze she had met in that instant before the creature had fled. "'Oh, God,' she said. "'Enko will shoot it,' Jari Effa was saying. "'No!' Phoebe shouted. "'No!' She knew already what she'd done, half-dreamed him, then driven him away incomplete. It was unbearable. Gasping for air, she stumbled on down the stairs and across the hallway to the front door. The sky was murky and the light drear, but she could see that the street was empty in both directions. Joe had gone. Two. Despite the fact that Grillo's body had been identified, it seemed he had confounded any trail that might have led the authorities back to the reef in the event of his demise. When Tesla got to the house in Omaha, it was untouched. There was dust on every surface and mold on every perishable in the fridge, drifts of mail behind the front door, and a backyard so overgrown she could not see the fence. But the reef itself was in good working order. She sat in Grillo's stale, windowless office for a few minutes, amazed at the amount of equipment he'd managed to pile into it. Six monitors, two printing machines, four fax machines, and three walls of floor-to-ceiling shelves, all loaded down with tapes, cassettes, and box files of notes. In front of her, the messages continued to fill up the screens as they had presumably been doing since his departure. Getting a grasp of the system and of all the information it contained was not going to be a simple matter. She was here for days, at least. She headed back out to pick up a few essentials from the local market. Coffee, milk, bagels, peaches, and, though she hadn't touched alcohol since her resurrection, vodka. Then sorted out a few domestic details. The house was freezing, so she had to turn on the heating, and the contents of the fridge and the garbage can in the kitchen had to be dumped to clear the sickening smell, before settling down to familiarize herself with Grillo's masterwork. She'd never been particularly adept at handling technology. It took her the best part of two days to teach herself how to operate everything, working slowly so as not to accidentally wipe some invaluable treasure from the files. She was aided in her exploration by Grillo's handwritten notes, 
which were pinned, glued, and taped to both the machines and shelves. Without them she would have despaired. Once she had a basic grasp of both the system and his methodology, she began to make her way through the files themselves. They numbered in the thousands. The names of some were self-evident, Dog Star Saucers, Seraphic Visions, Death by Animal Ingestation, but Grillo had titled most of them for his own amusement, obliquely, and she had to call them up one by one in order to find out what they were about. There was a kind of poetry in some of the titling, along with Grillo's love of puns and a playful obscurantism. The Devouring Song, Zoological Pardons, The Fiend Venus, Neither Here Nor There, Amen to That, the list went on and on. What soon became apparent was that while Grillo had assiduously collected and collated these reports, he had not edited them. There was no distinction made within each file between a minor bizarrity and something of cataclysmic scale, nor any between a lucid, measured account and a scrap of babble. Like a loving parent, unwilling to favor one child over another, Grillo had found a home for everything. Increasingly impatient, Tesla scrolled page after page after page, still hoping for some clue to the mystery in her cells. And while she dug, the reports kept pouring in from all directions. From Kentucky, a woman who claimed she had been twice raped by the higher ones, whoever they were, checked in to report that her violators were now moving south-southeast towards the state and would be visible tomorrow dusk in the form of a yellow cloud that will look like two angels tied back to back. From New Orleans, a certain Dr. Tournier wanted to share his discovery that disease was caused by an inability to speak with a true tongue, and that he had cured over 600 patients, thought terminal, by teaching them the basic vocabulary of a language he dubbed Nazca. From her hometown of Philadelphia came a piece of psychotic prose from one who signed himself it was surely a man, the cockatrice, warning the world that from Wednesday next he would be in glory, and only the blind would be safe. For three days she remained hostage to the reef, like an atheist locked in the Vatican library, contemptuous, repulsed even, but going back and back to the shelves, morbidly fascinated by the dogmas she found there. Even in her most frustrated moods, she could not quite shake the suspicion that somewhere amid this wilderness of insanities were gems she could profit by, knowledge of the art, knowledge of the Eid, if only she could find them. But it became increasingly clear that she might very well have passed over them already, their form so garbled or their code so dense she'd failed to recognize them for what they were. At last, in the middle of the afternoon of the fifth day, she told herself, If you do this much longer, you'll be as crazy as they are. Turn it off, woman. Just turn the damn thing off. She flicked back to the file list, and was about to kill the machines when one of the names caught her eye. The ride is over, it read. Perhaps she'd passed over these four words before and not recognized them, but now they rang bells. The Ride is Over had been the headline Grillo had wanted for his last report from Paloma Grove. He'd told her later she could use it for a screenplay if she wanted, as long as the movie was cheap and opportunistic. It was probably just a coincidence, but she called up the file anyway, determined it would be the last. Her heart jumped at the words that appeared on the screen. Tesla, Grillo had written. I hope it's you out there, but whether it is or it isn't, I guess it doesn't matter much now, because if you're reading this, whoever you are, I'm dead. It was the last thing she'd expected to find, but now that it was there in front of her, she wasn't so surprised. He'd known he was dying after all, and though he'd always hated farewells, even of the casual variety, he was still a journalist to the bone. Here was his final report, then, intended for a readership of one. It's the middle of June right now, he'd written, and the last couple of weeks I've been feeling like shit. The doc says things are moving faster than he's seen before. 
He wants me to go in for tests, but I told him I prefer to use the time working. He asked me on what, and of course I couldn't tell him about the reef, so I lied and said I was writing a book. It's strange. When I'm typing this, I'm imagining you sitting there, Tess, reading it, hearing my voice in your head. She could. She could hear it loud and clear. I tried to write once, when I first got the bad news. I'm not sure it was ever going to be a book, but I did try and put down a few memories to see how they looked on the page. And you know what? They were clichés, all of them. What I remembered was real enough. The feel of my mother's cheek, the smell of my dad's cigars, summers in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, a couple of Christmases in Maine with my grandmother. But there was nothing that you couldn't find in a million autobiographies. It didn't make the memories any less meaningful to me, but it did make the idea of writing them down redundant. So I thought, okay, maybe I'll write about the things that happened in the grove. Not just what went on at Coney Eye, but about Ellen. I think of her a lot these days. And her kid, Philip. I don't remember if you met him or not. And Fletcher in the mall. But that plan went to shit just as quickly. I'd be riding away, and some report would come in from buttfuck Ohio about angels or UFOs or skunks speaking in tongues. And when I got back to what I'd been writing, the words were like weak old cold cuts. They just lay there, stale and tasteless and gray. I was so pissed with myself. Here was me, the wordsmith, writing about something that had actually happened in the real world, and I couldn't make it sing, not the way these crazies who were putting down whatever wild chit came into their heads could do it. Then I began to see why. Tesla leaned forward at this juncture, as if she and Grillo were debating over a couple of glasses of vodka, and now he was getting to the crux of his argument. Tell me, Grillo, she murmured to the screen, tell me why. I wouldn't let the truth go. I wanted to describe things just the way they'd happened. No, that's not right, the way I remembered them happening. So I killed what I was doing, trying to be precise, instead of letting it fly, letting it sing, letting it be ragged and contradictory, like stories have to be. What really happened in Paloma Grove doesn't matter anymore. What matters is the stories people tell about it. I'm thinking while I'm writing this, None of it makes much sense. It's just fragments. Maybe you can connect it up for me, Tess. That's part of it, isn't it? Connecting everything? I know if I could just let my mother's skin and Christmas in Maine and Ellen and Fletcher and the talking skunks and every damn thing I ever felt or saw be part of the same story and called that story me, instead of always looking for something separate from the things I have felt or seen, it wouldn't matter that I was going to die soon, because I'd be part of what was going on and on, connecting and connecting. The way I see it now, the story doesn't give a shit if you're real or not, alive or not. All the story wants is to be told, and I guess in the end, that's what I want to. Will you do that for me, Tess? Will you make me part of what you tell, always? She wiped the tears from her eyes, smiling at the screen, as though Grillo was leaning back in his chair, sipping his vodka, waiting for her to reply. "'You've got it, Grillo,' she said, reaching out to touch the glass. "'So,' she added, "'what happens next?' "'The age-old question.' There was a breathless moment while the glass trembled beneath her fingers. Then she knew. Three. One. September had been a month of recuperation for Harry. He'd made a project of tidying his tiny office on 45th Street, touched base with friends he hadn't seen all summer, even attempted to reignite a few amorous fuses around town. In this last, he was completely unsuccessful. Only one of the women for whom he left messages returned his call, and only to remind him that he'd borrowed fifty bucks. He was not unhappy, then, to find a girl in her late teens at his apartment door that Tuesday night in early October. She had a ring through her left nostril, a black dress too short for her health, and a package. "'Are you Harry?' she said. "'Yep. I'm Sabina. I got something for you.' The parcel was cylindrical, four feet long, and wrapped in brown paper. "'You want to take it from me?' she said. "'What is it?' "'I'm going to drop it,' the girl said, and let the thing go. Harry caught it before it hit the floor. 
It's a present. Who from? Could I maybe get a Coke or something? The girl said, looking past Harry into the apartment. The word sure was barely out of Harry's mouth, and Sabina was pushing past him. What she lacked in manners she made up for in curves, he thought, watching her head on down the hall. He could live with that. The kitchen's on your right, he told her, but she headed straight past it into the living room. Got anything stronger? she said. There's probably some beers in the fridge, he replied, slamming the front door with his foot and following her into the living room. Beer gives me gas, she said. Harry dropped the package in the middle of the floor. I've got some rum, I think. Okay, she shrugged, as though Harry had been the one to suggest it, and she really wasn't that interested. He ducked into the kitchen to find the liquor, digging through the cupboard for an uncracked glass. You're not as weird as I thought you'd be, Sabina said to him, meanwhile. This place is nothing special. What were you expecting? Something more crazy, you know. I heard you get into some pretty sick stuff. Who told you that? Ted. You knew Ted? I more than knew him, she said, appearing at the kitchen door. She was trying to look sultry, but her face, despite the coal and the rouge and the blood-red lip gloss, was too round and childlike to carry it off. When was this? Harry asked her. Oh, three years ago. I was fourteen when I met him. That sounds like Ted. We never did anything I didn't want to do, she said, accepting the glass of rum from Harry. He was always real nice to me, even when he was going through lousy times. He was one of the good guys, Harry said. We should drink to him, Sabina replied. Sure. They tapped glasses. Here's to Ted. Wherever he is, Sabina added. Now, are you going to open your present? It was a painting. Ted's great work, in fact, De Moor in Wickoff Street, taken from its frame, stripped off its support, and somewhat ignominiously tied up with a piece of frayed string. He wanted you to have it, Sabina explained, as Harry pulled back the sofa to unroll the painting fully. The canvas was as powerful as Harry remembered. The seething color field in which the street was painted, the impasto from which his features had been carved, and, of course, that detail Ted had been so proud to point out to Harry in the gallery, the foot, the heel, the snake writhing as it was trodden lifeless. "'I guess maybe if somebody had offered him ten grand for it,' Sabina was saying, "'he would have given you something else, but nobody bought it, so I thought I'd come and give it to you.' "'And the gallery didn't mind?' "'They don't know it's gone.' Sabina said. They put it in storage with all the other pictures they couldn't sell. I guess they figured they'd find buyers sooner or later, but people don't want pictures like Ted's on their walls. They want stupid stuff. She had come to Harry's shoulder as she spoke. He could smell a light honey scent off her. If you like, she said, I could come back and make a new support for the canvas. Then you could hang it over your bed. She slid him a sly look. Or wherever. Harry didn't want to offend the girl. No doubt she'd done as Ted would have wished, bringing the picture here, but the notion of waking to an image of Wickoff Street every morning wasn't particularly comforting. "'I can see you want to think about it,' Sabina said, and, leaning across to Harry, laid a quick kiss beside his mouth. "'I'll stop by some time next week, okay?' she said. "'You can tell me then.' She finished her rum and handed the empty glass to Harry. "'It was really nice meeting you.' she said, suddenly and sweetly formal. She was slowly retreating to the door, as if waiting for a sign from Harry that she should stay. He was tempted, but he knew he wouldn't think much of himself in the morning if he took advantage. She was seventeen, for God's sake. By Ted's standards, that was practically senile, of course, but there was a part of Harry that still wanted seventeen-year-olds to be dreaming of love, not being plied with rum and coaxed into bed by men twice their age. She seemed to realize that nothing was going to come of this, and gave him a slightly quizzical smile. "'You really aren't the way I thought you'd be,' she remarked, faintly disappointed. "'I guess Ted didn't know me as well as he thought he did.' "'Oh, it wasn't just Ted told me about you,' she said. "'Who else?' "'Everyone and no one,' she replied with a lazy shrug. She was at the door now. "'See you, maybe.' she said, and opening the door was away, leaving him wishing he'd kept her company a little longer. 
Later, as he trailed to the john at three in the morning, he halted in front of the painting, and wondered if Mimi Lomax's house on Wickoff Street was still standing. The question was still with him when he woke the following morning, and as he walked to his office, and as he sorted through his outstanding paperwork. It didn't matter either way, of course, except to the extent that the question kept coming between him and his business. He knew why. He was afraid. Though he'd seen terrors in Paloma Grove, and come face to face with the Eod itself in Everville, the specter of Wickoff Street had never been properly exorcised. Perhaps it was time to do so now to deal once and for all with that last corner of his psyche still haunted by the stale notion of an evil that coveted human souls. He turned the notion over through the rest of the day, and through the day following that, knowing in his gut he would have to go sooner or later, or the subject would only gain authority over him. On Friday morning he got to his office to find that somebody had mailed him a mummified monkey's head elaborately mounted on what looked suspiciously like a length of human bone. It was not the first time he'd had such items come his way, some of them warnings, some of them talismans from well-wishers, some of them simply ill-advised gifts. But today the presence of this object, its aroma stinging his sinuses, seemed to harry a goad, to get him on his way. What are you afraid of? the gaping thing seemed to demand. Things die and spoil, but look, I'm laughing. He boxed the thing up, and was about to deposit it in the trash when some superstitious nerve in him twitched. Instead, he left it where it lay in the middle of his desk, and, telling it he'd be back soon, he headed off to Wickoff Street. Two. It was a cold day. Not yet New York bitter, that was probably a month, six weeks from now, but cold enough to know that there'd be no more shirt-sleeve days this side of winter. He didn't mind. The summer months had always brought him the most trouble. This summer had been no exception, and he was relieved to feel things running down around him. So what if the trees shed and the leaves rotted and the nights drew in? He needed to sleep. He found that much of the neighborhood around Wickoff Street had changed drastically since he'd last been here, and the closer he got, the more he dared hope his destination would be so much rubble. Not so. Wickoff Street remained almost exactly as it had been ten years before, the houses as gray and grim as ever. Rock might melt in Oregon, and the sky crack like a dropped egg, but here earth was earth and sky was sky, and whatever lived between was not going to be skipping anywhere soon. He wandered along the littered sidewalk to Mimi Lomax's house, expecting to find it in a state of dilapidation. Again, not so. Its present owner was plainly attentive. The house had a new roof, a new chimney, new eaves. The door he knocked on had been recently painted. There was no reply at first. Though he heard the murmur of voices from inside, he knocked again, and this time, after a delay of a minute or so, the door was opened a sliver, and a woman in late middle age, her face taut and sickly, stared out at him with red-rimmed eyes. "'Are you him?' she said. Her voice was frail with exhaustion. "'Are you de Amour? I'm the moor, yes. Harry was already uneasy. He could smell the woman from where he stood, sour sweat and dirt. How do you know who I am? he asked her. She said. The woman replied, opening the door a little wider. Who said? She's got my Stevie upstairs. She's had him there for three days. Tears were pouring down the woman's cheeks as she spoke. She made no effort to wipe them away. She said she wouldn't let him go till you got here. She stepped back from the door. You've got to make her let him go. He's all I got. Harry took a deep breath and stepped into the house. At the far end of the hallway stood a woman in her early twenties, long black hair, huge eyes shining in the gloom. This is Stevie's sister, Loretta. The young woman clutched her rosary and stared at Harry as though he was an accomplice of whatever was upstairs. The older woman closed the front door and came to Harry's side. How did it know you were coming here? she murmured. I don't know, Harry replied. 
It said if we tried to leave, Lavetta said, her voice barely whisper, it'd kill Stevie. Why do you say it? Because it's not human. She glanced up the flight, her face fearful. It's from hell, she breathed. Can't you smell it? There was certainly a foul smell. This wasn't the fish market stench of the Zion Karasophius chamber. This was shit and fire. Heart cavorting, Harry went to the bottom of the stairs. You stay down here, he told the two women, and started up the flight, stepping over the spot on the fifth stair where Father Hess's head had been resting when he expired. There was no noise from upstairs, and none now from below. He climbed in silence, knowing the creature awaiting him was listening for every creaking stair. Rather than let it think he was attempting to approach in silence and failing, he broke the hush himself. Coming, ready or not, he said. The reply came immediately, and he knew within a syllable what thing this was. Harry, said Lazy Susan, where have you been? No, don't tell me. You've been seeing the boss man, haven't you? While the demon talked, Harry reached the top of the stairs and crossed the landing to the door. The paint was blistered. You want a job, Harry? Lazy Susan went on. I don't blame you. Times are about to get real bad. The door was already open an inch. Harry pushed it lightly, and it swung wide. The room beyond was almost completely dark. The drapes drawn, the lamp on the floor so encrusted with caked excrement, it barely glimmered. The bed itself had been stripped down to the mattress, which in turn had been burned black. On it lay a youth, dressed in a filthy T-shirt and boxer shorts, face down. Stevie, Harry said. The boy didn't move. He's asleep right now said Lazy Susan's curdled voice from the darkness beyond the bed. He's had a busy time. Why don't you just let the kid go? It's me you want. You overestimate your appeal, Damore. Why would I want a fucked-up soul like yours when I could have this pure little thing? Then why did you bring me here? I didn't. Sure, Sabina may have planted the thought in your head, but you came of your own accord. Sabina's a friend of yours? She'd probably prefer mistress. Did you fuck her? No. Ah, the moor, the nomad said, exasperated, after all the trouble I went to getting her wet. You're not turning queer on me, are you? No, you're too straight for your own good. You're boring, the moor. Boring, boring. Well, maybe I should just piss off home, Harry said, turning back to the door. There was a rush of motion behind him. He heard the bed springs creak, and Stevie let out a little moan. Wait, the nomad hissed. Don't you ever turn your back on me. He glanced over his shoulder. The creature had shimmied up onto the bed, and now had its bone and muck body poised over its victim. It was the color of the filth on the lamp but wet, its too-naked anatomy full of peristaltic motions. "'Why is it always shit?' Harry said. The nomad cocked its head. Whatever features were upon it all resembled wounds. "'Because shit's all we have, Harry, until we're returned to glory. It's all God allows us to play with. Maybe a little fire once in a while, as long as he isn't looking. Speaking of fire... I saw Father Hess the other day, burning in his cell. I told him I might see you. Harry shook his head. It doesn't work, Nomad, he said. What doesn't work? The fallen angel routine. I don't believe it any more. He started towards the bed. You know why? I saw some of your relatives in Oregon. In fact, I almost got crucified by a couple of them. Brutish little fucks like you, except they didn't have any of your pretensions. They were just in it for the blood and the shit. He kept approaching the bed as he talked, far from certain what the creature would do. It had disemboweled Hess with a few short strokes, and he had no reason to believe it had lost the knack. But stripped of its phony autobiography, what was it? A thug with a few days' training in an abattoir. Stop right there, 
the creature said when Harry was a yard from the bed. It was shuddering from head to foot. If you come any closer, I'll kill little Stevie, and I'll throw him down the stairs just like Hess. Harry raised his hands in mock surrender. Okay, he said. This is as close as I get. I just wanted to check the family resemblance. You know, it's uncanny. The nomad shook his head. I was an angel, Damour, it said, its voice troubled. I remember heaven, I do, as though it were yesterday, clouds and light and— And the sea? The sea. Quiddity. No, it yelled. I was in heaven. I remember God's heart beating, beating all the time. Maybe you were born on a beach. I've warned you once, the creature said. I'll kill the boy. And what will that prove? That you're a fallen angel? Or that you're the little bully I say you are? The nomad raised its hands to its wretched face. Oh, you're clever, Damour. It sighed. You're very clever. But so was Hess. The creature parted its fingers, exhaling its sewer breath. And look what happened to him. Hess wasn't clever, Harry said softly. I loved him, and I respected him. But he was deluded. You're pretty much alike now that I think about it. He leaned an inch or two closer to the entity. You think you fell from heaven. He thought he was serving it. You believed the same things in the end. It was stupid to kill him, Nomad. It's not left you with very much. I've still got you, the creature replied. I could fuck with your head until the crack of doom. Nah, Harry said, standing upright. I'm not afraid of you any longer. I don't need prayers. Oh, don't you, it growled. I don't need a crucifix. I just need the eyes in my head. And what I see, what I see is an anorexic little shit-eater. At this it launched itself at him, shrieking, all the wounds in its head wide. Harry retreated across the filthy floor, avoiding its whining talons by inches, until his back was flat against the wall. Then it closed on him, flinging its arms up at his head. He raised his hands to protect his eyes, but the creature didn't want them, at least not yet. Instead, it dug its fingers into the flesh at the back of his neck, driving its spiked feet into the wall to either side of his body. Now again, Damour, the creature said. Harry felt the blood pour down his spine. He heard his vertebrae crack. Am I an angel? Its face was inches from Harry's, its voice issuing from all the holes at once. I want an answer, Damour. It's very important to me. I was in heaven once, wasn't I? Admit it. Very, very slowly, Harry shook his throbbing head. The creature sighed. Oh, the more, it said, uprooting one of its hands from the back of Harry's neck and bringing it round to stroke his larynx. The growl had gone from its voice. It was no longer the nomad, it was Lazy Susan. I'll miss you, it said, its fingers breaking the skin of Harry's throat. There hasn't been a night when I haven't thought of us. Its tone was sultry now. Here, in the dark, together. On the bed behind the creature, the boy moaned. Hush, Lazy Susan said. But Stevie was beyond being silenced. He wanted the comfort of a prayer. Hail Mary, full of grace, he began. The creature glanced round at him, the nomad surfacing again to shriek for the boy to shut the fuck up. As it did so, Harry caught hold of the hand at his neck, lacing his fingers with the talons. Then he threw his weight forward. The nomad's feet were loosed from the wall, and the two bodies, locked together, stumbled into the middle of the room. Instantly the creature drove its fingers deeper into Harry's nape. Blinded by pain, he swung around, determined that wherever they fell it wouldn't be on top of the boy. They reeled wildly, round and round, until Harry lost his balance and fell forward, carrying the nomad ahead of him. Its body struck the charred door, which splintered under the combined weight of their bodies. Through his tear-filled eyes, Harry glimpsed the misbegotten face in front of him, its hands slack with shock. Then they were out onto the landing. It was bright after the murk of the bedroom, for the nomad, painfully so. It convulsed in Harry's embrace, hot phlegm spurting from its maws. He seized the moment to wrest its talons from his neck. Then their momentum carried them against the banisters, which cracked but did not break, and over they went. It was a fall of perhaps ten feet. 
the nomad under Harry, shrieking still. They hit the stairs and rolled and rolled, finally coming to rest a few steps from the bottom. The first thing Harry thought was, God, it's quiet. Then he opened his eyes. He was cheek to cheek with the creature, its sweat stinging his skin. Reaching out for the spattered banister, he started to haul himself to his feet, his left arm, shoulder, ribs, and neck all paining him, but none so badly he could not enjoy the spectacle at his feet. The nomad was in extremis. Its body, which was even more pitiful and repulsive by the light of day than in the room above, a mass of degenerating tissue. Ah, uh, you there? the creature said. It had lost its growl and its silkiness, too, as though the selves it had pretended had flickered out along with its sight. I'm here, Harry replied. It tried to raise one of its hands, but failed. Are you dying? It wanted to know. Not today, Harry said softly. That's not right, the creature said. We have to go together. I... Em, you. You haven't got much time, Harry told it. Don't waste what you've got with that crap. But it's true, the thing went on. I am. I am you, and you are love. Harry thought of Ted's painting, of the snake beneath his heel. Clinging to the banister, he raised his foot. Be quiet, he said. The creature ignored him. You are love, it said again. And love is... Harry laid his heel upon its head. I'm warning you, he said. Love is what? He didn't warn it again, but ground his foot down into its suppurating face as hard as his weary body would allow. It was hard enough. He felt its muck cave in beneath his heel, layers of wafer bone and ooze dividing under his weight. Small spasms ran out along the creature's limbs to its bloodied fingertips. Then, quite suddenly, it ceased, its shtick unfinished. In the hallway below, Loretta was murmuring the prayer her brother had begun above. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. It sounded pretty to Harry's ears, after the shrieks and the threats. And blessed be the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. It would not turn death away, of course. It would not save the innocent from suffering. But prettiness was no insignificant quality, not in this troubled world. While he listened, he pulled his heel out of the nomad's face. The creature's matter, stripped of the will that had shaped it, was already losing distinction and running off down the stairs. Five steps to the bottom, Harry saw, just like Hess. The victory had taken its toll. In addition to his lacerated neck and punctured throat, Harry had a broken collarbone, four cracked ribs, a fractured right arm, and a mild concussion. As for Stevie, who had been the nomad's hostage for three days, his traumas were more psychological than physical. They would take some time to heal, if they ever did. But the first step on that journey was made the day after the creature's death. The family moved out of the house on Wickoff Street, leaving it to the mercy of gossip. This time there would be no attempt to redeem the house. Untenanted, it would fall into disrepair through the winter months, at what some thought an uncanny speed. Nobody would ever occupy it again. One mystery remained unsolved. Why had the creature plotted to bring him back to Wickoff Street in the first place? Had it begun to doubt its own mythology, and arranged a rematch with an old enemy to confirm its sense of itself? Or had it simply been bored one September day, and taken it into its head to play the old game of temptation and slaughter for the sheer hell of it? The answer to those questions would, Harry assumed, join the long list of things he would never know. As for Ted's magnum opus, after a few days of indecision, Harry elected to hang it in the living room. Given that he was presently one-handed, this took him the better part of two hours to accomplish, but once it was up, the canvas nailed it directly to the wall, it looked better than it had in the gallery. Unbounded by a frame, Ted's vision seemed to bleed out across the wall. 
of the lovely Sabina, who had presumably been obeying the nomad's instructions when she'd delivered the painting, there was no further sign. But Harry had two new deadbolts put on the front door anyway, just in case. A little less than a fortnight after the end game in Wickoff Street, he got a call out of the blue from a fretful Raoul. I need you to get on a plane, Harry. Whatever you're doing. Where are you? I'm in Omaha. I came looking for Tesla. And? I found her, but not quite the way I thought I would. Is she okay? Harry said. There was a silence down the line. Raoul? Yeah, I'm here. I don't know whether she's okay or not. You have to see for yourself. Is she at Grillo's place? Yeah, I tracked her from L.A. She told her neighbors she was heading out to Nebraska. That's proof of insanity in Hollywood. How soon can you get out here? I'll catch a flight today if I can find one. Will you pick me up at the airport? I'm not in the best of shape. What happened? I trod in some shit. But it's dead now. Four. One. Phoebe didn't tell Jarieffa that she knew the identity of their visitor. It was too painful for one thing, and for another she was afraid the result would be to scare the woman and her children out of the house. She certainly didn't want that, not just for their sakes, but for her own. She had become used to their mess and their ruckus, and it would make the recognition of what she'd done all the more unbearable, if she was left alone in the O'Connell mansion as a consequence. Jarieffa had a lot of questions, of course, and she was less than satisfied with some of the answers Phoebe furnished. But as time slipped by, and the children's nightmares and spontaneous bursts of tears diminished in frequency, the house returned to its former rhythm, and whatever doubts Jarieffa still had, she kept to herself. Phoebe, meanwhile, had begun a systematic search of the city, looking for some clue as to Joe's whereabouts. Assuming he had not simply evaporated upon departing the house, this she doubted. Rudimentary he'd been, but still solid. His escape through the streets could not, she reasoned, have gone completely unnoticed. Even in this city, the streets of which boasted more strange forms and physiognomies with every new vessel that dropped anchor, Joe's appearance had been, to say the least, noteworthy. Somebody must have seen something. She soon came to regret that she'd been so tardy warming up relations with her neighbors. Though most of them were reasonably polite to her when she came asking questions, they were all wary of her. As far as they were concerned, she remained an outsider, and she feared that even if they had answers to her questions, they would not be forthcoming. Several days in a row she returned to the O'Connell house frustrated and exhausted, having traipsed from door to door, on some streets, from construction site to construction site, asking for information, the parameters of her search steadily expanding, along with her sense of desperation. She lost her appetite and her sense of humor. Some days, having skipped two consecutive meals, she'd wander the streets light-headed and close to tears, calling Joe's name like a crazy woman. Once, finding herself at the end of the day lost and too weary to discover a way home, she slept in the street. On another occasion, wandering into the middle of some territorial dispute between two families, she almost had her throat cut. But she continued to journey out every day, hoping for some clue that would eventually lead her to him. As it turned out, the sliver of information she'd been searching for came from a source close to hand. Preparing to step into her bath one day, having walked the city for twelve hours or more, there was a knock on her bedroom door, and upon her invitation, Enko entered asking to speak to her for a few moments. He had always been the least friendly member of Jarieffa's brood, a gangly boy even by adolescent standards, his face human but for the symmetrical patches of mottling upon his brow and neck, and the vestigial gills that ran from the middle of his cheeks down to his neck. "'I've got a friend,' he explained. "'His name's Vip Lumu. He lives down the street two blocks. The house with the boarded-up windows?' "'I know it,' Phoebe said. He told me you'd been round asking about, you know, that thing that was here? Yes, I was. Well, Yip knew something about it, but his mother told him not to speak to you. That was neighborly, Phoebe remarked. It's not you, Enko replied. Well, it is and it isn't. It's mainly what happened here, you know, in the old days, and with the ships coming back in again, they think you're going to start up business like Miss O'Connell. Business? 
said Phoebe. Yes, you know, the women. I'm not following this, Enka. The whores, the boy said, the mottling on his face darkening. Whores, said Phoebe. Are you telling me this house used to be a brothel? The best. That's what Vip's father says. People came from all over. Phoebe pictured Maeve sitting in regal splendor amid her pillows and her billet doux, opining on the imbecility of love. And no wonder the woman had been a madam. Love wasn't good for business. You could do me a great service, Phoebe said, if you'd tell Vip to spread the word that I have no intention of reopening this house for business any time soon. I'll do that. Now, you said he knew something? Enko nodded. He heard his father talking about a missimi that was seen down at the harbor. Missimi? Oh, that's a word the sailors use. It means something they find out at sea that's not really made yet. Half dreamed, she thought, like my Joe. My missimi, Joe. Enko, thank you. No trouble, the boy replied, turning to go. Hand on the door, he glanced back. You know, Musnikov wasn't my father. Yes, I had heard. He was my father's cousin. Anyway, he told all about how he used to go out and find women for Miss O'Connell. I can imagine, Phoebe said. He explained everything, where to go, what to say, so... Enko halted and stared at his shoes. So if I ever go back into business, Phoebe said. The boy beamed. I'll bear you in mind. She let the bathwater go cold and began to get dressed again putting on several layers of clothing against the wind, which had been bitter the last couple of days, and was always keener close to the water. Then she went to the kitchen, filled up one of Maeve's silver liquor flasks with morning berry juice, and headed down to the harbor, thinking as she went that if she failed to find Joe after a year or so, she'd reopen the brothel, just to spite the neighbors who had given her so little help, and like Maeve, grow old and sour in luxury, profiting from lovelessness. Two. As Raoul had promised, he was waiting at Epley Airport, though at first Harry failed to recognize him. He'd warmed up the somewhat eerie pallor of his host body with a little pancake, and was sporting a fancy pair of tinted glasses to conceal his silvery pupils, covering his bald pate a baseball cap. The ensemble wasn't particularly fetching, but it allowed him to move unnoticed through the crowds. On the way back to Grillo's house, with Raoul tucked behind the wheel of the antiquated Ford convertible, which he confessed he had no license to drive, they exchanged accounts of their recent adventures. Harry told Raoul about all that had happened in Wickoff Street, and Raoul reciprocated by telling of the journey he'd made back to the Mission de Santa Catrina, on the Baja Peninsula, where Fletcher had first discovered and synthesized the nuncio. I built a shrine up there a long time ago, he said which I attended till Tesla found me. I was sure it would have disappeared, but no, it was still there. The village women still go up to the ruins to pray and ask Fletcher to intercede if their children are sick. It's quite touching. I saw one or two women I knew, but of course they didn't know me. There was one woman, though. God knows she must be ninety if she's a day, and I did go seek her out and tell her who I was. She's blind now and a little crazy, but she swore to me she'd seen him the day before she lost her sight. You mean Fletcher? I mean Fletcher. She said he was standing on the edge of the cliff, staring up at the sun. He used to do that. And you think he's still up there? Stranger things are true, Raoul pointed out. We both know that. The walls are getting thinner, right? Harry said. I'd say so. They drove on in silence for a while. I thought I'd maybe make another pilgrimage, Raoul said after a minute or so, while I'm here in Omaha. Let me guess, the dead letters office. If it's still standing, Raoul said. It's probably a deeply uninteresting piece of architecture, but we'd neither of us be here if it hadn't been built. You believe that? Oh, I'm sure the art would have found somebody to use if it hadn't been Jaffe, but we might never have known anything about it. We could have been like them, he nodded out through the window at Omaha's citizenry, going about their business, thinking what you see is what you get. Do you ever wish it were? Harry asked him. I was born an ape, Harry, Raoul replied. I know what it's like to evolve. He chuckled. Let me tell you, it's wonderful. And that's what this is all about, Harry said. Evolving? I think so. We're born to rise, to see more, to know more. 
maybe to know everything one day. He halted the car outside a large, gloomy house. Which brings us back to Tesla, he said, and led Harry up the overgrown driveway where Tesla's bike was parked to the front door. The afternoon was drawing on, and the house was even gloomier inside than out, its walls bare, its air damp. Where is she? Harry asked Raoul, struggling out of his jacket. Let me give you a hand. I can do it, Harry said, impatient now. Just take me to Tesla, will you? Raoul nodded, his mouth tight, and ushered Harry through to the back of the house. We have to be careful, he said, as they came to a closed door. Whatever's going on in here, I think it's volatile. With that, he opened the door. The room was packed to capacity with all the paraphernalia of Grillo's beloved reef, the sight of which put Harry in mind of Norma's little sanctum, with its thirty screens busily keeping lost souls at bay. Here, he knew, the reverse process was at work. Here, the lost and the crazy found refuge, a place to unburden themselves of all that obsessed them. Their reports were on the screens now, scrolling furiously. And sitting in front of them, her eyes closed, Tesla. This is how she was when I got here, Raoul said. In case you're wondering, she's breathing, but it's very slow. Harry took a step towards her, but Raoul checked him. Be careful, he said. Why? When I tried to get close to her, I felt some kind of energy field. I don't feel anything, Harry said, advancing another step. As he did so, something grazed his face, oh, so lightly, like the tremulous wall of a bubble. He made to retreat, but he was too slow. In one paradoxical moment, the bubble seemed to suck him in and burst. The room vanished, and he flew like a bullet, fired into the blaze of a scarlet sun, its color pure beyond expression. A moment there, and he was gone, out the other side, and into another, this one blue, and on into a yellow, then green, then purple. And as he traveled, sun succeeding sun, vistas began to open to left and right of him, above and below, receding from him to the limit of his sight. Forms erupted on every side, stealing their incandescence from the suns he was piercing, the blaze of which was retreating now, as the forms claimed his devotion. They came at him from every direction, bombarding him with images in such numbers his mind failed to grasp a single one. He started to panic as the assault intensified, fearing his sanity would abandon him if he didn't find a rock in this maelstrom. And then Tesla's voice. Harry? The sound fixed the vision for an instant. He saw a scene of vivid particulars— a patch of scarred ochre ground, a hole and a bitch mutt sitting beside it chewing at a rump, a hand with bitten fingernails emerging from the hole, tossing a shard of pottery out onto the cloth laid beside it, and Tesla, or a fragment of her, somewhere beyond the hole and the hand and the mutt. Thank God, Harry said, but he'd spoken too soon. The picture slid away, and he was off again, yelling for Tesla as he flew. It's okay, she said. Hold on. Again her voice pulled him up short. Another scene, more particulars. Dusk, this time, and distant hills. A wooden shack in a field of swaying grass, and a woman running towards him with a bawling baby in her arms. Behind her, three dark, diminutive creatures in eager pursuit, their heads huge, their eyes golden. The woman was sobbing in terror as she fled, but the child was weeping for very different reasons, its skinny arms reaching back towards the pursuers. And now, as the babe turned to beat at its mother's head, Harry saw why. Though it appeared to be a human child, its eyes were also golden. "'What's happening here?' Harry said. "'Anybody's guess,' Tesla replied. As she spoke, he saw another piece of her in the vicinity of the shack. "'It's all part of the reef.' And now, as the child started to slip from its mother's arms, the scene slid away like the first, and on he flew, his mind starting to snatch hold of some of the dramas he was piercing— Never more than a piece, a flock of birds in ice, a coin bleeding on the ground, somebody laughing in a burning chair, but enough to know that every one of these innumerable images was part of some greater scheme. Amazing, he breathed. Isn't it? Tesla said, and again her voice brought him to a halt. A city this time, a lowery sky, and from it flecks of silvery light dropping lightly like mirrored feathers. On the sidewalks below, people went about their business, blind to the sight, except for one upturned face, an old man, pointing and hollering. "'What am I seeing?' Harry said. "'Stories,' Tesla replied, and hearing her, Harry glimpsed another piece of her mosaic in the crowd. "'That's what Grillo gathered here. 
hundreds of thousands of stories. The street was slipping. I'm losing you, Harry warned. Just let go, Tesla replied. I'll catch up with you somewhere else. He did, as she instructed. The street fled, and he moved on at breath-snatching speed, while the stories continued to fly at him from all directions. Again, he caught only glimpses, but now he had some way to interpret the sights, however brief. There were epics and chamber pieces here, domestic dramas and quests to the end of the world, Old Testament splendors and nursery tale terrors. I'm not sure I can take much more, Harry said. I feel like I'm going to lose my mind. You'll find another, Tesla quipped and again he stopped dead in the midst of a tale. This time, however, there was something different about it. This was a story he knew. Recognize it? Tesla said. Of course. It was Everville. The crossroads, Saturday afternoon, with the sun pouring down on a scene of farce and lunacy. The band on their butts, Budenbaum digging for glory, the air laced with visions of whores. It was not the way Harry remembered it exactly, but what the hell? It held its own with anything he'd witnessed so far. Am I here? he asked. You are now, Tesla replied. What? Grillo was wrong, calling it a reef, Tesla went on. A reef's dead. This is still growing. Stories don't die, Harry. They change? Exactly. Your seeing all this enriches it, evolves it. Nothing's ever lost. That's what I'm learning. Are you going to stay? Harry said, watching the drama at the crossroads continue to elaborate. For a while, she said. There are answers here, if I can get down to the root. She reached out towards Harry as she spoke, and he saw that the fragments he'd glimpsed on the way here were before him still. Part of her was carved from a patch of ochre ground, and part from the hole dug there. Part resembled the shack in the field, and part the golden-eyed child. Part was made of mirror flakes, part was the old man pointing skyward. And part, of course, was made from that sunlit afternoon, and from Owen Budenbaum, who would be at the crossroads raging for as long as stories were told. Finally, though he could not see this sliver, he knew she was also made from him, who was in this story somewhere. I am you, the nomad murmured in his head. Do you understand any of this? Tesla asked him. I'm beginning to. It's like love, Harry. No, that's not right. I think maybe it is love. She smiled at her own comprehension, and as she smiled the contact between them was broken. He flew from her, back through the blazing colors, and was returned in the bursting of a bubble to the stale room he'd departed. Raoul was there, waiting for him, trembling. "'God the more, he said. "'I thought I'd lost you.' Harry shook his head. "'It was touch and go for a moment there,' he said. "'I was visiting with Tesla. She was showing me around.' He looked at the body sitting in the chair in front of the monitors. It seemed suddenly redundant, the flesh, the bone. The true Tesla, perhaps the true Harry, perhaps the true world, was back where he'd come from, telling itself in the infinite branches of the story tree. "'Will she be coming back?' Raoul wanted to know. "'When she's got where she wants to go,' Harry replied. "'And where's that?' Back to the beginning, Harry said. Where else? 3. That first trip down to the harbor proved fruitless. Phoebe found nobody who knew anything about the Missimi. But on the second day her relentless questioning bore fruit. Yes, one of the dock road bar owners told her he knew what she was talking about. Some creature, in an agonized and unfinished state, had indeed been seen down here several weeks before. In fact, if his memory served, some attempt had been made to corral the abomination, for fear it had murderous appetites. To his knowledge, the creature had never been caught. Perhaps, he suggested, it had been driven back into the sea, from which everybody had assumed it emerged, in which case the tide had carried its misbegotten body away. 
There was both good news here and bad. She had confirmation that she was at least searching in the right quarter of the city. That was the good. But the fact that Joe had not been sighted of late suggested that perhaps the bar owner's theory was correct, and he had indeed been lost to the waters. She now went in search of somebody who had been a member of the pursuit party, but as the days went by it became more and more difficult to keep track of her progress. There were new ships docking daily, from single-masted vessels to the plethora of fishing boats that plied in and out of the harbor, leaving light and returning heavy with their catch. Often she found herself neglecting her inquiries and listening, half-enchanted, to the talk exchanged by the sailors and the stevedores, stories of what lay out beyond the tranquil waters of the harbor, out in the wilds and wastes of the dream sea. She had heard of the ephemeris, of course, and from Musnikov, of Plothosaic and Trophete, but there were far more than these, countries and cities whose names conjured glories. Some were real places, their goods being unloaded at the dock, others in the category of fables. Into the former group went the island of Burger's Mantle, where crews were apparently lost all the time, preyed upon by a species so exquisite the victims died of disbelief. Into the latter went the city of Nilpalium, which had been founded by a fool, and which was ruled over, justly and well, so legend went, by its founder's dogs, who had devoured him upon his decease. The story that most engaged her, however, was that of Kikaranka Rojandi. It was reputedly a tower of burning rock, which rose straight-sided out of the sea, climbing to a height of half a mile. The species that crawled and climbed upon it were not consumed by its flames, but had to constantly fling themselves down into the steaming waves to cool their bodies, only to begin the ascent afresh when they could bear to, desperate to court and fertilize their queen, who lived encased in flame at the very summit. The more preposterous of these stories were a healthy, indeed vital, distraction from her misery, and the true ones were curiously encouraging, evidence, as they were, of how many miraculous states of being were plausible here. Yet the citizens of Beketer Sabat had the courage to live in an inverted pyramid, and the fire-climbers of Kikaranka Rojandi the devotion to climb their tower, believing they would one day reach their queen. Should she not keep looking for her misamy? And then came the day of the storm. It had been predicted by the retired mariners along the quayside for some time, a tempest of notable ferocity that would have all manner of deep-sea fish rising in shoals from their trenches. For those enterprising fishermen, willing to risk their nets, their boats, and very possibly their lives in open waters, a haul of prodigious proportions was predicted. Phoebe was warming herself in front of the kitchen fire, when the winds started to rise, the children sitting, eating stew nearby, their mother kneading bread. "'I hear a window slamming,' Jariefa said, as the first rain pattered on the kitchen cell and hurried away to close it. Phoebe stared into the flames, while the gusts whooped and howled in the chimney. It would be quite a spectacle down by the dark road, she suspected, ships tossing at anchor and the sea throwing itself against the harbour wall. Who knew what a storm like this would drive up onto the shore? She rose as she formed the thought. Who knew indeed? Jariatha, she yelled as she fetched her coat from the closet. Jariatha, I'm going out. The woman was coming down the stairs now, a look of concern on her face. In this weather? she said. Don't worry, I'll be fine. Take Anko with you, it's cruel out there. No, Jariatha, I can stand a little rain. You just stay in the warm and bake your bread. Still protesting that this was not a wise thing to be doing, Jariatha followed Phoebe to the door and out onto the step. Go back inside, Phoebe told her. I'll be back in a while. Then she was off into the deluge. It had cleared the streets as effectively as the Eid. She encountered scarcely a soul as she made her way down to the warren of minor streets and back alleys that were by now as familiar to her feet as Main Street and Poppy Lane. The closer she got to the water, the less cover she had to shield her from the fury of the storm. By the time she reached the dock road, she was leaning into the wind, and more than once had to grip a wall or railing to keep herself from being thrown off her feet. The quayside and the decks of the ships were a good deal busier than the streets she'd come through, as crews labored to secure sails and lash down cargo. One of the single-masted vessels had slipped its mooring, and as Phoebe watched, it was dashed against the harbor wall. 
Its timbers splintered, and a number of its crew jumped into the water, which was frenzied. She didn't wait to see if the vessel sank, but hurried on, past the harbor, and through the warehouse district adjacent to it, out onto the shore. The waves were tall and thunderous, the air so thick with spray and rain she could not see more than a dozen yards ahead of her. But the grim fury of the scene suited her mood. She stumbled over the dark, slick rocks, daring the waters to reach high enough to claim her, yelling Joe's name as she went. The gale snatched the syllable from her lips, of course, but she strode on doggedly, her tears mingling with the rain and the spume off the dream sea. At last her fatigue and her despair overcame her. She sank down onto the stones, soaked to the skin, her throat too hoarse and lungs too raw to call his name again. Her extremities were numb with cold, her head throbbing. She raised her hands to her mouth to warm her fingers with her breath, and was thinking that if she didn't move soon she might very well freeze to death when she caught sight of a figure in the mist further along the beach. Somebody was approaching her. A man, his few clothes less than rags, his body a strange compendium of forms and hues. In places he was purplish in color, his skin scaly, in others he had small patches of almost silvery skin. But the core of him, the flesh around his eyes and his mouth, down his neck and across his chest and belly, was black. She started to rise, the name she had been yelling to the wind too much for her astonished lips. It didn't matter. He had seen her, seen her with the eyes she herself had dreamed into being. He halted now a few yards from her, a tiny smile on his face. She could not hear his voice. The waves were too loud, but she knew the shape of her name when he spoke it. Phoebe. Tentatively she approached him, having the distance between them, but not yet coming within reach of his arms. She was just a little afraid. Perhaps the rumors of murderous intent were true. If not, where had he found the pieces of flesh to finish his body? It is you, isn't it? he said. She was close enough to catch his words now. It's me, she said. I thought maybe I'd lost my mind. Maybe I'd imagined it all. No, she said. I dreamed you here, Joe. Now it was he who approached, looking down at his hands. You certainly put some flesh on me, he said. But the spirit. One of those hands went to his chest. What's in here? That's me. Joe, you found out in the weeds. I was certain I dreamed you. You did. And I heard, and I came. But I'm not some fantasy, Phoebe. This is Joe. So what happened to you? She said. Where did the rest of me come from? Yes. Joe turned his gaze towards the water. The shoe. The spirit pilots. Phoebe remembered Musnikov's short lesson on that subject well enough. Pieces of the Creator, he'd said. Or not. I threw myself into the water hoping I'd drown, but they found me surrounded me, dreamed the rest of me into being. He raised his hand for her scrutiny. As you can see, he said, I think they put a little of their own nature into me while they were doing it. The limb was more strangely fashioned than she'd first realized. The fingers webbed, the skin full of subtle ripples. Does it offend you? Lord, no, she said. I'm just grateful to have you back. Now at last she opened her arms and went to him. He gathered her to his body, which was warm despite the rain and spray, his embrace as fierce as hers. I still can't quite believe you followed me, he murmured. What else was I going to do? She replied. You know there's no way back, don't you? Why would we want to go? She said. They stayed there on the shore for a long while, talking sometimes, but mostly just cradling one another. They didn't make love. That was for another day. For many days, in fact. Now just embraces, just kisses, just tenderness, until the storm had exhausted itself. When they returned along the quay several hours later, the heavens clearing, the air pristine, scarcely a gaze was turned in their direction. People were too busy. There were damaged hulls to be repaired, torn sails to be mended, scattered cargoes to be gathered up and restowed. And for those audacious fishermen who'd dared the violence of the storm and returned unharmed, prayers offered up on the quayside as the boats were unloaded. Prayers of thanks for their survival, 
and for the dream sees largesse. The prophets who'd predicted the tempest had been proved correct. The frenzied waters had indeed thrown up an unprecedented catch. While the lovers wandered unnoticed to the house on the hill, where they would with time come to a certain notoriety, the contents of the nets were heaped on the dock. Up, out of quiddity, from its unfathomed places, had come creatures strange even to the fishermen's eyes. They were like things made in the first days of the world, some of them, others like the scrawlings of an infant on a wall. A few were featureless, many more bright with colors that had no name. Some flickered with their own luminescence, even in the daylight. Only the shoe were thrown back. The rest were sorted, put in baskets, and carried up to the fish market, where a crowd had already gathered in anticipation of this bounty. Even the ugliest, the least of the infant's scrawls, would nourish somebody. Nothing would be wasted. Nothing lost. End of Everville by Clive Barker Read by Roy Avers in the studios of the American Printing House for the Blind, Louisville, Kentucky, for the Library of Congress, June 1995. For special distribution as authorized by Act of Congress under Public Law 89-522, with the permission of the copyright holder and the publisher, HarperCollins Publishers, Incorporated, 10 East 53rd Street, New York, New York, 10022. End of Book <laughs>